8i. The river is 473 yards wide, at the lower Great Falls the river is confined within 280 yards. Below the falls the water occupies 93 yards only, after taking the width of the river at those sundry places I return through the plains in a direct line to camp. Some rain this evening after a very hot day. The mountains which are in view to the south and NW, are covered with snow. Those nearer us and form a three-quarters circle around us is not covered with snow at this time. The hunters killed three buffalo, two antelopes, and a deer today, the immense herds of buffalo which was near us a few days ago, has proceeded on down the river, we can see but a few bulls in the plains. Lewis, July 9. 1805. Tuesday, July 9, 1805. The morning was fair and plent. The island seemed crowded with blackbirds, the young brood is now completely feathered and flying in common with the others. We corked the canoes and put them in the water and also launched the boat, she lay like a perfect cork on the water. Five men would carry her with the greatest ease. I now directed seats to be fixed in her and oars to be fitted. The men loaded the canoes in readiness to depart. Just at this moment a violent wind commenced and blew so hard that we were obliged to unload the canoes again, a part of the baggage in several of them got wet before it could be taken out. The wind continued violent until late in the evening. By which time we discovered that a greater part of the composition had separated from the skins and left the seams of the boat exposed to the water and she leaked in such manner that she would not answer. I need not add that this circumstance mortified me not a little. And to prevent her leaking without pitch was impossible with us, and to obtain this article was equally impossible, therefore the evil was irreparable I now found that the section formed of the buffalo hides on which some hair had been left. Answered much the best purpose. This leaked but little and the parts which were well covered with hair about one-eighth of an inch in length retained the composition perfectly and remained sound and dry. From these circumstances I am persuaded, that had I formed her with buffalo skin singed not quite as close as I had done those I employed, that she would have answered even with this composition. But to make any further experiments in our present situation seemed to me madness, the buffalo had principally deserted us, and the season was now advancing fast. I therefore relinquished all further hope of my favorite boat and ordered her to be sunk in the water. That the skins might become soft in order the better to take her in paces tomorrow and deposite the iron frame at this place as it could probably be of no further service to us. Had I only singed my elk skins instead of shaving them I believe the composition would have remained and the boat have answered. At least until we could have reached the pine country which must be in advance of us from the pine which is brought down by the water and which is probably at no great distance where we might have supplied ourselves with the necessary pitch or gum. But it was now too late to introduce a remedy and I bid adieu to my boat, and her expected services. The next difficulty which presented itself was how we should convey the stores and baggage which we had purposed carrying in the boat. Both Captain Clark and myself recollected having heard the hunters mention that the bottoms of the river some few miles above us were much better timbered than below and that some of the trees were large. The idea therefore suggested itself of building two other canoes sufficiently large to carry the surplus baggage. On inquiry of the hunters it seemed to be the general opinion that trees sufficiently a large for this purpose might be obtained in a bottom on the opposite side about eight miles distant by land and rether more than double that distance by water. Accordingly Captain Clark determined to set out early in the morning with ten of the best workmen and proceed by land to that place while the others would in the meantime be employed by myself in taking the boat in paces and depositing her. Together with the articles which we had previously determined to deposit at this place, and also in transporting all the baggage up the river to that point in the six small canoes. This plan being settled between us orders were accordingly given to the party, and the ten men who were to accompany Captain Clark had ground and prepared their axes and adds this evening in order to prepare for an early departure in the morning. We have on this as well as on many former occasions found a small grindstone which I brought with me from Harper's Ferry extremely convenient to us. If we find trees at the place mentioned sufficiently large for our purposes it will be extremely fortunate, for we have not seen one for many miles below the entrance of Musselshell River to this place, which would have answered. 
Clark, July 9, 1805. July 9, Tuesday, 1805 A clear worm morning wine from the S.W., lanced the leather boat, and found that it leaked a little. Corked lanced and loaded the canoes, hurried our truck wheels, and made a karsh for a skin and a few papers I intend to leave here on trial found the leather boat would not answer without the addition of tar which we had none of. Having substituted coal and tallow in its place to stop the seams and which would not answer as it separate from the skins when exposed to the water and left the skins naked and seams exposed to the water this flyer of our favorite boat was a great disappointment to us. We having more baggage than our canoes would carry. Concluded to build canoes for to carry them, no timber near our camp. I determined to proceed on up the river to a bottom in which our hunters reported was large trees and Lewis, July 10, 1805. Wednesday, July 10, 1805. Captain. Clark set out with his party early this morning and passed over to the opposite side. After which I dispatched served. Ordway with four canoes and eight men to take up a load of baggage as far as Captain. Clark's camp and return for the remainder of our plunder. With six others I now set to work on my boat, which had been previously drawn out of the water before the men departed, and in two hours had her frame in readiness to be deposited. Had a cash dug and deposited the frame of the boat, some papers, and a few other trivial articles of but little importance. The wind blew very hard the greater part of the day. I also had the truck wheels buried in the pit which had been made to hold the tar. Having nothing further to do I amused myself in fishing and caught a few small fish. They were of the species of white chub mentioned below the falls, though they are small and few in number. I had thought on my first arrival here that there were no fish in this part of the river. Captain. Clark proceeded up the river eight miles by land, distance by water 231-4, and found two trees of cottonwood and cut them down, one proved to be hollow and split in falling at the upper part and was somewhat wind-shaken at bottom. The other proved to be much wind-shaken. He searched the bottom for better but could not find any he therefore determined to make canoes of those which he had fallen. And to contract their length in such manner as to clear the cracks and the worst of the wind's can parts making up the deficiency by allowing them to be as wide as the trees would permit. They were much at a loss for wood to make axe handles. The chokecherry is the best we can procure for this purpose and of that wood they made and broke their thirteen handles in the course of this part of a day. Had the eyes of our axes been round they would have answered this country much better. The mosquitoes were very troublesome to them as well as ourselves today. Served. Ordway proceeded up the river about five miles when the wind became so violent that he was obliged to L.Y. by until late in the evening when he again set out with the canoes and arrived within three miles of Captain Clark's camp where he halted for the night. About five miles above White Bear Camp there are two islands in the river covered with cottonwood box alder and some sweet willow also the undergrowth like that of the islands at this place. Clark, July 10, 1805. July 10, Wednesday, 1805 A fair windy day wind hard the most of the day from the S. W. rained moderately all last night, by showers, we dispatched surged. Ordway with four canoes loaded and eight men by water to ascend as high as I should have found timber for canoes and form the camp, dash. I set out with Sirt. Prior four choppers two invalids and one man to hunt, crossed to the STD. Side and proceeded on up the river eight miles by land, distance by water 231-4 ms. And found two trees which I thought would make canoes, had them fallen, one of them proved to be hollow and split at one end and very much when shaken at the other, the other much when shaken. We searched the bottoms for better trees and made a trial of several which proved to be more indifferent. I determined to make canoes out of the two first trees we had fallen, to contract their length so as to clear the hollow and wind shakes, and add to the width as much as the tree would allow. The muskeeters immensely numerous and troublesome, killed two deer and a goat. The canoes did not arrive as I expected, owing to the hard wind which blew ahead in many places. We are much at a loss for wood to make axe hilts, thirteen hath been made and broken in this piece of a day by the four choppers, no other wood but cotton box elder choke cherry and red arrow wood. 
we substitute the cherry in place of hickory for axe hilts ram rods, and k. And k. Lewis, July 11, 1805. Thursday, July 11, 1805. We had now nothing to do but wait for the canoes. As they had not returned I sent out some of the small party with me to hunt, in the evening they returned with a good quantity of the flesh of a fat buffalo which they had killed. The canoes had not arrived this evening. I saw several very large grey eagles today they are a half as large again as the common bald eagle of this country. I do not think the bald eagle here cute so large as those of the U states. The grey eagle is infinitely larger and is no doubt a distinct species. This evening a little before the sun set I heard two other discharges of this unaccountable artillery of the Rocky Mountains proceeding from the same quarter that I had before heard it. I now recollected the minotaurs making mention of the noise which they had frequently heard in the Rocky Mountains like thunder, and which they said the mountains made. But I paid no attention to the information supposing it either false or the phantom of a superstitious imagination. I have also been informed by the engages that the Panis and Rikaras give the same account of the Black Mountains which lie west of them. This phenomenon the philosophy of the engages readily accounts for. They state it to be the bursting of the rich mines of silver which these mountains contain. This morning Captain Clark dispatched Bratton to meet the canoes which were detained by the wind to get a couple of axes. He obtained the axes and returned in about two hours. This man has been unable to work for several days in consequence of a whitlow on one of his fingers, a complaint which has been very common among the men. One of the canoes arrived at Captain Clark's camp about 10 a.m. This he had unloaded and set a few miles up the river for a buffalo which had been killed, the party sent killed another in third route and brought in the flesh and skins of both they were in good order. His hunters had also killed two deer and an antelope yesterday. The three other canoes did not arrive until late in the evening in consequence of the wind and the fear of wetting their loads which consisted of articles much more liable to be injured by moisture than those which composed the load of that which arrived in the morning. Captain C. had the canoes unloaded and ordered them to float down in the course of the night to my camp, but the wind proved so high after night that they were obliged to put to about eight miles above and remain until morning. Captain C kept the party with him busily engaged at the canoes. His hunters killed and brought in three very fat deer this evening. Clark, July 11, 1805. July 11, Thursday, 1805 A fair windy morning wind s. w. I dispatch w. Bratton, who cannot work he having a turner rising on his finger, to meet the canoes and bring from them two axes, which is necessary for the work at the pirogues or canoes and is indispensable he returned in about two hours and informed that one canoe was within three miles, about one o'clock the canoe which Bratton left arrived having killed a buffalo on the river above our camp. At which place the bend of the river below and that above is about one mile apart, I dispatched searched. Prior with three men in the canoe to get the meat they killed another buffalo ere the one killed and brought the meat of both down. At sunset the three remaining canoes arrived unloaded and returned immediately with orders to float down to camp at the portage tonight for the purpose of taking up the remaining baggage. Muskeeters very troublesome, and in addition to their torments we have a small gnat, which is as disagreeable, our hunter killed three deer today one of them very fat. All the men with me engaged about the canoes hunting and k. And. Lewis, July 12, 1805. Friday, July 12, 1805. The canoes not having arrived and the wind still high I dispatched served. Gas with three men to join Captain. Clark and assist in completing the canoes retaining only a few who in addition to those in the canoes that I expect every moment, will be sufficient to man the six canoes and take up all the baggage we have here at one load. I feel excessively anxious to be moving on. The canoes were detained by the wind until 2 p.m. when they set out and arrived at this place so late that I thought it best to detain them until morning. Bratton came down today for a couple of axes which I sent by him, he returned immediately. Served. Gas and party joined Captain Clark at 10 a.m. Captain C. Kept all the men with him busily engaged some in drying meat, others in hunting, 
and as many as could be employed about the canoes. Sect. Pryor got his shoulder dislocated yesterday, it was replaced immediately and is likely to do him but little injury, it is painful to him today. The hunters with Captain C killed three deer and two otter today. The otter are now plenty since the water has become sufficiently clear for them to take fish. The blue-crested fisher, or as they are sometimes called the kingfisher, is an inhabitant of this part of the country. This bird is very rare on the Missouri. I have not seen more than three or four of those birds during my voyage from the entrance of the Missouri to the mouth of Maria's River and those few were rether the inhabitants of streams of clearer water which discharged themselves into the Missouri then of that river. As they were seen about the entrances of such streams. Mosquitoes extremely troublesome to me today nor is a large black gnat less troublesome, which does not sting, but attacks the eye in swarms and compels us to brush them off or have our eyes filled with them. I made the men dry the balance of the fresh meat which we had about the camp amounting to about 200 pounds. Clark, July 12, 1805. July 12 Friday, 1805 A fair windy morning wine from the S.W. All hands at work at day light some at the canoes, and others drying meat for our voyage dispatched W. Bratton to the lower camp for two axes which are necessary to carry on our work at this place and searched. Pryor's shoulder was put out of place yesterday carrying meat and is painful today. Wind hard all day dispatched two hunters, they returned in the evening with three deer and two ortayers. For men arrived from the lower camp by land to assist at this place in building the canoes and mosquitoes and gnats very troublesome all day. A few wild pigeons about our camp. Lewis, July 13, 1805. Saturday, July 13, 1805. This morning being calm and clear I had the remainder of our baggage embarked in the six small canoes and made them with two men each. I now bid a cheerful adieu to my camp and passed over to the opposite shore. Baptiste LaPage one of the men whom I had reserved to man the canoes being sick I sent Charbono in his stead by water and the sick man and Indian woman accompanied me by land. From the head of the White Bear Islands I passed in A.S.W. Direction and struck the Missouri at three miles and continued up it to Captain Clark's camp where I arrived about 9 a.m. and found them busily engaged with their canoes meet and in my way I passed a very extraordinary Indian lodge, or at least the frame of one, it was formed of sixteen large cottonwood poles each about fifty feet long and at their larger end which rested on the ground as thick as a man's body. These were arranged in a circular manner at bottom and equally distributed except the omission of one on the east side which I suppose was the entrance to the lodge. The upper part of the poles are united in a common point above and secured with large withes of willow brush. In the center of this fabric there was the remains of a large fire, and about the place the marks of about eighty leather lodges. I know not what was the intention or design of such a lodge but certain I am that it was not designed for a dwelling of any one family. It was two hundred and sixteen feet in circumference at the base. It was most probably designed for some great feast, or a council house on some great national concern. I never saw a similar one nor do the nations lower down the Missouri construct such. The canoes and party with served. Ordway proceeded up the river about five miles when the wind became so violent that two of the canoes shiped a considerable quantity of water and they were compelled to put two take out the baggage to dry and cleanse the canoes of the water. About 5 p.m. The wind abetted and they came on about eight miles further and encamped. I saw a number of turtle doves and some pigeons today. Of the latter I shot one, they are the same common to the United States, or the wild pigeon as they are called. Nothing remarkable in the appearance of the country. The timber entirely confined to the river and the country back on either side as far as the eye can reach entirely destitute of trees or brush. The timber is larger and more abundant in the bottom in which we now are than I have seen it on the Missouri for many hundred miles. The current of the river is still extremely gentle. The hunters killed three buffalo today which were in good order. The flesh was brought and dried the skins wer also stretched for covering our baggage. We eat an immensity of meat. 
It requires four deer, an elk and a deer, or one buffalo, to supply us plentifully 24 hours. Meat now forms our food principally as we reserve our flour parched meal and corn as much as possible for the rocky mountains which we are shortly to enter, and where from the Indian account game is not very abundant. I preserved specimens of several small plants today which I have never before seen. The mosquitoes and gnats are more troublesome here if possible than they were at the White Bear Islands. I sent a man to the canoes for my mosquito beer which I had neglected to bring with me, as it is impossible to sleep a moment without being defended against the attacks of these most tormenting of all insects. The man returned with it a little after dark. Clark, July 13, 1805. July 13, Saturday, 1805. A fair calm morning, very cool before day, we were visited by a buffalo bull who came within a few steps of one of the canoes the men were at work. Captain Lewis, one man and Arrived overland at nine o'clock, the wind rose and blew hard from the S.E. The greater part of the day both canoes finished all to corking and fixing oars and k. And k. The hunters killed three buffalo the most of all the meat I had dried for to make pomidigan. The musketers and gnats very troublesome all day and night. Lewis, July 14, 1805. Sunday, July 14, 1805. This morning was calm fair and warm, the mosquitoes of course troublesome. All hands that could work were employed about the canoes. Which we completed and launched this evening. The one was twenty-five feet and the other thirty-three feet in length and about three feet wide. We have now the seats and oars to make and fit and. I walked out today and ascended the bluffs which are high rocky and steep. I continued my route about thirty-one halves when I gained a conspicuous eminence about two mes. Distant from the river a little below the entrance of Fort Mountain Creek. From this place I had a commanding view of the country and took the bearings of the following places. Viz. To the point at which the Missouri first enters the Rocky Mountains s. 28 degrees west, 25 to the termination of the first chain of Rocky Mountains. Northwardly, being that through which the Missouri first passes n, 73 degrees west 80 to the extremity or termination of two candelas chain of the Rocky Mountains n, 65 w 150 to the most distant point of a third and continued chain of the same MTS n, 50 degrees west. 200 the direction of the two candelas due. From s 45 e to n, 45 degrees, w. To Fort Mountain s, 75 degrees west. 8. The country in most parts very level and in others swelling with gentle rises and decents, or in other words what I have heretofore designated a wavy country destitute of timber except along the watercourses. On my return to camp found served. Ordway had arrived with all the canoes about noon and had unloaded them every preparation except the entire completion of the oars poles and is made for our departure tomorrow. The grass and weeds in this bottom are about two feet high which is a much greater height than we have seen them elsewhere this season. Here I found the sand rush and nittles in small quantities. The grass in the plains is not more than three inches high. Grasshoppers innumerable in the plains and the small birds before noticed together with the brown curlew still continue numerous in every part of the plains. Had a slight shower at 4 p.m. this evening. Clark, July 14, 1805 July 14 Sunday, 1805 A fine morning calm and worm musketers and gnats very troublesome. The canoes arrive at 12 o'clock and unload to dry and finished and lanced the two canoes, some rain this afternoon. All preparing to set out on tomorrow. Lewis, July 15, 1805. Monday July 15, 1805. We arose very early this morning assigned the canoes their loads and had it put on board. We now found our vessels eight in number all heavily laden, notwithstanding our several deposits, though it is true we have now a considerable stock of dried meat and grease. We find it extremely difficult to keep the baggage of many of our men within reasonable bounds, they will be adding bulky articles of but little use or value to them. At 10 a.m. 
We once more saw ourselves fairly underway much to my joy and I believe that of every individual who composed the party. I walked on shore and killed two elk near one of which the party halted and dined. We took the skin's marrow bones and a part of the flesh of these elk. In order to lighten the burthen of the canoes I continued my walk all the evening and took our only invalid's pots and loppage with me. We passed the river near where we dined and just above the entrance of a beautiful river eighty yards wide which falls in on the lard. Side which in honor of Mr. Robert Smith the Secretary of the Navy we called Smith's River. This stream meanders through a most lovely valley to the S. E. for about twenty-five miles when it enters the Rocky Mountains and is concealed from our view. Many herds of buffalo were feeding in this valley. We again crossed the river to the Stard. Side and passed through a plain and struck the river at a northwardly bend where there was timber here we waited until the canoes arrived by which time it was so late that we concluded to encamp for the night. Here Druyer wooded a deer which ran into the river my dog pursued caught it drowned it and brought it to shore at our camp. We have now passed Fort Mountain on our right it appears to be about ten miles distant. This mountain has a singular appearance it is situated in a level plain, its sides stand nearly at right angles with each other and are each about a mile in extent. These are formed of a yellow clay only without the mixture of rock or stone of any size and rise perpendicularly to the height of three hundred feet. The top appears to be a level plain and from the eminence on which I was yesterday I could see that it was covered with a similar cost of grass with the plain on which it stands. The surface appears also to possess a tolerable fertile mole of two feet thick. And is to all appearance inaccessible. From its figure we gave it the name of Fort Mountain. Those mounds before mentioned near the falls have much the same appearance but are none of them as large as this one. The prickly pear is now in full bloom and forms one of the beauties as well as the greatest pests of the plains. The sunflower is also in bloom and is abundant. This plant is common to every part of the Missouri from its entrance to this place. The lamb's quarter, wild cucumber, sand rush and narrow dock are also common here. Druyer killed another deer and an otter today. We find it inconvenient to take all the short meanders of the river which has now become cooked and much narrower than below, we therefore take its general course and lay down the small bends by the eye on our daily traverse or chart. The river is from 2 to 150 yards wide. More timber on the river than below the falls for a great distance. On the banks of the river there are many large banks of sand much elevated above the plains on which they ly and appear as if they had been collected in the course of time from the river by the almost incessant s w winds. They always appear on the sides of the river opposite to those winds. The cowses and distances from the White Bear Islands to the camp at which we made the canoes as taken by Cert. Ordway. Clark, July 15, 1805. July 15th Monday, 1805 rained all the last night I was wet all night this morning wind hard from the S. W. We set out at 10 o'clock and proceeded on very well past a river on the large side about 80 yards wide which we call after the C.C. of the Navy Smith's River the river very crooked bottoms extensive rich and passes through a beautiful valley between two. M.T.S. Cons. High grass, our canoes being so small several of the men Captain Lewis and myself compelled to walk on shore and cross the bends to keep up with the canoes, a round mountain on our right about ten miles appears inaccessible we call Fort Mountain. The prickly pear in bloom but few other flowers. Sun floor are common, also lambs quarter and nettles. Captain Lou killed two elk and the hunters killed two deer and a order, we camped on the starred side at which place I saw many beaver. The timber on the edge of the river more common than below the falls, as I am compelled to walk on shore find it very difficult to take the courses of the river, as it is very crooked more so than below. Lewis, July 16. 1805. Tuesday July 16, 1805. We had a heavy dew last night and one man back this morning for an axe that he had carelessly left last evening some miles below, and set out at an early hour. Early this morning we passed about forty little booths formed of willow bushes to shelter them from the sun, they appear to have been deserted about ten days, we suppose that they were snake Indians. 
they appeared to have a number of horses with them dash. This appearance gives me much hope of meeting with these people shortly. Druyer killed a buffalo this morning near the river and we halted and breakfasted on it. Here for the first time I ate of the small guts of the buffalo cooked over a blazing fire in the Indian style without any preparation of washing or other cleansing and found them very good after breakfast I determined to leave Captain C. and party, and go on to the point where the river enters the Rocky Mountains and make the necessary observations against their arrival, accordingly I set out with the two involves Potts and Lopage and Druyer. I passed through a very handsome level plain on the starred side of the river, the country equally level and beautiful, on the opposite side, at the distance of 8 mes. Passed a small stream on which I observed a considerable quantity of aspen. A little before 12 I halted on the river at a starred. Bend and well-timbered bottom about 41 halves miles below the mountains and made the following observation. After this observation we pursued our route through a high rolling plain to a rapid immediately at the foot of the mountain where the Missouri first enters them. The current of the Missouri below these rapids is strong for several miles, though just above there is scarcely any current, the river very narrow and deep of but seventy yards. Wide only and seems to be closely hemmed in by the mountains on both sides, the bottoms only a few yards in width. An Indian road enters the mountain at the same place with the river on the starred side and continues along its border under the steep cliffs these mountains appear to be only about 800 feet above the river and are formed almost entirely of a hard black granite with a few dwarf pine and cedar scattered on them. At this place there is a large rock of 400 feet high which stands immediately in the gap which the Missouri makes on its passage from the mountains. It is insulated from the neighboring mountains by a handsome little plain which surrounds its base on three sides and the Missouri washes its base on the other, leaving it on the lard. As it deck ends. This rock I called the tower. It may be ascended with some difficulty nearly to its summit, and from it there is a most pleasing view of the country we are now about to leave. From it I saw this evening immense herds of buffalo in the plains below. Near this place we killed a fat elk on which we both dined and souped. The mosquitoes are extremely troublesome this evening and I had left my beer, of course suffered considerably, and promised in my wrath that I never will be gilly of a similar pace of negligence while on this voyage. Clark, July 16, 1805 July 16, Tuesday, 1805 A fair morning after a very cold night, heavy dew, dispatched one man back for an axe left a few miles below. And set out early killed a buffalo on which we brackfast Captain Lewis and three men went on to the mountain to take a meridian altitude, passed about forty small camps, which appeared to be abandoned about ten or twelve days, supposed they were snake Indians. A few miles above I saw the poles standing in third position of a very large lodge of sixty feet diameter, and the appearance of a number of leather lodges about. This sign was old and appeared to have been last fall great number of buffalo the river is not so wide as below from 100 to 150 yards wide and deep crowded with islands and crooked some scattering timber on its edge such as cottonwood cotton willow. Willow and box elder, the shrubs are arrow wood, redwood, choke cherry, red berries, gooseberries, sarvis beret, red and yellow currants a spsi of showmake and I camped on the head of a small island near the start. Shore at the Rocky Mountains this range of mountains appears to run NW and SE and is about 800 feet higher than the water in the river faced with a hard black rock the current of the river from the Medicine River to the mountain is gentle bottoms low and extensive. And its general course is S. 10 degrees west, about 30 miles on a direct line. Lewis, July 17, 1805 Wednesday July 17, 1805. The sunflower is in bloom and abundant in the river bottoms. The Indians of the Missouri particularly those who do not cultivate maize make great use of the seed of this plant for bread, or use it in thickening their scope. They most commonly first parch the seed and then pound them between two smooth stones until, they reduce it to a fine meal. To this they sometimes merely add a portion of water and drink it in that state, or add a sufficient quantity of marrow grease to reduce it to the consistency of common dough and eat it in that manner. 
The last composition I think much best and have eat it in that state heartily and think it a palatable dish. There is but little of the broad-leafed cottonwood above the falls, much the greater portion being of the narrow-leafed kind. There are a great abundance of red, yellow, purple, and black currants, and service berries now ripe and in great perfection. I find these fruits very pleasant, particularly the yellow currant, which I think vastly preferable to those of our gardens. The shrub which produces this fruit rises to the height of six or eight feet, the stem simple branching and erect. They grow closely associated in copse either in the open or timbered lands near the watercouses. The leaf is petiolate of a pale green and resembles in its form that of the red currant common to our gardens. The perianth of the fructification is one-leaved, five-cleft, abbreviated and tubular, the corolla is monopetalous funnel-shaped. Very long, superior, withering and of a fine orange color. Five stamens and one pistillum, of the first, the filaments are capillaire, inserted into the corolla, equal, and converging, the anther ovate, bifid and incumbent. With respect to the second the germ is roundish, smooth, inferior pedicel than small, the style, long, and thicker than the stamens, simple, cylindrical, smooth, and erect, withering and remains with the corolla until the fruit is ripe. Stigma simple obtuse and withering. The fruit is a berry about the size and much the shape of the red currant of our gardens, like them growing in clusters supported by a compound footstalk. But the peduncles which support the several berries are longer in this species and the berries are more scattered. It is quite as transparent as the red currant of our gardens, not so acid, and more agreeably flavored. The other species differ not at all in appearance from the yellow except in the color and flavor of their berries. I am not confident as to the color of the corolla. But all those which I observed while in bloom as we came up the Missouri were yellow but they might possibly have been all of the yellow kind and that the purple red and black currants here may have corollas of different tints from that of the yellow currant. The service berry differs somewhat from that of the U states the bushes are small sometimes and not more than two feet high and scarcely ever exceed eight and are proportionably small in their stems, growing very thickly escogiated in clumps. The fruit is the same form but for the most part larger more luscious and of so deep a purple that on first sight you would think them black. There are two species of gooseberries here also but neither of them yet ripe. The choke cherries also abundant and not yet ripe. There is box alder, red willow, and a species of sumac here also. There is a large pine tree situated on a small island at the head of these rapids above our camp. It being the first we have seen for a long distance near the river I called the island Pine Island. This range of the Rocky Mountains runs from S.E. to N.W. At 8 a.m. this morning Captain Clark arrived with the party. We took breakfast here, after which I had the box which contained my instruments taken by land around Tower Rock to the river above the rapid, the canoes ascended with some difficulty but without loss or injury, with their loads. After making those observations we proceed, and as the canoes were still heavy loaded all persons not employed in navigating the canoes walled on shore. The river cliffs were so steep and frequently projecting into the river with their perpendicular points in such manner that we could not pass them by land. We wer therefore compelled to pass and repass the river very frequently in the cows of the evening. The bottoms are narrow the river also narrow deep and but little current. River from 70 to 100 yards wide. But little timber on the river Aspen constitutes a part of that little. See more pine than usual on the mountains though still but thinly scattered. We saw some mountain rams or bighorned animals this evening, and no other game whatever and indeed there is but little appearance of any. In some places both banks of the river are formed for a short distance of nearly perpendicular rocks of a dark black granite of great height, the river has the appearance of having cut its passage in the course of time through this solid rock. We ascended about six miles this evening from the entrance of the mountain and encamped on the starred side where we found as much wood as made our fires. Mosquitoes still troublesome gnats not as much so. Dot, Captain C. Now informed me that after I left him yesterday, he saw the poles of a large lodge in prayer on the starred side of the river which was sixty feet in diameter and appeared to have been built last fall. 
there were the remains of about eighty leather lodges near the place of the same apparent date. This large lodge was of the same construction of that mentioned above the White Bear Islands. The party came on very well and encamped on the lower point of an island near the start. Shore on that evening. This morning they had set out early and proceeded without obstruction until they reached the rapid where I was encamped. Clark, July 17, 1805. July 17, Wednesday, 1805 set out early this morning and crossed the rapid at the island called Pine Rapid with some difficulty, at this rapid I came up with Captain Lewis and party took a med. Altitude and we took some lunar observations and and proceeded on. The immense high precipices oblige all the party to pass and repass the river from one point to another. The river can find in many places in a very narrow chenal from 70 to 120 yards wide, bottoms narrow without timber, and many places the mountain approach on both sides. We observe great deal of scattering pine on the mountains, some aspen, spruce, and fir trees took a meridian alt which gave for latitude 46 degrees 42 minutes 14 seconds 7 tenths and we proceeded on very well about 8 miles and camped on the starred side the river crooked bottoms narrow, cliffs high and steep. I ascended a spur of the mountain which I found to be high and difficult of access. Containing pitch pine and covered with grass scarcely any game to be seen the yellow currant now ripe also the fussy red choke cherries getting ripe purple currant are also ripe. Saw several ibex or mountain rams today. Lewis, July 18, 1805. Thursday, July 18, 1805. Set out early this morning. Previous to our departure saw a large herd of the bighorned animals on the immensely high and nearly perpendicular cliff opposite to us. On the phase of this cliff they walked about and hounded from rock to rock with apparent unconcern where it appeared to me that no quadruped could have stood. And from which had they made one false step they must have been precipitated at least a five hundred feet. This animal appears to frequent such precipices and cliffs where in fact they are perfectly secure from the pursuit of the wolf, bear, or even man himself. At the distance of twenty-one halves miles we passed the entrance of a considerable river on the start. Side about eighty yards wide being nearly as wide as the Missouri at that place. Its current is rapid and water extremely transparent, the bed is formed of small smooth stones of flat rounded or other figures. Its bottoms are narrow but possess as much timber as the Missouri. The country is mountainous and broken through which it passes. It appears as if it might be navigated but to what extent must be conjectural. This handsome bold and clear stream we named in honor of the Secretary of War calling it Dearborn's River. As we were anxious now to meet with the Sosanese or Snake Indians as soon as possible in order to obtain information relative to the geography of the country and also if necessary, some horses we thought it better for one of us either Captain C. or myself to take a small party and proceed on up the river, some distance before the canoes, in order to discover them, should they be on the river before the daily discharge of our guns, which was necessary in procuring subsistence for the party. Should all arm and cause them to retreat to the mountains and conceal themselves, supposing us to be their enemies who visit them usually by the way of this river. Accordingly Captain Clark set out this morning after breakfast with Joseph Fields, Potts and his servant York. We proceeded on tolerably well, the current stonger than yesterday we employ the cord and oars principally though sometimes the setting pole. In the evening we passed a large creek about thirty yards wide which disembogues on the stard. Side, it discharges a bold current of water its banks low and bed formed of stones altogether, this stream we called Ordway's Creek after served. John Ordway I have observed for several days a species of flax growing in the river bottoms the leaf stem and pericarp of which resembles the common flax cultivated in the U states. The stem rises to the height of about twenty-one halves or three feet high. As many as eight or ten of which proceed from the same root. The root appears to be perennial. The bark of the stem is thick strong and appears as if it would make excellent hacks. The seed are not yet ripe but I hope to have an opportunity of collecting some of them after they are so if it should on experiment prove to yield good flax and at the same time admit of being cut without injuring the perennial root it will be a most valuable plant. 
and I think there is the greatest probability that it will do so. For notwithstanding the seed have not yet arrived at maturity it is putting up suckers or young shoots from the same root and would seem therefore that those which are fully grown and which are in the proper stage of vegetation to produce the best facts are not longer essential to the preservation or support of the root. The river somewhat wider than yesterday and the mountains more distant from the river and not so high, the bottoms are but narrow and little or no timber near the river. Some pine on the mountains which seems principally confined to their upper region. We killed one elk this morning and found part of the flesh and the skin of a deer this evening which had been kiked and left by Captain Clark. We saw several herds of the bighorn but they were all out of our reach on inaccessible cliffs, we encamped on the lard. Side in a small grove of narrow-leafed cottonwood there is not any of the broad-leafed cottonwood on the river since it has entered the mountains. Captain Clark ascended the river on the start. Side. In the early part of the day after he left me the hills were so steep that he gained but little off us, in the evening he passed over a mountain by which means he cut off many miles of the river's circuitous route. The Indian road which he pursued over this mountain is wide and appears as if it had been cut down or dug in many places. He passed two streams of water, the branches of Ordway's Creek, on which he saw a number of beaver dams succeeding each other in close order and extending as far up those streams as he could discover them in their cows towards the mountains. He also saw many bighorn animals on the cliffs of the mountains. Not far beyond the mountain which he passed in the evening he encamped on a small stream of ruining water. Having travelled about twenty m. The water of those rivulets which make down from these mountains is extremely cold pure and fine. The soil near the river is of a good quality and produces a luxuriant growth of grass and weeds. Among the last the sunflower holds a distinguished place. The aspen is small but grows very commonly on the river and small streams which make down from the mouths. I also observed another species of flax today which is not so large as the first, sildome obtaining a greater height than nine inches or a foot the stem and leaf resemble the other species but the stem is rarely branched. Bearing a single monopetalous bell-shaped blue flower which is suspended with its limb downwards. Clark, July 18th. 1805. July 18, Thursday 1805 A fine morning passed a considerable river which falls in on the starred side and nearly as wide as the Missouri we call Dearborn's River after the SETI. Of war. We thought it prudent for a party to go ahead for fear our firing should all arm the Indians and cause them to leave the river and take to the mountains for safety from their enemies who visit them through this route. I determined to go ahead with a small party a few days and find the Snake Indians if possible after breakfast I took J. Fields Potts and my servant proceeded on. The country so hilly that we gained but little of the canoes until in the evening I passed over a mountain on an Indian road by which route I cut off several miles of the meanderings of the river. The road which passes this mountain is wide and appears to have been dug in many places, we camped on a small run of clear cold water, Muskeeters very troublesome the forepart of the evening I saw great many ibex. We crossed two streams of running water on those streams I saw several beaver dams. Ordway Creek the Count Ray is mountainous and rocky except the Valley Andk. Which is covered with earth of a good quality without timber, the timber which is principally pitch pine is confined to the mountains, the small runs and creeks which have water running in them contain cotton willow, willow, and aspen. Trees all small I saw many fine springs and streams of running water which sink and rise alternately in the valleys the water of those streams are fine. Those streams which run off into the river are darned up by the beaver from near their mouths up as high as I could see up them. Lewis, July 19, 1805 Friday July 19, 1805 The mosquitoes are very troublesome to us as usual. This morning we set out early and proceeded on very well though the water appears to increase in velocity as we advance. The current has been strong all day and obstructed with some rapids, though these are but little broken by rocks and are perfectly safe. The river deep and from 100 to 150 yards wide. I walked along shore today and killed an antelope. Wherever we get a view of the lofty summits of the mountains the snow presents itself, although we are almost suffocated in this confined valley with heat. 
The pine cedar and balsam fir grow on the mountains in irregular assemblages or spots mostly high up on their sides and summits. This evening we entered much the most remarkable cliffs that we have yet seen. These cliffs rise from the water's edge on either side perpendicularly to the height of 1,200 feet. Every object here wears a dark and gloomy aspect. The towering and projecting rocks in many places seem ready to tumble on us. The river appears to have forced its way through this immense body of solid rock for the distance of 53 fourths miles and where it makes its exit below has down on either side vast columns of rocks mountains high. The river appears to have worn a passage just the width of its channel or 150 yards. It is deep from side to side or is there in the march first miles of this distance a spot except one of a few yards in extent on which a man could rest the sole of his foot. Several fine springs burst out at the water's edge from the interstices of the rocks. It happens fortunately that although the current is strong it is not so much so but what it may be overcome with the oars for there is here no possibility of using either the cord or setting pole. It was late in the evening before I entered this place and was obliged to continue my route until some time after dark before I found a place sufficiently large to encamp my small party, at length such an one occurred on the lard. Side where we found plenty of lightwood and pitch pine. This rock is a black granite below and appears to be of a much lighter color above and from the fragments I take it to be flint of a yellowish brown and light cream colored yellow. From the singular appearance of this place I called it the gates of the Rocky Mountains. The mountains higher today than yesterday, saw some bighorns and a few antelopes also beaver and otter. The latter are now very plenty one of the men killed one of them today with a setting pole. Mosquitoes less troublesome than usual. We had a thundershower today about 1 p.m. which continued about an hour and was attended with some hail. We have seen no buffalo since we entered the mounts. This morning early Captain Clark pursued his route, saw early in the day the remains of several Indians' camps formed of willow brush which appeared to have been inhabited some time this spring. Saw where the natives had peeled the bark off the pine trees about this same season. This the Indian woman with us informs that they do to obtain the sap and soft part of the wood and bark for food. At 11 a.m. Captain C. Feel in with a gang of elk of which he killed two. And not being able to obtain as much wood as would make a fire substituted the dung of the buffalo and cooked a part of their meat on which they breakfasted and again pursued their route, which lay along an old Indian road. This evening they passed a handsome valley watered by a large creek which extends itself with its valley into the mountain to a considerable distance. The latter part of the evening their route lay over a hilly and mountainous country covered with the sharp fragments of flint which cut and bruised their feet excessively, nor wr the prickly pair of the leveler part of the route much less painful. They have now become so abundant in the open uplands that it is impossible to avoid them and their thorns are so keen and stiff that they pierce a double thickness of dressed deer's skin with ease. Captain C informed me that he extracted seventeen of these briars from his feet this evening after he encamped by the light of the fire. I have guarded or rether fortified my feet against them by soling my moccasins with the hide of the buffalo in parchment. He encamped on the river much fortigued having passed two mountains in the course of the day and travelled about thirty miles. Clark, July 19, 1805 July 19 Friday 1805 A fine morning I proceeded on in an Indian path river very crooked passed over two mountains saw several Indian camps which they have left this spring. Saw trees peeled and found poles and k. At 11 O.C. I saw a gange of elk as we had no provision concluded to kill some killed two and dine being obliged to substitute dry buffalo dung in place of wood. This evening passed over a cream-colored flint which rolled down from the cliffs into the bottoms, the cliffs contain flint a dark gray stone and a reddish-brown intermixed and no one clift is solid rock. All the rocks of every description is in small pieces appears to have been broken by some convulsion, past a beautiful creek on the STD. Side this evang which meanders through a beautiful valley of great extent, I call after SGT prior the Count Ray on the large side a high mountain saw several small rapids today the river keep its width and appear to be deep. My feet is very much bruised and cut walking over the flint, 
and constantly stuck full prickly pear thorns, I peeled out seventeen by the light of the fire tonight we camped on the river same, lard, side musculars very troublesome. Lewis, July 20, 1805. Saturday 20H, 1805. Set out early this morning as usual, current strong, we therefore employ the tow rope whenever the banks permit the use of it, the water is rether deep for the setting pole in most places. At 6 a. m., the hills retreated from the river and the valley became wider than we have seen it since we entered the mountains. Some scattering timber on the river and in the valley. Consisting of the narrow-leafed cottonwood aspen and pine. Vast numbers of the several species of currants gooseberries and service berries, of each of these I preserved some seeds. I found a black currant which I thought preferable in flavor to the yellow. This currant is really a charming fruit and I am confident would be preferred at our markets to any currant now cultivated in the U States. We killed an elk this morning which was very acceptable to us. Through the valley which we entered early in the morning a large creek flows from the mountains and discharges itself into the river behind an island on Stard. Side about fifteen yards wide this we called Potts's Creek after John Potts one of our party. About 10 a.m. we saw the smoke arose as if the country had been set on fire up the valley of this creek about seven milliseconds. Distant we were at a loss to determine whether it had been set on fire by the natives as a sign all among themselves on discovering us, as is their custom or whether it had been set on fire by Captain C. and party accidentally. The first however proved to be the fact, they had unperceived by us discovered Captain Clark's party or mine, and had set the plain on fire to all arm the more distant natives and fled themselves further into the interior of the mountains. This evening we found the skin of an elk and part of the flesh of the animal which Captain C. had left near the river at the upper side of the valley where he ascended the mountain with a note informing me of his transactions and that he should pass the mounts which lay just above us and w-a-t-e our arrival at some convenient place on the river. The other elk which Captain C. had killed we could not find. About two in the evening we had passed through a range of low mountains and the country became more open again, though still broken and untimbered and the bottoms not very extensive. We encamped on the lard. Side near a spring on a high bank the prickly pears are so abundant that we could scarcely find room to lie. Just above our camp the river is again closed in by the mouths. On both sides. I saw a black woodpecker today about the size of the lark woodpecker as black as a crow. I indevoured to get a shoot at it but could not. It is a distinct species of woodpecker, it has a long tail and flies a good deal like the jay bird. This morning Captain Clark set out early and proceeded on through a valley leaving the river about six miles to his left. He fell in with an old Indian road which he pursued until it struck the river about eighteen miles from his camp of the last evening just above the entrance of a large creek which we call White Paint Creek. The party were so much fatigued with their march and their feet cut with the flint and pursed with the prickly pears until they had become so painful that he proceeded but little further before he determined to encamp on the river and wait my arrival. Captain C. saw a smoke today up the valley of Pryor's Creek which was no doubt caused by the natives likewise. He left signals or signs on his route in order to inform the Indians should they pursue his trolley that we were not their enemies, but white men and their friends. Cloth Enk. Clark, July 20, 1805. July 20 Saturday 1805 A fine morning we propped on through a valley leaving the river about six miles to our left and fell into an Indian road which took us to the river above the M.O. Of a creek eighteen miles the mosquitoes very trouble saw my man York nearly tired out, the bottoms of my feet blistered. I observe a smoke rise to our right up the valley of the last creek about twelve miles distant. The cause of this smoke I can't account for certainly though think it probable that the Indians have heard the shooting of the party below and set the prairies or valley on fire to all arm their camps. Supposing our party to be a war party coming against them, I left signs to shoo the Indians if they should come on our trail that we were not their enemies. Camped on the river, the feet of the men with me so stuck with prickly pear and cut with the stones that they were scarcely able to march at a slow gait this afternoon. Lewis, July 21, 1805. 
Sunday, July 21, 1805. Set out early this morning and passed a bad rapid where the river enters the mountain about 1 m from our camp of last evening the cliffs high and covered with fragments of broken rocks. The current strong. We employed the tow rope principally, and also the pole as the river is not now so deep but rether wider and much more rapid our progress was therefore slow and laborious. We saw three swans this morning, which like the geese have not yet recovered the feathers of the wing and could not fly we killed two of them the third escaped by diving and passed down with the current. They had no young ones with them therefore presume they do not breed in this country these are the first we have seen on the river for a great distance. We daily see great numbers of G's with their young which are perfectly feathered except the wings which are deficient in both young and old. My dog caught several today, as he frequently dose. The young ones are very fine, but the old G's are poor and unfit for use. Saw several of the large brown or sandhill crane today with their young. The young crane is as large as a turkey and cannot fly they are of a bright red bay color or that of the common deer at this season. This bird feeds on grass principally and is found in the river bottoms. The grass near the river is lofty and green that of the hill sides and high open grounds is perfectly dry and appears to be scorched by the heat of the sun. The country was rough mountainous and much as that of yesterday until towards evening when the river entered a beautiful and extensive plain country of about 10 or 12 miles wide which extended upwards further that the eye could reach this valley is. Bounded by two nearly parallel ranges of high mountains which have their summits partially covered with snow. Below the snowy region pine succeeds and reaches down their sides in some parts to the plain but much the greater portion of their surfaces is uncovered with timber and expose either a barren sterile soil covered with dry parched grass or black and rugged rocks. The river immediately on entering this valley assumes a different aspect and character, it spreads to a mile and upwards in width crowded with islands, some of them large is shallow enough for the use of the setting pole in almost every part and still more rapid than before. Its bottom is smooth stones and some large rocks as it has been since we have entered the mountains. The grass in these extensive bottoms is green and fine, about 18 inches or 2 feet high. The land is a black rich loam and appears very fertile. We encamped in this beautiful valley on the lard. Side the party complain of being much fatigued with this day's travel. We killed one deer today. This morning we passed a bold creek 28 yards wide which falls in on starved. Side. It has a handsome and an extensive valley. This we called Prior's Creek after Sirt. John, Prior one of our party. I also saw two pheasants today of a dark brown color much larger than the pheasant of the U States. This morning Captain. Clark having determined to hunt and wait my arrival somewhere about his preset station was fearful that some Indians might still be on the river above him sufficiently near to hear the report of his guns and therefore proceeded up. The river about three miles and not finding any Indians nor discovering any fresh appearance of them returned about four miles below and fixed his camp near the river. After refreshing themselves with a few hours rest they set out in different directions to hunt. Captain C. killed a buck and fields a buck and doe. He caught a young curlew which was nearly feathered. The mosquitoes were equally as troublesome to them as to ourselves this evening, though some hours after dark the air becomes so cold that these insects disappear. The men are all fortunately supplied with mosquito beers otherwise it would be impossible for them to exist under the fatigues which they daily encounter without their natural rest which they could not obtain for those tormenting insects if divested of their beers. Timber still extremely scant on the river but there is more in this valley than we have seen since we entered the mountains, the creeks which fall into the river are better supplied with this article than the river itself. We saw a number of trout today since the river has become more shallow, also caught a fish of a white color on the belly and sides and of a bluish cast on the back which had been accidentally wounded by a setting pole. It had a long pointed mouth which opened somewhat like the shad. Clark, July 21, 1805. July 21, Sunday, 1805 A fine morning our feet so bruised and cut that I determined to delay for the canoes, and if possible kill some meat by the time they arrived, all the creeks which fall into the Missouri on the STD. 
side since entering the mountains have extensive valleys of open plain. The river bottoms contain nothing larger than a shrub until above the last creek the creeks and runs have timber on them generally, the hills or mountains are in some places thickly covered with pine and cedar and k. And k. I proceeded on about three miles this morning finding no fresh Indian sign returned down the river four miles and camped, turned out to hunt for some meat, which if we are successful will be a seasonable supply for the party ascending. Immense quantities of sarvis berries, yellow, red, purple and black currants ripe and superior to any I ever tasted particularly the yellow and purple kind. Choke cherries are plenty. Some gooseberries, the wild rose continue the willow more abundant no cottonwood of the common kind small birds are plenty, some deer, elk, goats, and ibex, no buffalo in the mountains. Those mountains are high and a great proportion of them rocky valleys fertile I observe on the highest pinnacles of some of the mountains to the west snow lying in spots some still further north are covered with snow and can't be seen from this point the winds in those mountains are not settled generally with the river. Today the wind blow hard from the west at the camp. The Missouri continues its width the current strong and crowded with little islands and coes gravely bars but little fine sand the chanel generally a coarse gravel or soft mud. Musketers and gnats very troublesome. I killed a buck, and J. Fields killed a buck and doe this evening. Caught a young curlow. Lewis, July 22, 1805. Monday July 22 Candelas 1805. We set out early as usual. The river being divided into such a number of channels by both large and small island that I found it impossible to lay it down correctly following one channel only in a canoe and therefore walked on shore took the general courses of the river and from the rising grounds took a view of the islands and its different channels which I laid down in conformity thereto on my chart. There being but little timber to obstruct my view I could see its various meanders very satisfactorily. I passed though a large island which I found a beautiful level and fertile plain about ten feet above the surface of the water and never overflown. On this island I met with great quantities of a small onion about the size of a musket ball and some even larger, they were white crisp and well flavored I gathered about half a bushel of them before the canoes arrived. I halted the party for breakfast and the men also gathered considerable quantities of those onions. Its seed had just arrived to maturity and I gathered a good quantity of it. This appears to be a valuable plant inasmuch as it produces a large quantity to the squar foot and bears with ease the rigor of this climate, and withal I think it as pleasantly flavored as any species of that root I ever tasted. I called this beautiful and fertile island after this plant onion island. Here I passed over to the starred. Shore where the country was higher and ascended the river to the entrance of a large creek which discharges itself into the Missouri on the start. Side. It is composed of three pretty considerable creeks which unite in a beautiful and extensive valley a few miles before it discharges itself into the river. While waiting for the canoes to arrive I killed an otter which sunk to the bottom on being shot, a circumstance unusual with that animal. The water was about eight feet deep yet so clear that I could see it at the bottom. I swam in and obtained it by diving. I halted the party here for dinner, the canoes had taken different channels through these islands and it was some time before they all came up. I placed my thermometer in a good shade as was my custom about 4 p.m. And after dinner set out without it and had proceeded near a mile before I recollected it I sent served. Ord way back for it he found it and brought it on. The Mukai stood at 80 A. Zero this is the warmest day except one which we have experienced this summer. The Indian woman recognizes the country and assures us that this is the river on which her relations live, and that the three forks are at no great distance. This pace of information has cheered the spirits of the party who now begin to console themselves with the anticipation of shortly seeing the head of the Missouri yet unknown to the civilized world. The large creek which we passed on starred. 15 yards. We call White Earth Creek from the circumstance of the natives procuring a white paint on this crack. Saw many G's, crams, and small birds common to the plains. 
Also a few pheasants and a species of small curlew or plover of a brown color which I first met with near the entrance of Smith's River but they are so shy and watchful there is no possibility of getting a shoot at them it is a different kind from any heretofore described and is about the size of the yellow-legged plover or jack curlew. Both species of the willow that of the broad leaf and narrow leaf still continue, the sweet willow is very scarce. The rose bush, small honesuckle, the pulpy leaf thorn, southernwood, sage box alder narrow leafed cottonwood, red wod, a species of sumac are all found in abundance as well as the red and black gooseberries, service berries. Choke cherries and the currents of four distinct colors of black, yellow, red and purple. The cherries are not yet ripe. The bear appear to feed much on the currants. Late this evening we arrived at Captain Clark's camp on the Stard. Side of the river. We took them on board with the meat they had collected and proceeded a short distance and encamped on an island Captain Clark's party had killed a deer and an elk today and ourselves one deer and an antelope only. Although Captain C. Was much fatigued his feet yet blistered and sore he insisted on pursuing his route in the morning nor we would he consent willingly to my relieving him at that time by taking a tour of the same kind. Finding him anxious I readily consented to remain with the canoes, he ordered Fraser and Joe. And Reuben Files to hold themselves in readiness to accompany him in the morning. Charbonneau was anxious to accompany him and was accordingly permitted. The mosquitoes and gnats more than usually troublesome to us this evening. Clark, July 22, 1805. July 22 D. Monday, 1805 A fine morning wind from the S.E. The last night very cold, my blanket being small I lay on the grass and covered with it. I opened the bruises and blisters of my feet which caused them to be painful dispatched all the men to hunt in the bottom for deer, determined myself to lay by and as my feet. Having nothing to eat but venison and currants, I find myself much weaker than when I left the canoes and more inclined to rest and repose today. These men were not successful in hunting killed only one deer Captain Lewis and the party arved. At four o'clock and we all proceeded on a short distance and camped on an island the muskeeters very troublesome this evening G. Druyer not knowing the place we camped continued on up the river. I determined to proceed on in pursuit of the Snake Indians on tomorrow and directed Joe Reuben Fields Frazier to get ready to accompany me. Shabono, our interpreter requested to go, which was granted and. In my absence the hunters had killed some deer and a elk, one fusee found and. And. Lewis, July 23, 1805. Tuesday July 23, 1805. Set out early as usual, Captain Clark left us with his little party of four men and continued his route on the Stard. Side of the River About 10 o'clock A.M., we came up with Druier who had separated from us yesterday evening and lay out all night not being able to find where we had encamped. He had killed five deer which we took on board and continued our route. The river is still divided by a great number of islands, it channels sometimes separating to the distance of three miles, the current very rapid with a number of riffles, the bed gravel and smooth stones, the banks low and of rich loam in the bottoms. Some low bluffs of yellow and red clay with a hard red slate stone intermixed. The bottoms are wide and but scantily timbered, the underbrush very thick consisting of the narrow and broad-leafed willow rose and currant bushes principally. High plains succeeds the river bottoms and extend back on either side to the base of the mountains which are from 8 to 12 miles asunder, high, rocky, some small pine and cedar on them and ly parallel with the river. Past a large creek on lard. Side 20 yards. Wide which after meandering through a beautiful and extensive bottom for several miles nearly parallel with the river discharges itself opposite to a large cluster of islands which from their number I called the Ten Islands and the Creek Whitehouse's Creek. After Josph. Whitehouse one of the party. Saw a great abundance of the common thistles, also a number of the wild onions of which we collected a further supply. There is a species of garlic also which grows on the high lands with a flat leaf now green and in blow but is strong tough and disagreeable. Found some seed of the wild flax ripe which I preserved. This plant grows in great abundance in these bottoms. 
I halted rather early for dinner today than usual in order to dry some articles which had gotten wet in several of the canoes. I ordered the canoes to hoist their small flags in order that should the Indians see us they might discover that we were not Indians, nor their enemies. We made great use of our setting poles and cords the use of both which the river and banks favored. Most of our small sockets were lost, and the stones were so smooth that the points of their poles sliped in such manner that it increased the labor of navigating the canoes very considerably, I recollected a parcel of gigs which I had brought on. And made the men each attach one of these to the lower ends of their poles with strong wire, which answered the desired purpose. We saw antelopes crane geese ducks beaver and otter. We took up four deer which Captain Clark and party had killed and left near the river. He pursued his route until late in the evening and encamped on the bank of the river twenty-five milliseconds. Above our encampment of the last evening, he followed an old Indian road which lies along the river on the starred side captain saw a number of antelopes, and one herd of elk. Also much sign of the Indians but all of ancient date. I saw the bull rush and cattail flag today. I saw a black snake today about two feet long the belly of which was as black as any other part or as jet itself. It had 128 scuda on the belly 63 on the tail. Clark, July 23, 1805 July 23, Tuesday, 1805 A fair morning wind from the south. I set out by land at six miles overtook G. Druyer who had killed a deer. We killed in the same bottom four deer and the antelope and left them on the river bank for the canoes proceeded on an Indian road through a wider valley which the Missouri passes about twenty-five miles and camped on the bank of the river. High mountains on either side of the valley containing scattering pine and cedar some small cotton willow willow and on the islands and bank of the river I saw no fresh sign of Indians today great number of antelope some deer and a large gang of elk. Lewis, July 24, 1805 Wednesday July 24, 1805 Set out at sunrise, the current very strong. Passed a remarkable bluff of a crimson-colored earth on starred. Intermixed with stratas of black and brick-red slate. The valley through which the river passed today is much as that of yesterday nor is there any difference in the appearance of the mountains. They still continue high and seem to rise in some places like an amphitheater one rang above another as they recede from the river until the most distant and lofty have their tops clad with snow. The adjacent mountains commonly rise so high as to conceal the more distant and lofty mountains from our view. I fear every day that we shall meet with some considerable falls or obstruction in the river notwithstanding the information of the Indian woman to the contrary who assures us that the river continues much as we see it. I can scarcely form an idea of a river ruining to great extent through such a rough mountainous country without having its stream intercepted by some difficult and dangerous rapids or falls. We daily pass a great number of small rapids or riffles which deck end one two or three feet in 150 yards but they are rarely incommoded with fixed or standing rocks and although strong rapid water are nevertheless quite practicable and by no means dangerous. We saw many beaver and some otter today, the former dam up the small channels of the river between the islands and compel the river in these parts to make other channels. Which as soon as it has effected that which was stoked by the beaver becomes dry and is filled up with mud sand gravel and drift wood. The beaver is then compelled to seek another spot for his habitation where he again erects his dam. Thus the river in many places among the clusters of islands is constantly changing the direction of such sluices as the beaver are capable of stoping or of twenty yards, in width. This animal in that way I believe to be very instrumental in adding to the number of islands with which we find the river crowded. We killed one deer today and found a goat or antelope which had been left by Captain Clark. We saw a large bear but could not get a shoot at him. We also saw a great number of crams and antelopes, some geese and a few red-headed ducks the small bird of the plains and curlews still abundant. We observed a great number of snakes about the water of a brown uniform color, some black, and others speckled on the abdomen and striped with black and brownish yellow on the back and sides. The first of these is the largest being about four feet long, the second is of that kind mentioned yesterday, and the last is much like the garter snake of our country and about its size. 
None of these species are poisonous I examined their teeth and found them innocent. They all appear to be fond of the water, to which they fly for shelter immediately on being pursued. We saw much sign of elk but met with none of them. From the appearance of bones and excrement of old date the buffalo sometimes straggle into this valley. But there is no fresh sign of them and I begin think that our harvest of white puddings is at an end, at least until our return to the buffalo country. Our trio of pests still invade and obstruct us on all occasions, these are the mosquitoes I gnats and prickly pears, equal to any three curses that ever poor Egypt labored under, except the Mohammedan yoke. The men complain of being much fatigued, their labor is excessively great. I occasionally encourage them by assisting in the labor of navigating the canoes, and have learned to push a tolerable good pole in their phrase. This morning Captain Clark set out early and pursued the Indian road why took him up a creek some miles up at 10 a.m. He discovered a horse about six miles distant on his left, he changed his route towards the horse, on approaching him he found the horse in fine order but so wild he could not get within less than several hundred paces of him. He still saw much Indian sign but none of recent date. From this horse he directed his course obliquely to the river where on his arrival he killed a deer and dined. In this wide valley where he met with the horse he passed five handsome streams, one of which only had timber another some willows and much stoked by the beaver. After dinner he continued his route along the river upwards and encamped having traveled about thirty mes. Clark, July 24, 1805 July 24 Wednesday, 1805 A fine day wind from the N.W. I proceeded on up a creek on the direction of the Indian Road at ten o'clock discovered a horse six miles to my left towards the river as I approached the horse found him fat and very wild we could not get near him. We changed our direction to the river for water having previously crossed five handsome streams in one valley one only had any timber on it one other willows only and a number of beaver dams. When I struck the river turned down to kill a deer which we dined on and proceeded on up the river a few miles and camped. On the river. The river much like it was yesterday. The mountains on either side appear like the hills had fallen half down and turned side upwards the bottoms narrow and no timber a few bushes only. Lewis, July 25, 1805. Thursday July 25, 1805. Set out at an early hour and proceeded on tolerably well the water still strong and some riffles as yesterday. The country continues much the same as the two preceding days. In the forenoon we saw a large brown bear on an island but he retreated immediately to the main shore and ran off before we could get in reach of him. They appear to be more shy here than on the Missouri below the mountains. We saw some antelopes of which we killed one. These animals appear now to have collected again is small herd several females with their young and one or two males compose the herd usually. Some males are yet solitary or two perhaps together scattered over the plains which they seem invariably to prefer to the woodlands. If they happen accidentally in the woodlands and are all armed they run immediately to the plains, seeming to place a just confidence in their superior fleetness and bottom. We killed a couple of young G's which are very abundant and fine. But as they are but small game to subsist a party on of our strength I have forbid the men shooting at them as it wastes a considerable quantity of ammunition and delays our progress. We passed Captain Clark's encampment of the 23rd inst. The face of the country and animal and vegetable productions were the same as yesterday, until late in the evening, when the valley appeared to terminate and the river was again hemmed in on both sides with high keggy and rocky cliffs. Soon after entering these hills or low mountains we passed a number of fine bold springs which burst out underneath the lard. Cliffs near the edge of the water, they wer very cold and freestone water. We passed a large CRK. Today in the plain country, 25 yards wide, which discharges itself on the starred. Side, it is composed of five streams which unite in the plain at no great distance from the river and have their sauces in the MTS this stream we called Gass's Creek. After cert. Patrick Gass one of our party. Two rapids near the large spring we passed this evening were the worst we have seen since that we passed on entering the Rocky Mountain. They were obstructed with sharp pointed rocks, ranges of which extended quite across the river. 
The cliffs are formed of a lighter colored stone than those below I perceive some limestone also in the bed of the river which seem to have been brought down by the current as they are generally small and worn smooth. This morning Captain. Clark set out early and at the distance of a few miles arrived at the three forks of the Missouri, here he found the plains recently burnt on the starred side, and the track of a horse which appeared to have passed only about four or five days. After taking breakfast of some meat which they had brought with them, examined the rivers, and written me a note informing me of his intended route, he continued on up the north fork, which though not larger than the middle fork, bore more to the west, and of course more in the direction we were anxious to pursue. He ascended this stream about twenty-five miles on start sighed, and encamped, much fatigued, his feet blistered and wounded with the prickly pear thorns. Charbono gave out, one of his ankles failed him and he was unable to proceed any further. I observed that the rocks which form the cliffs on this part of the river appear as if they had been undermined by the river and by their weight had separated from the parent hill and tumbled on their sides. The stratas of rock of which they are composed lying with their edges up. Others not separate seem obliquely depressed on the side next the river as if they had sunk down to fill the cavity which had been formed by the washing and wearing of the river. I have observed a red as well as a yellow species of gooseberry which grows on the rocky cliffs in open places of a Swedish pine-like flavor, first observed in the neighborhood of the falls, at least the yellow species was first observed there. The red differs from it in no particular except its color and size being somewhat larger, it is a very indifferent fruit but as they form a variety of the native fruits of this country I preserved some of their seeds. Mosquitoes and gnats troublesome as usual. Clark, July 25, 1805. July 25, Thursday, 1805 A fine morning we proceeded on a few miles to the three forks of the Missouri Those three forks are nearly of a size. The north fork appears to have the most water and must be considered as the one best calculated for us to ascend middle fork is quit as large about 90 yards. Wide. The south fork is about 70 yards wide and falls in about 400 yards below the middle fork. Those forks appear to be very rapid and contain some timber in their bottoms which is very extensive, on the north side the Indians have latterly set the prairies on fire, the cause I can't account for. I saw one horse track going up the river about four or five days past. After breakfast, which we made on the ribs of a buck killed yesterday, I wrote a note informing Captain Lewis the route I intended to take, and proceeded on up the main north fork through a valley. The day very hot about six or eight miles up the north fork a small rapid river falls in on the large side which affords a great deal of water and appears to head in the snow mountains to the SW. This little river falls into the Missouri by three mouths, having separate after it arrives in the river bottoms. And contains as also all the water courses in this quarter immense number of beaver and ortaire many thousand inhabit the river and creeks near the three forks, Philosophy's River, we camped on the same side we ascended starboard twenty miles on a direct line up the N. Fork. Shabono our interpreter nearly tired one of his ankles falling him, the bottoms are extensive and tolerable land covered with tall grass and prickly pears the hills and mountains are high steep and rocky. The river very much divided by island some elk bear and deer and some small timber on the islands. Great quantities of currants, red, black, yellow, purple, also mountain currants which grow on the sides of cliffs. Inferior in taste to the others having sweet pinish flavor and are red and yellow, choke cherries, boyne roche, and the red berries also abound, muskeeters very troublesome until the mountain breeze sprung up which was a little after night. Lewis, July 26, 1805. Friday July 26, 1805. Set out early this morning as usual current strong with frequent riffles, employ the cord and setting poles. The oars scarcely ever being used except to pass the river in order to take advantage of the shore and current. At the distance of 33 fourths m past the entrance of a large creek 15 yards wide which discharges itself on lard. Near the center of a lard. Bend it is a bold ruining stream this we called Howard's Creek after Thomas P. Howard one of our party. At the distance of one mile further we passed the entrance of a small run which falls in just above a rocky cliff on lard. 
Here the hills or Reether Mountains again recede from the river and the valley again widens to the extent of several miles with wide and fertile bottom lands. Covered with grass and in many places a fine turf of greensward. The high lands are thin meager soil covered with dry low sedge and a species of grass also dry the seeds of which are armed with a long twisted hard beard at the upper extremity while the lower point is a sharp subulate firm point beset at its base. With little stiff bristles standing with their points in a contrary direction to the subulate point to which they answer as a barb and serve also to press it forward when once entered a small distance. These barbed seed penetrate our moccasins and leather leggings and give us great pain until they are removed. My poor dog suffers with them excessively, he is constantly hinting and scratching himself as if in a rack of pain. The prickly pear also grow here as abundantly as usual. There is another species of the prickly pear of a globular form. Composed of an assemblage of little conic leaves springing from a common root to which their small points are attached as a common center and the base of the cone forms the apex of the leaf which is garnished with a circular range of sharp thorns quite as stiff and more keen than the more common species with the flat leaf. Like the cochineal plant. On entering this open valley I saw the snow-clad tops of distant mountains before us. The timber and mountains much as heretofore. Saw a number of beaver today and some otter, killed one of the former, also four deer. Found a deer's skin which had been left by Captain C., with a note informing me of his having met with a horse but had seen no fresh appearance of the Indians. The river in the valley is from two to two hundred and fifty yards. Wide and crowded with islands, in some places it is three quarters of a mile wide including islands. Where it passed the hills it was from 150 to 200 yards, the banks are still low but never overflow. One of the men brought me an Indian bow which he found, it was made of cedar and about 2 f, 9 i n h, in length. It had nothing remarkable in its form being much such as is used by the Mandans Minetares and This morning Captain Clark left Charbonneau and Joseph Fields at the camp of last evening and proceeded up the river about twelve miles to the top of a mountain from whence he had an extensive view of the valley of the river upwards and of a large creek which flowed into it on. STD. Side. Not meeting with any fresh appearance of Indians he determined to return and examine the middle fork of the Missouri and meet me by the time he expected me to arrive at the forks. He returned down the mountain by the way of an old Indian road which led through a deep hollow of the mountain facing the south the day being warm and the road unshaded by timber he suffered excessively with heat and the want of water. At length he arrived at a very cold spring, at which he took the precaution of wetting his feet head and hands before drank but notwithstanding this precaution he soon felt the effects of the water. He felt himself very unwell shortly after but continued his march rejoined Charbonneau and Fields where the party eat of a fawn which Joe. Fields had killed in their absence Captain C. was so unwell that he had no inclination to eat. After a short respite he resumed his march past the North Fork at a large island, here Charbonneau was very near being swept away by the current and cannot swim, Captain C. however risked him and saved his life. Captain C. Continued his march to a small river which falls into the North Fork some miles above the junction of the three forks it being the distance of about four miles from his camp of last evening here finding himself still more unwell he determined to encamp. They killed two brown or grizzly bear this evening on the island where they passed the N, Fork of the Missouri. This stream is much divided by islands and its current rapid and much as that of the Missouri where we are and is navigable. Clark, July 26. 1805. July 26 Friday, 1805 I determined to leave Shabono and one man who had sore feet to rest and proceed on with the other two to the top of a mountain twelve miles distant west and from thence view the river and valleys ahead. We with great difficulty and much fatigue reached the top at eleven o'clock from the top of this mountain I could see the course of the North Fork about ten miles meandering through a valley but could discover no Indians or sign which was fresh. I could also see some distance up the small river below, and also the middle fork after satisfying myself returned to the two men by an old Indian path. on this path, and in the mountain we came to a spring of excessive cold water. Which we drank rether freely of as we were almost famished. Notwithstanding the precautions of wetting my face, hands, and feet, 
I soon felt the effects of the water. We contined. Through a deep valley without a tree to shade us scorching with heat to the men who had killed a poor deer, I was fatigued my feet with several blisters and stuck with prickly pears. I eat but very little determined to cross to the middle fork and examine that. We crossed the Missouri which was divided by a very large island, the first part was knee deep. The other waist deep and very rapid, I felt myself very unwell and took up camp on the little river three miles above its mouth and near the place it falls into the bottom a few drops of rain this evening. We killed two bear which was immediately in our way. Both pour immense number of beaver and ortaire in this little river which forks in the bottom. Lewis, July 27, 1805. Saturday, July 27, 1805. We set out at an early hour and proceeded on but slowly the current still so rapid that the men are in a continual state of their utmost exertion to get on, and they begin to weaken fast from this continual state of violent exertion. At the distance of thirteen-fourths miles the river was again closely hemmed in by high cliffs of a solid limestone rock which appear to have tumbled or sunk in the same manner of those described yesterday. The limestone appears to be of an excellent quality of deep blue color when fractured and of a light lead color where exposed to the weather. It appears to be of a very fine grain the fracture like that of marble. We saw a great number of the bighorn on those cliffs. At the distance of 33 fourths ms, further we arrived at 9 a.m. at the junction of the S.E. Fork of the Missouri and the country opens suddenly to extensive and beautiful plains and meadows which appear to be surrounded in every direction with distant and lofty mountains. Supposing this to be the three forks of the Missouri I halted the party on the lard. Shore for breakfast and walked up the S.E. Fork about one half a mile and ascended the point of a high limestone cliff from whence I commanded a most perfect view of the neighboring country. From this point I could see the S.E. fork about seven miles. It is rapid and about seventy yards wide. Throughout the distance I saw it, it passes through a smooth, extensive green meadow of fine grass in its course meandering in several streams the largest of which passes near the lard. Hills, of which, the one I stand on is the extremity in this direction. A high wide and extensive plain succeeds the meadow and extends back several miles from the river on the Stard. Sod and with the range of mountains up the Lard. Side of the Middle Fork. A large spring arises in this meadow about one quarter of a mile from the S.E. fork into which it discharges itself on the Stard. Side about four hundred paces above me. From E to S, between the S.E. And middle forks a distant range of lofty mountains rose their snow-clad tops above the irregular and broken mountains which lie adjacent to this beautiful spot. The extreme point to which I could see the S.E. fork bore S. 65 degrees east, distant 7 milliseconds. As before observed. Between the middle and S.E. forks near their junctions with the S. W. Fork there is a handsome site for a fortification it consists of a limestone rock of an oblong form. Its sides perpendicular and about 25 feet high except at the extremity towards the middle fork where it ascends gradually and like the top is covered with a fine turf of greensward. The top is level and contains about two acres. The rock rises from the level plain as if it had been designed for some such purpose. The extreme point to which I can see the bottom and meandering of the middle fork bears S. 15E distant about 14 miles. Here it turns to the right around a point of a high plain and disappears to my view. Its bottoms are several miles in width and like that of the S. E. fork form one smooth and beautiful green meadow. It is also divided into several streams. Bet when this and the S. W. Fork there is an extensive plain which appears to extend up both those rivers many miles and back to the mountains. The extreme point to which I can see the S. W. Fork bears S. 30 W. Distant about 12 miles. This stream passes through a similar country with the other two and is more divided and serpentine in its course than either of the others, it also possesses abundantly more timber in its bottoms. The timber here consists of the narrow-leafed cottonwood almost entirely. But little box alder or sweet willow the underbrush thick and as heretofore described in the quarter of the Missouri. 
A range of high mountains at a considerable distance appear to reach from south to west and are partially covered with snow the country to the right of the S, W, fork like that to the left of the S, E. Fork is high broken and mountainous as is that also down the Missouri behind us, through which these three rivers after assembling their united force at this point seem to have forced a passage these bottom lands though not more than eight or nine feet above the water seem never to overflow. After making a draft of the connection and meanders of these streams I deck-ended the hill and returned to the party, took breakfast and ascended the S. W. Fork 13 fourths miles and encamped at a lard. Bend in a handsome level smooth plain just below a bayou, having passed the entrance of the middle fork at one half a mile. Here I encamped to wait the return of Captain Clark and to give the men a little rest which seemed absolutely necessary to them. At the junction of the S, W, and Middle Forks I found a note which had been left by Captain Clark informing me of his intended route, and that he would rejoin me at this place provided he did not fall in with any fresh sign of Indians, in which case he intended to pursue until he overtook them calculating on my taking the S, W. Fork, which I most certainly prefer as its direction is much more promising than any other. Believing this to be an essential point in the geography of this western part of the continent I determined to remain at all events until I obtained the necessary data for fixing its latitude longitude and. After fixing my camp I had the canoes all unloaded and the baggage stowed away and securely covered on shore, and then permitted several men to hunt. I walked down to the middle fork and examined and compared it with the S. W. Fork but could not satisfy myself which was the largest stream of the two, in fact they appeared as if they had been cast in the same mold there being no difference in character or size. Therefore to call either of these streams the Missouri would be giving it a preference which its size does not warrant as it is not larger than the other. They are each ninety yards wide. In these meadows I saw a number of the duck and mallet with their young which are now nearly grown. Currants of every species as well as gooseberries are found here in great abundance and perfection. A large black gooseberry which grows to the height of five or six feet is also found here. This is the growth of the bottom lands and is found also near the little rivulets which make down from the hills and mountains it puts up many stems from the same root, some of which are partially branched and all reclining. The berry is attached separately by a long peduncle to the stem from which they hang pendant underneath. The berry is of an ovate form smooth as large as the common garden gooseberry when arrived at maturity and is as black as jet, though the pulp is of a simpson color. This fruit is extremely asked. The leaf resembles the common gooseberry in form but is rather larger and somewhat proportioned to the superior size of its stem when compared with the common gooseberry. The stem is covered with very sharp thorns or briars. Below the tree forks as we passed this morning I observed many collections of the mud nests of the small martin attached to the smooth face of the limestone rocks sheltered by projections of the same rock above. Our hunters returned this evening with six deer, three otter and a musk rat. They informed me that they had seen great numbers of antelopes, and much sign of beaver otter deer elk, and at 3 p.m. Captain Clark arrived very sick with a high fever on him and much fatigued and exhausted. He informed me that he was very sick all last night had a high fever and frequent chills and constant aching pains in all his mustlass. This morning notwithstanding his indisposition he pursued his intended route to the middle fork about eight miles and finding no recent sign of Indians rested about an hour and came down the middle fork to this place. Captain C thought himself somewhat bilious and had not had a passage for several days, I prevailed on him to take a dose of Russia's pills, which I have always found sovereign in such cases and to bath his feet in warm water and rest himself. Captain C's indisposition was a further inducement for my remaining here a couple of days, I therefore informed the men of my intention, and they put their deer skins in the water in order to prepare them for dressing tomorrow. We begin to feel considerable anxiety with respect to the Snake Indians. If we do not find them or some other nation who have horses I fear the successful issue of our voyage will be very doubtful or at all events much more difficult in its accomplishment. We are now several hundred miles within the bosom of this wild and mountainous country. 
where game may rationally be expected shortly to become scarce and subsistence precarious without any information with respect to the country not knowing how far these mountains continue. Or where to direct our course to pass them to advantage or intercept a navigable branch of the Columbia. Or even were we on such an one the probability is that we should not find any timber within these mountains large enough for canoes if we judge from the portion of them through which we have passed. However I still hope for the best, and intend taking a tramp myself in a few days to find these yellow gentlemen if possible. My two principal consolations are that from our present position it is impossible that the S.W. Fork can head with the waters of any other river but the Columbia, and that if any Indians can subsist in the form of a nation in these mountains with the means they have of acquiring food we can also subsist. Captain C. Informed me that there is a part of this bottom on the west side of the middle fork near the plain, which appears to overflow occasionally and is stony. Clark, July 27, 1805. July 27, Saturday, 1805 I was very unwell all last night with a high fever and aching in all my bones. My fever and continues, determined to pursue my intended route to the middle fork, accordingly set out in great pain across a prairie eight miles to the middle this fork is nearly as large as the north fork and appears to be more rapid. We examined and found no fresh sign of Indians, and after resting about an hour, proceeded down to the junction through a wide bottom which appears to be overflown every year. And many parts stony this river has several islands and number of beaver and gortier, but little timber. We could see no fresh sign of Indians just above the point I found Captain Lewis encamped having arrived about two o'clock. Several deer killed this evening. I continue to be very unwell fever very high. Take five of Rush's pills and bathe my feet and legs in hot water. Lewis, July 28, 1805. Sunday July 28, 1805. My friend Captain Clark was very sick all last night but feels himself somewhat better this morning since his medicine has operated. I dispatched two men early this morning up the S. E. Fork to examine the river and permitted sundry others to hunt in the neighborhood of this place. Both Captain C. and myself corresponded in Oppenon with respect to the impropriety of calling either of these streams the Missouri and accordingly agreed to name them after the President of the United States and the Secretaries of the Treasury and State having previously named one river in honor of the Secretaries of War and Navy. In pursuance of this resolution we called the S. W. Fork, that which we meant to ascend, Jefferson's River in honor of Thomas Jefferson. The middle fork we called Madison's River in honor of James Madison, and the S.E. Fork we called Gallatin's River in honor of Albert Gallatin. The two first are ninety yards wide and the last is seventy yards. All of them run with great velocity and fill out large bodies of water. Gallatin's River is rather more rapid than either of the others, is not quite as deep but from all appearances may be navigated to a considerable distance. Captain C. Who came down Madison's River yesterday and has also seen Jefferson some distance thinks Madison's Rether the most rapid, but it is not as much so by any means as Gallatin's. The beds of all these streams are formed of smooth pebble and gravel, and their waters perfectly transparent in short they are three noble streams. There is timber enough here to support an establishment, provided it be erected with brick or stone either of which would be much cheaper than wood as all the materials for such a work are immediately at the spot. There are several small sandbars along the shores at no great distance of very pure sand and the earth appears as if it would make good brick. I had all our baggage spread out to dry this morning. And the day proving warm, I had a small bower or booth erected for the comfort of Captain C. Our leather lodge when exposed to the sun is excessively hot. I observe large quantities of the sand rush in these bottoms which grow in many places as high as a man's breast and stand as thick as the stalks of wheat usually do. This affords one of the best winter pastures on earth for horses or cows, and of course will be much in favor of an establishment should it ever be thought necessary to fix one at this place. The grass is also luxuriant and would afford a fine swarth of hay at this time in parcels of many acres together. All those who are not hunting although much fatigued are busily engaged in dressing their skins, 
making moccasins leggings and to make themselves comfortable. The mosquitoes are more than usually troublesome, the gnats are not as much so. In the evening about four o'clock the wind blew hard from southwest and after some little time brought on a cloud attended with thunder and lightning from which we had a fine refreshing shower which cooled the air considerably. The showers continued with short intervals until after dark. In the evening the hunters all returned they had killed eight deer and two elk. Some of the deer wer in excellent order. Those whom I had sent up Gallatin's River reported that after it passed the point to which I had seen it yesterday that it turned more to the east to a considerable distance or as far as they could discover the opening of the mountains formed by its valley which was many miles. The bottoms were tolerably wide but not as much so as at or near its mouth. Its current is rapid and the stream much divided with islands but is sufficiently deep for canoe navigation. Our present camp is precisely on the spot that the Snake Indians were encamped at the time the Minotaurs of the Nifar first came in sight of them five years since. From hence they retreated about three miles up Jefferson's River and concealed themselves in the woods, the Minotaurs pursued, attacked them, killed four men four women a number of boys, and mad prisoners of all the females and four boys. Sasiage Garwia or Indian woman was one of the female prisoners taken at that time. Though I cannot discover that she shews any emotion of sorrow in recollecting this event, or of joy in being again restored to her native country, if she has enough to eat and a few trinkets to where I believe she would be perfectly content anywhere. Clark, July 28, 1805 July 28 Sunday, 1805 I was very unwell all night, something better this morning, a very warm day until four o'clock when the wind rose and blew hard from the SW and was cloudy, the thermometer. Stood at 90 degrees above zero in the evening a heavy thunder shower from the SW. Which continued at intervales until after dark, several deer killed today men all employed dressing skins for clothes and moccasins, two men went up the east fork and reports that it is nearly the size of the N fork, very rapid and has many islands. Our present camp is the precise spot the Snake Indians were camped at the time the Minetaries came in sight, attacked and killed four men four women and a number of boys, and made prisoners of all. The females and four boys. Lewis, July 29, 1805. Monday July 29, 1805. This morning some of the hunters turned out and returned in a few hours with four fat bucks, the venison is now very fine we have killed no mule deer since we lay here. They are all of the long-tailed red deer which appear quite as large as those of the United States. The hunters brought in a living young sandhill crane it has nearly obtained its growth but cannot fly, they had pursued it and caught it in the meadows. Its color is precisely that of the red deer. We see a number of the old or full-grown crams of this species feeding in these meadows. This young animal is very first and strikes a severe blow with his beak. After amusing myself with it I had it set at liberty and it moved off apparently much pleased with being relieved from his captivity. The men have been busily engaged all day in dicing skins and making them into various garments all are leather dressers and tailors. We see a great abundance of fish in the stream some of which we take to be trout but they will not bite at any bait we can offer them. The kingfisher is common on the river since we have left the falls of the Missouri. We have not seen the summer duck since we left that place, nor do I believe that it is an inhabitant of the Rocky Mountains. The duck and mallard were first seen with their young on the 20th INST and I forgot to note it. They are now abundant with their young but do not breed in the Missouri below the mountains. The grasshoppers and crickets are abundant in the plains as are also the small birds frequently mentioned. There is also in these plains a large ant with a reddish-brown body and legs, and a black head and abdomen. They construct little pyramids of small gravel in a conic shape, about 10 or 12 inches high without a mixture of sticks and with but little earth. Captain Clark is much better today, is perfectly clear of fever but still very languid and complains of a general soreness in all his limbs. I prevailed on him to take the barks which he has done and eat tolerably freely of our good venison. Clark, July 29, 1805. July 29, Monday, 
1805 A fair morning wind from the north I feel myself something better today, made some celestial observations took two mern. Altitudes which gave for lat. 45 degrees 22 minutes 34 seconds north men all dressing skins and. Lewis, July 30, 1805. Tuesday July 30, 1805. Captain Clark being much better this morning and having completed my observations we reloaded our canoes and set out, ascending Jefferson's River. Charbano, his woman too involves and myself walked through the bottom on the lard. Side of the river about forty-one to two miles when we again struck it at the place the woman informed us that she was taken prisoner. Here we halted until Captain. Clark arrived which was not until after 1 p.m. the water being strong and the river extremely crooked. We dined and again proceeded on. As the river now passed through the woods the involves got on board together with Charbonneau and the Indian woman, I passed the river and continued my walk on the starred. Side. Saw a vast number of beaver in many large dams which they had made in various bayos of the river which are distributed to the distance of three or four miles on this side of the river over an extensive bottom of timbered and meadow lands intermixed. In order to avoid these bayos and beaver dams which I found difficult to pass I directed my course to the high plain to the right which I gained after some time with much difficulty and wading many beaver dams to my waist in mud and water. I would willingly have joined the canoes but the brush were so thick, the river crooked and bottoms intercepted in such manner by the beaver dams, that I found it useless to attempt to find them. And therefore proceeded on up the river in order to intercept it where it came near the plain and won't be more collected into one channel. At length about sunset I arrived at the river only about six miles from my calculation on a direct line from the place I had left the canoes but I thought they were still below me. I found the river was divided where I reached it by an island and was therefore fearful that they might pass without my seeing them, and went down to the lower point of the large island. Here I discovered a small island, close under the shore on which I was. I passed the narrow channel to the small island and examined the gravelly bar along the edge of the river for the tracks of the men. Knowing from the appearance of the river at this place that if they had passed they would have used the cord on the side where I was. I saw no tracks and was then fully convinced that they were below me. I fired my gun and hallooed but cowled here nothing of them. By this time it was getting nearly dark and a duck lit on the shore in about forty steps of me and I killed it. Having now secured my supper I looked out for a suitable place to amuse myself in combating the mosquitoes for the balance of the evening. I found a parcel of drift wood at the head of the little island on which I was and immediately set it on fire and collected some willow brush to lie on. I cooked my duck which I found very good and after eating it laid down and should have had a comfortable night's lodge but for the mosquitoes which infested me all night. Late at night I was awakened by the noise of some animal running over the stony bar on which I lay but did not see it, from the weight with which it ran I supposed it to be either an elk or a brown bear. The latter are very abundant in this neighborhood. The night was cool but I felt very little inconvenience from it as I had a large fire all night. Captain Clark had proceeded on after I separate from him and encamped on an islet. Only about two miles below me but did not hear the report of my gun nor of my hooping, I saw some deer and antelopes. Clark, July 30, 1805. July 30, Monday, 1805 we set out 8 o'clock and proceeded on 131-2 miles up the N. Forked the river very rapid and surely the channel entirely coarse gravel many islands and a number of chanels in different directions through the bottom end. Past the place the squar interpretress was taken, one man with his shoulder strained, two with turners, we camped on the STD, side the evening cool. Captain Lewis who walked on shore did not join me this evening. Lewis, July 31, 1805. Wednesday, July 31, 1805. This morning I waited at my camp very impatiently for the arrival of Captain Clark and party, I observed by my watch that it was 7 a.m. And they had not come in sight. I now became very uneasy and determined to wait until 8 and if they did not arrive by that time to proceed on up the river taking it as a fact that they had passed my camp some miles last evening. 
Just as I set out to pursue my plan I discovered Charbono walking up shore some distance below me and waited until arrived I now learnt that the canoes were behind, they arrived shortly after. Their detention had been caused by the rapidity of the water and the circuitous route of the river. They halted and breakfasted after which we all set out again and I continued my walk on the start. Sure the river now becomes more collected the islands though numerous a are generally small. The river continues rapid and is from 90 to 120 yards wide has a considerable quantity of timber in its bottoms. Towards evening the bottoms became much narrower and the timber much more scant. High hills set in close on the lard. And the plain high wavy or wreath are broken on the stard. And approach the river closely for a shot distance valley above 11 halves MWD. About one mile above Captain Clark's encampment of the last evening the principal entrance of a considerable river discharges itself into Jefferson's River. This stream is a little upwards of 30 yards. Wide discharges a large quantity of very clear water its bed like that of Jefferson's River is pebble and gravel. It takes its rise in the snow-clad mountains between Jefferson's and Madison's rivers to the S.W. And discharges itself into the former by seven mouths it has some timber in its bottoms and vast numbers of beaver and otter. This stream we call River Philosophy. The rock of the cliffs this evening is a hard black granite like that of the cliffs of most parts of the river below the limestone cliffs at the three forks of the Missouri this evening just before we encamped Druyer discovered a brown bear enter a small copse of bushes on the lard. Side, we surrounded the place and searched the brush but he had escaped in some manner unperceived but how we could not discover. Nothing killed today and our fresh meat is out. When we have a plenty of fresh meat I find it impossible to make the men take any care of it, or use it with the least frugality. Though I expect that necessity will shortly teach them this art. The mountains on both sides of the river at no great distance are very lofty. We have a lame crew just now, two with turners or bad boils on various parts of them, one with a bad stone bruise, one with his arm exceedingly dislocated but fortunately well replaced. And a fifth has strained his back by sliping and falling backwards on the gun wall of the canoe. The latter is served. Gas. It gives him great pain to work in the canoe in his present situation, but he thinks he can walk with convenience, I therefore selected him as one of the party to accompany me tomorrow, being determined to go in quest of the Snake Indians. I also directed Druyer and Charbono to hold themselves in readiness. Charbono thinks that his ankle is sufficiently recovered to stand the march but I entertain my doubts of the fact, he is very anxious to accompany me and I therefore indulge him. There is some pine on the hills on both sides of the river opposite to our encampment which is on the lard. Side upon a small island just above a run. The bulrush and cattail flag grow in great abundance in the moist parts of the bottoms the drier situations are covered with fine grass, tansy, thistles, onions and flax. The bottom land fertile and of a black rich loam. The uplands pour sterile and of a light yellow clay with a mixture of small smooth pebble and gravel, producing prickly pears, sedge and the bearded grass in great abundance, this grass is now so dry that it would burn like tinder. We saw one bighorn today a few antelopes and deer. Clark, July 31, 1805 July 31st Tuesday, 1805 A fair morning Captain Lewis out all night, we arrived at his camp to breakfast. he was without a blanket, and he killed a duck which souped on and. The river as yesterday Choline rapid, passed the lower mouth of a small river on the lard. In the morning and the upper mouth a underscore 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 miles above, this little river is the one I camped on the 26th and heads in the snow mountains to the SW. Proceeded on very well and camped on a small island a little above the place I camped the 25th instant at the mouth of a run on the large side. The bottoms from the mouth of the river extend to 21 halves miles and enter a short and high hill which is about 1 mile through and, the river then passes through a 2d value of about 11 halves miles wide, some islands. Below this nob the river is crowded with islands, we are out of fresh meat, and nothing killed today the mountains on either side is high and rough we have two men with tumors and unable to work. 
Captain Lewis determined to proceed on with three men in search of the Snake Indians, tomorrow. Lewis, August 1, 1805. August 1, 1805 at half after 8 a.m. we halted for breakfast and as had been previously agreed on between Captain. Clark and myself I set out with three men in quest of the Snake Indians. The men I took were the two interpreters Druier and Charbonneau and Cirque. Gas who by an accidental fall had so disabled himself that it was with much pain he could work in the canoes though he could march with convenience. The route we took lay over a rough high range of mountains on the north side of the river. The Rive entered these mountains a few miles above where we left it. Captain Clark recommended this route to me from a belief that the river as soon as it passed the mountains bore to the N of W. He having a few days before ascended these mountains to a position from which he discovered a large valley passing between the mountains and which bore to the N west. This however proved to be the inlet of a large creek which discharged itself into the river just above this range of mountains, the river bearing to the S, W. We were therefore thrown several miles out of our route. As soon as we discovered our mistake we directed our course to the river which we at length gained about 2 p.m. much exhausted by the heat of the day the roughness of the road and the want of water. The mountains are extremely bare of timber and our route lay through the steep valleys exposed to the heat of the sun without shade and scarcely a breath of air. And to add to my fatigue in this walk of about eleven miles I had taken a dose of glauber salts in the morning in consequence of a slight dysentery with which I had been afflicted for several days. Being weakened by the disorder and the operation of the medicine I found myself almost exhausted before we reached the river. I felt my spirits much revived on our near approach to the river at the sight of a herd of elk of which Druier and myself killed two. We then hurried to the river and allayed our thirst. I ordered two of the men to skin the elk and bring the meat to the river while myself and the other prepared a fire and cooked some of the meat for our dinner. We made a comfortable meal of the elk and left the balance of the meat on the bank of the river the party with Captain Clark. This supply was no doubt very acceptable to them as they had had no fresh meat for near two days except one beaver game being very scarce and shy. We had seen a few deer and some goats but had not been fortunate enough to kill any of them. After dinner we resumed our march and encamped about 6 m, above on the starred side of the river. Lewis, August 1, 1805. Thursday, August 1, 1805. This morning we set out early and proceeded on tolerably well until October 8th. By which time we had arrived within a few miles of a mountain through which the river passes. We halted on the stard. Sighed and took breakfast. After which or at one half after 8 a.m. as had been previously concerted Betwin Captain. Clark and myself I set out with three men in search of the Snake Indians or Sosanese. Our route lay over a high range of mountains on the north side of the river. Captain C. Recommended this route to me no doubt from a belief that the river as soon as it passed this chain of mountains bore to the N, of W, he having on the 26th ULT. Ascended these mountains to a position from whence he discovered a large valley passing between the mountains which bore to the N, W and presumed that the river passed in that direction. This however proved to be the passage of a large creek which discharged itself into the river just above this range of mountains, the river bearing to the S, W. We were therefore thrown several miles out of our route. As soon as we discovered our error we directed our course to the river which we at length gained about 2 p.m. much exhausted by the heat of the day, the roughness of the road and the want of water. The mountains are extremely bare of timber. And our route lay through the steep and narrow hollows of the mountains exposed to the intense heat of the midday sun without shade or scarcely a breath of air to add to my fatigue in this walk of about eleven miles. I had taken a dose of glauber salts in the morning in consequence of a slight dysentery with which I had been afflicted for several days. Being weakened by the disorder and the operation of the medicine I found myself almost exhausted before we reached the river. I felt my spirits much revived on our near approach to the river at the sight of a herd of elk, of which Druier and myself soon killed a couple. We then hurried to the river and allayed our thirst. I ordered two of the men to skin the elk and bring the meat to the river, while myself and the other prepared a fire and cooked some of the meat for our dinner. We made a comfortable meal on the elk, 
and left the balance of the meat and skins on the bank of the river for Captain Clark and party. This supply will no doubt be acceptable to them, as they had had no fresh meat when I left them for almost two days except one beaver, game being very scarce and shy above the forks. We had seen a few deer and antelopes but had not been fortunate enough to kill any of them. As I passed these mountains I saw a flock of the black or dark brown pheasants, the young pheasant is almost grown we killed one of them. This bird is fully a third larger than the common pheasant of the Atlantic states. Its form is much the same. It is booted nearly to the toes and the male has not the tufts of long black feathers on the sides of the neck which are so conspicuous in those of the Atlantic. Their color is a uniform dark brown with a small mixture of yellow or yellowish brown specks on some of the feathers particularly those of the tail, though the extremities of these are perfectly black for about one inch. The eye is nearly black, the iris has a small dash of yellowish brown. The feathers of the tail are wreather longer than that of our pheasant or patridge as they are called in the eastern states. Are the same in number or eighteen and all nearly of the same length, those in the intermediate part being somewhat longest. The flesh of this bird is white and agreeably flavored. I also saw near the top of the mountain among some scattering pine a blue bird about the size of the common robin. Its action and form is somewhat that of the jay bird and never rests long in any one position but constantly flying or hoping from spray to spray. I shot at one of them but missed it. Their note is loud and frequently repeated both flying and when at rest and is chara, 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 as nearly as letters can express it. After dinner we resumed our march and my pack felt much lighter than it had done about two hours before. We traveled about six miles further and encamped on the start. Bank of the river, making a distance of seventeen miles for this day. The mosquitoes were troublesome but I had taken the precaution of bringing my beer. Shortly after I left Captain. Clark this morning he proceed on and pass through the mountains, they form tremendous cliffs of ragged and nearly perpendicular rocks, the lower. Part of this rock is of the black granite before mentioned and the upper part a light-colored freestone. These cliffs continue for nine miles and approach the river very closely on either side. He found the current very strong. Captain C. Killed a big horn on these cliffs which himself and party dined on. After passing this range of mountains he entered this beautiful valley in which we also were it is from six to eight miles wide. The river is crooked and crowded with islands, its bottoms wide fertile and covered with fine grass from nine inches to two feet high and possesses but a scant proportion of timber. Which consists almost entirely of a few narrow leafed cottonwood trees distributed along the verge of the river. In the evening Captain C. found the elk I had left him and ascended a short distance above to the entrance of a large creek which falls in on Stard. And encamped opposite to it on the lard. Side. He sent out the two fieldses to hunt this evening and they killed five deer, which with the elk again gave them a plentiful store of fresh provisions. This large creek we called Fields Creek after Reuben Fields won our party. On the river about the mountains which Captain C. Past today he saw some large cedar trees and some juniper also just at the upper side of the mountain there is a bad rapid here the tow line of our canoe broke in the chute of the rapids and swung on the rocks and had very nearly overset. A small distance above this rapid a large bold creek falls in on lard. Side which we called Fraser's Creek after rocked. Fraser. They saw a large brown bear feeding on currants but could not get a shoot at him. Clark, August 1, 1805. August 1st Wednesday, 1805 A fine day captain. Lewis left me at eight o'clock just below the place I entered a Verray high mountain which jutted its tremendous cliffs on either side for nine miles, the rocks ragged some very dark and other part very light rock the light rocks is sandstone. The water swift and very showy. I killed the ibex on which the whole party dined, after passing through the mountain we entered a wide extensive valley of from four to eight miles wide very level a creek falls in at the commencement of this valley on the large side. The river widens and spreads into small chanels. We encamped on the large side opposite a large creek I sent out Joe. And our fields to hunt this evening they killed five deer, 
I saw a large bear eating currents this evening the river so rapid that the greatest exertion is required by all to get the boats on wind S. W. Mercury at sunrise 50 degrees up. 0. Lewis, August 2, 1805. August 2, 1805. We resumed our march this morning at sunrise the weather was fair and wind from N. W. Finding that the river still bore to the south I determined to pass it if possible to shorten our route this we effected about five miles above our camp of last evening by wading it. Found the current very rapid about ninety yards wide and waist deep this is the first time that I ever dared to make the attempt to wade the river. Though there are many places between this and the three forks where I presume it might be attempted with equal success. The valley though which our route of this day lay and through which the river winds its meandering course is a beautiful level plain with but little timber and that on the verge of the river. The land is tolerably fertile, consisting of a black or dark yellow loam, and covered with grass from nine inches to two feet high. The plain ascends gradually on either side of the river to the bases of two ranges of mountains which ly parallel to the river and which terminate the width of the valley. The tops of these mountains were yet partially covered with snow while we in the valley were suffocated nearly with the intense heat of the midday sun. The nights are so could that two blankets are not more than sufficient covering. We found a great currants, two kinds of which were red, others yellow deep purple and black, also black gooseberries and service berries now ripe and in full perfection. We feasted sumptuously on our wild fruit particularly the yellow currant and the deep purple service berry which I found to be excellent the currant grows very much like the red currant common to the gardens in the Atlantic states though the leaf is somewhat different and the growth taller. The service berry grows on a smaller bush and differs from ours only in color and the superior excellence of its flavor and size, it is of a deep purple. This day we saw an abundance of deer and goats or antelopes and a great number of the tracks of elk, of the former we killed two. We continued our route along this valley which is from six to eight miles wide until sun set when we encamped for the night on the river bank having traveled about twenty-four miles. I feel myself perfectly recovered of my indisposition and do not doubt being able to pursue my march with equal comfort in the morning. Lewis, August 2, 1805 Friday, August 2 Candelas 1805. We resumed our march this morning at sunrise. The day was fair and wind from N. W. Finding that the river still bore to the south I determined to pass it if possible in order to shorten our route, this we effected by wading the river about five miles above our encampment of the last evening. We found the current very rapid waist deep and about ninety yards wide bottom smooth pebble with a small mixture of coarse gravel. This is the first time that I ever dared to wade the river, though there are many places between this and the forks where I presume it might be attempted with equal success. The valley along which we pass today, and through which the river winds its meandering course is from six to eight miles wide and consists of a beautiful level plain with but little timber and that confined to the verge of the river. The land is tolerably fertile, and is either black or a dark yellow loam, covered with grass from nine inches to two feet high. The plain ascends gradually on either side of the river to the bases of two ranges of high mountains, which lie parallel to the river and prescribe the limits of the plains. The tops of these mountains are yet covered partially with snow, while we in the valley are nearly suffocated with the intense heat of the midday sun, the nights are so cold that two blankets are not more than sufficient covering. Soon after passing the river this morning served. Gas lost my tomahawk in the thick brush and we were unable to find it, I regret the loss of this useful implement, however exceedance will happen in the best families. And I consoled myself with the recollection that it was not the only one we had with us. The bones of the buffalo and their excrement of an old date are to be met with in every part of this valley but we have long since lost all hope of meeting with that animal in these mountains. We met with great quantities of currants today, two species of which were red, others yellow, deep purple and black, also black gooseberries and serviceberries now ripe and in great perfection. We feasted sumptuously on our wild fruits, particularly the yellow currant and the deep purple serviceberries, which I found to be excellent. The serviceberry grows on a small bush and differs from ours only in color size and superior excellence of its flavor. It is somewhat larger than ours. 
On our way we saw an abundance of deer antelopes, of the former we killed two. We also saw many tracks of the elk and bear. No recent appearance of Indians. The Indians in this part of the country appear to construct their lodges with the willow boughs and brush. They are small of a conic figure and have a small aperture on one side through which they enter. We continued our route up this valley on the Lard. Side of the river until sunset, at which time we encamped on the Lard. Bank of the river having traveled twenty-four miles. We had brought with us a good stock of venison of which we eat a hearty supper. I feel myself perfectly recovered of my indisposition, and do not doubt being able to pursue my route tomorrow with the same comfort I have done today. We saw some very large beaver dams today in the bottoms of the river several of which wer five feet high and overflowed several acres of land. These dams are formed of willow brush mud and gravel and are so closely interwoven that they resist the water perfectly. The base of this work is thick and rises nearly perpendicularly on the lower side while the upper side or that within the dam is gently sloped. The brush appear to be laid in no regular order yet acquires a strength by the irregularity with which they are placed by the beaver that it would puzzle the ingenuity of man to give them. Captain Clark continued his route early this morning. The rapidity of the current was such that his progress was slow, in short it required the utmost exertion of the men to get on, nor could they resist this current by any other means than that of the cord and pole. In the course of the day they passed some villages of burrowing squirrels, saw a number of beaver dams and the inhabitants of them, many young ducks both of the duck and mallard and the red-headed fishing duck, geese, several rattlesnakes, black woodpeckers, and a large gang of elk. They found the river much crowded with island both large and small and passed a small creek on Stard. Side which we called Birth Creek. Captain Clark discovers a tumor rising on the inner side of his ankle this evening which was painful to him. They encamped in a level bottom on the lard. Side. Clark, August 2, 1805. August 2, Friday. 1805 a fine day set out early the river has much the same kind of bank chanel current and as it had in the last valley i walked out this morning on shore and saw several rattle snakes in the plain the wind from the sw we proceeded on with great difficulty from the rapidity of the current and rapids abt 15 miles and encamped on the large side saw a large gang of elk at sunset to the sw passed a small creek on the starred side and many large and small islands Saw a number of young ducks as we have also seen every day, some geese I saw black woodpeckers, I have either got my foot bitten by some poisonous insect or a turner is rising on the inner bone of my ankle which is painful. Lewis. August 3, 1805. August the 3rd, 1805. Set out this morning at sunrise and continued our route through the valley on the lard. Side of the river. At 11 a.m. Druyer killed a doe and we halted and took breakfast. The mountains continue high on either side of the valley, and are but scantily supplied with timber, small pine appears to be the prevalent growth. There is no timber in the valley except a small quantity of the narrow-leafed cottonwood on the verge of the river. The underwood consists of the narrow-leafed or small willow, honeysuckle rosebushes, currant, gooseberry and service berry bushes also a small quantity of a species of dwarf birch the leaf of which, oval, deep green, finely indented and very small. We encamped this evening after sunset having traveled by estimate 23 miles. From the width and appearance of the valley at this place I conceived that the river forked not far above me and therefore resolved the next morning to examine the adjacent country more minutely. Lewis, August 3, 1805. Saturday, August 3, 1805. Set out early this morning, or before sunrise, still continued our march through the level valley on the Lard. Side of the river. The valley much as yesterday only rether wider. I think it twelve miles wide, though the plains near the mountains rise higher and are more broken with some scattering pine near the mountain. In the leveller parts of the plain and river bottoms which are very extensive there is no timber except a scant proportion of cottonwood neat the river. The underwood consists of the narrow leafed or small willow, the small honeysuckle, rose bushes, currant, serviceberry, and gooseberry bushes. 
Also a small species of birth in but small quantities the leaf which is oval finely, indented, small and of a deep green color. The stem is simple ascending and branching, and seldom rises higher than 10 or 12 feet. The mountains continue high on either side of the valley, and are but scantily supplied with timber, small pine apars to be the prevalent growth, it is of the pith kind, with a short leaf. At 11 a.m. Druyer killed a doe and we halted about two hours and breakfasted, and then continued our route until night without halting, when we arrived at the river in a level bottom which appeared to spread to greater extent than usual. From the appearance of the timber I suppose that the river forked above us and resolved to examine this part of the river minutely tomorrow. This evening we passed through a high plain for about eight miles covered with prickly pears and bearded grass, though we found this even better walking than the wide bottoms of the river, which we passed in the evening. These although apparently level, from some cause which I know not, were formed into myriads of deep holes as if rooted up by hogs these the grass covered so thick that it was impossible to walk without the risk of falling down at every step. Some parts of these bottoms also possess excellent turf or peat, I believe of many feet deep. The mineral salts also frequently mentioned on the Missouri we saw this evening in these uneven bottoms. We saw many deer, antelopes ducks, geese, some beaver and great appearance of their work. Also a small bird and the curlew as usual. We encamped on the river bank on Lard. Side having traveled by estimate 23 miles. The fish of this part of the river are trout and a species of scale fish of a white color and a remarkable small long mouth which one of our men inform us are the same with the species called in the eastern states bottlenose. The snowy region of the mountains and for some distance below has no timber or herbage of any kind, the timber is confined to the lower and middle regions. Captain Clark set out this morning as usual. He walked on shore a small distance this morning and killed a deer. In the course of his walk he saw a track which he supposed to be that of an Indian from the circumstance of the large toes turning inward. He pursued the track and found that the person had ascended a point of a hill from which his camp of the last evening was visible, this circumstance also confirmed the belief of its being an Indian who had thus discovered them and ran off. They found the river as usual much crowded with islands, the current more rapid and much more shallow than usual. In many places they were obliged to double man the canoes and drag them over the stone and gravel. This morning they passed a small creek on Stard. At the entrance of which Reuben Fields killed a large panther. We called the creek after that animal panther creek. They also passed a handsome little stream on Lard. Which is form of several large springs which rise in the bottoms and along the base of the mountains with some little rivulets from the melting snows. The beaver have formed many large dams on this stream. They saw some deer antelopes and the common birds of the country. In the evening they passed a very bad rapid where the bed of the river is formed on trailly of solid rock and encamped on an island just above. The panther which fields killed measured seven and one slash two feet from the nose to the extremity of the tail. It is precisely the same animal common to the western part of our country. The men wer compelled to be a great proportion of their time in the water today, they have had a severe day's labor and are much fatigued. Clark, August 3, 1805 August 3, Saturday 1805 A fine morning wind from the N.E. I walked on shore and killed a deer in my walk I saw a fresh track which I took to be an Indian from the shape of the foot as the toes turned in. I think it probable that this Indian spied our fires and came to a situation to view us from the top of a small knob on the large side. The river more rapid and showy than yesterday 1 rf. Man killed a large panther on the shore we are obliged to haul over the canoes showy in many places where the islands are numerous and bottom showy. In the evening the river more rapid and showy we encamped on an island above a part of the river which passed through a rocky bed enclosed on both sides with thick willow current and red berries and can past a bold stream which heads in the mountains to our right and the dream of the minting snow in the mountain. On that side AR in view, at four o'clock past a bold stream which falls from a mountain in three channels to our left, the greater portion of the snow on this mountain is melted. But little remaining near us some deer elk and antelopes and bear in the bottoms. 
But few trees and they small the mountains on our left contain pine those on our right but very partially supplied and what pine and cedar it has is on the lower region, no wood being near the snow. Great numbers of beaver otter and some fish trout and in bottle nose. Birds as usual. Geese young ducks and curlows. Lewis, August 4, 1805. August 4, 1805. Set out very early this morning and steered s e by e. About four miles when we passed a bold ruining creek about twelve yards wide the water could and remarkably clear, we then changed our course to s e. Passing obliquely across a valley which bore nearly e leaving the valley which we had pursued for the two preceding days. At the distance of three miles we passed a handsome little river which passes through this valley. It is about thirty yards wide affords a considerable quantity of water and I believe it may be navigated some miles. I then changed my route to S. W. passed a high plain which lies between the valleys and returned to the S. Valley, in passing which I fell in with a river about forty-five yards wide which I weighed egg and then continued my route down to its junction with the river just mentioned, and from thence to the entrance of the creek which falls in about two miles below. Still continuing my route down this stream about three miles further and about two m, below our encampment of the last evening this river forms a junction with a river fifty yards wide which comes from the N, W, and falling into the S. Valley runs parallel with the middle fork about twelve miles. This is a bold rapid and clear stream its bed so broken and obstructed by gravel bars and islands that it appeared to me impossible to navigate it with safety. The middle fork is gentle and possesses about 2 3 ds as much water as this rapid stream, its course so far as I can observe it is about s, w, and it appears to be navigable. Its water is much warmer than that of the rapid fork and somewhat turbid, from which I concluded that it had its source at a greater distance in the mountains and passed through an opener country than the other. Under this impression I wrote a note to Captain Clark recommending his taking the middle fork provided he should arrive at this place before my return which I expect will be the day after tomorrow. The note I left on a pole at the forks of the river and having refreshed ourselves and eat heartily of some venison we killed this morning I continued my route up the starred side of the N. W. fork, determining to pursue it until 12 o.c. The next day and then pass over to the middle fork and return to their junction or until I met Captain Clark. We encamped this evening near the point where the river leaves the valley and enters the mountains, having traveled about twenty miles. Lewis, August 4, 1805. Sunday, August 4, 1805. Set out very early this morning and steered s, e, by e, for m, when we passed a bold ruining creek twelve yards wide, the water of which was clear and very cold. It appears to be formed by four drains from the snowy mountains to our left. After passing this creek we changed our direction to s, e, passing obliquely across a valley which bore e leaving the valley we had pursued for the two preceding days. At the distance of three mis we passed a handsome little river which meanders through this valley. It is about thirty yards wide, affords a considerable quantity of water and appears as if it might be navigated some miles. The current is not rapid or the water very clear, the banks are low and the bed formed of stone and gravel. I now changed my route to S, W. Passed a high plain which lies Betwin the valleys and returned to the south valley, in passing which I fell in with a river about forty-five yards wide gravelly bottom gentle current waist deep and water of a whitish blue tinge. This stream we waded and continued our route down it to the entrance of the river just mentioned about three quarters of a mile. Still continuing down we passed the entrance of the creek about two miles lower down. And at the distance of three miles further arrived at its junction with a river fifty yards wide which comes from the S, W, and falling into the south valley runs parallel with the middle fork about twelve miles before it forms a junction. I now found that our encampment of the last evening was about eleven halves miles above the entrance of this large river on Stard. This is a bold rapid and clear stream, its bed so much broken and obstructed by gravelly bars and its waters so much subdivided by islands that it appears to me utterly impossible to navigate it with safety. The middle fork is gentle and possesses about 2 3 rds as much water as this stream. Its course so far as I can observe it is about s, w, 
and from the opening of the valley I believe it still bears more to the west above it may be safely navigated. Its water is much warmer than the rapid fork and its water more turbid, from which I conjecture that it has its sources at a greater distance in the mountains and passes through an opener country than the other. Under this impression I wrote a note to Captain Clark, recommending his taking the middle fork provided he should arrive at this place before my return, which I expect will be the day after tomorrow. This note I left on a pole at the forks of the river, and having refreshed ourselves and eat heartily of some venison which we killed this morning we continued our route up the rapid fork on the start side. Resolving to pursue this stream until noon tomorrow and then pass over to the middle fork and come down it to their junction or until I meet Captain Clark. I have seen no recent Indian sign in the course of my route as yet. Charbono complains much of his leg, and is the cause of considerable detention to us. We encamped on the river bank near the place at which it leaves the valley and enters the mountain having traveled about twenty-three miles. We saw some antelopes deer grains, geese, and ducks of the two species common to this country. The summer duck has ceased to appear, nor do I believe it is an inhabitant of this part of the country. The timber ank is as heretofore though there is more in this valley on the rapid fork than we have seen in the same extent on the river since we entered this valley. The Indians appear on some parts of the river to have destroyed a great proportion of the little timber which there is by setting fire to the bottoms. This morning Captain Clark set out at sunrise, and sent two hunters ahead to kill some meat. At 8 a. m., he arrived at my camp of the two at ANST where he breakfasted, here he found a note which I had left for him at that place informing him of the occurrences of my route and the river continued to be crowded with islands, rapid and shoaly. These shoals or riffles succeeded each other every three or four hundred yards. At those places they are obliged to drag the canoes over the stone there not being water enough to float them, and bet when the riffles the current is so strong that they are compelled to have seacourse to the cord. And being unable to walk on the shore for the brush wade in the river along the shore and haul them by the cord, this has increased the pain and labor extremely, their feet soon get tender and sore by wading and walking over the stones. These are also so slippery that they frequently get severe falls. Being constantly wet soon makes them feble also. Their hunters killed two deer today and some geese and ducks wer killed by those who navigated the canoes. They saw deer antelopes grains beaver otter and Captain Clark's ankle became so painful to him that he was unable to walk. This evening they encamped on the start. Side in a bottom of cottonwood timber all much fatigued. Clark, August 4, 1805 August 4 Sunday, 1805 A fine morning cool proceeded on very early and breakfast at the camp Captain Lewis left yesterday morning, at this camp he left a note informing that he discovered no fresh sign of Indians and the river continued to be crowded with islands surely rapid and clear, I could not walk on shore today as my ankle was sore from a turner on that part. The method we are compelled to take to get on is fatiguing and laborious in the extreme, haul the canoes over the rapids, which succeed each other every two or three hundred yards and between the water rapid obliged to tow and walk on stones the whole day except when we have pulling men wet all day sore feet and and Mackey at sunrise 49A0. Lewis, August 5, 1805. Monday, August 5th, 1805 As Charbono complained of being unable to march far today I ordered him and served. Gas to pass the rapid river near our camp and proceed at their leisure through the level bottom to a point of high timber about seven miles distant on the middle fork which was in view. I gave them my pack that of Druier and the meat which we had, directing them to remain at that place until we joined them. I took Druier with me and continued my route up the start side of the river about four miles and then waded it. Found it so rapid and shallow that it was impossible to navigate it. Continued up it on the lard. Side about eleven halves miles further when the mountains put in close on both sides and arose to great height, partially covered with snow. From hence the course of the river was to the east of north. I took the advantage of a high projecting spur of the mountain which with some difficulty we ascended to its summit in about half an hour. 
From this eminence I had a pleasing view of the valley through which I had passed many miles below and the continuation of the middle fork through the valley equally wide above me to the distance of about twenty miles when that also appeared to enter. The mountains and disappeared to my view. However the mountains which terminate the valley in this direction appeared much lower than those up either of the other forks. On the rapid fork they appeared still to rise the one range towering above another as far as I could perceive them. The middle fork as I suspected dose bear considerably to the west of south and the gap formed by it in the mountains after the valley terminates is in the same direction. Under these circumstances I did not hesitate in believing the middle fork the most proper for us to ascend. About south from me, the middle fork approached within about five miles. I resolved to pass across the plains to it and return to Gas and Charbono, accordingly we set out and deck-ended the mountain among some steep and difficult precipices of rocks. Here Druyer missed his step and had a very dangerous fall, he sprained one of his fingers and hurt his leg very much. In fifteen or twenty minutes he was able to proceed and we continued our route to the river where we had designed to intercept it. I quenched my thirst and rested a few minutes examined the river and found it still very navigable. An old Indian road very large and plain leads up this fork, but I could see no tracks except those of horses which appeared to have passed early in the spring. As the river made a great bend to the southeast we again ascended the high plain and steered our course as straight as we could to the point where I had directed Gas and Charbano to remain. We passed the plain regained the bottom and struck the river about three miles above them, by this time it was perfectly dark and we hooped but could hear no tidings of them. We had struck the river at the point of timber to which I had directed them, but having mistaken a point of woods lower down, had halted short of the place. We continued our route after dark down the bottom through thick brush of the pulpy leaf thorn and prickly pears for about two hours when we arrived at their camp. They had a small quantity of meat left which Druyer and myself eat it being the first we had ticed dead today. We had traveled about twenty-five miles. I soon laid down and slept very soundly until morning. I saw no deer today nor any game except a few antelopes which were very shy. The soil of the plains is a light yellow clay very meager and intermixed with a large proportion of gravel, producing nothing except the twisted or bearded grass, sedge and prickly pears. The drier parts of the bottoms are also much more indifferent in point of soil to those below and are covered with the southernwood pulpy leaf thorn and prickly pears with but little grass. The moist parts are fertile and covered with fine grass and sand rushes. This morning Captain Clark set out at sunrise and dispatched Joseph and Reuben Fields to hunt. They killed two deer on one of which the party breakfasted. The river today they found straighter and more rapid even than yesterday, and the labor and difficulty of the navigation was proportionably increased. They therefore proceeded but slowly and with great pain as the men had become very languid from working in the water and many of their feet swollen and so painful that they could scarcely walk. At 4 p.m. they arrived at the confluence of the two rivers where I had left the note. This note had unfortunately been placed on a green pole which the beaver had cut and carried off together with the note. The possibility of such an occurrence never one occurred to me when I placed it on the green pole. This accident deprived Captain Clark of any information with respect to the country and supposing that the rapid fork was most in the direction which it was proper we should pursue, or west. He took that stream and ascended it with much difficulty about a mile and encamped on an island that had been lately overflown and was yet damp. They were therefore compelled to make beds of brush to keep themselves out of the mud. In ascending this stream for about a quarter of a mile it scattered in such a manner that they were obliged to cut a passage through the willow brush which leant over the little channels and united their tops. Captain. Clark's ankle is extremely painful to him this evening the tumor has not yet matured, he has a slight fever. The men were so much fatigued today that they wished much that navigation was at an end that they might go by land. Clark, August 5, 1805. August 5, Monday, 1805 A cold clear morning the wind from the S, E, the river straight and much more rapid than yesterday, I sent out Joe. N. R. 
fields to kill some meat they killed two deer and we bracked fast on one of them and proceeded on with great difficulty from the rapidity of the current, and numerable rapids we had to encounter, at four o'clock p.m. Maki 49 up. Zero, past the mouth of principal fork which falls in on the lard. Side, this fork is about the size of the starred. One less water wreather not so rapid, its course as far as can be seen is S, E and appear to pass through between two mountains, the NW. Fork being the one most in our course i.e. S 25 W, as far as I can see, determined me to take this fork as the principal and the one most proper the SE fork is of a greenish color and contains but little timber. The SW fork contains more timber than is below for some distance, we ascended this fork about one mile and encamped on an island which had been laterly overflown and was what we raised our bead on bushes. We passed a part of the river above the forks which was divided and scattered through the willows in such a manner as to render it difficult to pass through for a one quarter of a mile. We wer obliged to cut our way through the willows, men much fatigued from their excessive labors in hauling the canoes over the rapids and very weak being in the water all day. My foot very painful. Ass ended the NW fork nine miles on a course S, thirty degrees west, to a bluff on the start. Side passed several bayous and islands. Lewis, August 6th, 1805. Tuesday, August 6th, 1805. We set out this morning very early on our return to the forks. Having nothing to eat I set Druyer to the woodlands to my left in order to kill a deer, sent served. Gas to the right with orders to keep sufficiently near to discover Captain C. And the party should they be on their way up that stream, and with Charbonneau I directed my course to the main forks through the bottom directing the others to meet us there. About five miles above the forks I had the hooping of the party to my left and changed my route towards them, on my arrival found that they had taken the rapid fork and learnt from Captain. Clark that he had not found the note which I had left for him at that place and the reasons which had induced him to ascend this stream. It was easiest and more in our direction, and APD. To contain as much water he had hover previously to my coming up with him, met Druyer who informed him of the state of the two rivers and was on his return. One of their canoes had just overset and all the baggage wet, the medicine box among other articles and several articles lost a shot pouch and horn with all the implements for one rifle lost and never recovered. I walked down to the point where I waited their return. On their arrival found that two other canoes had filled with water and wet their cargoes completely. White House had been thrown out of one of the canoes as she swing in a rapid current and the canoe had rubed him and pressed him to the bottom as she passed over him and had the water been two inches shallower must inevitably have crushed him to death. Our parched meal, corn, Indian presents, and a great part of our most valuable stores were wet and much damaged on this occasion. To examine, dry and arrange our stores was the first object, we therefore passed over to the lard. Side opposite to the entrance of the rapid fork where there was a large gravelly bar that answered our purposes, wood was also convenient and plenty. Here we fixed our camp, and unloaded all our canoes and opened and exposed to dry such articles as had been wet. A part of the load of each canoe consisted of the leaden cane stirs of powder which were not in least injured, though some of them had remained upwards of an hour under water. About twenty pounds of powder which we had in a tight keg or at least one which we thought sufficiently so got wet and entirely spoiled. This would have been the case with the other had it not have been for the expedient which I had fallen on of securing the powder by means of the lead having the latter formed into canisters which were filled with the necessary proportion of poder to discharge the lead when used. And those canisters well secured with corks and wax. In this country the air is so pure and dry that any vessel however well seasoned the timber may be will give way or shrink unless it is kept full of some liquid. We found that three deer skins which we had left at a considerable height on a tree were taken off which we supposed had been done by a panther. We sent out some men to hunt this evening, they killed three deer and four elk which gave us a plentiful supply of meat once more. Shannon had been dispatched up the rapid fork this morning to hunt, by Captain Clark before he met with Druyer or learnt his mistake in the rivers. When he returned he sent Druyer in search of him, 
but he rejoined us this evening and reported that he had been several miles up the river and could find nothing of him. We had the trumpet sounded and fired several guns but he did not join us this evening. I am fearful he is lost again. This is the same man who was separate from us fifteen days as we came up the Missouri and subsisted nine days of that time on grapes only. White House is in much pain this evening with the injury one of his legs sustained from the canoe today at the time it upset and swing over him. Captain Clark's ankle is also very painful to him. We should have given the party a day's rest somewhere near this place had not this accident happened, as I had determined to take some observations to fix the latitude and longitude of these forks. Our merchandise medicine and car not sufficiently dry this evening we covered them securely for the evening. Captain Clark had ascended the river about nine miles from this place on a course of south thirty degrees west, before he met with Druyer. We believe that the N.W. or Rapid Fork is the Dane of the melting snows of the mountains. And that it is not as long as the Middle Fork and Dose not at all seasons of the year supply anything like as much water as the other and that about this season it rises to its greatest height. This last appears from the apparent bed of the river which is now overflown and the water in many places spreads through old channels which have their bottoms covered with grass that has grown this season and is such as appears on the parts of the bottom not inundated. We therefore determined that the middle fork was that which ought of right to bear the name we had given to the lower portion or river Jefferson and called the bold rapid and clear stream wisdom. And the more mild and placid one which flows in from the S. E. Philanthropy, in commemoration of two of those cardinal virtues, which have so eminently marked that deservedly celebrated character through life. Clark, August 6, 1805. August 6, Tuesday, 1805 A clear morning cool wind from the S.W. We proceeded on with much difficulty and fatigue over rapids and stones. River about forty or fifty yards wide much divided by islands and narrow bayous to a low bluff on the start side and Brackfast, during the time of Brackfast Druyer came to me from Captain Lewis and informed me that they had explored both forks for thirty or forty miles and that the one we were ascending was impracticable much further up and turned immediately to the north. The middle fork he reported was gentle and after a short distank turned to the S. W. and that all the Indian roads leads up the middle fork. This report determined me to take the middle fork, accordingly drove down to the forks where I met with Captain Lewis and party, Captain Lewis had left a letter on a pole in the forks informing me what he had discovered and the course of the river's end. This letter was cut down by the beaver as it was on a green pole and carried off. Three skins which was left on a tree was taken off by the panthers or wolvers. In deck ending to the point one canoe struck and turned on a rapid and sunk, and wet everything which was in her, this misfortune obliged us to halt at the forks and dry those articles, one other canoe nearly turning over. Filled half full of water and wet our medicin and some goods corn and several hunters out today and killed a young elk, antelope, and three deer, one man Shannon did not return tonight, this evening cool my ankle much worse than it has been, this evening a violent wind from the N. W. accompanied with rain which lasted half an hour wind N. W. Lewis, August 7, 1805. Wednesday, August 7, 1805. The morning being fair we spread our stores to dry at an early hour. Dispatched Reuben Fields in search of Shannon. Our stores were now so much exhausted that we found we could proceed with one canoe less. We therefore drew out one of them into a thicket of brush and secured her in such manner that the water could not take her off should the river rise to the height where she is. The creek which falls in above us we called Turf Creek from the circumstance of its bottoms being composed of excellent turf. My air gun was out of order and her sights had been removed by some exceedant I put her in order and regulated her. She shot again as well as she ever did. The clouds last night prevented my taking any lunar observations this day I took equal altitudes of the zero with sextant. At one o'clock all our baggage was dry we therefore packed it up reloaded the canoes and the party proceeded with Captain Clark up Jefferson's River. I remained with Cirked. Gas to complete the observation of equal altitudes and joined them in the evening at their camp on the Lard. Side just above the entrance of Turf Creek. 
We had a shower of rain which continued about 40 minutes attended with thunder and lightning. This shower wet me perfectly before I reached the camp. The clouds continued during the night in such manner that I was unable to obtain any lunar observations. This evening Druyer brought in a deer which he had killed. We have not heard anything from Shannon yet, we expect that he has pursued Wisdom River upwards for some distance probably killed some heavy animal and is waiting our arrival. The large biting fly or hair fly as they sometimes called are very troublesome to us. I observed two kinds of them a large black species and a small brown species with a green head. The mosquitoes are not as troublesome as they were below, but are still in considerable quantities. The eye gnats have disappeared. The green or blowing flies are still in swarms. Are the courses from the entrance of Wisdom River to the forks of Jefferson's River are taken directly to the objects mentioned and the distance set down is that by land on a direct line between the points. The estimated distances by water is also added in the body of the remarks on each course. Clark, August 7, 1805. August 7, Wednesday, 1805 A fine morning put out our stores and to dry and took equal altitudes with the sextant, as our store were a little exhausted and one canoe became unnecessary determined to leave one. We hauled her up in the bushes on the lower side of the main fork and fastened her so that the water could not float her off. The count ray in this quarter is as follows I, e a valley of five or six miles wide enclosed between two high mountains. The bottom rich some small timber on the islands and bushes on the edges of the river some bogs and very good turf in different places in the valley, some scattering pine and cedar on the mountains in places. Other parts naked except grass and stone the latitude of the mouth of Wisdom River is 45 degrees 2 minutes 21. 6 inch north, we proceeded up the main middle or S, E, fork, past a camp on the lard. Side above the mouth of a bold running stream twelve yards wide, which we call Turf Creek from the number of bogs and quantity of turf in its waters. This creek runs through a open plain for several miles, taking its rise in a high mountain to the N.E. The river Jefferson above Wisdom is gentle crooked and about forty yards wide, containing but little timber, some few cotton willow willow and birch, and the shrubs common to the Count Ray and before mentioned at five o'clock a thunderstorm from the N. W. Accompanied with rain which lasted about forty minutes. Dot, dispatched our fields to hunt Shannon, who was out hunt. On Wisdom River at the time I returned down that stream, and has made on up the river expecting us to follow him up that river one deer killed this evening. All those streams contain immense number of beaver or tear muskrats and Lewis, August 8, 1805. Thursday, August 8, 1805. We had a heavy dew this morning. As one canoe had been left we had now more hats to spear for the chase, game being scarce it requires more hunters to supply us. We therefore dispatched for this morning. We set out at sunrise and continued our route up the river which we find much more gentle and deep than below the entrance of Wisdom River it is from 35 to 45 yards wide very crooked many short bends constituting large and general bends. Insomuch that although we travel briskly and a considerable distance yet it takes us only a few miles on our general course or route. There is but very little timber on this fork principally the underbrush frequently mentioned. I observe a considerable quantity of the buffalo clover in the bottoms. The sunflower, flax, green sward, thistle and several species of the rye grass some of which rise to the height of three or four feet. There is a grass also with a soft smooth leaf that bears its seeds very much like the timothy but it does not grow very luxuriant or appear as if it would answer so well as the common timothy for meadows. I preserved some of its seeds which are now ripe, thinking perhaps it might answer better if cultivated, at all events is at least worth the experiment. It rises about three feet high. On a direct line about two miles above our encampment of this morning we passed the entrance of Philanthropy River which discharges itself by two channels a small distance asunder. This river from its size and s. Eastwardly course no doubt heads with Madison's River in the snowy mountains visible in that direction. At noon Reuben Fields arrived and reported that he had been up Wisdom River some miles above where it entered the mountain and could find nothing of Shannon. 
he had killed a deer and an antelope. Great quantity of beaver otter and muskrats in these rivers. Two of the hunters we sent out this morning returned at noon had killed each a deer and an antelope. We used the setting poles today almost altogether. We encamped on the large sides where there was but little timber were obliged to use willow brush for fuel, the rose bushes and briars were very thick. The hunters brought in another deer this evening. To tumor on Captain. Clark's ankle has discharged a considerable quantity of matter but is still much swollen and inflamed and gives him considerable pain. Saw a number of G's ducks and some cranes today. The former begin to fly. The evening again proved cloudy much to my mortification and prevented my making any lunar observations. The Indian woman recognized the point of a high plain to our right which she informed us was not very distant from the summer retreat of her nation on a river beyond the mountains which runs to the west. This hill she says her nation calls the beaver's head from a conceived remblance of its figure to the head of that animal. She assures us that we shall either find her people on this river or on the river immediately west of its source which from its present size cannot be very distant. As it is now all important with us to meet with those people as soon as possible, I determined to proceed tomorrow with a small party to the source of the principal stream of this river and past the mountains to the Columbia. And down that river until I found the Indians, in short it is my resolution to find them or some others, who have horses if it should cause me a trip of one month. For without horses we shall be obliged to leave a great part of our stores, of which, it appears to me that we have a stock already sufficiently small for the length of the voyage before us. Clark, August 8, 1805. August 8 Thursday, 1805 we proceeded on early wind from the SW. The thermometer at 52 as 0 at sunrise at 5 miles by water and 41 halves on a direct line from the forks we passed a river on the large side 30 yards wide and navigable for some distance taking its rise in the mountains easterly and with the waters of Madison's River. Passes through an extensive valley open and fertile end. This river we call philanthropy, above this river, which has but little timber, Jefferson's are is crooked with short bends a few islands and many gravelly shoals, no large timber, small willow birch and shrubs and. Encamped on the large side, our fields joined us this evening. And informs that he could not find Shannon my foot yet very swore. Lewis, August 9, 1805. Friday, August 9, 1805. The morning was fair and fine. We set out at an early hour and proceeded on very well. Some parts of the river more rapid than yesterday. I walked on shore across the land to a point which I presumed they would reach by 8 a.m. our usual time of halting. By this means I acquired leisure to accomplish some writings which I conceived from the nature of my instructions necessary lest any exceedance should befall me on the long and rather hazardous route I was now about to take. The party did not arrive and I returned about a mile and met them, here they halted and we breakfasted, I had killed two fine G's on my return. While we halted here Shannon arrived. And informed us that having missed the party the day on which he set out he had returned the next morning to the place from whence he had set out or first left them and not finding that he had supposed that they wer above him. That he then set out and marched one day up Wisdom River, by which time he was convinced that they were not above him as the river could not be navigated, he then returned to the forks and had pursued us up this river. He brought the skins of three deer which he had killed which he said were in good order. He had lived very plentifully this trip but looked a good deal worried with his march. He informed us that Wisdom River still kept its course obliquely down the Jefferson's River as far as he was up it. Immediately after breakfast I slung my pack and set out accompanied by Drewyer Shields and McNeil who had been previously directed to hold themselves in readiness for this service. I directed my course across the bottom to the start. Plain lead left the beaver's head about two miles to my left and intercepted the river about eight miles from the point at which I had left it. I then waited it and continued my route to the point where I could observe that it entered the mountain, but not being able to reach that place. Changed my direction to the river which I struck some miles below the mountain and encamped for the evening having traveled 16 m. We passed a handsome little stream formed by some large spring which rise in this wide bottom on the lard. Side of the river. 
We killed two antelopes on our way and brought with us as much meat as was necessary for our suppers and breakfast the next morning. We found this bottom fertile and covered with taller grass than usual. The river very crooked much divided by islands, shallow rocky in many places and very rapid, insomuch that I have my doubts whether the canoes could get on or not, or if they do it must be with great labor. Captain. Clark proceeded after I left him as usual, found the current of the river increasing in rapidity towards evening. His hunters killed two antelopes only. In the evening it clouded up and we experienced a slight rain attended with some thunder and lightning. The mosquitoes very troublesome this evening. There are some soft bogs in these valleys covered with turf. The earth of which this mud is composed is white or bluish white and appears to be argillaceous. Clark, August 9, 1805. August 9, Friday, 1805 A fine morning wind from the N. E. We proceeded on very well rapid places more numerous than below, Shannon the man whom we lost on Wisdom River joined us. Having returned to the forks and prosued us up after prosuring Wisdom River one day. Captain Lewis and three men set out after Braft. To examine the river above, find a portage if possible, also the Snake Indians. I should have taken this trip had I have been able to march, from the raging fury of a turner on my ankle muzzle, in the evening clouded up and a few drops of rain encamped on the large side near a low bluff, the river today as yesterday. The three hunters could kill only two antelopes today, game of every kind sirs. Lewis, August 10, 1805. Saturday, August 10, 1805. We set out very early this morning and continued our route through the wide bottom on the lard. Side of the river after passing a large creek at about five miles we fell in with a plain Indian road which led towards the point that the river entered the mountain we therefore pursued the road I sent Druyer to the right to kill a deer which we saw. Feeding and halted on the river under an immensely high perpendicular cliff of rocks where it entered the mountain here we kindled a fire and waited for Druyer. He arrived in about an hour and a half or at noon with three deer skins and the flesh of one of the best of them, we cooked and eat a hasty meal and departed. Returning a shot distance to the Indian road which led us the best way over the mountains. Which are not very high but are rugged and approached the river closely on both sides just below these mountains I saw several bald eagles and two large white-headed fishing hawks both these birds were the same common to our country. From the number of rattlesnakes about the cliffs at which we halted we called them the rattlesnake cliffs. This serpent is the same before described with oval spots of yellowish brown. The river below the mountains is rapid rocky, very crooked, much divided by islands and withal shallow. After it enters the mountains its bends are not so circuitous and its general course more direct, but it is equally shallow less divided more rocky and rapid. We continued our route along the Indian road which led us sometimes over the hills and again in the narrow bottoms of the river till at the distance of 15 ms. From the rattlesnake cliffs we arrived in a handsome open and level valley where the river divided itself nearly into two equal branches. Here I halted and examined those streams and readily discovered from their size that it would be vain to attempt the navigation of either any further. Here also the road forked one leading up the valley of each of these streams. I therefore sent Drewer on one and Shields on the other to examine these roads for a short distance and to return and compare their information with respect to the size and apparent plainness of the roads as I was now determined to pursue that which appeared to have been the most traveled this spring. In the meantime I wrote a note to Captain Clark informing him of the occurrences which had taken place. Recommending it to him to halt at this place until my return and informing him of the route I had taken which from the information of the men on their return seemed to be in favor of the SW or left hand fork which is rether the smallest. Accordingly I put up my note on a dry willow pole at the forks, and set out up the S.E. Fork, after proceeding about eleven halves miles I discovered that the road became so blind that it could not be that which we had followed to the forks of Jefferson's River. Neither could I find the tracks of the horses which had passed early in the spring along the other. I therefore determined to return and examine the other myself, which I did, and found that the same horses had passed up the west fork which was rether largest, and more in the direction that I wished to pursue. 
I therefore did not hesitate about changing my route but determined to take the western road. I now wrote a second note to Captain C, informing him of this change and sent Druyer to put it with the other at the forks and waited until he returned. There is scarcely any timber on the river above the R, Snake Cliffs, nor is there anything larger than willow brush inside of these forks. Immediately in the level plain between the forks and about one half a mile distance from them stands a high rocky mountain, the base of which is surrounded by the level plain, it has a singular appearance. The mountains do not appear very high in any direction though the tops of some of them are partially covered with snow. This convinces me that we have ascended to a great height since we have entered the Rocky Mountains, yet the ascent has been so gradual along the valleys that it was scarcely perceptible by land. I do not believe that the world can furnish an example of a river running to the extent which the Missouri and Jefferson's rivers do through such a mountainous country and at the same time so navigable as they are. If the Columbia furnishes us such another example, a communication across the continent by water will be practicable and safe. But this I can scarcely hope from a knowledge of its having in it comparatively short course to the ocean the same number of feet to deck end which the Missouri and Mississippi have from this point to the Gulf of Mexico. The valley of the West Fork through which we passed for four miles bore a little to N of west and was about one mile wide hemmed in on either side by rough mountain and steep cliffs of rock at forty-one to two miles this stream enters a beautiful and extensive plain about ten miles long and from five to six in width. This plain is surrounded on all sides by a country of rolling or high wavy plains through which several little rivulets extend their wide valleys quite to the mountains which surround the whole in an apparent circular manner. Forming one of the handsomest coves I ever saw, of about 16 or 18 miles in diameter. Just after entering this cove the river bends to the end, west and runs close under the starred. Hills. Here we killed a deer and encamped on the starred sighed and made our fire of dry willow brush, the only fuel which the country produces. There are not more than three or four cottonwood trees in this extensive cove and they are but small. The uplands are covered with prickly pears and twisted or bearded grass and are but poor, some parts of the bottom lands are covered with grass and tolerably fertile. But much the greater proportion is covered with prickly pears sedge twisted grass the pulpy leaf thorn southernwood wild sage and and like the uplands is very inferior in point of soil. We traveled by estimate 30 ms. Today, that is 10 to the rattlesnake cliff, 15 to the forks of Jefferson's River and 5 to our camp in the cove. At the apparent extremity of the bottom above us two perpendicular cliffs of considerable height stand on either side of the river in Appers at this distance like a gate, it is about 10 m, due west. Captain Clark set out at sunrise this morning and pursued his route, found the river not rapid but shallow also very crooked. They were obliged to drag the canoes over many riffles in the course of the day. They passed the point which the natives call the beaver's head. It is a steep rocky cliff of 150 feet high near the starred side of the river, opposite to it at the distance of 300 yards is a low cliff of about 50 feet which is the extremity of a spur of the mountains about 4 miles distant on Lard. At 4 p.m. They experienced a heavy shower of rain attended with hail thunder and lightning which continued about an hour. The men defended themselves from the hail by means of the willow bushes but all the party got perfectly wet. After the shower was over they pursued their march and encamped on the starred side only one deer killed by their hunters today. Though they took up another by the way which had been killed three days before by Joss Fields and hung up near the river. Clark, August 10, 1805 August 10th Saturday 1805 Some rain this morning at sunrise and cloudy we proceeded on past a remarkable clift point on the starred. Side about 150 feet high, this cliff the Indians call the beaver's head, opposite at 300 yards is a low cliff of 50 feet which is a spur from the mountain on the lard. About 4 miles, the river very crooked, at 4 o'clock a hard rain from the SW accompanied with hail continued half an hour, all wet, the men sheltered themselves from the hail with bushes we encamped on the starred side near a bluff. Only one deer killed today, the one killed Joe Fields three days past and hung up we made use of river narrow, and showly but not rapid. Lewis, August 11, 
1805. Sunday, August 11th, 1805. We set out very early this morning, but the track which we had pursued last evening soon disappeared. I therefore resolved to proceed to the narrow pass on the creek about ten miles west in hopes that I should again find the Indian road at the place. Accordingly I passed the river which was about twelve yards wide and bared in several places entirely across by beaver dams and proceeded through the level plain directly to the pass. I now sent Druyer to keep near the creek to my right and Shields to my left, with orders to search for the road which if they found they were to notify me by placing a hat in the muzzle of their gun. I kept McNeil with me. After having marched in this order for about five miles I discovered an Indian on horseback about two miles distant coming down the plain toward us. With my glass I discovered from his dress that he was of a different nation from any that we had yet seen, and was satisfied of his being a Soson. His arms were a bow and quiver of arrows, and was mounted on an elegant horse without a saddle, and a small string which was attached to the under jaw of the horse which answered as a bridle. I was overjoyed at the sight of this stranger and had no doubt of obtaining a friendly introduction to his nation provided I could get near enough to him to convince him of our being white men. I therefore proceeded towards him at my usual pace. When I had arrived within about a mile he mad a halt which I did also and unloosing my blanket from my pack, I mad him the signal of friendship known to the Indians of the Rocky Mountains and those of the Missouri which is by holding the mantle or robe in your hands at two corners and then throwing up in the air higher than the head bringing it to the earth as if in the act of spreading it, thus repeating three times. This signal of the robe has arisen from a custom among all those nations of spreading a robe or skin for their jests to set on when they are visited. This signal had not the desired effect, he still kept his position and seemed to view Druyer and Shields who were now commoning in sight on either hand with an air of suspicion. I would willingly have made them halt but they were too far distant to hear me and I feared to make any signal to them lest it should increase the suspicion in the mind of the Indian of our having some unfriendly design upon him. I therefore hastened to take out of my sack some beads a looking glass and a few trinkets which I had brought with me for this purpose and leaving my gun and pouch with McNeil advanced unarmed towards him. He remained in the same steadfast posture until I arrived in about two hundred paces of him when he turned his hose about and began to move off slowly from me. I now called to him in as loud a voice as I could command repeating the word tabie bone, which in their language signifies white man. But looking over his shoulder he still kept his eye on Druyer and Shields who wer still advancing neither of them having Sega City enough to recollect the impropriety of advancing when they saw me thus in parley with the Indian. I now made a signal to these men to halt, Druyer obeyed but Shields who afterwards told me that he did not perceive the signal still kept on the Indian halted again and turned his horse about as if to wait for me. And I believe he would have remained until I came up with him had it not been for Shields who still pressed forward. WHE I arrived within about 150 paces I again repeated the word tabie bone and held up the trinkets in my hands and striped up my shirt sieve to give him an opportunity of seeing the color of my skin and advanced leisure towards him but he did not remain until I got nearer than about 100 paces when he suddenly turned his hose about. Gave him the whip leaped the creek and disappeared in the willow brush in an instant and with him vanished all my hopes of obtaining horses for the present. I now felt quite as much mortification and disappointment as I had pleasure and expectation at the first sight of this Indian. I felt sorely chagrined at the conduct of the men particularly Shields to whom I principally attributed this failure in obtaining an introduction to the natives. I now called the men to me and could not forbear abrading them a little for their want of attention and imprudence on this occasion. They had neglected to bring my spyglass which in highest I had droped in the plain with the blanket where I made the signal before mentioned. I sent Druyer and Shields back to search it, they soon found it and rejoined me. We now set out on the track of the horse hoping by that means to be lead to an Indian camp. The trail of inhabitants of which should they abscond we should probably be enabled to pursue to the body of the nation to which they would most probably fly for safety. This route led us across a large island framed by nearly an equal division of the creek in this bottom, after passing to the open ground on the end side of the creek we observed that the track made out toward the high hills about 3 m. Distant in that direction. I thought it probable that their camp might probably be among those hills and that they would reconnoiter us from the tops of them, 
and that if we advanced hastily towards them that they would become all armed and probably run off. I therefore halted in an elevated situation near the creek had a fire kindled of willow brush cooked and took breakfast. During this leisure I prepared a small assortment of trinkets consisting of some moccasin awls a few strands of several kinds of beads some paint a looking glass and which I attached to the end of a pole and planted it near our fire in order that should the Indians return in search of us they might from this token discover that we were friendly and white persons. Before we had finest our meal a heavy shower of rain came on with some hail which continued about twenty minutes and wet us to the skin. After this shower we pursued the track of the horse but as the rain had raised the grass which he had trodden down it was with difficulty that we could follow it. We pursued it however about four miles at turning up the valley to the left under the foot of the hills. We passed several places where the Indians appeared to have been digging roots today and saw the fresh tracks of eight or ten horses but they had been wandering about in such a confused manner that we not only lost the track of the hose which we had been pursuing but could make nothing of them. In the head of this valley we passed a large bog covered with tall grass and moss in which were a great number of springs of cold pure water. We now turned a little to the left along the foot of the high hills and arrived at a small branch on which we encamped for the night, having traveled in different directions about twenty miles and about ten from the camp of last evening on a direct line. After meeting with the Indian today I fixed a small flag of the ewes. To a pole which I made McNeil carry. And planted in the ground where we halted or encamped. This morning Captain Clark dispatched several hunters ahead. The morning being rainy and wet did not set out until after an early breakfast. He passed a large island which he called the Three Thousand Mile Island from the circumstance of its being that distance from the entrance of the Missouri by water. A considerable proportion of the bottom on lard. Side is a bog covered with tall grass and many parts would afford fine turf, the bottom is about 8 ms. Wide and the plains which succeeded on either side extend about the same distance to the base of the mountains. They passed a number of small islands and bayous on both sides which cut and intersect the bottoms in various directions. Found the river shallow and rapid, insomuch that the men wer compelled to be in the water a considerable proportion of the day in dredging the canoes over the shoals and riffles. They saw a number of geese, ducks, beaver, and otter, also some deer and antelopes. The men killed a beaver with a setting pole and tomahawked several otter. The hunters killed three deer and an antelope. Captain C. Observed some bunches of privy near the river. There are but few trees in this bottom and those small narrow-leafed cottonwood. The principal growth is willow with the narrow leaf and currant bushes. They encamped this evening on the upper point of a large island near the Stard. Shore. Clark, August 11th, 1805. August 11th Sunday, 1805. A shower of rain this morning at sunrise, cloudy all the morning wind from the SW past a large island which I call the 3000 Mile Island as it is situated that distance from the mouth of the Missouri by water. A number of small bayos running in different directions through the bottom, which is about five miles wide, then rises to an elevated plain on each side which extends as far. Past several small islands and a number of bayos on each side and encamped on the upper point of a large island, our hunters killed three deer, one antelope, and tomahawked several ortaire today killed one beaver with a setting pole. I observed some bunches of privy on the banks. Lewis, August 12, 1805. Monday, August 12th, 1805 this morning I sent Druyer out as soon as it was light, to try and discover what route the Indians had taken. He followed the track of the horse we had pursued yesterday to the mountain where it had ascended, and returned to me in about an hour and a half. I now determined to pursue the base of the mountains which form this cove to the S.W. In the expectation of finding some Indian road which lead over the mountains. Accordingly I sent Druyer to my right and Shields to my left with orders to look out for a road or the fresh tracks of horses either of which we should first meet with I had determined to pursue. At the distance of about four miles we passed four small rivulets near each other on which we saw some resent bowers or small conic lodges formed with willow brush. Near them the Indians had gathered a number of roots from the manner in which they had torn up the ground 
but I could not discover the route which they seemed to be in search of. I saw several large hawks that were nearly black near this place we fell in with a large and plain Indian road which came into the cove from the N, E, and led along the foot of the mountains to the S, W. Obliquely approaching the main stream which we had left yesterday. This road we now pursued to the S, W. At five miles it passed a stout stream which is a principal fork of the man stream and falls into it just above the narrow pass between the two cliffs before mentioned and which we now saw below us. Here we halted and breakfasted on the last of our venison, having yet a small pace of pork in resive. After eating we continued our route through the low bottom of the main stream along the foot of the mountains on our right the valley for 5 mes. Further in as, w, direction was from 2 to 3 miles wide the main stream now after discarding two stream on the left in this valley turns abruptly to the west through a narrow bottom bet when the mountains. The road was still plain. I therefore did not despair of shortly finding a passage over the mountains and of tasting the waters of the great Columbia this evening. We saw an animal which we took to be of the fox kind as large or wreath or larger than the small wolf of the plains. Its colors were a curious mixture of black, reddish brown and yellow. Druyo shot at him about 130 yards and knocked him down bet he recovered and got out of our reach. It is certainly a different animal from any that we have yet seen. We also saw several of the heath cock with a long pointed tail and an uniform dark brown color but could not kill one of them. They are much larger than the common dunghill fowls, and in their habits and manner of flying resemble the grouse or prairie hen. At the distance of four miles further the road took us to the most distant fountain of the waters of the mighty Missouri in search of which we have spent so many toilsome days and restless nights. Thus far I had accomplished one of those great objects on which my mind has been unalterably fixed for many years. Judge then of the pleasure I felt in allying my thirst with this pure and ice-cold water which issues from the base of a low mountain or hill of a gentle ascent for one half a mile. The mountains are high on either hand leave this gap at the head of this rivulet through which the road passes. Here I halted a few minutes and rested myself. Two miles below McNeil had exultingly stood with a foot on each side of this little rivulet and thanked his God that he had lived to bestride the mighty and heretofore deemed endless Missouri. After refreshing ourselves we proceeded on to the top of the dividing ridge from which I discovered immense ranges of high mountains still to the west of us with their tops partially covered with snow. I now deck-ended the mountain about three-quarters of a mile which I found much steeper than on the opposite side, to a handsome bold running creek of cold clear water. Here I first tasted the water of the Great Columbia River. After a short halt of a few minutes we continued our march along the Indian road which lead us over steep hills and deep hollows to a spring on the side of a mountain where we found a sufficient quantity of dry willow brush for fuel. Here we encamped for the night having traveled about twenty miles. As we had killed nothing during the day we now boiled and eat the remainder of our pork, having yet a little flour and parched meal. At the creek on this side of the mountain I observed a species of deep purple current lower in its growth, the stem more branched and leaf doubly as large as that of the Missouri. The leaf is covered on its under disc with a hairy puberscence. The fruit is of the ordinary size and shape of the current and is supported in the usual manner, but is acid and very inferior in point of flavor. This morning Captain Clark set out early. Found the river shoaly, rapid shallow, and extremely difficult. The men in the water almost all day. They are getting weak sore and much fatigued. They complained of the fatigue to which the navigation subjected them and wished to go by land Captain C. encouraged them and pacified them. One of the canoes was very near oversetting in a rapid today. They proceeded but slowly. At noon they had a thunderstorm which continued about half an hour. Their hunters killed three deer and a fawn. They encamped in a smoth plain near a few cottonwood trees on the lard. Side. Clark, August 12, 1805. August 12 Monday, 1805 we set out early, wind and e, proceeded on past several large islands and three small ones. 
the river much more shoaly than below which obliges us to haul the canoes over those shoals which succeed each other at short intervals immensely laborious men much fatigued and weakened by being continually in the water drawing the canoes over the shoals encamped on the large side men complain very much of the immense labor they are obliged to undergo and wish much to leave the river. I pacify them. The weather cool, and nothing to eat but venison, the hunters killed three deer today. Lewis, August 13, 1805. Tuesday, August 13, 1805. We set out very early on the Indian road which still led us through an open broken country in a westerly direction. A deep valley appeared to our left at the base of a high range of mountains which extended from S, E, to N, W. Having their sides better clad with pine timber than we had been accustomed to see the mountains and their tops were also partially covered with snow. At the distance of five miles the road after leading us down a long deck-ending valley for two ms. Brought us to a large creek about ten yards wide. This we passed and on rising the hill beyond it had a view of a handsome little valley to our left of about a mile in width through which from the appearance of the timber I conjectured that a river passed. I saw near the creek some bushes of the white maple, the shoemate of the small species with the winged rib. And a species of honeysuckle much in its growth and leaf like the small honeysuckle of the Missouri only wreather larger and bears a globular berry as large as a garden pea and as white as wax. This berry is formed of a thin smooth pellicle which envelops a soft white mucilaginous substance in which there are several small brown seed irregularly scattered or intermixed without any cell or perceptible membranous covering. We had proceeded about four miles through a wavy plain parallel to the valley or river bottom when at the distance of about a mile we saw two women, a man and some dogs on an eminence immediately before us. They appeared to view us with attention and two of them after a few minutes sat down as if to wait our arrival we continued our usual pace towards them. When we had arrived within half a mile of them I directed the party to halt and leaving my pack and rifle I took the flag which I unfurled and advanced singly towards them the women soon disappeared behind the hill. The man continued until I arrived within a hundred yards of him and then likewise absconded. Though I frequently repeated the word tabie bone sufficiently loud for him to have heard it. I now hastened to the top of the hill where they had stood but could see nothing of them. The dogs were less shy than their masters they came about me pretty close I therefore thought of tying a handkerchief about one of their necks with some beads and other trinkets and then let them loose to search their fugitive owners thinking by. This means to convince them of our pacific disposition towards them but the dogs would not suffer me to take hold of them. They also soon disappeared. I now made a signal for the men to come on, they joined me and we pursued the back tark of these Indians which lead us along the same road which we had been traveling. The road was dusty and appeared to have been much traveled lately both by men and horses. These prairies are very poor the soil is of a light yellow clay, intermixed with small smooth gravel, and produces little else but prickly pears, and bearded grass about three inches high. The prickly pear are of three species that with a broad leaf common to the Missouri, that of a globular form also common to the upper part of the Missouri and more especially after it enters the Rocky Mountains, also a third peculiar to this country. It consists of small circular thick leaves with a much greater number of thorns. These thorns are stronger and appear to be barbed. The leaves grow from the margins of each other as in the broad-leafed pear of the Missouri, but are so slightly attached that when the thorn touches your mockers and it adheres and brings with it the leaf covered in every direction with many others. This is much the most troublesome plant of the three. We had not continued our route more than a mile when we were so fortunate as to meet with three female savages. The short and steep ravines which we passed concealed us from each other until we arrived within thirty paces. A young woman immediately took to flight, an elderly woman and a girl of about twelve years old remained. I instantly laid by my gun and advanced towards them. They appeared much all armed but saw that we were too near for them to escape by flight they therefore seated themselves on the ground, holding down their heads as if reconciled to die which the expected no doubt would be their fate. I took the elderly woman by the hand and raised her up repeated the word tababone and strip up my shirt sieve to sew her my skin. 
to prove to her the truth of the assertion that I was a white man for my face and hads which have been constantly exposed to the sun were quite as dark as their own. They appeared instantly reconciled, and the men coming up I gave these women some beads a few mockers and all some pewter looking glasses and a little paint. I directed Druyer to request the old woman to recall the young woman who had run off to some distance by this time fearing she might all arm the camp before we approached and might so exasperate the natives that they would perhaps attack us without inquiring who we were. The old woman did as she was requested and the fugitive soon returned almost out of breath. I bestowed an equivalent portion of trinket on her with the others. I now painted their tawny cheeks with some vermilion which with this nation is emblematic of peace. After they had become composed I informed them by signs that I wished them to conduct us to their camp that we were anxious to become acquainted with the chiefs and warriors of their nation. They readily obeyed and we set out, still pursuing the road down the river. We had marched about two miles when we met a party of about sixty warriors mounted on excellent horses who came in nearly full speed, when they arrived I advanced towards them with the flag leaving my gun with the party about fifty paces behind me. The chief and two others who were a little in advance of the main body spoke to the women. And they informed them who we were and exultingly shewed the presents which had been given them these men then advanced and embraced me very affectionately in their way which is by putting their left arm over your right shoulder clasping your back. While they apply their left cheek to yours and frequently vociferate the word ah hi e, and hi e that is, I am much pleased, I am much rejoiced. Boda parties now advanced and we wer all cursed and besmeared with their grease and paint till I was heartily tired of the national hug. I now had the pipe lit and gave them smoke. They seated themselves in a circle around us and pulled of their moccasins before they would receive or smoke the pipe. This is a custom among them as I afterwards learned indicative of a sacred obligation of sincerity in their profession of friendship given by the act of receiving and smoking the pipe of a stranger. Or which is as much as to say that they wish they may always go barefoot if they are not sincere, a pretty heavy penalty if they are to march through the plains of their country. After smoking a few pipes with them I distributed some trifles among them, with which they seemed much pleased particularly with the blue beads and vermilion. I now informed the chief that the object of our visit was a friendly one, that after we should reach his camp I would undertake to explain to him fully those objects, who we were, from whence we had come and whither we were going. That in the meantime I did not care how soon we were in motion, as the sun was very warm and no water at hand. They now put on their moccasins, and the principal chief C.A. Miawait made a short speech to the warriors. I gave him the flag which I informed him was an emblem of peace among white men and now that it had been received by him it was to be respected as the bond of union between us. I desired him to march on, which did and we followed him. The dragoons moved on in squadron in our rear. After we had marched about a mile in this order he halted them on gave a second harangue after which six or eight of the young men rode forward to their encampment and no further regularity was observed in the order of march. I afterwards understood that the Indians we had first seen this morning had returned and all armed the camp. These men had come out armed cap a P.E. for action expecting to meet with their enemies the minotaurs of Fort de Prairie whom they call Rockies. They were armed with bows arrow and shield except three whom I observed with small pieces such as the N.W. Company furnished the natives with which they had obtained from the Rocky Mountain Indians on the Yellowstone River with whom they are at peace. On our arrival at their encampment on the river in a handsome level and fertile bottom at the distance of 4 ms. From where we had first met them they introduced us to a lodge made of willow brush and an old leather lodge which had been prepared for our reception by the young men which the chief had dispatched for that purpose. Here we were seated on green boughs and the skins of antelopes. One of the warriors then pulled up the grass in the center of the lodge forming a small circle of about two feet in diameter the chief next produced his pipe and native tobacco and began a long ceremony of the pipe when we were requested to take of our moccasins. The chief having previously taken off his as well as all the warriors present. This we complied with. The chief then lit his pipe at the fire kindled in this little magic circle. 
and standing on the opposite side of the circle uttered a speech of several minutes in length at the conclusion of which he pointed the stem to the four cardinal points of the heavens first beginning at the east and ending with the north. He now presented the pipe to me as if desirous that I should smoke, but when I reached my hand to receive it, he drew it back and repeated the same cremony three times. After which he pointed the stern first to the heavens then to the center of the magic circle smoked himself with three whiffs and held the pipe until I took as many as I thought proper. He then held it to each of the white persons and then gave it to be consumed by his warriors. This pipe was made of a dense semi-transparent green stone very highly polished about twenty-one halves inches long and of an oval figure, the bowl being in the same direction with the stem. A small piece of burned clay is placed in the bottom of the bowl to separate the tobacco from the end of the stem and is of an irregularly rounded figure not fitting the tube perfectly closed in order that the smoke may pass. This is the form of the pipe. Their tobacco is of the same kind of that used by the Minotaurs Mandans and Ricares of the Missouri. The Shoshones do not cultivate this plant, but obtain it from the Rocky Mountain Indians and some of the bands of their own nation who live further south. I now explain to them the objects of our journey and all the women and children of the camp were shortly collected about the lodge to indulge themselves with looking at us, we being the first white persons they had ever seen. After the ceremony of the pipe was over I distributed the remainder of the small articles I had brought with me among the women and children. By this time it was late in the evening and we had not tasted any food since the evening before. The chief informed us that they had nothing but berries to eat and gave us some cakes of service berries and choke cherries which had been dried in the sun. Of these I made a hearty meal, and then walked to the river, which I found about forty yards wide very rapid clear and about three feet deep. The banks low and abrupt as those of the upper part of the Missouri, and the bed formed of loose stones and gravel. Kamiwait informed me that this stream discharged itself into another doubly as large at the distance of half a day's march which came from the S.W. But he added on further inquiry that there was but little more timber below the junction of those rivers than I saw here, and that the river was confined between inaccessible mountains. Was very rapid and rocky insomuch that it was impossible for us to pass either by land or water down this river to the great lake where the white men lived as he had been informed. This was unwelcome information but I still hoped that this account had been exaggerated with a view to detain us among them. As to timber I could discover not any that would answer the purpose of constructing canoes or in short more than was barely necessary for fuel consisting of the narrow-leafed cottonwood and willow. Also the red willow choke cherry service berry and a few currant bushes such as were common on the Missouri. These people had been attacked by the Minetares of Fort de Prairie this spring and about twenty of them killed and taken prisoners. On this occasion they lost a great part of their horses and all their lodges except that which they had erected for our accommodation, they were now living in lodges of a conic figure made of willow brush. I still observe a great number of horses feeding in every direction around their camp and therefore entertain but little doubt but we shall be enabled to furnish ourselves with an adequate number to transport our stores even if we are compelled to travel by land over these mountains. On my return to my lodge an Indian called me into his bower and gave me a small morsel of the flesh of an antelope boiled, and a pace of a fresh salmon roasted, both which I eat with a very good relish. This was the first salmon I had seen and perfectly convinced me that we were on the waters of the Pacific Ocean. The course of this river is a little to the north of west as far as I can discover it. And is bounded on each side by a range of high mountains. Though those on the east side are lowest and more distant from the river. This evening the Indians entertained us with their dancing nearly all night. At twelve o'clock. I grew sleepy and retired to rest leaving the men to amuse themselves with the Indians. I observe no essential difference between the music and manner of dancing among this nation and those of the Missouri. I was several times awoke in the course of the night by their yells but was too much fatigued to be deprived of a tolerable sound night's repose. This morning Captain Clark set out early having previously dispatched some hunters ahead. It was cool and cloudy all the forepart of the day. At 8 a.m. they had a slight rain. They passed a number of shoals over which they were obliged to drag the canoes, the men in the water 3-4 ths of the day, they passed a bold running stream 7 yards. 
wide on the lard. Side just below a high point of limestone rocks. This stream we call McNeil's Creek after Hugh McNeil one of our party. This creek heads in the mountains to the east and forms a handsome valley for some miles between the mountains. From the top of this limestone cliff above the creek the beavers head born north 24 degrees east, 12 mis the course of Wisdom River, or that which the opening of its valley makes through the mountains is n, 25 w. To the gap through which Jefferson's River enters the mountains above is south 18 degrees west 10 m, they killed one deer only today. Saw a number of otter some beaver antelopes ducks geese and grains. They caught a number of fine trout as they have every day since I left them. They encamped on LRD in a smooth level prairie near a few cottonwood trees, but were obliged to make use of the dry willow brush for fuel. Clark, August 13, 1805 August 13, Tuesday, 1805 A very cool morning the thermometer stood at 52 as zero all the fore part of the day. Cloudy at eight o'clock a mist of rain we proceeded on past innumerable shoals obliged to haul the boat three quarters of the day over the shoal water. Past the mouth of a bold running stream seven yards wide on the large side below a high point of limestone rocks on the starred side this creek heads in the mountains to the east and forms a valley between two mountains. Call this stream McNeil Creek from the top of this rock the point of the beaver head hill bears n, 24 degrees east 12 milliseconds. The course of the Wisdom River is, N, 25 W. The gap at the place the river passes through a mountain in advance is, S, 18 degrees west, 10 milliseconds. Proceeded on and encamped on the large side no wood except dry willows and them small, one deer killed today. The river obliges the men to undergo great fatigue and labor in hauling the canoes over the shoals in the cold water naked. Lewis, August 14, 1805. Wednesday, August 14, in order to give Captain Clark time to reach the forks of Jefferson's River, I concluded to spend this day at the Shoshone camp and obtain what information I could with respect to the country. As we had nothing but a little flour and parched meal to eat except the berries with which the Indians furnished us, I directed Druyer and Shields to hunt a few hours and try to kill something. The Indians furnished them with horses, and most of their young men also turned out to hunt. The game which they principally hunt is the antelope which they pursue on horseback and shoot with their arrows. This animal is so extremely fleet and durable that a single horse has no possible chance to overtake them or run them down. The Indians are therefore obliged to have recourse to stratagem when they discover a herd of the antelope they separate and scatter themselves to the distance of five or six miles in different directions around them generally selecting some. Commanding eminence for a stand. Some one or two now pursue the herd at full speed over the hills values gullies and the sides of precipices that are tremendous to view. Thus after ruining them from five to six or seven miles the fresh horses that were in waiting head them and drive them back pursuing them as far or perhaps further quite to the other extreme of the hunters who now in turn pursue on their fresh horses. Thus worrying the poor animal down and finally killing them with their arrows. Forty or fifty hunters will be engaged for half a day in this manner and perhaps not kill more than two or three antelopes. They have but few elk or black-tailed deer, and the common red deer they cannot take as they secrete themselves in the brush when pursued. And they have only the bow and arrow which is a very slender dependence for killing any game except such as they can run down with their horses. I was very much entertained with a view of this Indian chase it was after a herd of about ten antelope and about twenty hunters. It lasted about two hours and considerable part of the chase in view from my tent. About 1 a.m. The hunters returned had not killed a single antelope, and their horses foaming with sweat. My hunters returned soon after and had been equally unsuccessful. I now directed McNeil to make me a little paste with the flour and added some berries to it which I found very palatable. The means I had of communicating with these people was by way of Druyer who understood perfectly the common language of gesticulation or signs which seems to be universally understood by all the nations we have yet seen. It is true that this language is imperfect and liable to error but is much less so than would be expected. The strong parts of the ideas are seldom mistaken. I now prevailed on the chief to instruct me with respect to the geography of his country. 
This he undertook very cheerfully, by delineating the rivers on the ground. But I soon found that his information fell far short of my expectation or wishes. He drew the river on which we now are to which he placed two branches just above us, which he shewed me from the openings of the mountains were in view, he next made it discharge itself into a large river which flowed from the S. W. About ten miles below us, then continued this joint stream in the same direction of this valley or N. W. For one day's march and then inclined it to the west for two more days' march, here he placed a number of beeps of sand on each side which he informed me represented the vast mountains of rock eternally covered with snow through which the river passed. That the perpendicular and even juting rocks so closely hemmed in the river that there was no possibility of passing along the shore. That the bed of the river was obstructed by sharp pointed rocks and the rapidity of the stream such that the whole surface of the river was beat into perfect foam as far as the eye could reach. That the mountains were also inaccessible to man or horse. He said that this being the state of the country in that direction that himself nor none of his nation had ever been further down the river than these mountains. I then inquired the state of the country on either side of the river but he could not inform me. He said there was an old man of his nation a day's march below who could probably give me some information of the country to the N. W. and referred me to an old man then present for that to the S. W. The chief further informed me that he had understood from the pursed nosed Indians who inhabit this river below the rocky mountains that it ran a great way toward the setting sun and finally lost itself in a great lake of water which was Illy Tystad. And where the white men lived. I next commenced my inquiries of the old man to whom I had been referred for information relative to the country S.W. of us. This he depicted with horrors and obstructions scarcely inferior to that just mentioned. He informed me that the band of this nation to which he belonged resided at the distance of twenty days' march from hence not far from the white people with whom they traded for horses mules cloth metal beads and the shells which they wore as ornament. Being those of a species of pearl oyster. That the course to his relations was a little to the west of south. That in order to get to his relations the first seven days we should be obliged to climb over steep and rocky mountains where we could find no game to kill nor anything but roots such as a first and warlike nation lived on whom he called the broken mockersons or mockersons with holes. And said inhabited those mountains and lived like the bear of other countries among the rocks and fed on roots or the flesh of such horses as they could take or steal from those who passed through their country. That in passing this country the feet of our horses would be so much wounded with the stones many of them would give out. The next part of the route was about ten days through a dry and parched sandy desert in which no food at this season for either man or horse, and in which we must suffer if not perish for the want of water. That the sun had now dried up the little pools of water which exist through this desert plain in the spring season and had also scorched all the grass. That no animal inhabited this plain on which we could hope to subsist. That about the center of this plain a large river passed from S. E. to N. W., which was navigable but afforded neither salmon nor timber. That beyond this plain the or four days march his relations lived in a country tolerable fertile and partially covered with timber on another large river which ran in the same direction of the former. That this last discharged itself into a large river on which many numerous nations lived with whom his relations were at war but whether this last discharged itself into the great lake or not he did not know. That from his relations it was yet a great distance to the great or stinking lake as they call the ocean. That the way which such of his nation as had been to the stinking lake traveled was up the river on which they lived and over to that on which the white people lived which last they knew discharged itself into the ocean. And that this was the way which he would advise me to travel if I was determined to proceed to the ocean but would advise me to put off the journey until the next spring when he would conduct me. I thanked him for his information and advice and gave him a knife with which he appeared to be much gratified. From this narrative I was convinced that the streams of which he had spoken as running through the plains and that on which his relations lived were southern branches of the Columbia, heading with the rivers Apostles and Colorado. And that the route he had pointed out was to the Vermilion Sea or Gulf of California. I therefore told him that this route was more to the south than I wished to travel, and requested to know if there was no route on the left of this river on which we now are, by means of which I could intercept it below the mountains through which it passes. 
but he could not inform me of any except that of the barren plain which he said joined the mountain on that side and through which it was impossible for us to pass at this season even if we were fortunate enough to escape from the broken moccasin. Indians. I now asked Kamiwait by what route the pierced-nosed Indians, who he informed me inhabited this river below the mountains, came over to the Missouri. This he informed me was to the north but added that the road was a very bad one as he had been informed by them and that they had suffered excessively with hunger on the route being obliged to subsist for many days on berries alone as there was no game in that part of the mountains which were broken rocky and so thickly covered with timber that they could scarcely pass. However knowing that Indians had passed, and did pass, at this season on that side of this river to the same below the mountains, my route was instantly settled in my own mind. Provided the account of this river should prove true on an investigation of it, which I was determined should be made before we would undertake the route by land in any direction. I felt perfectly satisfied, that if the Indians could pass these mountains with their women and children, that we could also pass them. And that if the nations on this river below the mountains were as numerous as they were stated to be that they must have some means of subsistence which it would be equally in our power to procure in the same country. They informed me that there was no buffalo on the west side of these mountains, that the game consisted of a few elk deer and antelopes, and that the natives subsisted on fish and roots principally. In this manner I spent the day smoking with them and acquiring what information I could with respect to their country. They informed me that they could pass to the Spaniards by the way of the Yellowstone River in ten days. I can discover that these people are by no means friendly to the Spaniard their complaint is, that the Spaniards will not let them have firearms and ammunition. That they put them off by telling them that if they suffer them to have guns they will kill each other, thus leaving them defenseless and an easy prey to their bloodthirsty neighbors to the east of them. Who being in possession of firearms hunt them up and murder them without respect to sex or age and plunder them of their horses on all occasions. They told me that to avoid their enemies who were eternally harassing them that they were obliged to remain in the interior of these mountains at least two-thirds of the year where the suffered as we then saw great hardships for the want of food. Sometimes living for weeks without meat and only a little fish roots and berries. But this added Kamiwait, with his first eyes and lank jaws grown meager for the want of food, would not be the case if we had guns. We could then live in the country of buffalo and eat as our enemies do and not be compelled to hide ourselves in these mountains and live on roots and berries as the bear do. We do not fear our enemies when placed on an equal footing with them. I told them that the Minotaurs Mandans and Rekars of the Missouri had promised us to desist from making war on them and that we would in devour to find the means of making the Minotaurs of Fort D. Prairie or as they call them Pockies desist from waging war against them also. That after our finally returning to our homes towards the rising sun white men would come to them with an abundance of guns and every other article necessary to their defense and comfort. And that they would be enabled to supply themselves with these articles on reasonable terms in exchange for the skins of the beaver otter and ermine so abundant in their country. They expressed great pleasure at this information and said they had been long anxious to see the white men that traded guns and that we might rest assured of their friendship and that they would do whatever we wished them. I now told Kamiwait that I wished him to speak to his people and engage them to go with me tomorrow to the forks of Jefferson's River where our baggage was by this time arrived with another chief and a large party of white men who would wait my return at that place. That I wished them to take with them about thirty spare horses to transport our baggage to this place where we would then remain some time among them and trade with them for horses and finally concert our future plans for getting on to the ocean and of the trade which would be extended to them after our return to our homes. He complied with my request and made a lengthy harangue to his village. He returned in about an hour and a half and informed me that they would be ready to accompany me in the morning. I promised to reward them for their trouble. Druyer who had had a good view of their horses estimated them at four hundred. Most of them are fine horses. Indeed many of them would make a figure on the south side of James River or the land of fine horses. I saw several with Spanish brands on them, and some mules which they informed me that they had also obtained from the Spaniards. I also saw a bridal bit of Spanish manufactory, and sundry other articles which I have no doubt were obtained from the same source. 
Notwithstanding the extreme poverty of those poor people they are very merry they danced again this evening until midnight. Each warrior keep one or more horses tied by a cord to a stake near his lodge both day and night and are always prepared for action at a moment's warning. They fight on horseback altogether. Lob serve that the large flies are extremely troublesome to the horses as well as ourselves. The morning being cold and the men stiff and sore from the exertions of yesterday Captain Clark did not set out this morning until 7 a.m. The river was so crooked and rapid that they made but little way at one mile he passed a bold ruining stream on Stard. Which heads in a mountain to the north, on which there is snow. This we call Track Creek. It is four yard wide and three feet deep at seven mis past a stout stream which heads in some springs under the foot of the mountains on Lard. The river near the mountain they found one continued rapid, which was extremely laborious and difficult to ascend. This evening Charbono struck his Indian woman for which Captain C. gave him a severe reprimand. Joseph and Reuben Fields killed four deer and an antelope, Captain C. killed a buck. Several of the men have lamed themselves by various accidents in working the canoes through this difficult part of the river, and Captain C. was obliged personally to assist them in this labor. They encamped this evening on Lard. Side near the Rattlesnake Cliff. Clark, August 14, 1805. August 14, Wednesday, 1805. A cold morning wind from the S.W. The thermometer stood at 51 degrees a zero, at sunrise the morning being cold and men stiff. I determined to delay and take breakfast at the place we encamped. We set out at seven o'clock and proceeded on river very crooked and rapid as below some few trees on the borders near the mountain, past a bold running stream at one mile on the stard. Side which heads in a mountain to the north on which there is snow past a bold running stream on the lard. Side which heads in a spring under. A mountain, the river near the mountain is one continued rapid, which requires great labor to push and haul the canoes up. We encamped on the large side near the place the river passes through the mountain. I checked our interpreter for striking his woman at their dinner. The hunters Joe. And our fields killed four deer and the antelope, I killed a fat buck in the evening, several men have hurt themselves pushing up the canoes. I am obliged to a pole occasionally. Lewis, August 15, 1805. Thursday, August 15, 1805. This morning I arose very early and as hungry as a wolf. I had eaten nothing yesterday except one scant meal of the flour and berries except the dried cakes of berries which did not appear to satisfy my appetite as they appeared to do those of my Indian friends. I found on inquiry of McNeil that we had only about two pounds of flour remaining. This I directed him to divide into two equal parts and to cook the one half this morning in a kind of pudding with the hurries as he had done yesterday and reserve the balance for the evening. On this new fashion pudding four of us breakfasted, giving a pretty good allowance also to the chief who declared it the best thing he had tiestead for a long time. He took a little of the hour in his hand, Tice dead and examined very scrutinously and asked me if we made it of roots. I explained to him the manner in which it grew. I hurried the departure of the Indians. The chief addressed them several times before they would move they seemed very reluctant to accompany me. I at length asked the reason and he told me that some foolish persons among them had suggested the idea that we were in league with the Pockies and had come on in order to decoy them into an ambuscade where their enemies were waiting to receive them but that for his part he did not believe it. I readily perceived that our situation was not entirely free from danger as the transition from suspicion to the confirmation of the fact would not be very difficult in the minds of these ignorant people who have been accustomed from their infancy. To view every stranger as an enemy. I told Kamiwait that I was sorry to find that they had put so little confidence in us, that I knew they were not acquainted with white men and therefore could forgive them. That among white men it was considered disgraceful to lie or entrap an enemy by falsehood. I told him if they continued to think thus meanly of us that they might rely on it that no white men would ever come to trade with them or bring them arms and ammunition and that if the bulk of his nation still entertained this opinion I still hoped that there were some among them that were not afraid to die. 
that were men and would go with me and convince themselves of the truth of what I had asserted. That there was a party of white men waiting my return either at the forks of Jefferson's River or a little below coining on to that place in canoes loaded with provisions and merchandise. He told me for his own part he was determined to go, that he was not afraid to die. I soon found that I had touched him on the right string, to doubt the bravery of a savage is at once to put him on his mettle. He now mounted his horse and harangued his village a third time. The purport of which as he afterwards told me was to inform them that he would go with us and convince himself of the truth or falsity of what we had told him if he was certain he should be killed. That he hoped there were some of them who heard him were not afraid to die with him and if there was to let him see them mount their horses and prepare to set out. Shortly after this harangue he was joined by six or eight only and with these I smoked a pipe and directed the men to put on their packs being determined to set out with them while I had them in the humor at half after twelve we set out. Several of the old women were crying and imploring the great spirit to protect their warriors as if they were going to inevitable destruction. We had not proceeded far before our party was augmented by ten or twelve more, and before we reached the creek which we had passed in the morning of the thirteenth it appeared to me that we had all the men of the village and a number of women with us. This may serve in some measure to illustrate the capricious disposition of those people who never act but from the impulse of the moment. They were now very cheerful and gay, and two hours ago they looked as surly as so many imps of Saturn. When we arrived at the spring on the side of the mountain where we had encamped on the twelfth the chief insight on halting to let the horses grey eyes with which I complied and gave the Indians smoke. They are excessively fond of the pipe. But have it not much in their power to indulge themselves with even their native tobacco as they do not cultivate it themselves. After remaining about an hour we again set out, and by engaging to make compensation to four of them for their trouble obtained the privilege of riding with an Indian myself and a similar situation for each of my party. I soon found it more tiresome riding without tirrups than walking and of course chose the latter making the Indian carry my pack. About sunset we reached the upper part of the level valley of the cove which now called Shoshone Cove. The grass being burned on the north side of the river we passed over to the south and encamped near some willow brush about four miles above the narrow pass between the hills noticed as I came up this cove the river was here about six yards wide. And frequently darned up by the beaver. I had sent Druyer forward this evening before we halted to kill some meat but he was unsuccessful and did not rejoin us until after dark I now cooked and among six of us eat the remaining pound of flour stired in a little boiling water dot, Captain. Clark delayed again this morning until after breakfast, when he set out and passed between low and rugged mountains which had a few pine trees distributed over them the cliffs are formed of limestone and a hard black rock intermixed. No trees on the river, the bottom's narrow river crooked shallow shoaly and rapid. The water is as cold as that of the best springs in our country. The men as usual suffered excessively with fatigue and the coldness of the water to which they were exposed for hours together. At the distance of six miles by water they passed the entrance of a bold creek on starred. Side ten yards wide and three f three i. Deep which we called Willard's Creek after Alexander Willard one of our party. At four miles by water from their encampment of Lost Evening passed a bold branch which tumbled down a steep precipice of rocks from the mountains on the lard. Captain Clark was very near being bitten twice today by rattlesnakes, the Indian woman also narrowly escaped. They caught a number of fine trout. Captain Clark killed a buck which was the only game killed today. The venison has an uncommon bitter taste which is unpleasant. I presume it proceeds from some article of their food, perhaps the willow on the leaves of which they feed very much. They encamped this evening on the lard. Side near a few cottonwood trees about which there were the remains of several old Indian brush lodges. Clark, August 15, 1805. August 15, Thursday, 1805 A cool windy morning wine from the SW we proceeded on through a rouged low mountain water rapid as usual past a bold running stream which falls from the mountain on the lard. Side at four miles, also a bold running stream ten yards wide on the starred side eight feet three inches. Deep at six miles, Willard's Creek the bottoms narrow, the cliffs of a dark brown stone some limestone intermixed, an Indian road passes on the large side latterly used. 
took a meridian altitude at the Kalmsand. Of the mountain with octant 65 degrees 47 minutes 0 seconds. The lat. 44 degrees 0 minutes 48 and 1 tenth, proceeded on with great labor and fatigue to the mouth of a small run on the lard. Side. Past several spring runs, the men complain much of their fatigue and being repeatedly in the water which weakens them much particularly as they are obliged to live on poor deer meat which has a singular bitter taste. I have no accounts of Captain Lewis since he set out. In walking on shore I saw several rattlesnakes and narrowly escaped at two different times. As also the squaw when walking with her husband on shore, I killed a buck nothing else killed today, this mountain. I call Rattlesnake Mountain. Not one tree on either side today. Lewis, August 16, 1805. Friday, August 16, 1805. I sent Druier and Shields before this morning in order to kill some meat as neither the Indians nor ourselves had anything to eat. I informed the chief of my view in this measure, and requested that he would keep his young men with us lest by their hooping and noise they should all arm the game and we should get nothing to eat. But so strongly were their suspicions exited by this measure that two parties of discovery immediately set out one on X side of the valley to watch the hunters as I believed to see whether they had not been sent to give information of their approach to an enemy that they still persuaded themselves were lying in wait for them. I saw that any further effort to prevent their going would only add strength to their suspicions and therefore said no more. After the hunters had been gone about an hour we set out. We had just passed through the narrows when we saw one of the spies coming up the level plain under whip, the chief paused a little and seemed somewhat concerned. I felt a good deal so myself and began to suspect that by some unfortunate accident that perhaps some of their enemies had straggled hither at this unlucky moment. But we were all agreeably disappointed on the arrival of the young man to learn that he had come to inform us that one of the white men had killed a deer. In an instant they all gave their horses the whip and I was taken nearly a mile before I could learn what were the tidings. As I was without tirrups and an Indian behind me the jostling was disagreeable I therefore reined up my horse and forbid the Indian to whip him who had given him the lash at every jump for a mile fearing he should lose a part of the feast. The fellow was so uneasy that he left me the horse dismounted and ran on foot at full speed, I am confident a mile. When they arrived where the deer was which was in view of me they dismounted and ran in tumbling over each other like a parcel of famished dogs each seizing and tearing away a part of the intestines which had been previously thrown out by Druyer who killed it. The scene was such when I arrived that had I not have had a pretty keen appetite myself I am confident I should not have ticed at any part of the venison shortly. Each one had a pace of some description and all eating most ravenously. Some were eating the kidneys the melt and liver and the blood ruining from the corners of their mouths, others were in a similar situation with the paunch and guts but the exuding substance in this case from their lips was of a different description. One of the last who attracted my attention particularly had been fortunate in his allotment or rether active in the division. He had provided himself with about nine feet of the small guts one end of which he was chewing on while with his hands he was squeezing the contents out at the other. I really did not until now think that human nature ever presented itself in a shape so nearly allied to the brute creation. I viewed these poor starved devils with pity and compassion I directed McNeil to skin the deer and reserved a quarter, the balance I gave the chief to be divided among his people, they devoured the whole of it nearly without cooking. I now bore obliquely to the left in order to intercept the creek where there was some brush to make a fire, and arrived at this stream where Druyer had killed a second deer. Here nearly the same scene was encored. A fire being kindled we cooked and eat and gave the balance of the two deer to the Indians who eat the whole of them even to the soft parts of the hoofs. Druyer joined us at breakfast with a third deer. Of this I reserved a quarter and gave the balance to the Indians. They all appeared now to have filled themselves and were in a good humor. This morning early soon after the hunters set out a considerable part of our escort became all armed and returned twenty-eight men and three women only continued with us. After eating and suffering the horses to grey eyes about two hours we renewed our march and Toad's evening arrived at the lower part of the cove shields killed an antelope on the way a part of which we took and gave the remainder to the Indians. 
Being now informed of the place at which I expected to meet Captain C and the party they insisted on making a halt, which was complied with. We now dismounted and the chief with much ceremony put tippets about our necks such as they themselves wore I readily perceived that this was to disguise us and owed its origin to the same cause already mentioned. To give them further confidence I put my cocked hat with feather on the chief and my overshirt being of the Indian form my hair dishevelled and skin well browned with the sun I wanted no further addition to make me a complete Indian in appearance the men followed my example and we were sun completely metamorphosed. I again repeated to them the possibility of the party not having arrived at the place which I expected they were, but assured them they could not be far below. Lest by not finding them at the forks their suspicions might arise to such height as to induce them to return precipitately. We now set out and rode briskly within sight of the forks making one of the Indians carry the flag that our own party should know who we were. When we arrived in sight at the distance of about two miles I discovered to my mortification that the party had not arrived, and the Indians slackened their pace. I now scarcely knew what to do and feared every moment when they would halt altogether. I now determined to restore their confidence cost what it might and therefore gave the chief my gun and told him that if his enemies were in those bushes before him that he could defend himself with that gun. That for my own part one was not afraid to die and if I deceived him he might make what use of the gun he thought proper, or in other words that he might shoot me. The men also gave their guns to other Indians which seemed to inspire them with more confidence. They sent their spies before them at some distance and when I drew near the place I thought of the notes which I had left and directed Druyer to go with an Indian man and bring them to me which he did. The Indian seeing him take the notes from the stake on which they had been placed I now had recourse to a stratagem in which I thought myself justified by the occasion, but which I must confess said a little awkward. It had its desired effect. After reading the notes which were the same I had left I told the chief that when I had left my brother chief with the party below where the river entered the mountain that we both agreed not to bring the canoes higher up than the next forks of the river above us wherever this might happen. That there he was to wait my return should he arrive first, and that in the event of his not being able to travel as fast as usual from the difficulty of the water. That he was to send up to the first forks above him and leave a note informing me where he was, that this note was left here today and that he informed me that he was just below the mountains and was coming on slowly up. And added that I should wait here for him, but if they did not believe me that I should send a man at any rate to the chief and they might also send one of their young men with him, that myself and two others would remain with them at this place. This plan was readily adopted and one of the young men offered his services, I promised him a knife and some beads as a reward for his confidence in us. Most of them seemed satisfied but there were several that complained of the chiefs exposing them to danger unnecessarily and said that we told different stories, in short a few were much dissatisfied. I wrote a note to Captain. Clark by the light of some willow brush and directed Druyer to set out early being confident that there was not a moment to spare. The chief and five or six others slept about my fire and the others hid themselves in various parts of the willow brush to avoid the enemy whom they were fearful would attack them in the course of the night. I now entertained various conjectures myself with respect to the cause of Captain Clark's detention and was even fearful L that he had found the river so difficult that he had halted below the rattlesnake bluffs. I knew that if these people left me that they would immediately disperse and secrete themselves in the mountains where it would be impossible to find them or at least in vain to pursue them and that they would spread the all-arm to all other bands within our reach and of course we should be disappointed in obtaining horses. Which would vastly retard and increase the labor of our voyage and I feared might so discourage the men as to defeat the expedition altogether. My mind was in reality quite as gloomy all this evening as the most affrighted Indian but I affected cheerfulness to keep the Indians so who were about me. We finally laid down and the chief placed himself by the side of my mosquito beer. I slept but little as might be well expected, my mind dwelling on the state of the expedition which I have ever held in equal estimation with my own existence. And the fate of which appeared at this moment to depend in a great measure upon the caprice of a few savages who are ever as fickle as the wind. I had mentioned to the chief several times that we had with us a woman of his nation who had been taken prisoner by the minotaurs, and that by means of her I hoped to explain myself more fully than I could do by signs. 
Some of the party had also told the Indians that we had a man with us who was black and had short curling hair, this had excited their curiosity very much. And they seemed quite as anxious to see this monster as they wer the merchandise which we had to barter for their horses. At 7 a.m., Captain C. set out after breakfast. He changed the hands in some of the canoes. They proceeded with more ease than yesterday, yet they found the river still rapid and shallow insomuch that they were obliged to drag the large canoes the greater part of the day. The water excessively cold. In the evening they passed several bad rapids. Considerable quantities of the buffalo clover grows along the narrow bottoms through which they passed. There was no timber except a few scattering small pine on the hills. Willow service berry and currant bushes were the growth of the river bottoms. They get heard considerable quantities of service berries, and caught some trout. One deer was killed by the hunters who slept out last night. And did not join the party until 10 a.m. Captain Clark sent the hunters this evening up to the forks of the river which he discovered from an eminence, they muse have left this place but a little time before we arrived. This evening they encamped on the lard side only a few miles below us. And were obliged like ourselves to make use of small willow brush for fuel. The men were much fatigued and exhausted this evening. Clark, August 16, 1805. August 16 Friday, 1805 As this morning was cold and the men fatigued stiff and chilled determined me to detain and take breakfast before I set out. I changed the hands and set out at seven o'clock proceeded on something better than yesterday for the fore part of the day passed several rapids in the latter part of the day near the hills river passed between two hills I saw a great number of service. Berries now ripe. The yellow currant are also common I observe the long leaf clover in great plenty in the valley below this valley, some few trace on the river no timber on the hills or mountain. Except a few small pine and cedar. The THMTR stood at 48 degrees A. Zero at sunrise wind SW. The hunters joined me at one o'clock, I dispatched two men to prosue an Indian road over the hills for a few miles. At the narrows I ascended a mountain from the top of which I could see that the river forked near me the left hand appeared the largest and bore S. E. The right passed from the west through an extensive valley, I could see but three small trees in any direction from the top of this mountain. Passed an isled. An encamped eye on the lard. Side the only wood was small willows. Lewis, August 17, 1805. Saturday, August 17, 1805. This morning I arose very early and dispatched Druyer and the Indian down the river. Sent shields to hunt. I made McNeil cook the remainder of our meat which afforded a slight breakfast for ourselves and the chief. Druyer had been gone about two hours when an Indian who had straggled some little distance down the river returned and reported that the white men were coming, that he had seen them just below. They all appeared transported with joy, and the chef repeated his fraternal hug. I felt quite as much gratified at this information as the Indians appeared to be. Shortly after Captain Clark arrived with the interpreter Charbono, and the Indian woman, who proved to be a sister of the chief Kamiwait. The meeting of those people was really affecting, particularly between Sa Ch Garwia and an Indian woman, who had been taken prisoner at the same time with her, and who had afterwards escaped from the Minotaurs and rejoined her nation. At noon the canoes arrived, and we had the satisfaction once more to find ourselves all together. With a flattering prospect of being able to obtain as many horses shortly as would enable us to prosecute our voyage by land should that by water be deemed unadvisable. We now formed our camp just below the junction of the forks on the lard. Side in a level smooth bottom covered with a fine turf of greensward. Here we unloaded our canoes and arranged our baggage on shore. Formed a canopy of one of our large sails and planted some willow brush in the ground to form a shade for the Indians to set under while we spoke to them, which we thought it best to do this evening. Accordingly about 4 p.m. We called them together and through the medium of Labuish, Charbono and Sasiage Garwia, we communicated to them fully the objects which had brought us into this distant part of the country. 
in which we took care to make them a conspicuous object of our own good wishes and the care of our government. We made them sensible of their dependence on the will of our government for every species of merchandise as well for their defense and comfort, and apprised them of the strength of our government and its friendly dispositions towards them. We also gave them as a reason why we wished to pet rate the country as far as the ocean to the west of them was to examine and find out a more direct way to bring merchandise to them. That as no trade could be carried on with them before our return to our homes that it was mutually advantageous to them as well as to ourselves that they should render us such aids as they had it in their power to furnish in order to hasten our voyage and of course our return home. That such were their horses to transport our baggage without which we could not subsist, and that a pilot to conduct us through the mountains was also necessary if we could not deck end the river by water. But that we did not ask either their horses or their services without giving a satisfactory compensation in return. That at present we wished them to collect as many horses as were necessary to transport our baggage to their village on the Columbia where we would then trade with them at our leisure for such horses as they could spare us. They appeared well pleased with what had been said. The chief thanked us for friendship towards himself and nation and declared his wish to serve us in every respect. That he was sorry to find that it must yet be some time before they could be furnished with firearms but said they could live as they had done heretofore until we brought them as we had promised. He said they had not horses enough with them at present to remove our baggage to their village over the mountain. But that he would return tomorrow and encourage his people to come over with their horses and that he would bring his own and assist us. This was complying with all we wished at present. We next inquired who were chiefs among them. Kamiwake pointed out two others whom he said were chiefs we gave him a medal of the small size with the likeness of Mr. Jefferson the President of the U States in relief on one side and clasp hands with a pipe and tomahawk on the other, to the other chiefs we gave each a small medal which were struck in the presidency of George Washingasker. We also gave small medals of the last description to two young men whom the first chief informed us W. E. R. good young men and much respected among them. We gave the first chief an uniform coat shirt a pair of scarlet leggings a carrot of tobacco and some small articles to each of the others we gave a shirt legging handkerchief a knife some tobacco and a few small articles we also distributed a good quantity paint mockers and awls knives beads looking glasses and among the other Indians and gave them a plentiful meal of lead corn which was the first they had ever eaten in their lives. They were much pleased with it. Every article about us appeared to excite astonishment in the minds. The appearance of the men, their arms, the canoes, our manner of working them, the back man York and the Sega City of my dog were equally objects of admiration. I also shot my air gun which was so perfectly incomprehensible that they immediately denominated it the great medicine. The idea which the Indians mean to convey by this appellation is something that emanates from or acts immediately by the influence or power of the great spirit, or that in which the power of God is manifest by its incomprehensible power of action. Our hunters killed four deer and an antelope this evening of which we also gave the Indians a good proportion. The ceremony of our council and smoking the pipe was in conformity of the custom of this nation profaned barefoot. On those occasions points of etiquette are quite as much attended to by the Indians as among civilized nations. To keep Indians in a good humor you must not fatigue them with too much business at one time. Therefore after the council we gave them to eat and amuse them a while by shewing them such articles as we thought would be entertaining to them, and then renewed our inquiries with respect to the country. The information we derived was only a repetition of that they had given me before and in which they appeared to be so candid that I could not avoid yelling confidence to what they had said. Captain Clark and myself now concerted measures for our future operations, and it was mutually agreed that he should set out tomorrow morning with eleven men furnished with axes and other necessary tools for making canoes. Their arms accoutrements and as much of their baggage as they could carry. Also to take the Indian's carbono and the Indian woman with him. That on his arrival at the Shoshone camp he was to leave Charbono and the Indian woman to hasten the return of the Indians with their horses to this place and to proceed himself with the eleven men down the Columbia in order to examine the river and if he found it navigable and could obtain timber to set about making canoes immediately. In the meantime I was to bring on the party and baggage to the Shoshone camp, 
calculating that by the time I should reach that place that he would have sufficiently informed himself with respect to the state of the river and as to determine us whether to prosecute our journey from thence by land or water. In the former case we should want all the horses which we could purchase, the latter only to hire the Indians to transport our baggage to the place at which we made the canoes. In order to inform me as early as possible of the state of the river he was to send back one of the men with the necessary information as soon as he should satisfy himself on this subject. This plan being settled we gave orders accordingly and the men prepared for an early march. The nights are very cold and the sun excessively hot in the day. We have no fuel here but a few dry willow brush. And from the appearance of country I am confident we shall not find game here to subsist us many days. These are additional reasons why I conceive it necessary to get under way as soon as possible. This morning Captain Clark had delayed until 7 a.m. Before he set out just about which time Drewyer arrived with the Indian, he left the canoes to come on after him, and immediately set out and joined me as has been before mentioned. The spirits of the men were now much elated at the prospect of getting horses. Clark, August 17, 1805 August 17 Saturday 1805 A fair cold morning wind s, w, the thermometer at 42 a. 0 at sunrise, we set out at 7 o'clock and proceeded on to the forks I had not proceeded on one mile before I saw at a distance several Indians on or back coming towards me. The intertrepidor and squar who were before me at some distance danced for the joyful sight, and she made signs to me that they were her nation, as I approached nearer them to covered one of Captain Lewis' party with them dressed in their dress. They met me with great signs of joy, as the canoes were proceeding on nearly opposite me I turned those people and joined Captain Lewis who had camped with sixteen of those snake Indians at the forks two miles in advance. Those Indians sung all the way to their camp where the others had proved. A sind of shade of willows stuck up in a circle the three chiefs with Captain. Lewis met me with great cordiality embraced and took a seat on a white robe. The main chief immediately tied to my hair six small pieces of shells resembling pearl which is highly valued by those people and is procured from the nations residing near the sea coast. We then smoked in their fashion without shoes and without much ceremony and form. Captain Lewis informed me he found those people on the Columbia River about forty miles from the forks at that place there was a large camp of them he had persuaded those with him to come and see that what he said was the truth. They had been under great apprehension all the way, for fear of their being deceived. The great chief of this nation proved to be the brother of the woman with us and is a man of influence sense and easy and reserved manners, appears to possess a great deal of sincerity. The canoes arrived and unloaded, everything appeared to astonish those people. The appearance of the men, their arms, the canoes, the clothing my black servant. And the sagacity of Captain Lewis's dog. We spoke a few words to them in the evening respecting our route intentions our want of horses and and gave them a few presents and medals, we made a number of inquires of those people about the Columbia River the Count Ray game and the account they gave us was very unfavorable, that the river abounded in immense falls, one particularly much higher than the falls of the Missouri and at the place the mountains closed so close that it was impracticable to pass. And that the ridge continued on each side of perpendicular cliffs impenetrable, and that no deer elk or any game was to be found in that country. Odd aid to that they informed us that there was no timber on the river sufficiently large to make small canoes, this information, if true is alarming, I determined to go in advance and examine the country. See if those de Ficuelts presented themselves in the gloomy picture in which they painted them, and if the river was practicable and I could find timber to build canoes, those ideas and plan appeared to be agreeable to Captain Lewis's ideas on this point. And I selected eleven men, directed them to pack up their baggage complete themselves with ammunition, take each an axe and such tools as will be suitable to build canoes, and be ready to set out at ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Those people greatly pleased our hunters killed three deer and an antelope which was eaten in a short time the Indians being so harassed and compelled to move about in those rigid mountains that they are half starved living at this time on berries and roots which they hayether in the plains. Those people are not begurly but generous, only one has asked me for anything and he for powder. 
This nation call themselves Choshapang the chief is named Tu E T T E Khan L Black Gun is his war name Kamiawa, or Come and Smoke. This chief gave me the following name and pipe Kamiawa. Lewis, August 18, 1805. Sunday, August 18, 1805. This morning while Captain Clark was busily engaged in preparing for his route. I exposed some articles to barter with the Indians for horses as I wished a few at this moment to relieve the men who were going with Captain Clark from the labor of carrying their baggage and also one to keep here in order to pack the meat to camp which the hunters might kill. I soon obtained three very good horses for which I gave an uniform coat, a pair of leggings, a few handkerchiefs, three knives and some other small articles the whole of which did not cost more than about twenty dollars in the U States. The Indians seemed quite as well pleased with their bargain as I was. The men also purchased one for an old checked shirt a pair of old leggings and a knife. Two of those I purchased Captain C took on with him. At 10 a.m. Captain Clark departed with his detachment and all the Indians except two men and two women who remained with us. Two of the inferior chiefs were a little displeased at not having received a present equivalent to that given the first chief. To relieve this difficulty Captain Clark bestowed a couple of his old coats on them and I promised that if they were active in assisting me over the mountains with horses that I would give them an additional present. This seemed perfectly to satisfy them and they all set out in a good humor. Captain Clark encamped this evening near the narrow pass between the hills on Jefferson's River in the Shoshone Cove. His hunters killed one deer which the party with the aid of the Indians readily consumed in the course of the evening. After their departure this morning I had all the stores and baggage of every description opened and aired. And began the operation of forming the packages in proper parcels for the purpose of transporting them on horseback. The rain in the evening compelled me to desist from my operations. I had the raw hides put in the water in order to cut them in throngs proper for lashing the packages and forming the necessary gear for pack horses, a business which I fortunately had not to learn on this occasion. Drewyer killed one deer this evening. A beaver was also caught by one of the party. I had the net arranged and set this evening to catch some trout which we could see in great abundance at the bottom of the river. This day I completed my thirty-first year, and conceived that I had in all human probability now existed about half the period which I am to remain in this sublunary world. I reflected that I had as yet done but little, very little indeed, to further the happiness of the human race, or to advance the information of the succeeding generation. I viewed with regret the many hours I have spent in indolence, and now sorely feel the want of that information which those hours would have given me had they been judiciously expended. But since they are past and cannot be recalled, I dash from me the gloomy thought and resolved in future, to redouble my exertions and at least endeavor to promote those two primary objects of human existence. By giving them the aid of that portion of talents which nature and fortune have bestowed on me. Or in future, to live for mankind, as I have heretofore lived for myself. Clark, August 18, 1805. August 18, Sunday, 1805 purchased of the Indians three horses for which we gave a chief's coat some handkerchiefs a shirt leg ends and a few arrow points and... I gave two of my coats to two of the under chiefs who appeared not well satisfied that the first chief was dressed so much finer than themselves. At ten o'clock I set out accompanied by the Indians except three the interpreter and wife, the fore part of the day worm, at twelve o'clock it became hazy with a mist of rain wind hard from the S. W. and cold which increased until night the rain ceased in about two hours. We proceeded on through a widely vell valley without wood except willows and shrubs for fifteen miles and encamped at a place the high lands approach within two hundred yards in two points the river here only ten yards wide several small streams branching out on each side below. All the Indians proceeded on except the three chiefs and two young men. My hunters killed two deer which we eat. The course from the forks is west 9 miles and 60 degrees west, 6 miles. The laid of the forks agreeable to observations is 43 degrees 30 minutes 43 seconds north. Lewis, August 19, 1805. Monday, August 19, 1805. This morning I arose at daylight. 
and sent out three hunters. Some of the men who were much in want of leggings and moccasins I suffered to dress some skins. The others I employed in repacking the baggage, making pack saddles and... We took up the net this morning but caught no fish. One beaver was caught in a trap. The frost which perfectly whitened the grass this morning had a singular appearance to me at this season. This evening I made a few of the men construct a seine of willow brush which we hauled and caught a large number of fine trout and a kind of mullet about sixteen in heath long which I had not seen before. The scales are small, the nose is long and obtusely pointed and exceeds the under jaw. The mouth is not large but opens with folds at the sides, the color of its back and sides is of a bluish brown and belly white. It has the faggot bones, from which I have supposed it to be of the mullet kind. The tongue and palate are smooth and it has no teeth. It is by no means as good as the trout. The trout are the same which I first met with at the falls of the Missouri, they are larger than the speckled trout of our mountains and equally as well flavored, the hunters returned this evening with two deer. From what has been said of the Shoshones it will be readily perceived that they live in a wretched state of poverty. Yet notwithstanding their extreme poverty they are not only cheerful but even gay, fond of gaudy dress and amusements. Like most other Indians they are great egotists and frequently boast of heroic acts which they never performed. They are also fond of games of risk. They are frank, communicative, fair in dealing, generous with the little they possess, extremely honest, and by no means beggarly. Each individual is his own sovereign master, and acts from the dictates of his own mind. The authority of the chief being nothing more than mere admonition supported by the influence which the propriety of his own exemplary conduct may have acquired him in the minds of the individuals who compose the band. The title of chief is not hereditary, nor can I learn that there is any ceremony of installment, or other a po in the life of a chief from which his title as such can be dated. In fact every man is a chief, but all have not an equal influence on the minds of the other members of the community, and he who happens to enjoy the greatest share of confidence is the principal chief. The Shoshones may be estimated at about one hundred warriors, and about three times that number of Wu men and children. They have more children among them than I expected to have seen among a people who procure subsistence with such difficulty. There are but few very old persons, nor did they appear to treat those with much tenderness or respect. The man is the sole proprietor of his wives and daughters, and can barter or dispose of either as he thinks proper. A plurality of wives is common among them, but these are not generally sisters as with the Minotaurs and Mandans but are purchased of different fathers. The father frequently disposes of his infant daughters in marriage to men who are grown or to men who have sons for whom they think proper to provide wives. The compensation given in such cases usually consists of horses or mules which the father receives at the time of contract and converts to his own use. The girl remains with her parents until she is conceived to have obtained the age of puberty which with them is considered to be about the age of thirteen or fourteen years. The female at this age is surrendered to her sovereign lord and husband agreeably to contract, and with her is frequently restored by the father quite as much as he received in the first instance in payment for his daughter. But this is discretionary with the father. Sakargarwia had been thus disposed of before she was taken by the minotaurs, or had arrived to the years of puberty. The husband was yet living and with this band. He was more than double her age and had two other wives. He claimed her as his wife but said that as she had had a child by another man, who was Charbono, that he did not want her. They seldom correct their children particularly the boys who soon become masters of their own acts. They give as a reason that it cows and breaks the spirit of the boy to whip him, and that he never recovers his independence of mind after he is grown. They treat their women but with little respect, and compel them to perform every species of drudgery. They collect the wild fruits and roots, attend to the horses or assist in that duty cook dress the skins and make all their apple, collect wood and make their fires, arrange and form their lodges. And when they travel pack the horses and take charge of all the baggage. In short the man does little else except attend his horses hunt and fish. 
The man considers himself degraded if he is compelled to walk any distance, and if he is so unfortunately poor as only to possess two horses he rides the best himself and leaves the woman or women if he has more than one. To transport their baggage and children on the other, and to walk if the horse is unable to carry the additional weight of their persons, the chastity of their women is not held in high estimation. And the husband will for a trifle barter the companion of his bead for a night or longer if he conceives the reward adequate. Though they are not so importunate that we should caress their women as the Sioux were and some of their women appear to be held more sacred than in any nation we have seen I have requested the men to give them no cause of jealousy by having connection with their women without their knowledge. Which with them strange as it may seem is considered as disgraceful to the husband as clandestine connections of a similar kind are among civilized nations. To prevent this mutual exchange of good offices altogether I know it impossible to effect, particularly on the part of our young men whom some months' abstinence have made very polite to those tawny damsels. No evil has yet resulted and I hope will not from these connections. Notwithstanding the late loss of horses which this people sustained by the minotaurs the stock of the band may be very safely estimated at seven hundred of which they are perhaps about forty colts and half that number of mules. These people are diminutive in stature, thick ankles, crooked legs, thick flat feet and in short but illy formed, at least much more so in general than any nation of Indians I ever saw. Their complexion is much that of the Sioux or darker than the Minotaurs Mandans or Shawnees. Generally both men and women wear their hair in a loose lank flow over the shoulders and face. Though I observed some few men who confined their hair in two equal cues hanging over each ear and drawn in front of the body. The cue is formed with throngs of dressed lather or otter skin adonately crossing each other. At present most of them have cut short in the neck in consequence of the loss of their relations by the minotaurs. Kamiwait has his cut close all over his head. This constitutes their ceremony of mourning for their deceased relations. The dress of the men consists of a robe long leggings, shirt, tippet and moccasins, that of the women is also a robe, chemise, and moccasins, sometimes they make use of short leggings. The ornaments of both men and women are very similar, and consist of several species of sea shells, blue and white beads, bras and iron arm bands, plated cords of the sweet grass and collars of leather ornamented with the quills of the porcupine dyed of various colors among which I observed the red, yellow, blue, and black. The ear is perforated in the lower part to receive various ornaments but the nose is not, nor is the ear lacerated or disfigured for this purpose as among many nations. The men never mark their skins by burning, cuting, nor puncturing and introducing a coloring matter as many nations do. Their women sometimes puncture a small circle on their forehead nose or cheeks and thus introduce a black matter usually soot and grease which leaves an indelible stain. Though this even is by no means common. Their arms offensive and defensive consist in the bow and arrow's shield, some lances, and a weapon called by the Sipways who formerly used it, the Poggalmaggon. In fishing they employ wares, gigs, and fishing hooks. The salmon is the principal object of their pursuit. They snare wolves and foxes. I was anxious to learn whether these people had the venereal, and made the inquiry through the interpreter and his wife. The information was that they sometimes had it but I could not learn their remedy, they most usually die with its effects. This seems a strong proof that these disorders Boda Gonorrhoea and Louis Venery are native disorders of America. Though these people have suffered much by the smallpox which is known to be imported and perhaps those other disorders might have been contracted from other Indian tribes who by a round of communication might have obtained from the Europeans since it was introduced into that quarter of the globe. But so much detached on the other had from all communication with the whites that I think it most probable that those disorders are original with them. From the middle of May to the 3rd of September these people reside on the waters of the Columbia where they consider themselves in perfect security from their enemies as they have not as yet ever found their way to this retreat. During this season the salmon furnish the principal part of their subsistence and as this fish either perishes or returns about the 1st of September they are compelled at this season in search of subsistence to resort to the Missouri. In the valleys of which, there is more game even within the mountains. 
Here they move slowly down the river in order to collect and join other bands either of their own nation or the Flatheads, and having become sufficiently strong as they can see venture on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains into the plains. Where the buffalo abound. But they never leave the interior of the mountains while they can obtain a scanty subsistence, and always return as soon as they have acquired a good stock of dried meat in the plains, when this stock is consumed they venture again into the plains. Thus alternately obtaining their food at the risk of their lives and retiring to the mountains, while they consume it. These people are now on the eve of their departure for the Missouri, and inform us that they expect to be joined at or about the Three Forks by several bands of their own nation, and a band of the Flatheads. As I am now too busily engaged to enter at once into a minute description of the several articles which compose their dress, employments of war hunting fishing and I shall pursue them at my leisure in the order they have here occurred to my mind. And have been mentioned. This morning Captain Clark continued his route with his party, the Indians accompanying him as yesterday, he was obliged to feed them. Nothing remarkable happened during the day. He was met by an Indian with two mules on this side of the dividing ridge at the foot of the mountain, the Indian had the politeness to offer Captain C. One of his mules to ride as he was on foot, which he accepted and gave the fellow a waistcoat as a reward for his politeness. In the evening he reached the creek on this side of the Indian camp and halted for the night. His hunters killed nothing today. The Indians value their mules very highly. A good mule cannot be obtained for less than three and sometimes four horses, and the most indifferent are rated at two horses. Their mules generally are the finest I ever saw without any comparison to, today I observe time and distance of suns and moons nearest limbs with sextant sun east. Clark, August 19. 1805. August 19th Monday, 1805 A very cold morning frost to be seen we set out at seven o'clock and proceeded on through a widely vell valley the chief shew me the place that a number of his nation was killed about one years past this valley continues five miles and then becomes narrow. The beaver has darned up the river in many places we proceeded on up the main branch with a gradual ascent to the head and passed over a low mountain and decended a steep descent to a beautiful stream. Passed over a second hill of a very steep ascent and through a hilly count ray for eight miles and encamped on a small stream the Indians with us we wr obliged to feed, one man met one with a mule and Spanish saddle to ride. I gave him a wistote a mule is considered of great value among those people we proceeded on over a very mountainous count ray across the head of hollows and springs. Lewis, August 20th, 1805. Tuesday, August 20th. 1805. This morning I sent out the two hunters and employed the balance of the party pretty much as yesterday. I walked down the river about, three quarters of a mile and selected a place near the river bank unperceived by the Indians for a cache, which I set three men to make. And directed the sentinel to discharge his gun if he perceived any of the Indians going down in that direction which was to be the signal for the men at work on the cache to desist and separate. Least these people should discover our deposit and rob us of the baggage we intend leaving here. By evening the cache was completed unperceived by the Indians, and all our packages made up. The pack saddles and harries is not yet complete. In this operation we find ourselves at a loss for nails and boards. For the first we substitute throngs of raw hide which answer very well. And for the last to cut off the blades of our oars and use the plank of some boxes which have heretofore held other articles and put those articles into sacks of raw hide which I have had made for the purpose. By this means I have obtained as many boards as will make twenty saddles which I suppose will be sufficient for our present exigencies. The Indians with us behave themselves extremely well. The women have been busily engaged all day making and mending the moccasins of our party. In the evening the hunters returned unsuccessful. Druyer went in search of his trap which a beaver had taken off last night. He found the beaver dead with the trap to his foot about two miles below the place he had set it. This beaver constituted the whole of the game taken today. The fur of this animal is as good as I ever saw any, and believe that they are never out of season on the upper part of the Missouri and its branches within the mountains. Goodrich caught several thousand fine trout. Today. 
I made up a small assortment of medicines, together with the specimines of plants, minerals, seeds and which, I have collected Betwin this place and the falls of the Missouri which I shall deposit here. The robe worn by the Shoshones is the same in both sexes and is loosely thrown about their shoulders, and the sides at pleasure either hanging loose or drawn together with the hands. Sometimes if the weather is cold they confine it with a girdle around the waist. They are generally about the size of a twenty-one halves point blanket for grown persons and reach as low as the middle of the leg. This robe forms a garment in the day and constitutes their only covering at night. With these people the robe is formed most commonly of the skins of antelope, bighorn, or deer, dressed with the hair on, though they prefer the buffalo when they can procure them. I have also observed some robes among them of beaver, munax, and small wolves. The summer robes of both sexes are also frequently made of the elk skin dressed without the hair. The shirt of the men is really a commodious and decent garment. It rumine reaches nearly halfway the thigh, there is no collar, the aperture being sufficiently large to admit the head and is left square at top, or most frequently. Both before and behind terminate in the tails of the animals of which they are made and which fold outwards being frequently left entire or sometimes cut into a fring on the edges and ornament with the quills of the porcupine. The sides of the shirt are so deeply fringed, and ornamented in a similar manner from the bottom upwards, within six or eight inches of the sieve from whence it is left open as well as the sieve on its underside to the elbow nearly. From the elbow the sieve fits the arm tight as low as the wrist and is not ornament with a fringe as the sides and under parts of the sieve are above the elbow. The shoulder straps are wide and on them is generally displayed the taste of the manufacturer in a variety of figures wrought with the quills of the porcupine of several colors, beads when they have them are also displayed on this part. The tail of the shirt is left in the form which the forelegs and neck give it with the addition of a slight fringe. The hair is usually left on the tail, and near the hoofs of the animal. Part of the hoof is also retained to the skin and is split into a fring by way of ornament. These shirts are generally made of deer's antelopes, bighorns, or elk skins dressed without the hair. The elk skin is less used for this purpose than either of the others. Their only thread used on this or any other occasion is the sinews taken from the back and loins of the deer elk buffalo and their leggings are most usually formed of the skins of the antelope dressed without the hair. In the men they are very long and full each legging being formed of a skin nearly entire. The legs, tail and neck are also left on these, and the tail worn upwards, and the neck deeply fringed and ornament with porcupine culls drags or trails on the ground behind the heel. The skin is sewn in such manner as to fit the leg and thigh closely. The upper part being left open a sufficient distance to permit the legs of the skin to be drawn underneath a girdle both before and behind. And the wide part of the skin to cover the buttock and lap before in such manner that the breechcloth is unnecessary. They are much more decent in concealing those parts than any nation on the Missouri the sides of the leggings are also deeply fringed and ornament. Sometimes this part is ornament with little fascicles of the hair of an enemy whom they have slain in battle. The tippet of the snake Indians is the most elegant piece of Indian dress I ever saw, the neck or collar of this is formed of a strip of dressed otter skin with the fur. It is about four or five inches wide and is cut out of the back of the skin the nose and eyes forming one extremity and the tail the other. Beginning a little behind the ear of the animal at one edge of this collar and proceeding towards the tail, they attach from one to two hundred and fifty little rolls of ermine skin formed in the following manner. The skin is first dressed with the fur on it and a narrow strip is cut out of the back of the skin reaching from the nose and embracing the tail. This is sewed around a small cord of the silk grass twisted for the purpose and regularly tapering in such manner as to give it a just proportion to the tail which is to form the lower extremity of the strand. Thus arranged they are confined at the upper point in little bundles of two three, or more as the design may be to make them more full. These are then attached to the collars as before mentioned, and to conceal the connection of this part which would otherwise have a coarse appearance they attach a broad fringe of the ermine skin to the collar overlaying that part. Little bundles of fine fringe of the same materials is fastened to the extremity of the tails in order to shew their black extremities to greater advantage. 
The center of the otter skin collar is also ornamented with the shells of the pearl oyster. The collar is confined around the neck and the little rolls of ermine skin about the size of a large quill covers the sodders and body nearly to the waist and has the appearance of a short cloak and is really handsome. These they esteem very highly, and give or dispose of only on important occasions. The ermine wick is known to the traders of the N.W. By the name of the white weasel is the genuine ermine, and might no doubt be turned to great advantage by those people if they would encourage the Indians to take them. They are no doubt extremely plenty and readily taken, from the number of these tippets which I have seen among these people and the great number of skins employed in the construction of each tippet. Scarcely any of them have employed less than one hundred of these skins in their formation that, this morning captain. Clark set out at six in the morning and soon after arrived near their camp they having removed about two miles higher up the river than the camp at which they were when I first visited them. The chief requested a halt, which was complied with, and a number of the Indians came out from the village and joined them after smoking a few pipes with them they all proceeded to the village where Captain C. was conducted to a large lodge prepared in the center of the encampment for himself and party. Here they gave him one salmon and some cakes of dried berries. He now repeated to them what had been said to them in council at this place which was repeated to the village by the chief. When he had concluded this address he requested a guide to accompany him down the river and an elderly man was pointed out by the chief who consented to undertake this task. This was the old man of whom Kamiwait had spoken as a person well acquainted with the country to the north of this river. Captain C. encouraged the Indians to come over with their horses and assist me over with the baggage. He distributed some presents among the Indians. About half the men of the village turned out to hunt the antelope but were unsuccessful. At 3 p.m. Captain Clark departed, accompanied by his guide and party except one man whom he left with orders to purchase a horse if possible and overtake him as soon as he could. He left Charbono and the Indian woman to return to my camp with the Indians. He passed the river about four miles below the Indians, and encamped on a small branch, eight miles distant. On his way he met a respectable-looking Indian who returned and continued with him all night, this Indian gave them three salmon. Captain C. Killed a cock of the plains or mountain cock. It was of a dark brown color with a long and pointed tail larger than the dunghill fowl and had a fleshy protuberant substance about the base of the upper chap, something like that of the turkey though without the snout. Clark, August 20, 1805 August 20, Tuesday, 1805 set out at half past six o'clock and proceeded on, met many parties of Indians, through a hilly count ray to the camp of the Indians on a branch of the Columbia River. Before we entered this camp a ceremonious halt was requested by the chief and I smoked with all that came around for several pipes. We then proceeded on to the camp and I was introduced into the only lodge they had which was pitched in the center for my party all the other lodges made of bushes. After a few Indian ceremonies I informed the Indians the object of our journey our good intentions towards them my concern for their distressed situation, what we had done for them in making a peace with the mini terras mandans Rikera and for them dash, and requested them all to take over their horses and assist Captain Lewis across Enk. Also informing them the object of my journey down the river and requested a guide to accompany me, all of which was repeated by the chief to the whole village. Those poor people could only raise a salmon and a little dried choke cherries for us half the men of the tribe with the chief turned out to hunt the antelopes. At three o'clock after giving a few small articles as presents I set out accompanied by an old man as a guide, I endeavored to procure as much information from those people as possible without much success they being but little acquainted or affecting to be so, I left one man to purchase a horse and overtake me and proceeded on through a wide rich bottom on a beaten road eight miles crossed the river and encamped on a small run. This evening passed a number of old lodges, and met a number of men women children and horses, met a man who appeared of some consideration who turned back with us, he halted a woman and gave us three small salmon. This man continued with me all night and partook of what I had which was a little pork very salt. Those Indians are very attentive to strangers and 
I left our interpreter and his woman to accompany the Indians to Captain Lewis tomorrow the day they informed me they would set out I killed a pheasant at the Indian camp larger than a dungle fowl with feshy protuberances about the head like a turkey. Frost last night. Lewis, August 21, 1805. Wednesday, August 21, 1805. This morning was very cold. The ice one quarter of an inch thick on the water which stood in the vessels exposed to the air. Some wet deerskins that had been spread the grass last evening are stiffly frozen. The ink feizes in my pen. The bottoms are perfectly covered with frost insomuch that they appear to be covered with snow. This morning early I dispatched two hunters to kill some meat if possible before the Indians arrive, drew ear I sent with the horse into the cove for that purpose. The party pursued their several occupations as yesterday. By evening I had all the baggage, saddles, and harness completely ready for a march. After dark, I made the men take the baggage to the cache and deposit it. I believe we have been unperceived by the Indians in this movement. Notwithstanding the coldness of the last night the day has proved excessively warm. Neither of the hunters returned this evening and I was obliged to issue pork and corn. The moccasins of both sexes are usually the same and are made of deer elk or buffalo skin dressed without the hair. Sometimes in the winter they make them of buffalo skin dressed with the hair on and turn the hair inwards as the Mandans Minetares and most of the nations do who inhabit the buffalo country. The moccasin is formed with one seam on the outer edge of the foot is cut open at the instep to admit the foot and sewed up behind. In this respect they are the same with the Mandans. They sometimes ornament their moccasins with various figures wrought with the quills of the porcupine. Some of the dressy young men ornament the tops of their moccasins with the skins of polecats and trolley the tail of that animal on the ground at their heels as they walk. The robe of the woman is generally smaller than that of the man but is worn in the same manner over the shoulders. The chemise is roomy and comes down below the middle of the leg the upper part of this garment is formed much like the shirt of the men except the shoulder strap which is never used with the chemise. In women who give suck, they are left open at the sides nearly as low as the waist, in others, close as high as the sleeve. The sleeve underneath as low as the elbow is open, that part being left very full. The sides tail and upper part of the sleeves are deeply fringed and sometimes ornament in a similar manner with the shirts of the men with the addition of little patches of red cloth about the tail edged around with beads. The breast is usually ornament with various figures of party colors wrought with the quills of the porcupine. It is on this part of the garment that they appear to exert their greatest ingenuity. A girdle of dressed leather confines the chemise around the waist. When either the man or woman wish to disengage their arm from the sleeve they draw it out by means of the opening underneath the arm and throw the sleeve behind the body. The leggings of the women reach as high as the knee and are confined with a garter below. The moccasin covers and confines its lower extremity. They are neither fringed nor ornamented. These leggings are made of the skins of the antelope and the chemise usually of those of the large deer bighorn and the smallest elk. They seldom wear the beads they possess about their necks at least I have never seen a grown person of either sex wear them on this part, some their children are seen with them in this way. The men and women wear them suspen from the ear in little bunches or intermixed with triangular paces of the shells of the pearl oyster. The men also wear them attached in a similar manner to the hair of the fore part of the crown of the head. To which they sometimes make the addition of the wings and tails of birds. The nose in neither sex is pierced nor do they wear any ornament in it. They have a variety of small sea shells of which they form collars worn indiscriminately by both sexes. These as well as the shell of the pearl oyster they value very highly and inform us that they obtain them from their friends and relations who live beyond the barren plain towards the ocean in a.s. westerly direction. These friends of theirs they say inhabit a good country abounding with elk, deer, bear, and antelope and possess a much greater number of horses and mules than they do themselves. Or using their own figure that their horses and mules are as numerous as the grass of the plains. The warriors or such as esteem themselves brave men wear collars made of the claws of the brown bear which are also esteemed of great value and are preserved with great care. 
These claws are ornamented with beads about the thick end near which they are pierced through their sides and strung on a throng of dressed leather and tied about the neck commonly with the upper edge of the talon next the breast or neck butt. Sometimes are reversed. It is esteemed by them an act of equal celebrity the killing one of these bear or an enemy, and with the means they have of killing this animal it must really be a serious undertaking. The sweet-scented grass which grows very abundant on this river is either twisted or plaited and worn around the neck in either sex, but most commonly by the men. They have a collar also worn by either sex. It generally round and about the size of a man's finger, formed of leather or silk grass twisted or firmly rolled and covered with the quills of the porcupine of different colors. The tusks of the elk are pierced strung on a throng and worn as an ornament for the neck, and is most generally worn by the women and children. The men frequently wear the skin of a fox or a broad strip of that of the otter around the forehead and head in form of a bando. They are also fond of the feathers of the tail of the beautiful eagle or calumet birds with which they ornament their own hair and the tails and manes of their horses. The dress of these people is quite as daint and convenient as that of any nation of Indians I ever saw. This morning early Captain C. resumed his march. At the distance of five miles he arrived at some brush lodges of the Shoshones inhabited by about seven families here he halted and was very friendly received by these people, who gave himself and party as much boiled salmon as they could eat. They also gave him several dried salmon and a considerable quantity of dried chokecherries. After smoking with them he visited their fish where which was about two hundred yards, distant. He found the ware extended across four channels of the river which was here divided by three small islands. Three of these channels were narrow, and were stoked by means of trees fallen across, supported by which stakes of willow were driven down sufficiently near each other to prevent the salmon from passing. About the center of each a cylindric basket of eighteen or twenty feet in length terminating in a conic shape at its lower extremity, formed of willows, was opposed to a small aperture in the ware with its mouth upstream to receive the fish. The main channel of the water was conducted to this basket, which was so narrow at its lower extremity that the fish when once in could not turn itself about, and were taken out by untying the small ends of the longitudinal willows, which formed the hull of the basket. The ware in the main channel was somewhat differently contrived. There were two distinct wares formed of poles and willow sticks, quite across the river, at no great distance from each other. Each of these were furnished with two baskets. The one where to take them ascending and the other in deck ending. In constructing these wares, poles were first tied together in parcels of three near the smaller extremity. These were set on end, and spread in a triangular form at the base, in such manner, that two of the three poles ranged in the direction of the intended work, and the third down the stream. Two ranges of horizontal poles were next lashed with willow bark and widths to the ranging poles, and on these willow sticks were placed perpendicularly, reaching from the bottom of the river to about three or four feet above its surface. And placed so near each other, as not to permit the passage of the fish, and even so thick in some parts, as with the help of gravel and stone to give a direction to the water which they wished to, the baskets were the same in form of the others. This is the form of the work, and disposition of the baskets. After examining the wares Captain C. returned to the lodges, and shortly continued his route and passed the river to the lard. Side a little distance below the wares. He sent Collins with an Indian down the lard. Side of the river to the forks five me. In search of Cruzat who was left at the upper camp yesterday to purchase a horse and had followed on today and passed them by another road while they were at the lodges and had gone on to the forks. While Captain Clark was at these lodges an Indian brought him a tomahawk which he said he found in the grass near the lodge where I had stayed at the upper camp when I was first with his nation the tomahawk was drew ears he missed it in the morning before we had set out and searched for it but it was not to be found I believe the young fellow stole it. But if he did it is the only article they have pilfered and this was now returned. Captain C., after traveling about twenty miles through the valley with the course of the river nearly N. W., encamped on the Stard. Sighed in a small bottom under a high cliff of rocks. On his way one of the party killed a very large salmon in a creek which they passed at the distance of fourteen milliseconds. 
He was joined this evening by Cruzat and Collins who brought with them five fresh salmon which had been given them by the Indians at the Forks. The Forks of this river is famous as a gig fishery and is much resorted by the natives. They killed one deer today. The guide appeared to be a very friendly intelligent old man, Captain C., is much pleased with him. Clark, August 21, 1805 August 21 Wednesday, 1805 Frost last night proceeded on with the Indians I met about five miles to their camp. I entered a lodge and after smoking with all who came about me I went to see the place those people take the fish. Aware across the creek in which there is stuck baskets set in different directions so as to take the fish either deck-ending or ascending on my return to the camp which was two hundred yards only the different lodges, which is only bushes, brought into the lodge I was introduced into. Salmon boiled, and dried choke shares. Sufficient for all my party. One man brought me a tomahawk which we expected they had stolen from a man of Captain Lewis's party, this man informed me he found the tonk in the grass near the place the man slept. Crossed the river and went over a point of high land and struck it again near a bluff on the right side the man I left to get a horse at the upper camp missed me and went to the forks which is about five miles below the last camp. I sent one man by the forks with directions to join me tonight with the one now at that place, those two men joined me at my camp on the right side below the first cliff with five salmon which the Indians gave them at the forks. The place they gig fish at this season. Their method of taking fish with a gig or bone is with a long pole, about a foot from one end is a strong string attached to the pole, this string is a little more than a foot long and is tied to the middle of a bone from four to six inches long. One end sharp the other with a hole to fasten on the end of the pole with a beard to the large end, the fasten this bone on one end and with the other. Feel for the fish and turn and strike them so hard that the bone passes through and catches on the opposite side. Slips off the end of the pole and holds the center of the bone those Indians are mild in their disposition appear sincere in their friendship, punctual, and decided. Kind with what they have, to spare. They are excessive poor, nothing but horses their enemies which are numerous on account of their horses and defenseless situation, have deprived them of tents and all the small conveniences of life. They have only a few indifferent knives, no axe, make use of elk's horn sharpened to spit their wood, no clothes except a short leg ends and robes of different animals, beaver, bear, buffalo, wolf panther, ibex, sheep deer. But most commonly the antelope skins which they wear loosely about them, their ornaments are ortaire skin curated with sea shells and the skins and tails of the white weasel, sea shells of different size hung to their ears hair and breast of their shirts. Beads of shells plaited grass, and small strings of otter skin dressed, they are fond of our trinkets, and give us those ornaments as the most valuable of their possession. The women are held sacred and appear to have an equal share in all conversation, which is not the case in any of nation I have seen. Their boys and girls are also admitted to speak except in councils, the women do all the druggery except fishing and taking care of the horses, which the men April to take upon themselves. The men wear the hair loose flowing over their shoulders and face the women cut short. Ornaments of the back bones of fish strung plated grass grains of corn strung feathers and ornaments of birds claws of the bear encircling their necks the most sacred of all the ornaments of this nation is the sea shells of various sizes and shapes and colors. Of the bastard pearl kind. Which they inform us they get from the Indians to the south on the other side of a large fork of this river in passing to which they have to pass through sandy and barren open plains without water to which place they can travel in fifteen or twenty days, the men who passed by the forks informed me that the S.W. Fork was double the size of the one I came down, and I observed that it was a handsome river at my camp I shall in justice to Captain Lewis who was the first white man ever on this fork of the Columbia call this Lewis's river. One deer killed this morning. And a salmon in the last creek 21 slash 2 feet long the westerly fork of the Columbia River is double the size of the easterly fork and below those forks the river is about the size Jefferson's River near its mouth or 100 yards wide. It is very rapid and showy water clear but little timber. This cliff is of a reddish brown color the rocks which fall from it is a dark brown flint tinged with that color. Some gullies of white sandstone and sand fine and as white as snow. 
The mountains on each side are high, and those on the east rouged and contain a few scattering pine. Those on the west contain pine on their tops and high up the hollows, the bottoms of this is wide and rich from some distance above the place I struck the east fork they are also wide on the east past a large creek which fall in on the right side six miles below the forks a road passes up this creek and to the Missouri. Lewis, August 22, 1805 Thursday August 22 at 1805 this morning early I sent a couple of men to complete the covering of the cache which could not be done well last night in the dark, they soon accomplished their work and returned. Late last night Druyer returned with a fawn he had killed and a considerable quantity of Indian plunder. The anecdote with respect to the latter is perhaps worthy of relation. He informed me that while hunting in the cove yesterday about twelve o'clock, he came suddenly upon an Indian camp, at which there were a young man an old man a boy and three women, that they seemed but little surprised at seeing him and he rode up to them and dismounted turning horse out to grey eyes. These people had just finished their repast on some roots, he entered into conversation with them by signs. And after about twenty minutes one of the women spoke to the others of the party and they all went immediately and collected their horses brought them to camp and saddled them at this moment he thought he would also set out and continue his hunt and accordingly walked to catch his horse at some little distance and neglected to take up his gun which, he left at camp. The Indians perceiving him at the distance of fifty paces immediately mounted their horses, the young man took the gun and the whole of them left their baggage and laid whip to their horses directing their course to the pass of the mountains. Finding himself deprived of his gun he immediately mounted his horse and pursued. After ruining them about ten miles the horses of two of the women nearly gave out and the young fellow with the gun from their frequent cries slackened his pace and being on a very fleet horse rode around the women at a little distance at length Drewer overtook the women and by signs convinced them that he did not wish to hurt them they then halted and the young fellow approached still nearer. He asked him for his gun but the only part of the answer which he could understand was Pa Ki which he knew to be the name by which they called their enemies. Watching his opportunity when the fellow was off his guard he suddenly rode alongside of him seized his gun and wrest her out of his hands. The fellow finding Druyer too strong for him and discovering that he must yield the gun had peasants of mind to open the pan and cast the priming before he let the gun escape from his hands. Now finding himself devast of the gun he turned his horse about and laid whip leaving the women to follow him as well as they could. Druyer now returned to the place they had left their baggage and brought it with him to my camp. It consisted of several dressed and undressed skins. A couple of bags wove with the fingers of the bark of the silk grass containing each about a bushel of dried service berries some chay cakes and about a bushel of roots of three different kinds dried and prepared for use which were full dead in. As many parchment hides of buffalo. Some flint and the instrument of bone for manufacturing the flint into arrow points. Some of this flint was as transparent as the common black glass and much of the same color easily broken, and flaked off much like glass leaving a very sharp edge. One species of the roots were fusiform but six inches long and about the size of a man's finger at the larger end tapering to a small point. The radicals larger than in most fusiform roots. The rind was white and thin. The body or consistence of the root was white mealy and easily reduced by pounding to a substance resembling flour which thickens with boiling water something like flour and is agreeably flavored. This route is frequently eaten by the Indians either green or in its dried state without the preparation of boiling. Another species was much mutilated but appeared to be fibrous. The parts were brittle, hard of the size of a small quill, cylindric and as white as snow throughout, except some small parts of the hard black rind which they had not separate in the preparation. This the Indians with me informed were always boiled for use. I made the experiment, found that they became perfectly soft by boiling, but had a very bitter taste, which was nauseous to my palate, and I transferred them to the Indians who had eat them heartily. A third species were about the size of a nutmeg, and of an irregularly rounded form, something like the smallest of the Jerusalem artichoke, which they also resemble in every other appearance. They had become very hard by being dried these I also boiled agreeably to the instruction of the Indians and found them very agreeable. They resemble the Jerusalem artichoke very much in their flavor and I thought them preferable, 
however there is some allowance to be made for the length of time I have now been without vegetable food to which I was always much attached. These are certainly the best root I have yet seen in use among the Indians. I asked the Indians to shew me the plant of which these roots formed a part but they informed me that neither of them grew near this place. I had set most of the men at work today to dress the deerskin belonging to those who had gone on command with Captain Clark. At 11 a.m. Charbono the Indian woman, Kamiwait and about 50 men with a number of women and children arrived. They encamped near us. After they had turned out their horses and arranged their camp I called the chiefs and warriors together and addressed them a second time. Gave them some further presents, particularly the second and third chiefs who had appeared had agreeably to their promise exerted themselves in my favor. Having no fresh meat and these poor devils half starved I had previously prepared a good meal for them all of boiled corn and beans which I gave them as soon as the council was over and I had distributed the presents. This was thankfully received by them. The chief wished that his nation could live in a country where they could provide such food. I told him that it would not be many years before the white men would put it in the power of his nation to live in the country below the mountains where they might cultivate corn beans and squashes. He appeared much pleased with the information. I gave him a few dried squashes which we had brought from the mandans he had them boiled and declared them to be the best thing he had ever tasted except sugar, a small lump of which it seems his sister Sasi Ahgar we had given him. Late in the evening I made the men form a bush drag, and with it in about two hours they caught 528 very good fish, most of them large trout. Among them I now for the first time saw ten or a dozen of a WHT species of trout. They are of a silvery color except on the back and head, where they are of a bluish cast. The scales are much larger than the speckled trout, but in their form position of their fins teeth mouth and they are precisely like them they are not generally quite as large but equally well flavored. I distributed much the greater portion of the fish among the Indians. I purchased five good horses of them very reasonably, or at least for about the value of six dollars a pace in merchandise. The Indians are very orderly and do not crowd about our camp nor attempt to disturb any article they see lying about. They borrow knives kettles and from the men and always carefully return them. Captain. Clark says, we set out early and passed a small creek at one mile, also the points of four mountains which were high steep and rocky. The mountains are so steep that it is almost incredible to mention that horses had passed them. Our road in many places lay over the sharp fragments of rocks which had fallen from the mountains and lay in confused heaps for miles together, yet notwithstanding our horse traveled barefoot over them as fast as we could and did not detain us. Passed two bold running streams, and arrived at the entrance of a small river, where some Indian families resided. They had some scaffolds of fish and buries exposed to dry. They were not acquainted with the circumstance of any white men being in their country and were therefore much all armed on our approach several of the women and children fled in the woods for shelter. The guide was behind and the wood thick in which their lodges were situated we came on them before they had the least notice of us. Those who remained offered us everything they had, which was but little. They offered us collars of elk's tusks which their children wore salmon berries and. We eat some of their fish and berries but returned them the other articles they had offered with a present of some small articles which seemed to add much to their pacification. The guide who had by this time arrived explained to them who we were and our object in visiting them, but still there were some of the women and children inconsolable, they continued to cry during our stay, which was about an hour. A road passes up this river which my guide informed me led over the mountains to the Missouri. From this place I continued my route along the steep side of a mountain for about three miles and arrived at the river near a small island on the lower point of which we encamped in the evening we attempted to gig fish but were unsuccessful only. Obtaining one small salmon. In the course of the day we had passed several women and children gathering buries who were very liberal in bestowing us a part of their collections. The river is very rapid and shoaly. Many rocks lie in various directions scattered throughout its bed. There are some few small pines scattered through the bottoms, of which I only saw one which appeared as if it would answer for a canoe and that was but small. The tops of the mountains on the lard. 
side are covered with pine and some also scattered on the sides of all the mountains. I saw today a species of woodpecker, which fed on the seeds of the pine. Its beak and tail were white, its wings were black, and every other part of a dark brown. It was about the size of a robin. Clark, August 22, 1805 August 22 d Thursday 1805 we set out early past a small creek on the right at one mile and the points of four mountains very steep high and rocky. The ascent of three was so steep that it is incredible to describe the rocks in many places loose and slight from those mountains and is a bed of rigid loose white and dark brown loose rock for miles. The Indian horses pass over those cliffs hills sids and rocks as fast as a man, the three horses with me do not detain me any on account of those difficulties, past two bold rung. Streams on the right and a small river at the mouth of which several families of Indians were encamped and had several scaffolds of fish and berries drying we all armed them very much as they knew nothing of a white man being in their count ray. And at the time we approached their lodges which was in a thick place of bushes my geeds were behind. They offered everything they possessed, which was very little, to us, some run off and hid in the bushes the first offer of theirs were elk's tusks from around their children's necks, salmon and. My guide attempted pacified those people and they set before me bears, and fish to eat, I gave a few small articles to those frightened people which added very much to their pacification but not entirely as some of the women and child. Cried during my stay of an hour at this place, I proceeded on the side of a very steep and rocky mountain for three miles and encamped on the lower pt of an island. We attempted to gig fish without success. Caught but one small one. The last creek or small river is on the right side and a road passes up it and over to the Missouri, in this day passed several women and children gathering and drying berries of which they were very kind and gave us a part. The river rapid and showy many stones scattered through it in different directions. I saw today bird of the woodpecker kind which fed on pine burrs its bill and tail white the wings black every other part of a light brown, and about the size of a robin. Some few pines scattered in the bottoms and sides of the mountains, the top of the mountain. To the left covered and inaccessible, I saw one which would make a small canoe. Lewis, August 23, 1805 Friday, August 23, 1805. This morning I arose very early and dispatched two hunters on horseback with orders to extend their hunt to a greater distance up the S.E. Fork than they had done heretofore, in order if possible to obtain some meat for ourselves as well as the Indians who appear to depend on us for food and our store of provision is growing too low to indulge them with much more corn or flour. I wished to have set out this morning but the chief requested that I would wait until another party of his nation arrived which he expected today, to this I consented from necessity, and therefore sent out the hunters as I have mentioned. I also laid up the canoes this morning in a pond near the forks, sunk them in the water and weighted them down with stone, after taking out the plugs of the gauge holes in their bottoms. Hoping by this means to guard against both the effects of high water, and that of the fire which is frequently kindled in these plains by the natives. The Indians have promised to do them no intentional injury and believe they are too lazy at any rate to give themselves the trouble to raise them from their present situation in order to cut or burn them. I reminded the chief of the low state of our stores of provision and advised him to send his young men to hunt, which he immediately recommended to them and most of them turned out. I wished to have purchased some more horses of them but they objected against disposing of any more of them until we reached their camp beyond the mountains. The Indians pursued a mule buck near our camp I saw this chase for about four miles it was really entertaining, there were about twelve of them in pursuit of it on horseback, they finally rode it down and killed it. They all came in about 1 p.m. Having killed two mule deer and three goats. This mule buck was the largest deer of any kind I had ever seen. It was nearly as large as a doe elk. I observed that there was but little division or distribution of the meat they had taken among themselves. Some farmers had a large stock and others none. This is not customary among the nations of Indians with whom I have hitherto been acquainted I asked Kamiwait the reason why the hunters did not divide the meat among themselves. He said that meat was so scarce with them that the men who killed it reserved it for themselves and their own families. 
My hunters arrived about two in the evening with two mule deer and three common deer. I distributed three of the deer among those families who appeared to have nothing to eat. At 3 p.m. the expected party of Indians arrived, about 50 men women and children. I now learnt that most of them were thus far on their way down the valley towards the buffalo country. And observed that there was a good deal of anxiety on the part of some of those who had promised to assist me over the mountains to accompany this party. I felt some uneasiness on this subject but as they still said they would return with me as they had promised I said nothing to them but resolved to set out in the morning as early as possible. I dispatched two hunters this evening into the cove to hunt and leave the meat they might kill on the route we shall pass tomorrow. The metal which we found in possession of these people consisted of a few indifferent knives, a few brass kettles some arm bands of iron and brass, a few buttons, worn as ornaments in their hair. A spear or two of a foot in length and some iron and brass arrow points which they informed me they obtained in exchange for horses from the Crow or Rocky Mountain Indians on the Yellowstone River. The bridle bits and stirrups they obtained from the Spaniards, though these were but few. Many of them made use of flint for knives, and with this instrument, skinned the animals they killed, dressed their fish and made their arrows. In short they used it for every purpose to which the knife is applied. This flint is of no regular form, and if they can only obtain a part of it, an inch or two in length that will cut they are satisfied, they renew the edge by fleeking off the flint by means of the point of an elk's or deer's horn. With the point of a deer or elk's horn they also form their arrow points of the flint, with a quickness and neatness that is really astonishing. We found no axes nor hatchets among them, what would they cut was done either with stone or elk's horn. The latter they use always to rive or split their wood. Their culinary utensils exclusive of the brass kettle before mentioned consist of pots in the form of a jar made either of earth, or of a white soft stone which becomes black and very hard by burning. And is found in the hills near the three forks of the Missouri Betwin Madisons and Gallatins rivers they have also spoons made of the buffalo's horn and those of the bighorn. Their bows are made of cedar or pine and have nothing remarkable about them. The back of the bow is covered with sinews and glue and is about twenty-one halves feet long. Much the shape of those used by the Sioux Mandans Minotaurs and K. Their arrows are more slender generally than those used by the nations just mentioned but much the same in construction. Their shield is formed of buffalo hide, perfectly arrow-proof, and is a circle of two feet four i, or two f, six i, in diameter. This is frequently painted with varios figures and ornamented around the edges with feather and a fringe of dressed leather. They sometimes make bows of the elk's horn and those also of the big horn. Those of the elk's horn are made of a single pace and covered on the back with glue and sinews like those made of wood. And are frequently ornamented with a strand wrought porcupine quills and sinews raped around them for some distance at both extremities. The bows of the bighorn are formed of small paces laid flat and cemented with glue, and rolled with sinews, after which, they are also covered on the back with sinews and glue, and highly ornamented as they are much prized. Forming the shield is a ceremony of great importance among them, this implement would in their minds be devast of much of its protecting power were it not inspired with those virtues by their old men and jugglers. Their method of preparing it is thus, an entire skin of a bull buffalo two years old is first provided, a feast is next prepared and all the warriors old men and jugglers invited to partake. A hole is sunk in the ground about the same in diameter with the intended shield and about eighteen inches deep. A parcel of stones are now made red hot and thrown into the whole water is next thrown in and the hot stones cause it to emit a very strong hot steam. Over this they spread the green skin which must not have been suffered to dry after taken off the beast. The flesh side is laid next to the grow round and as many of the workmen as can reach it take hold on its edges and extend it in every direction. As the skin becomes heated, the hair separates and is taken of with the fingers, and the skin continues to contract until the hoo is drawn within the compass designed for the shield. It is then taken off and laid on a parchment hide where they pound it with their heels when barefoot. This operation of pounding continues for several days or as long as the feast lasts when it is delivered to the proprietor and declared by the jugglers and old men to be a sufficient defense against the arrows of their enemies or even bullets if 
feast has been a satisfactory one. Many of them believe implicitly that a ball cannot penetrate their shields, in consequence of certain supernormal powers with which they have been inspired by their jugglers. The pagamagan is an instrument with a handle of wood covered with dressed leather about the size of a whip handle and 22 inches long. A round stone of two pounds weight is also covered with leather and strongly united to the leather of the handle by a throng of two inches long, a loop of leather united to the handle passes errand the wrist. A very heavy blow may be given with this instrument. They have also a kind of armor which they form with many folds of dressed antelope skin, unite with glue and sand. With this they cover their own bodies and those of their horses. These are sufficient against the effects of the arrow dot, the quiver which contains their arrows and implements for making fire is formed of various skins. That of the otter seems to be preferred. They are but narrow, of a length sufficient to protect the arrow from the weather, and are worn on the back by means of a strap which passes over the left shoulder and under the right arm. Their implements for making fire is nothing more than a blunt arrow and a pace of well-seasoned soft spongy wood such as the willow or cottonwood. The point of this arrow they apply to this dry stick so near one edge of it that the particles of wood which are separate from it by the friction of the arrow falls down by its side in a little pile. The arrow is held between the palms of the hand with the fingers extended. And being pressed as much as possible against the pace is briskly rolled between the palms of the hands backwards and forwards by pressing the arrow downwards the hands of course in rolling arrow also deck end. They bring them back with a quick motion and repeat the operation till the dust by the friction takes fire, the pace and arrow are then removed and some dry grass or boated wood is added. It astonished me to see in what little time these people would kindle fire in this way. In less than a minute they will produce fire. Captain. Clark set out this morning very early and proceeded but slowly in consequence of the difficulty of his road which lay along the steep side of a mountain over large irregular and broken masses of rocks which had tumbled from the upper part of the mountain. It was with much risk and pain that the horses could get on. At the distance of four miles he arrived at the river and the rocks were here so steep and juked into the river such manner that there was no other alternative but passing through the river. This he attempted with success though water was so deep for a short distance as to swim the horses and was very rapid. He continued his route one mile along the edge of the river under this steep cliff to a little bottom, below which the whole current of the river beat against the starred shore on which he was, and which was formed of a solid rock perfectly inaccessible to horses. Here also the little track which he had been pursuing, terminated. He therefore determined to leave the horses and the majority of the party here and with his guide and three men to continue his route down the river still further, in order more fully to satisfy himself as to its practicability. Accordingly he directed the men to hunt and fish at this place until his return. They had not killed anything today but one goose, and the balance of the little provision they had brought with them, as well as the five salmon they had procured yesterday were consumed last evening. There was of Tours no inducement for his halting any time, at this place. After a few minutes he continued his route clambering over immense rocks and along the sides of lofty precipices on the border of the river to the distance of twelve miles, at which place a large creek discharged itself on the north side twelve yards wide and deep. A short distance above the entrance of this creek there is a narrow bottom which is the first that he had found on the river from that in which he left the horses and party. A plain Indian road led up this creek which the guide informed him led to a large river that ran to the north, and was frequented by another nation who occasionally visited this river for the purpose of taking fish. At this place he saw some late appearance of Indians having been encamped and the tracks of a number of horses. Captain C., halted here about two hours, caught some small fish, on which, with the addition of some berries, they dined. The river from the place at which he left the party to his present station was one continued rapid, in which there were five shoals neither of which could be passed with loaded canoes nor even run with empty ones. At those several places therefore it would be necessary to unload and transport the baggage for a considerable distance over steep and almost inaccessible rocks where there was no possibility of employing horses for the relief of the men. The canoes would next have to be let down by cords and even with this precaution Captain C. C. 
conceived there would be much risk of both canoes and men. At one of those shoals the lofty perpendicular rocks which from the bases of the mountains approached the river so nearly on each side, as to prevent the possibility of a portage. Or passage for the canoes without expending much labor in removing rocks and cuting away the earth in some places. To surmount these difficulties, precautions must be observed which in their execution must necessarily consume much time and provision, neither of which we can command. The season is now far advanced to remain in these mountains as the Indians inform us we shall shortly have snow. The salmon have so far declined that they are themselves hastening from the country and not an animal of any description is to be seen in this difficult part of the river larger than a pheasant or a squirrel and they not abundant. Add to this that our stock of provision is now so low that it would not support us more than ten days. The bends of the river are short and the current beats from side to side against the rocks with great violence. The river is about one hundred yards. Wide and so deep that it cannot be forded, but in a few places, and the rocks approach the river so near in most places that there is no possibility of passing between them and the water. A passage therefore with horses along the river is also impracticable. The sides of these mountains present generally one barren surface of confused and broken masses of stone. Above these are white or brown and towards the base of a grey colour and so hard that when struck with a steel, yield fire like flint. Those he had just passed were scarcely relieved by the appearance of a tree. But those below the entrance of the creek were better covered with timber, and there were also some tall pine near the river. The sides of the mountains are very steep, and the torrents of water which roll down their sides at certain seasons appear to carry with them vast quantities of the loose stone into the river. After dinner Captain C. Continued his route down the river and at one half a mile passed another creek not so large as that just mentioned, or about five yards wide. Here his guide informed him that by ascending this creek some distance they would have a better road and would cut off a considerable bend which the river made to the south. Accordingly he pursued a well-beaten Indian track which led up this creek about six miles, then leaving the creek on the right he passed over a ridge and at the distance of a mile arrived at the river where it passes through a well-timbered bottom of about eighty acres of land. They passed this bottom and ascended a steep and elevated point of a mountain, from whence the guide shewed him the break of the river through the mountains for about twenty miles further. This view was terminated by one of the most lofty mountains, Captain C., informed me, he had ever seen which was perfectly covered with snow. The river directed its course immediately to this stupendous mountain at the base of which the good informed him those difficulties of which himself and nation had spoken, commenced. That after the river reached this mountain it continued its route to the north for many miles between high and perpendicular rocks, rolling foaming and beating against innumerable rocks which crowded its channel. That then it penetrated the mountain through a narrow gap leaving a perpendicular rock on either side as high as the top of the mountain which he beheld. That the river here making a bend they could not see through the mountain, and as it was impossible to deck end the river or clamber over that vast mountain covered with eternal snow. Neither himself nor any of his nation had ever been lower in this direction, than in view of the place at which the river entered this mountain. That if Captain C. wished him to do so, he would conduct him to that place, where he thought they could probably arrive by the next evening. Captain C. Being now perfectly satisfied as to the impracticability of this route either by land or water, informed the old man. That he was convinced of the veracity of his assertions and would now return to the village from whence they had set out where he expected to meet myself and party. They now returned to the upper part of the last creek he had passed, and encamped. It was an hour after dark before he reached this place. A small river falls into this fork of the Columbia just above the high mountain through which it passes on the south side. Clark, August 23, 1805. August 23, Friday, 1805 We set out early proceed on with great difficulty as the rocks were so sharp large and unsettled and the hillside steep that the horses could with the greatest risque and difficulty get on. No provisions as the five salmons given us yesterday by the Indians were eaten last night, one goose killed this morning. At four miles we came to a place the horses could not pass without going into the river, 
we passed one mile to a very bad riffle the water confined in a narrow channel and beating against the left shore, as we have no path further and the mounts. Jut so close as to prevent the possibility of horses proceeding down, I determined to delay the party here and with my guide and three men proceed on down to examine if the river continued bad or was practicable. I set out with three men directing those left to hunt and fish until my return. I proceeded on Somtims in a small wolf path and at other times climbing over the rocks for twelve miles to a large creek on the right side above the mouth of this creek for a short distance is a narrow bottom and the first. Below the place I left my party, a road passes down this creek which I understood passed to the water of a river which run to th north and was the ground of another nation, some fresh sign about this creek of horse and camps. I delayed two hours to fish, caught some small fish on which we dined. The river from the place I left my party to this creek is almost one continued rapid, five very considerable rapids the passage of either with canoes is entirely impossible. As the water is confined Betwin Hugh rocks and the current beating from one against another for some distance below and and at one of those rapids the mountains close so clost as to prevent a possibility of a portage with great labor in cutting down the side of the hill removing large rocks and and all the others may be passed by taking everything over slippery rocks and the smaller ones passed by letting down the canoes empty with cords, as running them would certainly be productive of the loss of some canoes. Those difficulties and necessary precautions would delay us an immense time in which provisions would be necessary. We have but little and nothing to be procured in this quarter except choke shares and red haws not an animal of any kind to be seen and only the track of a bear, below this creek the lofty pine is thick in the bottom hill sides on the mountains and up. The runs. The river has much the resemblance of that above bends shorter and no passing, after a few miles between the river and the mountains and the current so strong that is dangerous crossing the river. And to proceed down it would render it necessary to cross almost at every bend this river is about 100 yards wide and can be forded but in a few places. Below my guide and many other Indians tell me that the mountains close and is a perpendicular cliff on each side and continues for a great distance and that the water runs with great violence from one rock to the other on each side foaming and roaring through rocks in every direction, so as to render the passage of anything impossible. Those rapids which I had seen he said was small and trifling in comparison to the rocks and rapids below. At no great distance and the hills or mountains were not like those I had seen but like the side of a tree straight up, those mountains which I had passed were steep contain a white, a brown, and low down a grey hard stone which would make fire. Those stone were of different sisses all sharp and are continually slipping down, and in many places one bed of those stones inclined from the river bottom to the top of the mountains. The torrents of water which come down after a rain carries with it immense numbers of those stone into the river about one half a mile below the last mentioned creek another creek falls in. My guide informed me that our route was up this creek by which route we would save a considerable bend of the river to the south. We proceeded on a well B10 Indian path up this creek about six miles and passed over a ridge one mile to the river in a small valley through which we passed and ascended a spur of the mountain from which place my guide shew me the river for about twenty miles lower and pointed out the difficulty we returned to the last creek and camped about one hour after dark. There my guide shewed me a road from the end which came into the one I was in which he said went to a large river which run to the north on which was a nation he called Tushapas, he made a map of it. Lewis, August 24th. 1805. Saturday August 24th, 1805. As the Indians who were on their way down the Missouri had a number of spare hoses with them I thought it probable that I could obtain some of them and therefore desired the chief to speak to them and inform me whether they would trade. They gave no positive answer but requested to see the goods which I was willing to give in exchange. I now produced some battle axes which I had made at Fort Mandan with which they were much pleased. Knives also seemed in great demand among them. I soon purchased three horses and a mule. For each horse I gave an axe a knife handkerchief and a little paint, and for the mule the addition of a knife a shirt handkerchief and a pair of leggings. 
At this price which was quite double that given for the horses, the fellow who sold him made a merit of having bestowed me one of his mules. I consider this mule a great acquisition. These Indians soon told me that they had no more horses for sale and I directed the party to prepare to set out. I had now nine horses and a mule, and two which I had hired made twelve these I had loaded and the Indian women took the balance of the baggage. I had given the interpreter some articles with which to purchase a horse for the woman which he had obtained. At twelve o'clock we set out and passed the river below the forks, directing our route towards the cove along the track formerly mentioned. Most of the horses were heavily laden, and it appears to me that it will require at least twenty-five horses to convey our baggage along such roads as I expect we shall be obliged to pass in the mountains. I had now the inexpressible satisfaction to find myself once more under way with all my baggage and party. An Indian had the politeness to offer me one of his horses to ride which I accepted with cheerfulness as it enabled me to attend better to the march of the party. I had reached the lower part of the cove when an Indian rode up and informed me that one of my men was very sick and unable to come on. I directed the party to halt at a small run which falls into the creek on lard. At the lower part of the cove and rode back about two miles where I found Wiser very ill with a fit of the colic. I sent Sirt. Ordway who had remained with him for some water and gave him a dose of the essence of peppermint and laudanum which in the course of half an hour so far recovered him that he was enabled to ride my horse and I proceeded on foot and rejoined the party. The sun was yet an hour high but the Indians who had for some time impatiently waited my return at length unloaded and turned out their horses and my party had followed their example. As it was so late and the Indians had prepared their camp for the night I thought it best to acquiesce and determined also to remain. We had traveled only about six miles. After we encamped we had a slight shower of rain. Goodrich who is our principal fisherman caught several fine trout. Druyer came to us late in the evening and had not killed anything. I gave the Indians who were absolutely engaged in transporting the baggage, a little corn as they had nothing to eat. I told Kamiwait that my stock of provision was too small to indulge all his people with provision and recommended it to him to advise such as were not assisting us with our baggage to go on to their camp tomorrow and wait our arrival. Which he did accordingly. Kamiwait literally translated is one who never walks. He told me that his nation had also given him another name by which he was signalized as a warrior which was Tu Ettee Kani or Black Gun. These people have many names in the course of their lives, particularly if they become distinguished characters. For it seems that every important event by which they happen to distinguish themselves entitles them to claim another name which is generally selected by themselves and confirmed by the nation. Those distinguishing acts are the killing and scalping an enemy, the killing a white bear, leading a party to war who happen to be successful either in destroying their enemies or robing them of their horses or individually stealing the horses of an enemy. These are considered acts of equal heroism among them, and that of killing an enemy without scalping him is considered of no importance. In fact the whole honor seems to be founded in the act of scalping. For if a man happens to slay a dozen of his enemies in action and others get the scalps or first lay their hand on the dead person the honor is lost to him who killed them and devolves on those who scalp or first touch them. Among the Shoshones, as well as all the Indians of America, bravery is esteemed the primary virtue, nor can any one become eminent among them who has not at some period of his life given proofs of his possessing this virtue. With them there can be no preferment without some warlike achievement. And so completely interwoven is this principle with the earliest elements of thought that it will in my opinion prove a serious obstruction to the restoration of a general peace among the nations of the Missouri. While at Fort Mandan I was one day addressing some chiefs of the Minetares who visited us and pointing out to them the advantages of a state of peace with their neighbors over that of war in which they were engaged. The chiefs who had already gathered their harvest of laurels, and having forcibly felt in many instances some of those inconveniences attending a state of war which I pointed out, readily agreed with me in Apanon. A young fellow under the full impression of the idea I have just suggested asked me if they were in a state of peace with all their neighbors what the nation would do for chiefs. And added that the chiefs were now old and must shortly die and that the nation could not exist without chiefs. 
taking as granted that there could be no other mode devised for making chifes but that which custom had established through the medium of warlike achievements. The few guns which the Shoshones have are reserved for war almost exclusively and the bow and arrows are used in hunting. I have seen a few skins among these people which have almost every appearance of the common sheep. They inform me that they find this animals on the high mountains to the west and s, w, of them. It is about the size of the common sheep, the wool is rather shorter and more intermixed with long hairs particularly on the upper part of the neck. These skins have been so much worn that I could not form a just idea of the animal or its color. The Indians however inform me that it is white and that its horns are lunated comparis twisted and bent backward as those of the common sheep. The texture of the skin appears to be that of the sheep. I am now perfectly convinced that the sheep as well as the bighorn exist in these mountains. The usual comparison of the Shoshone horse is a halter and saddle. The first consists either of a round plated or twisted cord of six or seven strands of buffalo's hair, or a throng of raw hide made pliant by pounding and rubing. These cords of buffalo's hair are about the size of a man's finger and remarkably strong. This is the kind of halter which is preferred by them. The halter of whatever it may be composed is always of great length and is never taken from the neck of the horse which they commonly use at any time. It is first attached at one end about the neck of the horse with a knot that will not slip. It is then brought down to his under jaw and being passed through the mouth embases the under jaw and tonge in a simple noose formed by crossing the rope underneath the jaw of the horse. This when mounted he draws up on the near side of the horse's neck and holds in the left hand. Suffering it to trail at a great distance behind him sometimes the halter is attached so far from the end that while the shorter end serves him to govern his horse, the other trails on the ground as before mentioned. They put their horses to their full speed with those cords trailing on the ground. When they turn out the horse to graze the noose is merely loosed from his mouth. The saddle is made of wood and covered with raw hide which holds the parts very firmly together. It is made like the pack saddles in use among the French and Spaniards. It consists of two flat thin boards which fit the sides of the horse's back. And are held firm by two paces which are united to them behind and before on the outer side and which rise to a considerable height terminating sometimes in flat horizontal points extending outwards. And alwas in an acute angle or short bend underneath the upper part of these paces. A pace of buffalo's skin with the hair on, is usually put underneath the saddle, and very seldom any covering on the saddle. Stirrups when used are made of wood and covered with leather. These are generally used by the elderly men and women. The young men scarcely ever use anything more than a small pad of dressed leather stuffed with hair, which is confined with a leather thong passing errand the body of the horse in the manner of a girth. They frequently paint their favorite horses, and cut their ears in various shapes. They also decorate their manes and tails, which they never draw or trim, with the feathers of birds, and sometimes suspend at the breast of the horse the finest ornaments they possess. The Spanish bridle is preferred by them when they can obtain them, but they never dispense with the cord about the neck of the horse, which serves them to take him with more ease when he is ruining at large. They are excellent horsemen and extremely expert in casting the cord about the neck of a horse. The horses that have been habituated to be taken with the cord in this way, however wild they may appear at first, surrender the moment they feel the cord about their necks. There are no horses in this quarter which can with propriety be termed wild. There are some few which have been left by the Indians at large for so great a length of time that they have become shy, but they all shew marks of having been in possession of man. Such is that one which Captain Clark saw just below the three forks of the Missouri, and one other which I saw on the Missouri below the entrance of the Muscle Shell River. Captain Clark set out very early this morning on his return, he traveled down the creek to its entrance by the same Indian track he had ascended it. At the river he marked his name on a pine tree, then ascended to the bottom above the second creek, and breakfasted on buries, which occupied them about one hour. He now retraced his former track and joined the party where he had left them at 4 p.m. On his way Captain C. fell from a rock and injured one of his legs very much. 
The party during his absence had killed a few pheasants and caught a few small fish on which together with haws and service berries they had subsisted. They had also killed one cock of the mountain's captain. Clark now wrote me a description of the river and country, and stated our prospects by this route as they have been heretofore mentioned and dispatched Calter on horseback with orders to lose no time reaching me. He set out late with the party continued his route about two miles and encamped. Captain Clark had seen some trees which would make small canoes but all of them some distance below the Indian caps which he passed at the entrance of Fish Creek. Clark, August 24, 1805 August 24, Saturday 1805 set out very early this morning on my return passed down the creek at the mouth marked my name on a pine tree. Proceed on to the bottom above the creek and brack fast on berries and delayed one hour, then proceed on up the river by the same route we decended to the place I left my party where we arrived at four o'clock. I slighted and bruised my leg very much on a rock, the party had killed several pheasants and caught a few small fish on which they had subsisted in my absence. Also a heath hen, near the size of a small turkey. I wrote a letter to Captain Lewis informing him of the prospects before us and information wrecked of my guide which I thought favorable and and stating two plans one of which for us to pursue and and dispatched one man and horse and directed the party to get ready to march back, every man appeared disheartened from the prospects of the river, and nothing to eat, I set out late and camped two miles above. Nothing to eat but choke cherries and red haws which act in different ways so as to make us sick, do very heavy, my beating wet in passing around a rock the horses were obliged to go deep into the water. The plan I stated to Captain Lewis if he agrees with me we shall adopt is to procure as many horses, one for each man, if possible and to hire my present guide who I sent on to him to interrogate through the imperture. And proceed on by land to some navigable part of the Columbia River, or to the ocean, depending on what provisions we can procure by the gun ade to the small stock we have on hand depending on our horses as the last resort. A second plan to divide the party one part to attempt this defecuate river with what provisions we had, and the remainder to pass by land on hose back depending on our gun and for provisions and and come together occasionally on the river. The ones of which I would be most pleased with and I saw several trees which would make small canoes and by putting two together would make a sissable one, all below the last Indian camp several miles. Lewis, August 25, 1805. Sunday, August 25, 1805. This morning loaded our horses and set out a little after sunrise, a few only of the Indians unengaged in assisting us went on as I had yesterday proposed to the chief. The others flanked us on each side and started some antelope which they pursued for several hours but killed none of them. We proceeded within two mis of the narrow pass or seven miles from our camp of last evening and halted for dinner. Our hunters joined us at noon with three deer the greater part of which I gave the Indians. Some time after we had halted, Charbono mentioned to me with apparent unconcern that he expected to meet all the Indians from the camp on the Columbia tomorrow on their way to the Missouri. All armed at this information I asked why he expected to meet them. He then informed me that the first chief had dispatched some of his young men this morning to this camp requesting the Indians to meet them tomorrow and that himself and those with him would go on with them down the Missouri. And consequently leave me and my baggage on the mountain or thereabouts. I was out of patience with the folly of Charbono who had not sufficient sagacity to see the consequences which would inevitably flow from such a movement of the Indians. And although he had been in possession of this information since early in the morning when it had been communicated to him by his Indian woman yet he never mentioned it until the afternoon. I could not forbear speaking to him with some degree of asperity on this occasion. I saw that there was no time to be lost in having those orders countermanded, or that we should not in all probability obtain any more horses or even get my baggage to the waters of the Columbia. I therefore called the three chiefs together and having smoked a pipe with them, I asked them if they were men of their words, and whether I could depend on the promises they had made me, they readily answered in the affirmative. I then asked them if they had not promised to assist me with my baggage to their camp on the other side of the mountains, or to the place at which Captain Clark might build the canoes, should I wish it. They acknowledged that they had. 
I then asked them why they had requested their people on the other side of the mountain to meet them tomorrow on the mountain where there would be no possibility of our remaining together for the purpose of trading for their horses as they had also promised. That if they had not promised to have given me their assistance in transporting my baggage to the waters on the other side of the mountain that I should not have attempted to pass the mountains but would have returned down the river and that in that case they would never have seen any more white men in their country. That if they wished the white men to be their friends and to assist them against their enemies by furnishing them with arms and keeping their enemies from attacking them that they must never promise us anything which they did not mean to perform. That when I had first seen them they had doubted what I told them about the arrival of the party of white men in canoes, that they had been convinced that what I told them on that occasion was true. Why then would they doubt what I said on any other point? I told them that they had witnessed my liberality in dividing the meat which my hunters killed with them, and that I should continue to give such of them as assisted me a part of whatever we had ourselves to eat. And finally concluded by telling them if they intended to keep the promises they had made me to dispatch one of their young men immediately with orders to their people to remain where they were until our arrival. The two inferior chiefs said that they wished to assist me and be as good as their word, and that they had not sent for their people, that it was the first chief who had done so, and they did not approve of the measure. Kamiwait remained silent for some time, at length he told me that he knew he had done wrong but that he had been induced to that measure from seeing all his people hungry. But as he had promised to give me his assistance he would not in future be worse than his word. I then desired him to send immediately and countermand his orders, accordingly a young man was sent for this purpose and I gave him a handkerchief to engage him in my interest. This matter being arranged to my satisfaction I called all the women and men together who had been assisting me in the transportation of the baggage and gave them a billet for each horse which they had employed in that service and informed them when. We arrived at the place where we should finally halt on the river I would take the billet back and give them merchandise for it. Everyone appeared now satisfied and when I ordered the horses loaded for our departure the Indians were more than usually alert. We continued our march until late in the evening and encamped at the upper part of the cove where the creek enters the mountains. Here our hunters joined us with another deer which they had killed, this I gave to the women and children, and for my own part remained supperless. I observed considerable quantities of wild onions in the bottom lands of this cove. I also saw several large hares and many of the cock of the plains. Captain Clark set out early this morning and continued his route to the Indian camp at the entrance of Fish Creek, here he halted about an hour. The Indians gave himself and party some boiled salmon and hurries. These people appeared extremely hospitable though poor and dirty in the extreme. He still pursued the track up the river by which he had deck ended and in the evening arrived at the bluff on the river where he had encamped on the 21st INST it was late in the evening before he reached this place. They formed their camp, and Captain C. sent them in different directions to hunt and fish. Some little time after they halted a party of Indians passed by on their way down the river, consisting of a man a woman and several boys. From these people the guide obtained two salmon which together with some small fish they caught and a beaver which Shannon killed furnished them with a plentiful supper. The pine grows pretty abundantly high up on the sides of the mountains on the opposite side of the river. One of the hunters saw a large herd of elk on the opposite side of the river in the edge of the timbered land. Windsor was taken very sick today and detained Captain C. very much on his march. Three hunters whom he had sent on before him this morning joined him in the evening having killed nothing, they saw only one deer. The course and the distances, of Captain Clark's route down this branch of the Columbia below this bluff, commencing opposite to an island, are as follow. This morning while passing through the Shoshone Cove Fraser fired his musket at some ducks in a little pond at the distance of about sixty yards from me, the ball rebounded from the water and posade within a very few feet of me. Near the upper part of this cove the Shoshones suffered a very severe defeat by the Minotaurs about six years since. This part of the cove on the N.E. side of the creek has lately been burned by the Indians as a signal on some occasion. Clark, August 25th 1805. August 25 Sunday, 1805 set out very early and halted one hour at the Indian camp, they were kind gave us all a little boiled sarnman and dried berries to eat, ABT. 
half as much as I could eat, those people are kind with what they have, but excessive poor and dirty. We proceeded on over the mountains we had before passed to the bluff we encamped at on the 21's instant where we arrived late and turned out to hunt and fish, caught several small fish. A party of squars and one man with several boys going down to Gwaith Berries below, my guide got two salmon from this party, which made about half a supper for the party. After dark Shannon came in with a beaver which the party souped on sumptuously, one man very sick today which detained us very much I had three hunters out all day, they saw one deer, killed nothing. One of the party saw nine elk on a mountain to our right ascending, amongst the pine timber which is thick on that side. Lewis, August 26, 1805. Monday, August 26, 1805. This morning was excessively cold. There was ice on the vessels of water which stood exposed to the air nearly a quarter of an inch thick. We collected our horses and set out at sunrise. We soon arrived at the extreme source of the Missouri. Here I halted a few minutes, the men drank of the water and consoled themselves with the idea of having at length arrived at this long wished for point. From hence we proceeded to a fine spring on the side of the mountain where I had lain the evening before I first arrived at the Shoshone camp. Here I halted to dine and grey eyes our horses, there being fine green grass on that part of the hillside which was moistened by the water of the spring while the grass on the other parts was perfectly dry and parched with the sun. I directed a pint of corn to be given each Indian who was engaged in transporting our baggage and about the same quantity to each of the men which they parched pounded and made into soup. One of the women who had been assisting in the transportation of the baggage halted at a little run about a mile behind us, and sent on the two pack horses which she had been conducting by one of her female friends. I inquired of Kamiwait the cause of her detention, and was informed by him in an unconcerned manner that she had halted to bring forth a child and would soon overtake us. In about an hour the woman arrived with her newborn babe and passed us on her way to the camp apparently as well as she ever was. It appears to me that the facility and ease with which the women of the Aborigines of North America bring forth their children is rather a gift of nature than depending as some have supposed on the habitude of carrying heavy burthens on their backs while in a state of pregnancy. If a pure and dry air, an elevated and cold country is unfavorable to childbirth, we might expect every difficult incident to that operation of nature in this part of the continent. Again as the Snake Indians possess an abundance of horses, their women are seldom compelled like those in other parts of the continent to carry burthens on their backs, yet they have their children with equal convenience. And it is a rare occurrence for any of them to experience difficulty in childbirth. I have been several times informed by those who were conversant with the fact, that the Indian women who are pregnant by white men experience more difficulty in childbirth than when pregnant by an Indian. If this be true it would go far in support of the opinion I have advanced. The tops of the high and irregular mountains which present themselves to our view on the opposite side of this branch of the Columbia are yet perfectly covered with snow. The air which proceeds from those mountains has an agreeable coolness and renders these parched and south hillsides much more supportable at this time of the day it being now about noon. I observe the Indian women collecting the root of a species of fennel which grows in the moist grounds and feeding their poor starved children, it is really distressing to witness the situation of those poor wretches. The radix of this plant is of the knob kind, of a long ovate form terminating in a single radical, the whole being about three or four inches in length and the thickest part about the size of a man's little finger. It is white firm and crisp in its present state, when dried and pounded it makes a fine white meal, the flavor of this root is not unlike that of aniseed but not so pungent. The stem rises to the height of three or four feet is jointed smooth and cylindric, from our to four of those knobbed roots are attached to the base of this stem. The leaf is sheathing sessile, and pultipartite, the divisions long and narrow. The whole is of a deep green. It is now in blame, the flowers are numerous, small, petals white, and are of the umbilaferous kind. Several small peduncles put forth from the main stalk one at each joint above the sheathing leaf. It has no root leaves. The root of the present year declines when the seeds have been matured and the succeeding spring other roots of a similar kind put forth from the little knot which unites the roots and stem and grow and decline with the stem as before mentioned. 
The sunflower is very abundant near the watercourses the seeds of this plant are now ripe and the natives collect them in considerable quantities and reduce them to meal by pounding and rubing them between smooth stones. This meal is a favorite food their manner of using it has been before mentioned. After dinner we continued our route towards the village. On our near approach we were met by a number of young men on horseback. Kamiwait requested that we would discharge our guns when we arrived in sight of the village. Accordingly when I arrived on an eminence above the village in the plain I drew up the party at open order in a single rank and gave them a ruining fire discharging two rounds. They appeared much gratified with this exhibition. We then proceeded to the village or encampment of brush lodges 32 in number. We were conducted to a large lodge which had been prepared for me in the center of their encampment which was situated in a beautiful level smooth and extensive bottom near the river about three miles above the place I had first found them encamped. Here we arrived at six in the evening arranged our baggage near my tent and placed those of the men on either side of the baggage facing outwards. I found Coulter here who had just arrived with a letter from Captain Clark in which Captain C. had given me an account of his peregrination and the description of the river and country as before detailed from this view of the subject I found it a folly to think of attempting to deckend this river in canoes and therefore to commence the purchase of horses in the morning from the Indians in order to carry into execution the design we had formed of passing the Rocky Mountains. I now informed Kamiwait of my intended expedition overland to the great river which lay in the plains beyond the mountains and told him that I wished to purchase twenty horses of himself and his people to convey our baggage. He observed that the Minotaurs had stolen a great number of their horses this spring but hoped his people would spear me the number I wished. I also asked a guide, he observed that he had no doubt but the old man who was with Captain C would accompany us if we wished him and that he was better informed of the country than any of them. Matters being thus far arranged I directed the fiddle to be played and the party danced very merrily much to the amusement and gratification of the natives. Though I must confess that the state of my own mind at this moment did not well accord with the prevailing mirth as I somewhat feared that the caprice of the Indians might suddenly induce them to withhold their horses from us without which my hopes of prosecuting my voyage to advantage was lost. However I determined to keep the Indians in a good humor if possible, and to lose no time in obtaining the necessary number of horses. I directed the hunters to turn out early in the morning and endeavor to obtain some meat. I had nothing but a little parched corn to eat this evening. This morning Captain C. and Party. Clark, August 26, 1805. August 26, Monday. 1805 a fine morning dispatched three men ahead to hunt, our horses missing sent out my guide and four men to hunt them, which detained me until nine o'clock a.m. At which time I set out and proceeded on by the way of the forks to the Indian camps at the first were not one mouthful to eat until night as our hunters could kill nothing and I could see and catch no fish except a few small ones. The Indians gave us two salmon boiled which I gave to the men, one of my men shot a salmon in the river about sunset those fish gave us a supper. All the camp flocked about me until I went to sleep, and I believe if they had a sufficiency to eat themselves and any to spare they would be liberal of it I directed the men to mend their moccasins tonight and turn out in the morning early to hunt. Dear fish birds and k. And k. Saw great numbers of the large black grasshopper. Some bars which were very wild, but few birds. A number of ground lizards. Some few pigeons. Clark, August 27, 1805. August 27, Tuesday, 1805 Some frost this morning every man except one, out hunting, a young man came from the upper village and informed me that Captain Lewis would join me about twelve o'clock today. One man killed a small salmon, and the Indians gave me another which afforded us a slight breakfast. Those poor people are here depending on what fish they can catch, without anything else to depend on. And appear contented, my party hourly complaining of their wretched situation and doubts of starving in a count ray where no game of any kind except a few fish can be found, an Indian broth into the camp five salmon. Two of which I purchased which afforded us a supper. Clark, August 28, 1805. August 28, Wednesday. 1805 a frost this morning. The inns. 
caught out of their trap several salmon and gave us two, I purchased two others which we made last us today. Several a camp of about forty Indians came from the West Fork and passed up today, nothing killed by my party with every exertion in all places where game probably might be found. I dispatched one man to the upper camps to inquire if Cap. Lewis was coming and he returned after night with a letter from Captain Lewis informing me of his situation at the upper village, and had procured twenty-two horses for our route through by land on the plan which I had preposed in which he agreed with me in. And requested me to ride up and get the horses the Indian informed him they had reserved for me and. I purchased some fish row of those poor but kind people with whom I am encamped for which I gave three small fish hooks, the use of which they readily proseved, one Indian out all day and killed only one salmon with his gig. My hunters killed nothing, I had three pack saddles made today for our horses which I expected Captain Lewis would purchase and. Those salmon which I live on at present are pleasant eating, notwithstanding they weaken me very fast and my flesh I find is declining. Clark, August 29, 1805. August 29, Thursday, 1805 A cold morning some frost. The wind from the south. I left our baggage in possession of two men and proceeded on up to join Captain Lewis at the upper village of Snake Indians where I arrived at one o'clock found him much engaged in counseling and attempting to purchase a few more horses. I spoke to the Indians on various subjects endeavoring to impress on the higher minds the advantage it would be to them for to sell us horses and expedite the our journey the nearest and best way possibly that we might return as soon as possible and winter with them at some place where there was plenty of buffalo. Our wish is to get a horse for each man to carry our baggage and for some of the men to ride occasionally, the horses are handsome and much accustomed to be changed as to their pasture. We cannot calculate on their carrying large loads and feed on the grass which we may calculate on finding in the mountain through which we may expect to pass on our route made some celestial observations, the lard. Of this part the Columbia River is underscore 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 north. Longed. Underscore 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 w. I purchased a horse for which I gave my pistol one hundred balls powder and a knife. Our hunters killed two deer near their camp today. Two yesterday and three the day before, this meat was a great treat to me as I had eaten none for eight days past. Clark, August 30th, 1805. August 30th Friday, 1805 A fine morning, finding that we could purchase no more horse than we had for our goods and. And those not a sufficient number for each of our party to have one which is our wish, I gave my fusee to one of the men and sold his musket for a horse which completed us to twenty-nine total horses. We purchased pack cords made saddles and set out on our route down the river by land guided by my old guide one other who joined him. The old good's three sons followed him before we set out our hunters killed three deer procked on twelve miles and encamped on the river south side. At the time we set out from the Indian camps the greater part of the band set out over to the waters of the Missouri. We had great attention paid to the horses, as they were nearly all sore backs and several poor, and young those horses are indifferent, many sore backs and others not accustomed to pack. And as we cannot put large loads on them are compelled to purchase as many as we can to take our small proportion of baggage of the parties. And eat if necessary, proceeded on twelve miles today. Clark, August 31, 1805. August 31, 1805 Saturday a fine morning set out before sunrise, as we passed the lodges at which place I had encamped for THRE nights and left two men. Those two men joined us and we proceeded on in the same route I deck-ended the 21st instant, halted three hours on Salmon Creek to let our horses graze the wind hard from the S. W. I met an Indian on horseback who fled with great speed to some lodges below and informed them that the enemies were coming down, RMD with guns and. The inhabitants of the lodges indeceived him. We proceeded on the road on which I had deck ended as far as the first run below and left the road and proceeded up the run in a tolerable road four miles and encamped in some old lodges at the place the road leaves the creek and ascends the high count ray six Indians followed us four of them the sons of our guide. Our hunters killed one deer a goose and prairie fowl. This day warm and sultry, prairies or open valleys on fire in several places, 
the Count Ray is set on fire for the purpose of collecting the different bands. And a band of the Flatheads to go to the Missouri where they intend passing the winter here the buffalo proceeded on 22 miles today, for miles of which up a run. Clark, September 1. 1805. September 1 Sunday, 1805 A fine morning set out early and proceeded on over high rouged hills passing the heads of the small runs which fall into the river on our left to a large creek which falls into the river six miles to our left and encamped in the bottom. Some rain today at twelve and in the evening which obliges us to continue all night dispatched two men to the mouth of the creek to purchase fish of the Indians at that place, they returned with some dried, we gigged four salmon and killed one deer today. The Count Ray which we pass today is well watered and broken poor stony hilly country except the bottoms of the creek which is narrow, all the Indians leave us except our guide. One man shot two bear this evening unfortunately we could get neither of them. Clark, September 2, 1805. September 2, Monday, 1805 A cloudy morning, rain some last night we set out early and proceeded on up the creek. Crossed a large fork from the right and one from the left. And at eight miles left the road on which we were pursuing and which leads over to the Missouri. And proceeded up a west fork without a road procked on through thickets in which we were obliged to cut a road, over rocky hillsides where our horses were in pitchal danger of slipping to their certain destruction and up and down steep hills. Where several horses fell, some turned over, and others sliped down steep hillsides, one horse crippled and two gave out. With the greatest difficulty risque and We made five miles and encamped on the left side of the creek in a small stony bottom after night some time before the rear came up, one load left, about two miles back, the horse on which it was carried crippled. Some rain at night. Clark, September 3, 1805. September 3, Tuesday, 1805 A cloudy morning. Horses very stiff sent two men back with the horse on which Captain Lewis rode for the load left back last night which detained us until, eight o'clock at which time we set out. The country is timbered with pine generally the bottoms have a variety of shrubs and the fir trees in great abundance. Hills high and rocky on each side, in the after part of the day the high mountains closed the creek on each side and obliged us to take on the steep sides of those mountains, so steep that the horses could screckly keep from slipping down. Several sliped and injured themselves very much, with great difficulty we made underscore 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 miles and encamped on a bran of the creek we ascended after crossing several steep points and one mountain. But little to eat I killed five pheasants and the hunts four with a little corn afforded us a kind of supper, at dusk it began to snow at three o'clock some rain. The mountains to the east covered with snow. We met with a great misfortune, in having our last thermometer broken by accident. This day we passed over immense hills and some of the worst road that ever horses passed our horses frequently fell snow about two inches deep when it began to rain which terminated in a sleet our GNL. Courses nearly north from the R. Clark, September 4, 1805. September 4 Wednesday, 1805 A very cold morning everything wet and frost, we detained until 8 o'clock to thaw the covering for the baggage and. And. Ground covered with snow, we ascended a mountain and took a dividing ridge which we kept for several miles and fell on the head of a creek which appeared to run the course we wished to go, I was in front. And saw several of the Argalia or Ibex deck ended the mountain by very steep descent taking the advantage of the points and best places to the creek. Where our hunter killed a deer which we made use of and pursued our course down the creek to the forks about five miles where we met a part of the flat head nation of thirty-three lodges about eighty men four hundred total and at least five hundred horses. Those people wrecked us friendly, threw white robes over our shoulders and smoked in the pipes of peace, we encamped with them and found them friendly but nothing but berries to eat a part of which they gave us. Those Indians are well dressed with skin shirts and robes, they stout and light complected more so than common for Indians, the chiefs harangued until late at night, smoked our pipe and appeared satisfied. I was the first white man who ever wer on the waters of this river. Clark, September 5, 1805. September 5 Thursday, 
1805 a cloudy morning we assembled the chiefs and warriors and spoke to them, with much difficulty as what we said had to pass through several languages before it got into theirs. Which is a guggling kind of language spoken much through the fraught, we informed them who we were, where we came from, where bound and for what purpose and k. And k. And requested to purchase and exchange a few horses with them, in the course of the day I purchased eleven horses and exchanged seven for which we gave a few articles of merchandise. Those people possess elegant horses. We made four chiefs whom we gave meat ells and a few small articles with tobacco. The women brought us a few berries and roots to eat and the principal chief addressed braro, otter and two goat and antelope skins. Those people wore their hair the men sued with otter skin on each side falling over the shoulders forward. The women loose promiscuously over their shoulders and face long shirts which comes to the ankles and tied with a belt about their waist with a robe over, they have but few ornaments and what they do were are similar to the snake Indians. They call themselves Eat Lash Shoot and consist of 450 lodges in all and divided into several bands on the heads of Columbia River and Missouri, some low down the Columbia River. Clark, September 6th. 1805. September 6th Friday, 1805 Some little rain, purchased two fine horses and took a vocabulary of the language littened our loads and packed up, rain continued. Until 12 o'clock we set out at 2 o'clock at the same time all the Indians set out on their way to meet the Snake Indians at the Three Forks of the Missouri. Crossed a small river from the right we call underscore 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 soon after setting out, also a small creek from the north all three forks coming together below our camp at which place the mountains close on each side of the river, we proceeded on N30W. Crossed a mountain and struck the river several miles down, at which place the Indians had encamped two days before, we proceeded on down the river which is thirty yards wide shallow and stony. Crossing it several times and encamped in a small bottom on the right side. Rained this evening nothing to eat but berries, our flour out, and but little corn, the hunters killed two pheasants only, all our horses purchased of the at last shoots we secured well for fear of their leaving of us. And watched them all night for fear of their leaving us or the Indians pursuing and stealing them. Clark, September 7. 1805. September 7 Saturday 1805 A cloudy and rainy day the greater part of the day dark and drizzly we proceed on down the river through a valley past several small runs on the right and three creeks on the left the valley from one to two miles wide the snow top mountains to our left. Open hilly Count Ray on the right. Saw two horses left by the Indians those horses were as wild elk. One of our hunters came up this morning without his horse, in the course of the night the horse broke loose and cleared out, we did not make camp until dark, for the want of a good place, one of our hunters did not join us this evening. He having killed an elk packed his horses and could not overtake us. Clark, September 8. 1805. September 8 Sunday, 1805 A cloudy morning set out early and proceeded on through an open valley for twenty-three miles past four creeks on the right some runs on the left, the bottoms as also the hill's stony bad land. Some pine on the creeks and mountains, and partial on the hills to the right-hand side. Two of our hunters came up with us at twelve o'clock with an elk and buck, the wind from the N, W, and cold. The foot of the snow mountains approached the river on the left side. Some snow on the mountain to the right also proceeded on down the valley which is poor stony land and encamped on the right side of the river a hard rain all the evening we are all cold and wet. On this part of the river on the head of Clark's River I observe great quantities of a peculiar sort of prickly pear grow in clusters oval and about the size of a pigeon's eggy with strong thorns which is so burred as to draw the pear from the cluster. After penetrating our feet. Druyer killed a deer. I killed a prairie fowl we found two mirrors and a colt the mirrors were lame, we ventured to let our late purchase of horses loose tonight. Lewis, September 9th. 1805. Monday, September 9, 1805. Set out at 7 a.m. This morning and proceeded down the Flathead River leaving it on our left, the country in the valley of this river is generally a prairie and from five to six miles wide the growth is almost altogether pine principally of the long-leafed kind. With some spruce and a kind of fir resembling the Scotch fir. 
Near the watercourses we find a small proportion of the narrow-leafed cottonwood some redwood honeysuckle and rose bushes form the scant proportion of underbrush to be seen. At twelve we halted on a small branch which falls into the river on the E. Side, where we breakfasted on a scant proportion of meat which we had reserved from the hunt of yesterday added to three geese which one of our hunters killed this morning. Two of our hunters have arrived, one of them brought with him a red-headed woodpecker of the large kind common to the U States. This is the first of the kind I have seen since I left the Illinois. Just as we were setting out Druyer arrived with two deer. We continued our route down the valley about four miles and crossed the river. It is here a handsome stream about 100 yards wide and affords a considerable quantity of very clear water, the banks are low and its bed entirely gravel. The stream appears navigable, but from the circumstance of there being no salmon in it I believe that there must be a considerable fall in it below. Our guide could not inform us where this river discharged itself into the Columbia River, he informed us that it continues its course along the mountains to the end. As far as he knew it and that not very distant from where we then were it formed a junction with a stream nearly as large as itself which took its rise in the mountains near the Missouri to the east of U.S. and passed through an extensive valley. Generally open prairie which forms an excellent pass to the Missouri. The point of the Missouri where this Indian pass intersects it, is about thirty miles above the gates of the Rocky Mountain, or the place where the valley of the Missouri first widens into an extensive plain after entering the Rocky Mountains. The guide informed us that a man might pass to the Missouri from hence by that route in four days. We continued our route down the W. Side of the river about five miles further and encamped on a large creek which falls in on the west as our guide informs that we should leave the river at this place and the weather appearing settled and fair I determined to halt the next day rest our horses and take some celestial observations. We called this creek Traveler's Rest. It is about twenty yards wide a fine bold clear running stream the land through which we passed is but indifferent a good white gravelly soil. We estimate our journey of this day at 19 m. Clark, September 9, 1805. September 9, Monday, 1805 A fair morning set out early and proceeded on through a plain as yesterday down the valley crossed a large scattering creek on which cotton trees grew at eleven halves miles, a small one at ten miles. Both from the right, the main river at fifteen miles and encamped on a large creek from the left which we call Traveler's Rest Creek. Killed four deer and four ducks and three prairie fowls. Day Fair Wind N. W. C. Supplement. Lewis, September 10, 1805. Tuesday, September 10, 1805. The morning being fair I sent out all the hunters, and directed two of them to proceed down the river as far as its junction with the eastern fork which heads near the Missouri, and return this evening. This fork of the river we determined to name the Valley Plain River. I think it most probable that this river continues its course along the rocky MTS. Northwardly as far or perhaps beyond the scourses of Medicine River and then turning to the west falls into the Tecuchitesi. The Minetares informed us that there was a large river west of, and at no great distance from the sources of Medicine River, which passed along the Rocky Mountains from S to N. This evening one of our hunters returned accompanied by three men of the Flathead Nation whom he had met in his excursion up Traveler's Rest Creek. On first meeting him the Indians were all armed and prepared for battle with their bows and arrows, but he soon relieved their fears by laying down his gun and advancing towards them. The Indians were mounted on very fine horses of which the Flatheads have a great abundance, that is, each man in the nation possesses from twenty to a hundred head. Our guide could not speak the language of these people but soon engaged them in conversation by signs or gesticulation, the common language of all the aborigines of North America. It is one understood by all of them and appears to be sufficiently copious to convey with a degree of certainty the outlines of what they wish to communicate. In this manner we learned from these people that two men which they supposed to be of the Snake Nation had stolen twenty-three horses from them and that they were in pursuit of the thieves. They told us they were in great haste, we gave them some boiled venison, of which they eat sparingly. The sun was now set, two of them departed after receiving a few small articles which we gave them, and the third remained, having agreed to continue with us as a guide. 
and to introduce us to his relations whom he informed us were numerous and resided in the plain below the mountains on the Columbia River, from whence he said the water was good and capable of being navigated to the sea. That some of his relation were at the sea last fall and saw an old white man who resided there by himself and who had given them some handkerchiefs such as he saw in our possession. He said it would require five sleeps which is six days' travel, to reach his relations. The Flatheads are a very light-colored people of large stature and comely form. Clark, September 10, 1805 September 10, Tuesday, 1805 A fair morning concluded to delay today and make some observations, as at this place the route which we are to pursue will pass up the Traveler's Rest Creek. The day proved fair and we took equal altitudes and some inner observations. The Lat. 46 degrees 48 minutes 28 seconds as the guide report that no game is to be found on our route for a long ways, adds an addition to the cause of our delay to procure some meat, dispatched all our hunters in different directions. To hunt the deer which is the only large game to be found they killed four deer a beaver and three grouse which was divided, one of the hunters Coulter. Met with three Tushapaw Indians who were in pursuit of two snake Indians that bayed taken from their camps on the head of Kuskusk River 21 horses. Those Indians came with Coulter to our camp and informed by signs of their misfortune and the route to their villages and k. And k. One of them concluded to return with us. We gave them a ring fish hook and tied a piece of ribbon in the hair of each which appeared to please them very much, Cap Lewis gave them a steel and a little powder to make fire, after eating two of them proceeded on in pursuit of their horses. Men all much engaged preparing moccasins and k. And k. The Count Ray about this place is already described in that above. Clark, September 11, 1805. September 11th Wednesday, 1805 A fair morning wind from the N.W. We set out at three o'clock and proceeded on up the Traveler's Rest Creek. Accompanied by the Flat Head or Tushapaws Indians about seven miles below this creek a large fork comes in from the right and heads up against the waters of the Missouri below the Three Forks, this river has extensive valleys of open level land. And passes in its whole course through a valley, they call it our guide telephones us a fine large road passes up this river to the Missouri, the loss of two of our horses detained us utile. 3 o'clock. P.M. Our flathead Indian being restless thought proper to leave us and proceed on alone, sent out the hunters to hunt in advance as usual. We have selected four of the best hunters to go in advance to hunt for the party. This arrangement has been made long sink, we proceeded on up the creek on the right side through a narrow valley and good road for seven miles and encamped at some old Indian lodges, nothing killed this evening hills on the right high and rouged. The mountains on the left high and covered with snow. The day very warm. Clark, September 12, 1805. September 12 Thursday, 1805 A white frost set out at seven o'clock and proceeded on up the creek. Past a fork on the right on which I saw near an old Indian encampment a sweat house covered WTHH earth, at two miles ascended a high hill and proceeded through a hilly and thickly timbered count ray for nine miles and on the right of the creek. Passing several branches from the right of fine clear water and struck at a fork at which place the road forks, one passing up each fork. The timber is short and long leaf pine spruce pine and fir. The road through this hilly count ray is very bad passing over hills and through steep hollows, over falling timber and k. And k. Continued on and passed some most intolerable road on the sides of the steep stony mountains. Which might be avoided by keeping up the creek which is thickly covered with undergrowth and falling timber crossed a mountain eight miles without water and encamped on a hillside on the creek after decending a long steep mountain. Some of our party did not get up until 10 o'clock p.m. I mad camp at 8 on this road and particularly on this creek the Indians have peeled a number of pine for the underbark which they eat at certain seasons of the year. I am told in the spring they make use of this bark our hunters killed only one pheasant this afternoon. Party and horses much fatigued. Clark, September 13, 1805. September 13, Wednesday. 1805 A cloudy morning Captain Lewis and one of our guides lost their horses, Captain Lewis and four men detained to hunt the horses. 
I proceeded on with the party up the creek at two miles past several springs which I observed the deer elk and had made roads to, and below one of the Indians had made a hole to bathe. I tasted this water and found it hot and not bad tasted the last underscore 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 and further examination I found this water nearly boiling hot at the places it spouted from the rocks, which a hard coarse grit. And of great size the rocks on the side of the mountain of the same texture, I put my finger in the water, at first could not bear it in a second as several roads led from these springs in different directions. My guide took a wrong road and took us out of our route three miles through intolerable route, after falling into the right road I proceeded on through tolerable route for ABT. Four or five miles and halted to let our horses graze as well as wait for Captain Lewis who has not yet come up, the pine count ray falling timber and and continue. This creek is very much darned up with the beaver, but we can see none, dispatched two men back to hunt Captain Lewis' horse, after he came up. And we proceeded over a mountain to the head of the creek which we left to our left and at six miles from the place I nooned it, we fell on a small creek from the left which passed through open glades some of which one half a mile wide. We proceeded down this creek about two miles to where the mountains closed on either side crossing the creek several times and encamped. One deer and some pheasants killed this morning, I shot four pheasants of the common kind except the tail was black. The road over the last mountain was thick steep and stony as usual, after passing the head of Traveler's Rest Creek, the road was very finely well open and firm some mountains in view to the S.E. and S.W. covered with snow. Clark, September 14, 1805 September 14 Thursday, 1805 A cloudy day in the valley as it rained and hailed. On the top of the mountain some snow fell we set out early and crossed a high mountain on the right of the creek for six miles to the forks of the Glade Creek the right hand fork which falls in is about the size of the other. We crossed to the left side at the Fox, and crossed a very high steep mountain for nine miles to a large fork from the left which appears to head in a snow-toped mountain southerly and s. e. we crossed. Glade Creek above its mouth, at a place the Tushpaws or Flathead Indians have made two wares across to catch salmon and have but latterly left the place I could see no fish, and the grass entirely eaten out by the horses. We proceeded on two miles and encamped opposite a small island at the mouth of a branch on the right side of the river which is at this place eighty yards wide, swift and stony. Here we wer compelled to kill a colt for our men and selves to eat for the want of meat and we named the South Fork Colt Killed Creek. And this river we call Flathead River, the mountains which we pass today much worse than yesterday the last excessively bad and thickly strode with falling timber and pine spruck for Hackmatak and Tamarack. Steep and stony are men and horses much fatigued, the rain underscore 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 underscore. Clark, September 15, 1805. Wednesday Septure. 15, 1805 We set out early. The morning cloudy and proceeded on down the right side of river over steep points rocky and bushy as usual for four miles to an old Indian fishing place. Here the road leaves the river to the left and ascends a mountain winding in every direction to get up the steep ascents and to pass the immense quantity of falling timber which had fallen from Dift. Causes i.e. Fire and wind and has deprived the greater part of the southerly sides of this mountain of its grand timber, for miles up the mountain I found a spring and halted for the rear to come up and to let our horses rest and feed. About two hours the rear of the party came up much fatigued and horses more so. Several horses sliped and rolled down steep hills which hurt them very much the one which carried my desk and small trunk turned over and rolled down a mountain for forty yards and lodged against a tree. Broke the desk the horse escaped and appeared but little hurt some others very much hurt, from this point I observed a range of high mountains covered with snow from S.E. to S.W. with their top bald or void of timber. After two hours delay we proceeded on up the mountain steep and rouged as usual, more timber near the top. When we arrived at the top as we conceived we could find no water and concluded to camp and make use of the snow we found on the top to cook the remnant of our colt and make our soup, evening very cold and cloudy. Two of our horses gave out, poor and too much hurt to proceed on and left in the rear, nothing killed today except two fests. 
From this mountain I could observe high rouged mountains in every direction as far as I could see. With the greatest exertion we could only make twelve miles up this mountain and encamped on the top of the mountain near a bank of old snow about three feet deep lying on the northern side of the mountain and in small banks on the top and level parts of the mountain. We melted the snow to drink, and cook our horse flesh to eat. Clark, September 16, 1805 Saturday Septure 16, 1805 began to snow about three hours before day and continued all day the snow in the morning four inches deep on the old snow. And by night we found it from six to eight inches deep I walked in front to keep the road and found great difficulty in keeping it as in many places the snow had entirely filled up the track. And obliged me to hunt several minutes for the track at twelve o'clock we halted on the top of the mountain to worm and dry ourselves a little as well as to let our horses rest and graze a little on some long grass which I observed. On, the south steep hill's side and falling timber continue today, and a thickly timbered count ray of eight different kinds of pine, which are so covered with snow, that in passing through them we are continually covered with snow. I have been wet and as cold in every part as I ever was in my life. Indeed I was at one time fearful my feet would freeze in the thin moccasins which I wore, after a short delay in the middle of the day. I took one man and proceeded on as fast as I could about six miles to a small branch passing to the right. Halted and built fires for the party against their arrival which was at dusk very cold and much fatigued we encamped at this branch in a thickly timbered bottom which was scarcely large enough for us to lie level, men all wet cold and hungry. Killed a second colt which we all souped heartily on and thought it fine meat. I saw four black-tailed deer today before we set out which came up the mountain and what is singular snaped seven tims at a large buck. It is singular as my gun has a steel frizzen and never snaped seven times before in examining her found the flint loose to describe the road of this day would be a repetition of yesterday ex the snow which made it much worse to prose as we had in many places to direct ourselves by the appearance of the rubbings of the packs against the trees which have limbs quiet low and bending downwards. Clark. September 17, 1805. Sunday 17th Septure. 1805 Cloudy morning our horses much scattered which detained us until 1 o'clock p.m. At which time we set out the falling snow and snow from the trees which kept us wet all the afternoon passed over several high rouged knobs and several drains and springs passing to the right. And passing on the ridge dividing the waters of two small rivers. Rode excessively bad snow on the knobs, no snow in the valleys killed a few pheasants which was not sufficient for our supper which compelled us to kill something. A colt being the most useless part of our stock he fell a prey to our appetites. The after part of the day fair, we made only ten miles today two horses fell and hurt themselves very much. We encamped on the top of a high knob of the mountain at a run passing to the left. We proceed on as yesterday, and with difficulty found the road. Lewis, September 18, 1805 Wednesday, September 18, 1805 Cap Clark set out this morning to go ahead with six hunters. There being no game in these mountains we concluded it would be better for one of us to take the hunters and hurry on to the Livell country ahead and their hunt and provide some provision while the other remained with and brought on the party the Latter of these was my part. Accordingly I directed the horses to be gotten up early being determined to force my march as much as the abilities of our horses would permit. The negligence of one of the party Willard who had a spare horse not attending to him and bringing him up last evening was the cause of our detention this morning until one half after eight a.m. when we set out. I sent Willard back to search for his horse, and proceeded on with the party at four in the evening he overtook us without the horse, we marched eighteen miles this day and encamped on the side of a steep mountain. We suffered for water this day passing one rivulet only, we wer fortunate in finding water in a steep ravine about one half mile from our camp. This morning we finished the remainder of our last coolt. We dined and souped on a scant proportion of portable soup, a few canisters of which, a little bear's oil and about twenty pounds, of candles form our stock of provision, the only recourses being our guns and packhorses. The first is but a poor dependence in our present situation where there is nothing upon earth except ourselves and a few small pheasants, 
small gray squirrels, and a blue bird of the vulture kind about the size of a turtle dove or jay bird. Our route lay along the ridge of a high mountain course S 20W 18 inches. Used the snow for cooking. Clark, September 18, 1805. Monday, 18th Septur. 1805 A fair morning cold I procked on in advance with six hunters to try and find deer or something to kill we passed over a count ray similar to the one of yesterday more falling timber past several runs and springs passing to the right from the top of a high part of the mountain at twenty miles I had a view of an immense plain and level count ray to the SW and west at a great distance a high mountain in advance beyond the plain saw but little sign of deer and nothing else much falling timber Made thirty-two miles and encamped on a bold running creek passing to the left which I call Hungary Creek as at that place we had nothing to eat. I halted only one hour today to let our horses feed on grass and rest. Lewis, September 19, 1805. Thursday, September 19, 1805. Set out this morning a little after sunrise and continued our route about the same course of yesterday or s. 20 w for six miles when the ridge terminated and we to our inexpressible joy discovered a large tract of prairie country lying to the s w and widening as it appeared to extend to the w through that plain the indian informed us that the columbia river in which we were in search run this plain appeared to be about 60 miles distant but our guide assured us that we should reach its borders tomorrow the appearance of this country our only hope for subsistence greatly revived the spirits of the party already reduced and much weakened for the want of food. The country is thickly covered with a very heavy growth of pine of which I have enumerated eight distinct species. After leaving the ridge we ascended and decended several steep mountains in the distance of six miles further when we struck a creek about fifteen yards wide our course being S. 35 W. We continued our route six miles along the side of this creek upwards passing two of its branches which flowed in from the end, first at the place we struck the creek and the other three miles further. The road was excessively dangerous along this creek being a narrow rocky path generally on the side of steep precipice, from which in many places if either man or horse were precipitated they would inevitably be dashed in pieces. Fraser's horse fell from this road in the evening, and rolled with his load near a hundred yards into the creek. We all expected that the horse was killed but to our astonishment when the load was taken off him he arose to his feet and appeared to be but little injured, in twenty minutes he proceeded with his load. This was the most wonderful escape I ever witnessed, the hill down which he rolled was almost perpendicular and broken by large irregular and broken rocks. The course of this creek upwards due w we encamped on the starred side of it in a little ravine, having traveled eighteen miles over a very bad road. We took a small quantity of portable soup, and retired to rest much fatigued. Several of the men are unwell of the dysentery. Breakings out, or eruptions of the skin, have also been common with us for some time. Clark, September 19, 1805 Tuesday 19th Septur. 1805 set out early proceeded on up the creek passing through a small glade at six miles at which place we found a horse. I directed him killed and hung up for the party after taking a breakfast off for ourselves which we thought fine after breakfast proceed on up the creek two miles and left it to our right passed over a mountain. And the heads of branch of Hungary Creek, two high mountains. Ridges and through much falling timber, which caused our road of today to be double the direct distance on the course, struck a large creek passing to our left which I kept down for four miles and left it to our left and passed over a mountain bad falling timber to a small creek passing to our left and encamped. I killed two pheasants, but few birds blue jay, small white-headed hawk, some crows and ravens and large hawks. Road bad. Lewis, September 20, 1805. Friday, September 20, 1805. This morning my attention was called to a species of bird which I had never seen before. It was rather larger than a robin, though much its form and action. The colors were a bluish brown on the back the wings and tail black, as was a stripe above the croup three quarters of an inch wide in front of the neck, and two others of the same color passed from its eyes back along the sides of the head. 
The top of the head, neck breast and belly and butts of the wing were of a fine yellowish brick reed. It was feeding on the berries of a species of shoemake or ash which grows common in country and which I first observed on 2D of this month. I have also observed two birds of a blue color both of which I believe to be of the hawk or vulture kind. The one of a blue shining color with a very high tuft of feathers on the head a long tail, it feeds on flesh the beak and feet black. Its note is cha cha. It is about the size of a pigeon, and in shape and action resembles the jay bird. Another bird of very similar genus, the note resembling the mewing of the cat, with a white head and a light blue color is also common, as are a black species of woodpecker about the size of the lark woodpecker three species of pheasants. A large black species, with some white feathers irregularly scattered on the breast neck and belly a smaller kind of a dark uniform color with a red stripe above the eye. And a brown and yellow species that a good deal resembles the pheasant common to the Atlantic states. We were detained this morning until 10 o'clock in consequence of not being enabled to collect our horses. We had proceeded about two miles when we found the greater part of a horse which Captain Clark had met with and killed for us. He informed me by note that he should proceed as fast as possible to the Livell country which lay to the S.W. of us, which we discovered from the heights of the mountains on the 19th there he intended to hunt until our arrival. At one o'clock we halted and made a hearty meal on our horse beef much to the comfort of our hungry stomachs. Here I learnt that one of the packhorses with his load was missing and immediately dispatched Baptist Lopage who had charge of him, to search for him. He returned at, 3 O.C. without the horse. The load of the horse was of considerable value consisting of merchandise and all my stock of winter clothing. I therefore dispatched two of my best woodsmen in search of him, and proceeded with the party. Our route lay through a thick forest of large pine the general course being S. 25 W. and distance about 15 miles. Our road was much obstructed by fallen timber particularly in the evening we encamped on a ridge where there was but little grass for our horses, and at a distance from water. However we obtained as much as served our culinary purposes and souped on our beef. The soil as you leave the heights of the mountains becomes gradually more fertile. The land through which we passed this evening is of an excellent quality though very broken, it is a dark grey soil. A grey free stone appearing in large masses above the earth in many places. Saw the huckleberry, honeysuckle, and alder common to the Atlantic states, also a kind of honeysuckle which bears a white berry and rises about four feet high not common but to the western side of the Rocky Mountains. A growth which resembles the choke cherry bears a black berry with a single stone of a sweetish taste, it rises to the height of eight or ten feet and grows in thick clumps. The arborvita is also common and grows to an immense size, being from two to six feet in diameter. Clark, September 20th. 1805. Wednesday, September 20th, 1805 I set out early and proceeded on through a count ray as rouged as usual passed over a low mountain into the forks of a large creek which I kept down two miles and ascended a steep mountain leaving the creek to our left hand past the head of several dreams on a dividing ridge. And at twelve miles deck ended the mountain to a level pine count ray proceeded on through a beautiful count ray for three miles to a small plain in which I found many Indian lodges, at the distance of one mile from the lodges I met three boys. When they saw me ran and hid themselves searched found gave them small pieces of ribbon and sent them forward to the village a man came out to meet me with. Great caution and conducted us to a large spacious lodge which he told me, by signs, was the lodge of his great chief who had set out three days previous with all the warriors of the nation to war on a south-west direction and would return in fifteen or eighteen days. The few men that were left in the village aged, great numbers of women gathered around me with much apparent signs of fear, and April. Please they gave us a small piece of buffalo meat, some dried salmon berries and roots in different states, some round and much like an onion which they call quamash the bread or cake is called pashko sweet. Of this they make bread and soup they also gave us the bread made of this root all of which we eat heartily, I gave them a few small articles as presents, and proceeded on with a chief to his village two miles in the same plain. 
where we were treated kindly in their way and continued with them all night those two villages consist of about thirty double lodges, but few men a number of women and children. They call themselves Cho Pun Nish or Pierced Noses. Their dialect appears very different from the Tushapas although originally the same people, they are darker than the Tushapas their dress similar, with more beads white and blue principally, brass and copper in different forms. Shells and wear their hair in the same way. They are large portly men small women and handsome featured immense quantity of the quamash or pashako root gathered and in piles about the plains, those roots grow much in onion in marshy places the seed are in triangular shell on the stalk. They sweat them in the following manner i.e. Dig a large hole three feet deep cover the bottom with split wood on the top of which they lay small stones of about three or four inches thick, a second layer of splitted wood and set the hole on fire which heats the stones. After the fire is extinguished they lay grass and mud mixed on the stones, on that dry grass which supports the pasturco root a thin coat of the same grass is laid on the top, a small fire is kept when necessary in the center of the kite and. I find myself very unwell all the evening from eating the fish and roots too freely. Sent out the hunters they killed nothing saw some signs of deer. Lewis, September 21, 1805 Saturday, September 21, 1805. We were detained this morning until 11 o'clock. In consequence of not being able to collect our horses. We then set out and proceeded along the ridge on which we had encamped. Leaving which at 11 halves we passed a large creek running to the left just above its junction with another which run parallel with and on the left of our road before we struck the creek. Through the level wide and heavy timbered bottom of this creek we proceeded about twenty-one halves miles when bearing to the right we passed a broken country heavily timbered great quantities of which had fallen and so obstructed our road that it was almost impracticable to proceed in many places. Though these hills we proceeded about five ms. When we passed a small creek on which Captain Clark encamped on the 19th passing this creek we continued our route five mis through a similar country when we struck a large creek at the forks. Passed the northern branch and continued down it on the west side one mile and encamped in a small open bottom where there was tolerable food for our horses. I directed the horses to be hubbled to prevent delay in the morning being determined to make a forced march tomorrow in order to reach if possible the open country. We killed a few pheasants, and I killed a prairie wolf which together with the balance of our horse beef and some crawfish which we obtained in the creek enabled us to make one more hearty meal, not knowing where the next was to be found. The arborvita increases in quantity and size. I saw several sticks today large enough to form elegant pirogues of at least forty-five feet in length. I find myself growing weak for the want of food and most of the men complain of a similar deficiency and have fallen off very much. The general course of this day S 30 W 15 M. Clark, September 21, 1805. Scepter. 21st Saturday 1805 A fine morning sent out all the hunters early in different directions to kill something and delayed with the Indians to prevent suspicion and to acquire as much information as possible. One of them drew me a chart of the river and nations below informed of one falls below which the white men lived from whom they got white beads cloth and and the day proved warm two chips of bands visited me today the hunters all returned without anything i collected a horse load of roots and three salmon and sent her fields with one indian to meet captain lewis at four o'clock set out with the other men to the river Passed through a fine pine country deck ended a steep rouge till very long to a small river which comes from our left and I suppose it to be underscore 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 river passed down the river two miles on a steep hill side at our r o'clock p. m. Arrived at a camp of five squares a boy and two children those people were glad to see us and gave us drid salmon one had formerly been taken by the minitaries of the north and seen white men. Our guide called the chief who was fishing on the other side of the river, whom I found a shareful man of about sixty-five I gave him a medal. Clark, September 21, 1805 Thursday 21st Scepter 1805 A fine morning sent out all the hunters in different directions to hunt deer, I myself delayed with the chief to prevent suspicion and to collect by signs as much information as possible about the river and Count Ray in advance. 
the chief drew me a kind of chart of the river, and informed me that a greater chief than himself was fishing at the river half a day's march from his village called the Twisted Hare. And that the river forked a little below his camp and at a long distance below and below two large forks one from the left and the other from the right the river passed through G.H. the mountains at which place was a great fall of the water passing through the rocks. At those falls white people lived from whom they preserved the white beads and brass and which the woman wore. A chief of another band visit me today and smoked a pipe, I gave my handkerchief and a silver cord with a little tobacco to those chiefs, the hunters all return without anything. I purchased as much provisions as I could with what few things I chawned to have in my pockets, such as salmon bread roots and berries, and sent one man r. Fields with an Indian to meet Captain Lewis, and at four o'clock p.m. Set out to the river, met a man at dark on his way from the river to the village, whom I hired and gave the neck handkerchief of one of the men. To pull at me to the camp of the Twisted Hare we did not arrive at the camp of the Twisted Hare but opposed, until half past eleven o'clock p.m. Found at this camp five squares and three children. My guide called to the chief who was encamped with two others on a small island in the river, he soon joined me, I found him a cheerful man with apparent sincerity, I gave him a metal and and smoked until one o'clock a.m. and went to sleep. The Count Ray from the mountains to the river hills is a level rich beautiful pine Count Ray badly watered, thinly timbered and covered with grass, the weather very warm after decending into the low Count Ray the river hills are very high and steep. Small bottoms to this little river which is flat head and is 160 yards wide and surely this river is the one we killed the first colt on near a fishing where I am very sick today and puke which relive me. Lewis, September 22, 1805 Sunday September 22 Candelas 1805 Notwithstanding my positive directions to hubble the horses last evening one of the men neglected to comply. He plead ignorance of the order. This neglect however detained us until one half after eleven o'clock at which time we renewed our march, our course being about west. We had proceeded about two and a half miles when we met Reuben Fields one of our hunters, whom Captain. Clark had dispatched to meet us with some dried fish and roots that he had procured from a band of Indians, whose lodges were about eight miles in advance. I ordered the party to halt for the purpose of taking some refreshment. I divided the fish roots and berries, and was happy to find a sufficiency to satisfy completely all our appetites. Fields also killed a crow after refreshing ourselves we proceeded to the village due west seventy-one halves miles where we arrived at five o'clock. In the afternoon our route was through lands heavily timbered, the larger wood entirely pine. The country except the last three miles was broken and deck-ending the pleasure I now felt in having triumphed over the rocky mountains and deck-ending once more to a level and fertile country where there was every rational hope of finding a comfortable subsistence for myself and party can be more readily conceived than expressed. Nor was the flattering prospect of the final success of the expedition less pleasing. On our approach to the village which consisted of eighteen lodges most of the women fled to the neighboring woods on horseback with their children, a circumstance I did not expect as captain. Clark had previously been with them and informed them of our pacific intentions towards them and also the time at which we should most probably arrive. The men seemed but little concerned, and several of them came to meet us at a short distance from their lodges unarmed. Clark, September 22, 1805 September 22 Sunday, 1805 A fine morning. I proceed on down the little river to about eleven halves a mile and found the chief in a canoe coming to meet me I got into his canoe and crossed over to his camp on a small island at a rapid sent out the hunters leaving one to take care of the baggage. And after eating a part of a sam. I set out on my return to meet Captain Lewis with the chief and his son at two miles met shields with three deer, I took a small pace and changed for his horse which was fresh and procked on this horse through me three times which hurt me some. At dark met Captain Lewis encamped at the first village men much fatigued and reduced, the supply which I sent by RFLDS. Was timely, they all eat heartily of roots and fish, two horses lost one day's journey back. Clark, September 22, 1805. Friday 22nd Sceptre. 
1805 A very warm day the hunter's child killed three deer this morning. I left them on the island and set out with the chief and his son on a young horse for the village at which place I expected to meet Captain Lewis this young horse in fright threw himself and me three times on the side of a steep hill and hurt my hip much. Caught a colt which we found on the road and I rode it for several miles until we saw the chief's horses, he caught one and we arrived at his village at sunset. And himself and MYSLF walked up to the 2D village where I found Captain Lewis and the party encamped, much fatigued, and hungry, much rejoiced to find something to eat of which they appeared to partake plentifully. I cautioned them of the consequences of eating too much and the plains appeared covered with spectators viewing the white men and the articles which we had, our party weak and much reduced in flesh as well as strength, the horse I left hung up they received at a time they were in great want. And the supply I sent by our fields proved timely and gave great encouragement to the party with Captain Lewis. He lost three horses one of which belonged to our guide. Those Indians stole out of our F. Shot pouch his knife wipers compass and steel, which we could not procure from them, we attempted to have some talk with those people but could not for the want of an interpreter through which we could speak. We were compelled to converse altogether by signs, I got the twisted hair to draw the river from his camp down which he did with great cheerfulness on a white elk skin, from the one's fork which is a few seven miles below. To the large fork on which the so so any or snake Indians fish, is south two sleeps. To a large river which falls in on the N.W. side and into which the Clarks River empties itself is five sleeps from the mouth of that river to the falls is five sleeps at the falls he places establishments of white people and and informs that great numbers of Indians reside on all those fox as well as the main river, one other Indian gave me a like account of the Count Ray, some few drops of rain this evening. I procured maps of the country and river with the situation of Indians, to come from several men of note separately which varied very little. Clark, September 23, 1805. Scepter. 23rd Sunday traded with the Indians, made three chiefs and gave the meat ells and tobacco and handkerchief and knives, and a flag and left a flag and hand kerchiefs for the great chief when he returns from war, in the evening proceeded to the 2D Vilg two miles. A hard wind and rain at dark, traded for some root bread and skins to make shirts. Hot day. Clark, September 23, 1805. Saturday 23rd September 1805. We assembled the principal men as well as the chiefs and by signs informed them where we came from where bound our wish to inculcate peace and good understanding between all the red people and which appeared to satisfy them much, we then gave two other medals to other chefs of bands, a flag to the twisted hair, left a flag and handkerchief to the grand chief gave. A shirt to the twisted hair and a knife and handkerchief with a small pess of tobacco to each. Finding that those people gave no provisions today we determined to purchase with our small articles of merchandise, accord we purchased all we could, such as roots dried, in bread, and in the raw state. Barris of red haws and fish and in the evening set out and proceeded on to the 2D village two miles disti. Where we also purchased a few articles all amounting to as much as our weak horses could carry to the river captain. Lewis and two men very sick this evening, my hip very painful, the men trade a few old tin canisters for dressed elk skin to make themselves shirts, at dark a hard wind from the SW accompanied with rain which lasted half an hour. The twisted hair invited Captain Lewis and myself to his lodge which was nothing more than pine bushes and bark, and gave us some broiled dried salmon to eat. Great numbers about us all night at this village the women were busily employed in gathering and drying the poshi co root of which they had great quantites dug in piles. Clark, September 24, 1805. Scepter. 24th Monday 1805 set out early for the river and proceeded on the same road I had previously gone to the island at which place I had found the chief and formed a camp several eight or nine men sick. Captain Lewis sick all complain of a lax and heaviness at the stomach, I gave rushes pills to several hot day many Indians and theer gangs of horses follow us hot day hunter had five deer. Clark, September 24, 1805. Sunday 24th Scepter. 
1805 a fine morning collected our horses dispatched J. Calter back to hunt the horses lost in the mountains and bring up some shot left behind, and at ten o'clock we all set out for the river and proceeded on by the same route I had previously travelled. And at sunset we arrived at the island on which I found the twisted hair and formed a camp on a large island a little below, Captain Lewis Sursley able to ride on a gentle horse which was furnished by the chief. Several men so unwell that they were compelled to lie on the side of the road for some time others obliged to be put on horses. I gave Rush's pills to the sick this evening. Several Indians follow us. Clark, September 25, 1805. Scepter. 25th I with T.H. Chief and two young men went down to hunt timber for canoes, proceeded on down to the forks four miles north 70 degrees west two miles s. 75 degrees west two miles, halted young men caught six salmon, the forks nearly the same size, crossed the south fork and found timber large pine in a bottom proceeded up the south side three parts of party sick Captain Lewis very sick hot day. Clark. September 25th, 1805. Monday 25th of September, 1805 a very hot day most of the party complaining and two of our hunters left here on the 22nd very sick they had killed only two bucks in my absence. I set out early with the chief and two young men to hunt some trees calculated to build canoes, as we had previously determined to proceed on by water. I was furnished with a horse and we proceeded on down the river crossed a creek at one mile from the right very rocky which I call Rock Dam Creek and passed down on the end side of the river to a fork from the north which is about the same size and affords about the same quantity of water with the other forks we halted about an hour. One of the young men took his guilt and killed six fine salmon two of them were roasted and we eat, two canoes came up loaded with the furniture and provisions of two families. Those canoes are long steedy and without much rake I crossed the south fork and proceeded up on the south side. The most of the way through a narrow pine bottom in which I saw fine timber for canoes one of the Indian canoes with two men with poles set out from the forks at the same time I did and arrived at our camp on the island within fifteen minutes of the same time I did. Notwithstanding three rapids which they had to draw the canoe through in the distance, when I arrived at camp found Captain Lewis very sick, several men also very sick, I gave some salts and tartar emetic. We determined to go to where the best timber was and there form a camp. Clark, September 26, 1805. Scepter. 26th set out early and proceeded down the river to the bottom on the s side opposite the forks and formed a camp had axe handled ground and. Our axes all too small, Indians caught salmon and sold us, Two chiefs and third families came and camped near us, several men bad, Captain Lewis sick I gave puke salts and. To several, I am a little unwell. Hot day. Clark, September 26, 1805. Tuesday 26th Scepter. 1805 set out early and proceeded on down the river to a bottom opposite the forks of the river on the south side and formed a camp. Soon after our arrival a raft came down the inn. Fork on which was two men, they came too, I had the axes distributed and handled and men apotent. Ready to commence building canoes on tomorrow, our axes are small and badly calculated to build canoes of the large pine, Captain Lewis still very unwell, several men taken sick on the way down, I administered salts pills gallop, tartar emetic and. I feel unwell this evening, Two chiefs and their families follow us and encamp near us, they have great numbers of horses. This day proved very hot, we purchase fresh salmon of the Indians. Clark, September 27, 1805. Scepter. 27th Thursday 1805 set all the men able to work ABT. Building canoes, Calter returned and found one horse and the canister of shot left in the mountains he also killed a deer one half of which he brought hot day, men sick. Clark, September 27, 1805. 27th Scepter. Wednesday 1805 all the men able to work come Ned building five canoes, several taken sick at work, our hunters returned sick without meat. J. Calter returned he found only one of the lost horses, on his way killed a deer, half of which he gave the Indians the other proved nourishing to the sick the day very hot. 
We purchase fresh salmon of them several Indians come up the river from a camp some distance below Captain Lewis very sick nearly all the men sick. Our Shoshone Indian guide employed himself making flint points for his arrows. Clark, September 28, 1805. Sceptre. 28th Friday several men sick all at work which is able, nothing killed today. Drew your sick many Indians visit us worm day. Clark, September 28, 1805. Thursday 28th Sceptre. 1805 Our men nearly all complaining of their bowels, a heaviness at the stomach and lax, some of those taken first getting better, a number of Indians about us gazing and and This day proved very worm and sultry, nothing killed men complaining of their diet of fish and roots. All that is able working at the canoes, several Indians leave us today, the raft continue on down the river. One old man informed us that he had been to the white people's fort at the falls and got white beads and his story was not beloved as he could explain nothing. Clark, September 29, 1805. Sceptre. 29th Saturday Drew year killed two deer Collins wonder men conti sickly at work all able to work. Clark, September 29, 1805. Sunday 29th Sceptre. 1805 A cool morning wind from the S.W. Men sick as usual, all the men that are able to at work, at the canoes drew ear killed two deer Coulter killed one deer, the after part of this day worm Cap Lewis very sick, and most of the men complaining very much of their bowels and stomach. Clark. September 30, 1805. Sunday 30th Sceptre. 1805 Forks a fine morning our men recruiting a little cool, all at work doing something except two which are very sick, great run of small duck passing down the river this morning. Clark, September 30, 1805. Sceptre. 30th Saturday, Monday, 1805 A fine fair morning of the men recruiting a little, all at work which are able. Great number of small ducks pass down the river this morning. Many Indians passing up and down the river. Clark, October 1, 1805. October 1, 1805 Tuesday A cool morning wind from the N.E. I examine and dry all our article cloths and nothing to eat except drid fish very bad diet Captain Lewis getting much better than for several days past several Indians visit us from the different villages below and on the main forecast. Nothing killed. Clark, October 1. 1805. October 1st Tuesday, 1805 A cool morning wind from the east had examined and dried all our clothes and other articles and laid out a small assortment of such articles as those Indians were fond of to trade with them for some provisions, they are remarkably fond of beads, nothing to eat except a little dried fish which they men complain of as working of them as as much as a dost of salts. Captain Lewis getting much better. Several Indians visit us from the different tribes below some from the main south fork our hunters killed nothing today worm evening. Clark, October 2nd, 1805. October. 2nd 1805 Wednesday dispatched two men and an Indian up to the villages we first came to to purchase roots fish and nothing to eat but roots. Gave a small piece of tobacco to the Indians, three brooches and two rings with my handkerchief divided between five of them. I walked on the hills to hunt today, saw only one deer, could kill nothing day excessively hot in the river bottom wind north, burning out the holler of our canoes, men something better nothing except a small prairie wolf killed today. Our provisions all out except what few fish we purchase of the Indians with us. We kill a horse for the men at work to eat and and Clark, October 2, 1805. October 2, Wednesday, 1805 dispatched two men Fraser and S. Gutterick back to the village with one Indian and six horses to purchase dried fish, roots and We have nothing to eat but roots, which give the men violent pains in their bowels after eating much of them. To the Indians who visited us yesterday I gave divided my handkerchief between five of them, with a small piece of tobacco and a piece of ribbon and to the two principal men each a ring and brooch. I walked out with my gun on the hills which is very steep and high could kill nothing. 
Day hot wind and hunters killed nothing except a small prairie wolf. Provisions all out, which compels us to kill one of our horses to eat and make soup for the sick men. Clark, October 3, 1805. October 3rd, Thursday, 1805 Canoe Camp A fair cool morning wine from the east All our men getting well and at work at the canoe's end. Clark, October 3, 1805. October 3rd, Thursday, 1805 A fine morning cool wind east All our men getting better in health, and at work at the canoe's end. The Indians who visited us from below set out on their return early. Several others came from different directions. Clark, October 4, 1805. October 4, 1805 Friday this morning is a little cool wind from the east. Displeased an Indian by refusing to let him have a piece of tobacco. THRE INS. From the S. Fork visit us Frosser and Gut Eric return from the village with fish roots and which they purchased. Clark, October 4th. 1805. October 4th Friday, 1805 A cool wind from off the eastern mountains I displeased an Indian by refusing him a piece of tobacco which he took the liberty to take out of our sack three Indians visit us from the Grat River south of us. The two men Fraser and Gut Eric return late from the village with fish roots and which they purchased as our horse is eaten we have nothing to eat except dried fish and roots which disagree with us very much. The after part of this day very warm. Captain Lewis still sick but able to walk about a little. Clark, October 5, 1805. October 5th Saturday, 1805 A cool morning wind from the east, collected all our horses, and branded them thirty-eight in no. And delivered them to the men who were to take charge of them, each of which I gave a knife and one a wampum shell gorget, the latted. Of this place the mean of two observations is 46 degrees 34 minutes 56.3 seconds north. Nothing to eat but dried roots and dried fish, Captain Lewis and myself eat a supper of roots boiled, which filled us so full of wind, that we were scarcely able to breathe all night felt the effects of it. Lanced two canoes today one proved a little leaky the other a very good one. Clark, October 5, 1805 October 5th, Sadie, 1805, wind easterly and cool. Had all our horses 38 in number collected and branded cut off their four top and delivered them to the two brothers and one son of one of the chiefs who intends to accompany us down the river to each of those men I gave a knife and some small articles and. They promised to be attentive to our horses until we should return. Latitude of this place from the mean of two observations is 46 degrees 34 minutes 56.3 seconds north. Nothing to eat except dried fish and roots. Captain Lewis and myself eat a supper of roots boiled. Which swelled us in such a manner that we were scarcely able to breath for several hours, finished and lanced two of our canoes this evening which proved to be very good our hunters with every diligence could kill nothing. The hills high and rouged and woods too dry to hunt the deer which is the only game in our neighborhood. Several squares came with fish and roots which we purchased of them for beads, which they were fond of, Captain Lewis not so well today as yesterday. Clark, October 6. 1805. October 6 Sunday, 1805 A call Easter lay wind which spring up in the latter part of the night and continues until about 7 or 8 o'clock a. M. Had all our saddles collected a whole dug and in the night buried them. Also a canister of powder and a bag of balls at the place the canoe which shields made was cut from the body of the tree, the saddles were buried on the side of a bend about one half a mile below, all the canoes finished this evening ready to be put into the water. I am taken very unwell with a pain in the bowels and stomach, which is certainly the effects of my diet which last all night dash. The winds blow cold from a little before day until the suns gets to some height from the mountains east as they did from the mountains at the time we lay at the falls of Missouri from the west the river below this forks is called Coast Coast Keel it is clear rapid with shoals or swift places the open count ray commences a few miles below this on each side of the river. On the large side below the first creek. With a few trees scattered near the river. Past many bad rapids, one canoe that in which I went in front sprung a leak in passing the third rapid. 
set out at 3 o'clock p.m. and proceeded on. Clark, October 7. 1805. October 7, Monday, 1805 I continue very unwell but obliged to attend everything all the canoes put into the water and loaded, fixed our canoes as well as possible and set out as we were about to set out we missed. Both of the chiefs who promised to accompany us, I also missed my pipe tomahawk which could not be found. The after part of the day cloudy procked on past ten rapids which wr dangerous the canoe in which I was struck a rock and sprung a leak in the third rapid, we proceeded on twenty miles and encamped on a starred point opposite to run. Past a creek small on the lard. Side at nine miles, a short distank from the river at two feet four inches n. Of a dead toped pine tree had bured two lead canisters of powder. Had the canoes unloaded examined and mended a small leak which we discovered in a thin place in her side past several camps of Indians today our course and distance shall be given. After I get to the forks. And that which the Indians say is the last of the bad water until we get to the great falls ten day below, where the white people live and. The lodges are of sticks set in a form of roof of a house and covered with mats and straw. Clark, October 8. 1805. 8th Octre. 1805 Tuesday a cloudy morning changed canoes and buried two lead canisters of powder two foot four in point. North of a dead toped pine opposite our camp and opposite the mouth of a run after repairing leaks in the canoes sprung coming over the rapids yesterday set out at nine o'clock. Clark, October 8th. 1805. October 8th Tuesday, 1805 A cloudy morning loaded our canoes which was unloaded last night and set out at 9 o'clock past 15 rapids four islands and a creek on the starred side at 16 miles just below which one canoe in which surged. Gas was steering and was knurled turning over, she sprung a leak or split open on one side and bottom filled with water and sunk on the rapid, the men, several of which could not swim hung on to the canoe. I had one of the other canoes unloaded and with the assistance of our small canoe and one Indian canoe took out everything and towed the empty canoe on shore, one man Thompson a little hurt. Everything wet particularly the greater part of our small stock of merchandise, had everything opened, and two sentinels put over them to keep off the Indians. Who are inclined to the Ave having stole several small articles those people appeared disposed to give us every assistance in their power during our distress, we passed several encampments of Indians on the islands and those near the rapids in which places they took the salmon. At one of those camps we found our two chiefs who had promised to accompany us, we took them on board after the ceremony of smoking. Clark, October 9, 1805. Octo. Ninth all day drying our roots good and articles which got wet in the canoe last night. Our two snake Indian guides left us without our knowledge, the Indians troublesome stole my spoon which they returned. Men marry at night and singular acts of a ind. Woman. Clark, October 9, 1805. October 9th Wednesday, 1805 The morning cool as usual the greater part of the day proved to be cloudy, which was unfavorable for drying our things and which got wet yesterday. In examining our canoe found that by putting knees and strong pecks pine to her sides and bottom and she could be made fit for service in by the time the goods dried, set four men to work at her, searched. Prior and Gas, Joe Fields and Gibson, others to collect rosin. At one o'clock she was finished stronger than ever the wet articles not sufficiently dried to pack up obliged us to delay another night during the time one man was trading for fish for our voyage. At dark we were informed that our old guide and his son had left us and had been seen running up the river several miles above, we could not account for the cause of his leaving us at this time. Without receiving his pay for the services he had rendered us, or letting us know anything of his intention. We requested the chief to send a horseman after our old guide to come back and receive his pay and which he advised us not to do as his nation would take his things from him before he passed their camps the Indians and our party were very merry this afternoon a woman feigned madness and and singular acts of this woman in giving in small potions all she had and if they were not received she would scarify herself in a horrid manner and Captain Lewis recovering fast. A very warm day, 
Indians continue all day on the banks to view us as low as the forks. Two Indians come up in a canoe, who means to accompany us to the great rapids, could get no observations, worm night the water of the south fork is of a bluish-green color. Clark, October 10. 1805. October 10th Wednesday Thursday a fine morning loaded and set out at 7 o'clock at 21 halves miles past a run on the start. Side having passed two islands and two bad rapids at three miles lower past a creek on the lard. With wide cotton willow bottoms having passed an island and a rapid an Indian camp of three lodges below the creek at 81 halves miles lower we arrived at the heat of a very bad riffle at which place we landed near eight lodges of Indians on the lard side to view the riffle. Having passed two islands and six rapids several of them very bad after view g this riffled two canoes were taken over very well. The third stuck on a rock which took us an hour to get her off which was effected without her receiving a greater injury than a small split in her side which was repart in a short time, we purchased fish and dogs of those people. Dined and proceeded on, here we met with an Indian from the falls at which place he says he saw white people, and expressed an inclination to accompany us, we passed. A few miles above this riffle two lodges and an Indian bathing in a hot bath made by hot stones thrown into a pond of water. At this riffle which we call Ragged Rapid took meridian altitude of the sun's upper limb with sext. 74 degrees 26 minutes 0 seconds lat. Produced underscore 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 north at 5 miles lower and 60 miles below the forks arrived at a large southerly fork which is the one we were on with the Snake or Sosone Nation, having passed five rapids, this south fork or Lewis's River which has two forks. Which fall into it on the south the east small the upper large and about two days march up immediately Perilo to the first villages we came to and is called by those Indians Parnash te on this fork a little above its mouth resides a chief who as the Indians say has more horses than he can count and further saith that Louise's river is navigable about sixty miles up with many rapids at which places the Indians have fishing camps and lodges built of an oblong form with flat roughs. Below the first river on the south side there is ten established fishing places on the first fork which fall in on the south side is one fishing place, between that and the Par Nash to river, five fishing places, above two. And one on that river all of the Chopunnish or Pierced Nose Nation many other Indians reside high up those rivers the Count Ray about the forks is an open plain on either side I can observe at a distance on the lower star. Side a high ridge of thinly timbered Count Ray the water of the south fork is a greenish blue, the north as clear as crystal. Immediately in the point is an Indian cabin and in the south fork a small island, we came to on the starred. Side below with a view to make some lunar observations the night proved cloudy and we were disappointed the Indians came down all the cowses of this river on each side on horses to view us as we were de-ending. The man whom we saw at the rouged rapid and expressed an inclination to accompany us to the great rapids. Came up with his son in a small canoe and persisted in his intentions, worthy of remark that not one stick of timber on the river near the forks and but a few trees for a great distance up the river we decended I think Lewis's river is about 250 yards wide. The Coos Coos Co River about 150 yards wide and the river below the forks about 300 yards wide. A misunderstanding took place between Shabono one of our interpreters, and Joe. And our fields which appears to have originated in just, our diet extremely bad having nothing but roots and dried fish to eat, all the party have greatly the advantage of me, inasmuch as they all relish the flesh of the dogs. Several of which we purchased of the natives for to add to our store of fish and roots and k. And k. The Chopunnish or pierced nose Indians are stout like lay men, handsome women, and very dressy in their way, the dress of the men are a white buffalo robe or elk skin dressed with beads which are generally white. See shells i.e. the mother of pearl hung to their hair and on a piece of otter skin about their necks hair sued in two parcels hanging forward over their shoulders, feathers, and different colored paints which they find in their count ray generally white. Green and light blue. Some few were a shirt of dressed skins and long leggings, and moccasins painted, which appears to be their winter's dress, with a plait of twisted grass about their necks. The women dress in a shirt of ibex, 
or goat skins which reach quite down to their ankles with a girdle, their heads are not ornament, their shirts are ornament with quilled brass, small pecks of brass cut into different forms, beads. Shells and curios bones and the men expose those parts which are generally kept from view by other nations but the women are more particular than any other nation which I have passed in screening the parts. Their amusements appear but few as their situation requires the utmost exertion to procure food they are generally employed in that pursuit. All the summer and fall fishing for the salmon, the winter hunting the deer on snow shoes in the plains and taking care of their immense numbers of horses, and in the spring cross the mountains to the Missouri to get buffalo robes and meat and at which time they frequent meat with their enemies and lose their horses and many of their people. Their disorders are but few and those few of a scoffless nature. They make great use of sweating. The hot and cold bathes, they are very selfish and stingy of what they have to eat or wear, and they expect in return something for everything give as presents or the services which they do let it be however small. And fail to make those returns on their part. Clark, October 11, 1805. October 11, 1805 A cloudy morning wind from the east we set out early and proceeded on past a rapid at two miles, at six miles we came to at some Indian lodges and took breakfast. We purchased all the fish we could and seven dogs of those people for stores of provisions down the river. At this place I saw a curious sweat house underground, with a small hole at top to pass in or throw in the hot stones. Which those in threw on as much water as to create the temperature of heat they wished, at nine mile past a rapid at fifteen miles halted at an Indian lodge. To purchase provisions of which we precred some of the Pashikor roots five dogs and a few fish dried, after taking some dinner of dog and we proceeded on. Came to and encamped at two Indian lodges at a great place of fishing here we met an Indian of a nation near the mouth of this river. We purchased three dogs and a few fish of those Indians, we passed today nine rapids all of them great fishing places. At different places on the river saw Indian houses and slabs and spilt timber raised from the ground being the different parts of the houses of the natives when they reside on this river for the purpose of fishing at this time they are out in the plain on each side of the river hunting the antelope as we are informed by our chiefs. Near each of those houses we observe graveyards picketed, or pieces of wood stuck in promiscuously over the grave or body which is covered with earth. The country on either side is an open plain level and fertile after ascending a steep ascent of about 200 feet not a tree of any kind to be seen on the river the after part of the day the wind from the S. W. N. Hard. The Day Worm. Clark, October 12, 1805. October 12, 1805 Saturday a fair cool morning wind from E after purchasing all the drid fish those people would spear from their hole in which they wer buried we set out at 7 o'clock and proceeded on. Clark. October 12, 1805. October 12 Saturday, 1805 a fair cool morning wine from the east. After purchasing every species of the provisions those Indians could spare we set out and proceeded on at three miles past four islands swift water and a bad rapid opposite to those islands on the lard. Side. At 141-2 miles past the mouth of a large creek on the lard side opposite a small island here the Count Ray ascends with a gentle ascent to the high plains. And the river is 400 yards wide about one mile below the creek on the same side took meridian altitude which gave 72 degrees 30 minutes 0 seconds latitude produced underscore 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 north in the afternoon the wind shifted to the S. W and blew hard we passed today underscore 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 rapid several of them very bad and came to at the head of one, at 30 miles, on the start. Side to view it before we attempted. To send through it. The Indians had told us was very bad, we found long and dangerous about two miles in length, and many turns necessary to steer clear of the rocks, which appeared to be in every direction. The Indians went through and our small canoe followed them, as it was late we determined to camp above until the morning. We passed several stony islands today country as yesterday open plains, no timber of any kind a few hackberry bushes and willows excepted and but few drift trees to be found so that firewood is very scarce, 
the hills or ascents from the water is faced with a dark rouged stone. The wind blew hard this evening. Clark, October 13, 1805. October 13 Sunday, 1805 rained a little before day, and all the morning, a hard wind from the S west until nine o'clock, the rain ceased and wind lulled. And Captain Lewis with two canoes set out and passed down the rapid the others soon followed and we passed over this bad rapid safe. We should make more portages if the season was not so far advanced and time precious with us. The wife of Shabono our interpreter we find reconciles all the Indians. As to our friendly intentions a woman with a party of men is a token of peace. Clark, October 13. 1805. October 13 Sunday, 1805 A windy dark rainy morning the rain commenced before day and continued moderately until, near twelve o'clock, we took all our canoes through this rapid without any injury. A little below passed through another bad rapid at underscore 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 miles past the M.O. of a large creek little river in a starred. Bend, immediately below a long bad rapid. In which the water is confined in a chenelle of about twenty yards between rigid rocks for the distance of a mile and a half and a rapid rocky chenelle for two miles above. This must be a very bad place in high water, here is great fishing place, the timbers of several houses piled up, and a number of holes of fish, and the bottom appears to have been made use of as a place of deposit for their fish for ages past. Here two Indians from the upper fox overtook us and continued on down on horseback, two others were at this mouth of the creek, we passed a rapid about nine mile lower. At dusk came to on the STD, side and encamped. The two inns. On horseback stayed with us. The country through which we pass today is similar to that of yesterday open plain no timber passed several houses evacuated at established fishing places, wind hard from the S.W. In the evening and not very cold. Clark, October 14. 1805. October 14, Monday, 1805 A very cool morning wine from the west set out at eight o'clock proceeded on. At this rapid the canoe a stern steered by Druyer struck a rock turned the men got out on a rock the stern of the canoe took in water and she sunk the men on the rock held her. A number of articles floated all that could be caught were taken by two of the author canoes, great many articles lost among other things two of the men's beating shot pouches tomahas and k. and k. and every article wet of which we have great cause to lament as all our loose powder two canisters, all our roots prepared in the Indian way, and one half of our goods, fortunately the lead canisters which was in the canoe was tied down. Otherwise they must have been lost as the canoe turned over we got off the men from the rock towed our canoe on shore after taking out all the stores and k. We could and put them out to dry on the island on which we found some wood which was covered with stones, this is the parts of an Indian house, which we used for firewood, by the wish of our two chiefs, those cheese, one of them was in the canoe. Swam in and saved some property, the inns. Have buried fish on this isle. Which we are cautious not to touch. Our small canoe and three Indians in another was out of sight at the time our misfortune happened, and did not join us. Wind Hard S.W. Clark, October 14, 1805. October 14, Monday, 1805 A very cold morning wind from the west and cool until about 12 o'clock when it shifted to the S.W. At twenty-one halves miles past a remarkable rock very large and resembling the hull of a ship situated on a large point at some distance from the ascending Count Ray past rapids at six and nine miles. At twelve miles we came to at the head of a rapid which the Indians told me was very bad, we viewed the rapid found it bad in deck ending three stern canoes stuck fast for some time on the head of the rapid and one struck a rock in the worst part. Fortunately all landed safe below the rapid which was nearly three miles in length. Here we dined, and for the first time for three weeks past I had a good dinner of blue wing teal, after dinner we set out and had not procked on two miles before our stern canoe in passing through a short rapid opposite the head of an island. Run on a smooth rock and turned broadside, the men got out on the rock all except one of our Indian chiefs who swam on shore, the canoe filed and sunk a number of articles floated out, such as the men's bedding clothes and skins, the lodge and 
and k, the greater part of which were caught by two of the canoes, whilst a third was unloading and stemming the swift current to the relief of the men on the rock who could with much difficulty hold the canoe. However in about an hour we got the men and canoe to shore with the loss of some bedding tomahaws shot pouches skins clothes and canned. All what we had every articles exposed to the sun to dry on the island, our loss in provisions is very considerable all our roots was in the canoe that sunk, and cannot be dried sufficient to save. Our loose powder was also in the canoe and is all what this I think, we shall saved. In this island we found some split timber the parts of a house which the Indians had very securely covered with stone, we also observed a place where the Indians had buried their fish. We have made it a point at all times not to take anything belonging to the Indians even their wood. But at this time we are compelled to violate that rule and take a part of the split timber we find here buried for firewood, as no other is to be found in any direction. Our small canoe which was ahead returned at night with two oars which they found floating below. The wind this afternoon from the S.W. As usual and hard way of the forks to the Indian camps at the first were not one mouthful to eat until night as our hunters could kill nothing and I could see and catch no fish except a few small ones. The Indians gave us two salmon boiled which I gave to the men, one of my men shot a salmon in the river about sunset those fish gave us a supper. All the camp flocked about me until I went to sleep, and I believe if they had a sufficiency to eat themselves and any to spare they would be liberal of it I detected the men to mend their moccasins tonight and turn out in the morning early to hunt. Dear fish birds and k. And k. Saw great numbers of the large black grasshopper. Some bars which were very wild, but few birds. A number of ground lizards, some few pigeons plainly see a range of mountains which bore s, e, n, n, w. The nearest point south about sixty miles, and becomes high toward the n, w. The plains on each side is wavering. Labiish killed two g's and two ducks of the large kind. At two o'clock we loaded and set out, our powder and provisions of roots not sufficiently dry. We shall put them out at the forks or mouth of this river which is at no great distance, and at which place we shall delay to make some celestial observations and past eleven island and seven rapids today. Several of the rapids very bad and difficult to pass. The islands of different sizes and all of round stone and sand, no timber of any kind in sight of the river, a few small willows excepted. In the evening the count ray becomes lower not exceeding 90 or 100 feet above the water and back is a wavering plain on each side. Pass through narrows for three miles where the cliffs of rocks jute to the river on each side compressing the water of the river through a narrow chanel. Below which it widens into a kind of basin nearly round without any perceptible current, at the lower part of this basin is a bad difficult and dangerous rapid to pass. At the upper part of this rapid we overtook the three Indians who had polite us through the rapids from the forks. Those people with our two chiefs had proceeded on to this place where they thought proper to delay for us to warn us of the difficulties of this rapid. We landed at a parcel of split timber, the timber of a house of Indians out hunting the antelope in the plains, and raised on scaffolds to save them from the spring floods. Here we were obliged for the first time to take the property of the Indians without the consent or approbation of the owner. The night was cold and we made use of a part of those boards and split logs for firewood. Killed two teal this evening. Examined the rapids which we found more difficult to pass than we expected from the Indians' information. A succession of shoals appears to reach from bank to bank for three miles which was also intercepted with large rocks sticking up in every direction, and the chanel through which we must pass crooked and narrow. We only made twenty miles today, owing to the detention in passing rapids and Clark, October 16, 1805 Or 16, 1805 Wednesday a cool morning set out early past the rapid with all the canoes except SGT. Priors which run on a rock near the lower part of the rapid and stuck fast, by the assistance of the three other canoes she was unloaded and got off the rock without any further injury than. The wetting the greater part of her loading, loaded and proceeded on I walked around this rapid. We halted a short time above the point and smoked with the Indians, and examined the point and best place for our camp. 
We camped on the Columbia River a little above the point I saw about 200 men coming down from their villages and were turned back by the chief, after we built our fires of what wood we could collect, and get from the Indians. The chief brought down all his men singing and dancing as they came, formed a ring and danced for some time around us we gave them a smoke, and they returned the village a little above, the chief and several delay until I went to bead. Bought seven dogs and they gave us several fresh salmon and some horse dried. Clark, October 16, 1805 October 16 Wednesday, 1805 A cool morning determined to run the rapids. Put our Indian guide in front our small canoe next and the other four following each other, the canoes all passed over safe except the rear canoe which run fast on a rock at the lower part of the rapids. With the early assistance of the other canoes and the Indians, who was extremely alert everything was taken out and the canoe got off without any injury further than the articles which it was loaded all wet. At fourteen miles past a bad rapid at which place we unloaded and made a portage of three quarters of a mile, having passed. For smaller rapids, three islands and the parts of a house above, I saw Indians and horses on the south side below. Five Indians came up the river in great haste, we smoked with them and gave them a piece of tobacco to smoke with their people and sent them back, they set out in a run and continued to go as fast as they could run as far as we could see them. After getting safely over the rapid and having taken diner set out and proceeded on seven miles to the junction of this river and the Columbia which joins from the N.W. passed. A rapid two islands and a gravely bear, and immediately in the mouth a rapid above an island. In every direction from the junction of those rivers the Count Ray is one continued plain low and rises from the water gradually, except a range of high Count Ray which runs from S. W and N E and is on the opposite side about two miles distant from the Columbia and keeping its detection S W until it joins A S W range of mountains. We halted above the point on the river Kimunim to smoke with the Indians who had collected there in great numbers to view us. Here we met our two chiefs who left us two days ago and proceeded on to this place to inform those bands of our approach and friendly intentions towards all nations and. We also met the two men who had passed us several days ago on or back, one of them we observed was a man of great influence with those Indians, Har ranged them. After smoking with the Indians who had collected to view us we formed a camp at the point near which place I saw a few pieces of drift wood after we had our camp fixed and fires made. A chief came from their camp which was about one quarter of a mile up the Columbia River at the head of about two hundred men singing and beating on their drum stick and keeping time to the music, they formed a half circle around us and sung for some time. We gave them all smoke, and spoke to their chiefs as well as we could by signs informing them of our friendly disposition to all nations, and our joy in seeing those of our children around us, gave the principal chief a large metal shirt and handkerchief. A second chief a mayadel of small size, and to the chief who came down from the upper villages a small medal and handkerchief. The chiefs then returned with the men to their camp. Soon after we purchased for our provisions seven dogs. Some few of those people made us presents of fish and several returned and delayed with us until bedtime, the two old chiefs who accompanied us from the head of the river procured us some full such as the stalks of weed or plant and willow bushes, one man made me a present of a about twenty pounds. A very fat dried horse meat. Great quantities of a kind of prickly pears, much worse than any I have before seen of a tapering form and attached themselves by bunches. Clark, October 17, 1805. October 17, Thursday, 1805 Forks of Columbia This morning after the lunar observations, the old chief came down, and several men with dogs to sell and woman with fish and. The dogs we purchased the fish not good. I took two men and set out in a small canoe with a view to go as high up the Columbia River as the first forks which the Indians made signs was but a short distance, I set out at two o'clock first course was n. 83 degrees west six miles to the lower point of a island on the lard. Side, past an island in the middle of the river at five miles, at the head of which is a rapid not bad at this rapid three lodges of mats on the lard among quantites of dried fish, then west four miles to the lower point of an island on the starred. Side, 
Two lodges of Indians large and built of mats passed three very large mat lodges at two mile on the starred side large scaffolds of fish drying at every lodge, and piles of salmon lying. The squares engaged preparing them for the scaffold, a squire gave me a dried salmon from those loads on the island an Indian showed me the mouth of the river which falls in below a high hill on the lard. N. 80 degrees west 8 miles from the island. The river bending lard. This river is remarkably clear and crowded with salmon in many places, I observe in ascending great numbers of salmon dead on the shores, floating on the water and in the bottoms which can be seen at the dead of twenty feet. The cause of the immense numbers of dead salmon I can't account for so it is I must have seen three or four hundred dead and many living the Indians, I believe make use of the fish which is not long dead as, I struck one nearly dead and left him floating. Some Indians in a canoe behind took the fish on board his canoe. The bottoms on the south side as high as the Tarkush Tess is from one to two miles wide, back of the bottoms rises to hilly Countray. The plain is low on the north and east for a great distance no wood to be seen in any direction. The Tarkush Tess bears south of west. The Columbia and W above range of hills on the west parallel a range of mountains to the east which appears to run nearly north and south distance not more than fifty miles, I return to the point at dusk followed by three canoes of Indians twenty in number, I killed a fowl of the pheasant kind as large as a turkey. The length from his beak to the end of its tail two feet six, three quarters inches, from the extremity of its wings across three feet six inches. The tail feathers thirteen inches long, feeds on grasshoppers, and the seed of wild isop six. Those Indians are orderly. Badly dressed in the same fashions of those above except the women who wore short shirts and a flap over them twenty-two fishing houses of mats robes of deer, goat and beaver. Clark, October 17, 1805. October 17, Thursday. 1805 A fair morning made the above observations during which time the principal chief came down with several of his principal men and smoked with us. Several men and women offered dogs and fish to sell, we purchased all the dogs we could, the fish being out of season and dying in great numbers in the river, we did not think proper to use them. Send out hunters to shoot the prairie cock a large fowl which I have only seen on this river. Several of which I have killed, they are the size of a small turkey, of the pheasant kind, one I killed on the water edge today measured from the beak to the end of the toe two feet six and three quarters inches, from the extremities of its wings three feet six inches. The tail feathers is thirteen inches long, they feed on grasshoppers and the seed of the wild plant which is also peculiar to this river and the upper parts of the misery somewhat resembling the wind's dash. Captain Lewis took a vocabulary of the language of those people who call themselves so hulk. And also one of the language of a nation residing on a westerly fork of the Columbia which mouths a few miles above this place who call themselves Chim Na Pum some few of this nation reside with the so Kulks nation. Their language differ but little from either the so Kulks or the Chopun Nish, or Pierced Nose, nation which inhabit the Kaskaskia River and Lewis's are below. I took two men in a small canoe and ascended the Columbia River ten miles to an island near the Stard. Shore on which two large mat lodges of Indians were drying salmon, as they informed me by signs for the purpose of food and fuel, and I do not think at all improbable that those people make use of dried fish as fuel. The number of dead salmon on the shores and floating in the river is incredible to say and at this season they have only to collect the fish split them open and dry them on their scaffolds on which they have great numbers. How far they have to raft their timber they make their scaffolds of I could not learn. But there is no timber of any sort except small willow bushes in sight in any direction from this island the natives showed me the entrance of a large westerly fork which they call Tapetet at about eight miles distant. The evening being late I determined to return to the forks, at which place I reached at dark. From the point up the Columbia River is n, 83 degrees west, 6 miles to the lower point of an island near the Lard. Side past the island in the middle of the river at 5 miles at the head of which is a rapid, not dangerous on the Lard side opposite to this rapid is a fishing place 3 mat lodges, and great quants. Of salmon on scaffolds drying. Saw great numbers of dead salmon on the shores and floating in the water, 
great numbers of Indians on the banks viewing me and eighteen canoes accompanied me from the point, the waters of this river is clear. And a salmon may be seen at the dead of fifteen or twenty feet. West four miles to the lower point of a large island near the start. Side at two lodges. Past three large lodges on the starred side near which great number of salmon was drying on scaffolds one of those mat lodges I entered found it crowded with men women and children and near the entrance of those houses I saw many squares engaged splitting and drying salmon. I was furnished with a mat to sit on, and one man set about preparing me something to eat, first he brought in a piece of a drift log of pine and with a wedge of the elk's horn. And a mallet of stone curiously carved he split the log into small pieces and laid it open on the fire on which he put round stones, a woman handed him a basket of water and a large salmon about half dried. When the stones were hot he put them into the basket of water with the fish which was soon sufficiently boiled for use. It was then taken out put on a platter of rushes neatly made, and set before me they boiled a salmon for each of the men with me, during those preparations, I smoked with those about me who chose to smoke which was but few. This being a custom those people are but little accustomed to and only smock through form. After eating the boiled fish which was delicious, I set out and halted or came to on the island at the two lodges. Several fish was given to me, in return for which I gave small pieces of rib bond from those lodges the natives showed me the mouth of Tapteal River about eight miles above on the west side this western fork appears to bear nearly west. The main Columbia River NW. A range of high land to the SW and parallel to the river and at the distance of two miles on the lard. Side, the Count Ray low on the starred. Side, and all covered with a weed or plant about two and three feet high and resembles the winds. I can perceive a range of mountains to the east which appears to bear N and south distant about fifty or sixty miles. No wood to be seen in any direction, on my return I was followed. By three canoes in which there was twenty Indians I shot a large prairie cock several grouse, ducks and fish. On my return found great number. Of the natives with Captain Lewis, men all employed in dressing their skins mending their clothes and putting their arms in the best order the latter being always a matter of attention with us. The dress of those natives differ but little from those on the Kaskaskia and Lewis's rivers, except the women who dress very different inasmuch as those above wear long leather shirts which highly ornament with heed shells and k. And k. And those on the main Columbia River only wear a truss or piece of leather tied around them at their hips and drawn tight between their legs and fastened before so as barley to hide those parts which are so sacredly hid and skewered by our women. Those women are more inclined to copulancy than any we have yet seen, with low stature broad faces, heads flattened and the forward compressed so as to form a straight line from the nose to the crown of the head, their eyes are of a dusky black. Their hair of a coarse black without ornaments of any kind braid as above, the ornaments of each sex are similar, such as large blue and white beads, either pendant from their ears or encircling their necks, or wrists and arms. They also wear bracelets of brass, copper and horn, and trinkets of shells, fish bones and curious feathers. Their garments consists of a short shirt of leather and a robe of the skins of deer or the antelope but few of them wear shirts all have short robes. Those people appears to live in a state of comparative happiness. They take a greater share labor of the woman, than is common among savage tribes, and as I am informed. Content with one wife, as also those on the Kimu e Nim River, those people respect the aged with veneration, I observed an old woman in one of the lodges which I entered she was entirely blind as I was informed by signs. Had lived more than one hundred winters, she occupied the best position in the house, and when she spoke great attention was paid to what she said dash. Those people as also those of the flat heads which we had passed on the Koskosk and Lewis's rivers are subject to sore eyes, and many are blind of one and some of both eyes. This misfortune must be owing to the reflections of the sun and k. On the waters in which they are continually fishing during the spring summer and fall, and the snows during the winter seasons, in this open count ray where the eye has no rest. I have observed amongst those, as well in all other tribes which I have passed on these waters who live on fish many of different sects who have lost their teeth about middle age, some have their teeth worn to the gums. 
particular those of the upper jaws, and the tribes generally have bad teeth the cause of it I cannot account sand attached. To the roots and the method they have of using the DRI'd salmon, which is merely worming it and eating the rind and scales with the flesh of the fish. No doubt contributes to it. The houses or lodges of the tribes of the main Columbia River is of large mats made of rushes, those houses are from 15 to 60 feet in length generally of an oblong square form, supported by poles on forks in the inner side. Six feet high, the top is covered also with mats leaving a separation in the whole length of about 12 or 15 inches wide, left for the purpose of admitting light and for the smock of the fire to pass which is made in the middle of the house. The roofs are nearly flat. Which proves to me that rains are not common in this open country. Those people appear of a mild disposition and friendly disposed they have in their huts independent of their nets gigs and fishing tackling each bows and large quivers of arrows on which they use flint spikes. The higher amusements are similar to those of the Missouri. They are not beggarly and receive what is given them with much joy. I saw but flew horses they appeared make but little use of those animals principally using canoes for their uses of procuring food and. Clark, October 18, 1805. October 18 Friday, 1805 A cold morning fair and wind from S.E. several heath hens or large pheasants lit near us and the men killed six of them. Took one altitude of the sun's upper limb 28 degrees 22 minutes 15 seconds at HMS 8124A. M. Several Indian canoes come down and joined those with us. Made a second chief by giving a mayadel and wampum I also gave a string of wampum to the old chief who came down with us and informed the Indians of our views and intentions in a council. Measured the width of the Columbia River. From the point across to a point of view is south 22 degrees west from the point up the Columa to a point of view is n. 84 degrees west 148 poles, thence across to the first point of view is s 281 2e. Measured the width of Kimu e Nim River, from the point across to an object on the opposite side is n, for 11 2e from the point up the river is n, ad. 82 poles thence across to the point of view is n. 79 degrees east. Distance across the Columbia 9603 4 yards water. Distance across the Kimu e Nim 575 yards water. Names of this nation above the mouth of the Kimu e Nim is Sokulk Pirst Noses. The names of the nation on the Kimonim River is Chopun Nish Pirt Noses at the prairie. The name of a nation at the second forks of the Tape Tela River. Or Noktok Fork Chimnapum. Some of which reside with the so kulk above this at and a few miles distance, for men in a canoe come up from below stayed a few minutes and returned. Took a meridian altitude 68 degrees 57 minutes 30 seconds the sun's upper limb. The latitudes produced is 46 degrees 15 minutes 13 and 9 tenths north. Captain Lewis took a vocabulary of the so kulk or pierced noses language and chim and pum language wick is in some words different but originally the same people the great chief cut saw. H. Nim gave me a sketch of the rivers and tribes above on the great river and its waters on which he put great numbers of villages of his nation and friends. As noted on the sketch. The fish being very bad those which was offered to us we had every reason to believe was taken up on the shore dead, we thought proper not to purchase any, we purchased forty dogs for which we gave articles of little value. Such as beads, bell, and thimbles, of which they appeared very fond, at four o'clock we set out down the great Columbia accompanied by our two old chiefs, one young man wished to accompany us, but we had no room for more. And he could be of no service to us. The great chief continued with us until our departure. We encamped a little below and opsed. The lower point of the island on the lard. Side no wood to be found we were obliged to make use small drid willows to cook, our old chief informed us that the great chief of all the nations about lived at the nine lodges above and wished us to land and. He said he would go up and call him over they went up and did not return until late at night, about twenty came down and built a fire above and stayed all night. The chief brought a basket of mashed berries. Clark, October 18th, 1805. October 18th Friday, 
1805 this morning cool and fair wind from the S. E. 6 of the large prairie cock killed this morning. Several canoes of Indians came down and joined those with us, we had a council with those in which we informed of our friendly intentions towards them and all other of our red children. Of our wish to make a peace between all of our red children in this quarter and and this was conveyed by signs through our two chiefs who accompanied us, and was understood. We made a 2D chief and gave strings of wampum to them all in remembrance of what we said, for men in a canoe came up from a large encampment on an island in the river about eight miles below, they delayed but a few minutes and returned. Without speaking a word to us. The great chief and one of the Chimna Pum nation drew me a sketch of the Columbia above and the tribes of his nation, living on the bank, and its waters. And the Tape Tet River which falls in 18 miles above on the westerly side see sketch below for the number of villages and nations and and we thought it necessary to lay in a store of provisions for our voyage, and the fish being out of season, we purchased forty dogs for which we gave articles of little value, such as bells, thimbles, knitting pins, brass wire and a few beads all of which they appeared well satisfied and pleased. Everything being arranged we took in our two chiefs, and set out on the great Columbia River, having left our guide and the two young men two of them inclined not to proceed on any further. And the third could be of no service to us as he did not know the river below. Took our leave of the chiefs and all those about us and proceeded on down the great Columbia River past a large island at eight miles about three miles in length. A island on the starred side the upper point of which is opposite the center of the last mentioned island and reaches thirty-one halves miles below the first. Island and opposite to this near the middle of the river nine lodges are situated on the upper point at a rapid which is between the lower point of the first island and upper point of this. Great numbers of Indians appeared to be on this island, and immense quantities of fish scaffold we landed a few minutes to view a rapid which commenced at the lower point. Past this rapid which was very bad between two small islands two still smaller near the lard. Side, at this rapid on the starred. Side is two lodges of Indians drying fish, at twenty-one halves miles lower and one forty-one slash two below the point past an island close under the starred. Side on which was two lodges of Indians drying fish on scaffolds as above at sixteen miles from the point the river passes into the range of high count ray at which place the rocks project into the river from the high cliffs which is on the lard. Side about two-thirds of the way across and those of the starred side about the same distance, the count ray rises here about two hundred feet above the water and is bordered with black rigid rocks. At the commencement of this high count ray on large side a small rivulet falls in which appears to pass under the high county in its whole coast saw a mountain bearing s. w. conical form covered with snow. Past four islands, at the upper point of the third is a rapid, on this island is two lodges of Indians, drying fish, on the fourth island close under the starred. Side is nine large lodges of Indians drying fish on scaffolds as above at this place we were called to land, as it was near night and no appearance of wood, we proceeded on about two miles lower to some willows. At which place we observed a drift log formed a camp on the large side under a high hill nearly opposite to five lodges of Indians. Soon after we landed, our old chiefs informed us that the large camp above was the camp of the first chief of all the tribes in this quarter, and that he had called to us to land and stay all night with him. That he had plenty of wood for us and this would have been agreeable to us if it had been understood particularly as we were compelled to use drid willows for fuel for the purpose of cooking. We requested the old chiefs to walk up on the side we had landed and call to the chief to come down and stay with us all night which they did. Late at night the chief came down accompanied by twenty men, and formed a camp a short distance above, the chief brought with him a large basket of mashed berries which he left at our lodge as a present. I saw on the mainland opposite those lodges a number of horses feeding, we made twenty-one miles today. Clark, October 19, 1805. October 19, Saturday. The great chief 2D chief and a chief of a band below came and smoked with us we gave a mayadel a string of wampum and handkerchief to the great chief by name Yellepit the 2D chief we gave a string of wampum. 
His name is underscore 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 the three D who lives below a string of wampum his name I did not learn. The chief requested us to stay until twelve we excused ourselves and set out at nine o'clock. P. Crusat played on the violin which pleased and astonished those richies who are badly clad, three quarters with robes not half large enough to cover them, they are homely high cheeks, and but few ornaments. I souped on the crane which I killed today. Clark, October 19, 1805. October 19, Saturday, 1805 The great chief Yellep Pit two other chiefs, and a chief of band below presented themselves to us very early this morning. We smoked with them, informed them as we had all others above as well as we could by signs of our friendly intentions towards our red children particular those who opened their ears to our counsels. We gave a medal, a handkerchief and a string of wampum to Yelapit and a string of wampum to each of the others. Yelapit is a bold handsome Indian, with a dignified countenance about thirty-five years of age, about five feet eight inches high and well proportioned. He requested us to delay until the middle of the day, that his people might come down and see us, we excused ourselves and promised to stay with him one or two days on our return which appeared to satisfy him. Great numbers of Indians came down in canoes to view us before we set out which was not until nine o'clock a.m., we proceeded on past the island, close under the large side about six miles in length opposite to the lower point of which two ists are situated on one of which five lodges vacant and saffolds drying fish at the upper point of this island swift water. A short distance below past two islands. One near the middle of the river on which is seven lodges of Indians drying fish, at our approach they hid themselves in their lodges and not one was to be seen until we passed. They then came out in greater numbers than is common in lodges of their size, it is probable that. The inhabitants of the five lodges above had in a fright left their lodges and deck ended to this place to defend themselves if attacked had there being a bad rapid opposite the island through which we had to pass prevented our landing on this island and pacifying those people. About four miles below this frightened island we arrived at the head of a very bad rapid, we came to on the large side to view the rapid before we would venture to run it, as the chanel appeared to be close under the oct. Sure, and it would be necessary to litten our canoe, I determined to walk down on the large side, with the two chiefs the interpreter and his woman. And directed the small canoe to proceed down on the large side to the foot of the rapid which was about two miles in length I sent on the Indian chief's end. Down and I ascended a high cliff about two hundred feet above the water from the top of which is a level plain extending up the river and off for a great extent, at this place the count ray becomes low on each side of the river and affords a prospect of the river and Count Ray below for great extent both to the right and left. From this place I discovered a high mountain of immense height covered with snow, this must be one of the mountains laid down by Vancouver, as seen from the mouth of the Columbia River, from the course which it bears which is west I take it to be empty. St. Helens, Dest at 156 miles a range of mountains in the direction crossing, a conical mountain S. W. Toked with snow this rapid I observed as I passed opposite to it to be very bad intercept with high rock and small rocky islands, here I observed banks of mussel shells banked up in the river in several places. I delayed at the foot of the rapid about two hours for the canoes which I could see met with much difficulty in passing down the rapid on the opposite side many places the men were obliged to get into the water and haul the canoes over shoals while setting on a rock waiting for Captain Lewis I shot a crane which was flying over of the common kind. I observed a great number of lodges on the opposite side at some distance below and several Indians on the opposite bank passing up to where Captain. Lewis was with the canoes, others I saw on a knob nearly opposite to me at which place they delayed but a short time before they returned to their lodges as fast as they could run, I was fearful that those people might not be informed of us. I determined to take the little canoe which was with me and proceed with the three men in it to the lodges, on my approach not one person was to be seen except three men off in the plains, and they sheared off as I approached near the shore. I landed in front of five lodges which was at no great distance from each other, saw no person the enter anchor doors of the lodges wer shut with the same materials of which they were built a mat. 
I approached one with a pipe in my hand entered a lodge which was the nearest to me found thirty-two persons men, women and a few children setting promiscuously in the LODG, in the greatest agitation, some crying and wringing their hands. Others hanging their heads. I gave my hand to them all and made signs of my friendly dispotion and offered the men my pipe to smock and distributed a few small articles which I had in my pockets, this measure pacified those distressed people very much. I then sent one man into each lodge and entered a second myself the inhabitants of which I found more frightened than those of the first lodge I distributed sundry small articles amongst them, and smoked with the men. I then entered the third 4-H and fifth lodge which I found somewhat pacified, the three men, Drewer Joe. And R. Fields, having used every means in their power to convince them of our friendly disposition to them, I then set myself on a rock and made signs to the men to come and smoke with me not one come out until the canoes arrived with the two chiefs. One of whom spoke aloud, and as was their custom to all we had passed the Indians came out and sat by me and smoked they said we came from the clouds and kank and were not men and k. And k. This time Captain. Lewis came down with the canoe's rear in which the Indian, as soon as they saw the squaw wife of the interpreters they pointed to her and informed those who continued yet in the same position I first found them. They immediately all came out and appeared to assume new life, the sight of this Indian woman, wife to one of our interpreters. Confirmed those people of our friendly intentions, as no woman ever accompanies a war party of Indians in this quarter, Captain Lewis joined us and we smoked with those people in the greatest friendship. During which time one of our old chiefs informed them who we were from whence we came and where we were going giving them a friendly account of us, those people do not speak precisely the same language of those above but understand them. I saw several horses and persons on or back in the plains many of the men women and children came up from the lodges below. All of them appeared pleased to see us, we traded some few articles for fish and berries, dined, and proceeded on past a small rapid and fifteen lodges below the five, and encamped below an island close under the lard side. Nearly opposite to twenty-four lodges on an island near the middle of the river, and the main starred shore soon after we landed which was at a few willow trees about one hundred Indians came from the different lodges. And a number of them brought wood which they gave us, we smoked with all of them, and two of our party Peter Crusat and Gibson played on the violin which delighted them greatly. We gave to the principal man a string of wampon treated them kindly for which they appeared grateful. This tribe can raise about 350 men their dress are similar to those at the fork except their robes are smaller and do not reach lower than the waist and three quarters of them have scarcely any robes at all. The women have only a small piece of a robe which covers their shoulders neck and reaching down behind to their waists, with a tight piece of leather about the waist, the breasts are large and hang down very low illy shaped. High cheeks flattened heads, and have but few ornaments, they are all employed in fishing and drying fish of which they have great quantites on their scaffolds, their habits customs and. I could not learn. I killed a duck that with the crane afforded us a good supper. The Indians continued all night at our fires. This day we made thirty-six miles. Clark, October 20, 1805 October 20, 1805 Sunday A very cold morning wind S.W. About one hundred Indians came over this morning to see us, after a smoke, a breakfast on dog's flesh we set out. About three hundred and fifty men. Killed two large speckled guts four duck in malade small ducks the flavor of which much resembles the canvas back no timber of any kind on the river, we saw in the last lodges acorns of the white oak which the inns. In form they precure above the falls the men are badly dressed, some have scarlet and blue cloth robes. One has a sailor's jacket, the women have a short indifferent shirt, a short robe of deer or goat skins, and a small skin which they fast end tight around their bodies and fast end. Between the legs to hide the. Clark, October 20th, 1805. October 20th Sunday, 1805 A cool morning wind s. w. We concluded to delay until after breakfast which we were obliged to make on the flesh of dog. After breakfast we gave all the Indian men smoke, and we set out leaving about 200 of the natives at our encampment, passed. 
Three Indian lodges on the large side a little below our camp which lodges I did not discover last evening, passed a rapid at seven miles one at a short distance below we passed a very bad rapid, a chain of rocks making from the start. Side and nearly choking the river up entirely with hue black rocks, an island below close under the start. Side on which was four lodges of Indians drying fish, here I saw a great number of pelicans on the wing, and black cumrans. At one o'clock we landed on the lower point of an island at some Indian lodges, a large island on the starred side nearly opposite and a small one a little below on the large side on those three island I counted seventeen Indian lodges. Those people are in every respect like those above. Preparing fish for the higher winter consumption here we purchased a few indifferent dried fish and a few berries on which we dined dash. On the upper part of this island we discovered an Indian vault, our curiosity induced us to examine the method those natives practiced in deposing the dead. The vault was made by broad poles and pieces of canoes leaning on a ridge pole which was supported by two forks set in the ground six feet in height in an easterly and westerly direction and about sixty feet in length, and twelve feet wide. In it I observed great numbers of humane bones of every description particularly in a pile near the center of the vault, on the east end twenty-one skull bones forming a circle on Matt's dash. In the westerly part of the vault appeared to be appropriated for those of more resent death, as many of the bodies of the deceased raped up in leather robes lay on board covered with mats, and we observed. Independent of the canoes which served as a covering, fishing nets of various kinds, baskets of different sizes, wooden bowls, robes skins, trenchers, and various kind of trinkets, in and suspended on the ends of the pieces forming the vault. We also saw the skeletons of several horses at the vault and great number of bones about it, which convinced me that those animals were sacrificed as well as the above articles to the deceased. After diner we proceeded on to a bad rapid at the lower point of a small island on which four lodges of Indians were situated drying fish, here the high count ray commences again on the start. Side leaving a valley of forty miles in width, from the mussel shell rapid. Examined and passed this rapid close to the island at eight miles lower past a large island near the middle of the river a brook on the start. Side and eleven isles. All in view of each other below, a riverlet falls in on the lard. Side behind a small island a small rapid below. The star side is high rugged hills, the lard. Side a low plain and not a tree to be seen in any direction except a few small willow bushes which are scattered partially on the sides of the bank. The river today is about one quarter of a mile in width, this evening the count ray on the lard. Side rises to the height of that on the starboard side, and is wavering, we made forty-two miles today, the current much more uniform than yesterday or the day before. Killed two speckle gulls several. Ducks of a delicious flavor. Clark, October 21, 1805. October 21, 1805 Monday a very cold morning we set out early wind from the SW, we could not cook breakfast before we embarked as usual for the want of wood or something to burn. Clark, October 21, 1805. October 21 Monday, 1805 A very cool morning wine from the SW. We set out very early and proceeded on, last night we could not collect more dry willows the only fuel, than was barely sufficient to cook supper, and not a sufficiency to cook breakfast this morning, passed. A small island at fifty-one halves miles a large one eight miles in the middle of the river, some rapid water at the head and eight lodges of natives opposite its lower point on the start. Side, we came to at those lodges, bought some wood and breakfast. Those people received us with great kindness, and examined us with much attention, their employments custom dress and appearance similar to those above. Speak the same language, here we saw two scarlet and a blue cloth blanket, also a sailor's jacket the dress of the men of this tribe only a short robe of deer or goat skins. And that of the womb is a short piece of dressed skin which fall from the neck so as to cover the front of the body as low as the waist, a short robe which is of one deer or antelope skin, and a hap. Around their waist and drawn tight between their legs as before described, their ornaments are but few, and worn as those above. We got from those people a few pounded roats fish and acorns of the white oak, 
those acorns they make use of as food. And inform us they precure them of the natives who live near the falls below which place they all describe by the term Tim at two miles lower past a rapid, large rocks stringing into the river of large size opposite to this rapid on the star. Shore is situated two lodges of the natives drying fish here we halted a few minutes to examine the rapid before we entered it which was our constant custom, and at all that was very dangerous put out all who could not swim to walk around. After passing this rapid we proceeded on past a north rapid at five miles lower down, above this rapid on five lodges of Indians fishing and above this rapid many large rocks on each side at some distance from shore, one mile past an island close to the star. Side, below which is two lodge of natives, a little below is a bad rapid which is bad crowded with hue rocks scattered in every direction which renders the passage very difficult a little above this rapid on the lard. Side immense piles of rocks appears as if sliped from the cliffs under which they lay, past great number of rocks in every direction scattered in the river five lodges a little below on the stard. Side, and one lodge on an island near the stard. Shore opposite to which is a very bad rapid, through which we found much difficulty in passing, the river is crowded with rocks in every direction. After passing this difficult rapid to the mouth of a small river on the larboard side forty yards wide discharges but little water at this time, and appears to take its source in the open plains to the S. East from this place I perceived some few small pines on the tops of the high hills and bushes in the hollers. Immediately above and below this little river commences a rapid which is crowded with large rocks in every direction, the passage both crooked and difficult, we halted at a lodge to examine those numerous islands of rock which APD. To extend many miles below, dash. Great numbs. Of Indians came in canoes to view us at this place, after passing this rapid which we accomplished without loss, winding through between the hue rocks for about two miles dash. From this rapid the Conisal Mountain is S. W. which the Indians inform me is not far to the left of the Great Falls. This I call the Tim or Falls Mountain it is high and the top is covered with snow, immediately below the last rapids there is four lodges of Indians on the Stard. Side, proceeded on about two miles lower and landed and encamped near five lodges of natives, drying fish those are the relations of those at the Great Falls. They are poor and have but little wood which they bring up the river from the falls as they say, we purchased a little wood to cook our dog meat and fish. Those people did not receive us at first with the same cordiality of those above, they appear to be the same nation speak the same language with a little corruption of many words dress and fish in the same way. All of whom have pierced noses and the men when dressed wear a long tapered piece of shell or bead put through the nose this part of the river is furnished with fine springs which either rise high up the sides of the hills or on the bottom near the river and run into the river. The hills are high and rigid a few scattering trees to be seen on them either small pine or scrubby white oak. The probable reason of the Indians residing on the stard. Side of this as well as the waters of Lewis's river is their fear of the snake Indians who reside, as they natives say on a great river to the south, and are at war with those tribes. One of the old chiefs who accompanies us pointed out a place on the lard. Side where they had a great battle, not many years ago, in which many were killed on both sides dash, one of our party J. Collins presented us with some very good beer made of the Pashikokormash bread which bread is the remains of what was laid in as stores of provisions. At the first flat heads or Chopunish nation at the head of the Koskosk River which by being frequently wet molded and soared and we made 33 miles today. Clark, October 22, 1805 October 22, Tuesday, 1805 A fine morning calm. We set out at 9 o'clock and on the course s 52 degrees west, ten miles past lodges and inns. And rapids as mentioned in the course of yesterday, from the expiration of. Took our baggage and formed a camp below the rapids in a cove on the starred side the distance 1,200 yards having passed at the upper end of the portage 17 lodges of Indians. Below the rapids and above the camp five large loges of Indians, great numbers of baskets of pounded fish on the rocks islands and near their lodges those are neatly pounded and put in very new baskets of about 90 or 100 pounds white. 
Hire Indians to take our heavy articles across the portage purchased a dog for supper great numbers of Indians view us, we with much difficulty perched. As much wood as cooked our dogs this evening, our men all in health, the Indians have their graveyards on an island in the rapids. The great chief of those Indians is out hunting. No Indians reside on the large side for fear of the snake Indians with whom they are at war and who reside on the large fork on the lard. A little above. Clark, October 22, 1805. October 22 d. Tuesday 1805 A fine morning calm and fair we set out at nine o'clock past a very bad rapid at the head of an island close under the start. Side, above this rapid on the start side is six lodges of natives drying fish, at nine mls past a bad rapid at the head of a large island of high, uneven rocks, jutting over the water, a small island in a start. Bend opposite the upper point, on which I counted twenty parcels of dried and pounded fish, on the main starred shore opposite to this island five lodges of Indians are situated several Indians in canoes killing fish with gigs, and opposite the center of this island of rocks which is about four miles long we discovered the entrance of a large river on the lard. Side which appeared to come from the S.E. We landed at some distance above the mouth of this river and captain. Lewis and myself set out to view this river above its mouth, as our route was intercepted by a deep narrow chanel which runs out of this river into the Columbia a little below the place we landed. Leaving a high dry rich island of about 400 yards wide and 800 yards long here we separate, I proceeded on to the river and struck it at the foot of a very considerable rapid. Here I beheld an immense body of water compressed in a narrow chanel of about 200 yards in width, foaming over rocks many of which presented their tops above the water, when at this place Captain. Lewis joined me having delayed on the way to examine a root of which the natives had been digging great quantities in the bottoms of this river. At about two miles above this river appears to be confined between two high hills below which it divided by numbers of large rocks, and small islands covered with a low growth of timber and has a rapid as far as the narrows three small islands in the mouth of this river, this river having no Indian name that we could find out, except, the river on which the Snake Indians live. We think it best to leave the naming of it until our return. We proceeded on past the mouth of this river at which place it appears to discharge one quarter as much water as runs down the Columbia. At two miles below this river passed eight lodges on the lower point of the rock island aforesaid at those lodges we saw large logs of wood which must have been rafted down the Tawarani High Ocase River. Below this island on the main start shore is sixteen lodges of natives. Here we landed a few minutes to smoke. The lower point of one island opposite which heads in the mouth of Torn Hayuk's river which I did not observe until after passing these lodges about one half a mile lower past six more lodges on the same side and six miles below the upper mouth of Torn Hayuk's river the commencement of the pitch of the Great Falls. Opposite on the start. Side is seventeen lodges of the natives we landed and walked down accompanied by an old man to view the falls, and the best route for to make a portage which we soon discovered was much nearest on the start. Side, and the distance 1,200 yards one-third of the way on a rock, about 200 yards over a loose sand collected in a holler blown by the winds from the bottoms below which was disagreeable to pass, as it was steep and loose. At the lower part of those rapids we arrived at five large lodges of natives drying and preparing fish for market, they gave us filberts, and berries to eat. We returned drove down to the head of the rapids and took every article except the canoes across the port tag where I had formed a camp on El Gable situation for the protection of our stores from thief, which we were more fearful of. Then their arrows. We dispatched two men to examine the river on the opposite side, and reported that the canoes could be taken down a narrow chanel on the opposite side after a short portage at the head of the falls, at which place the Indians take over their canoes. Indians assisted us over the portage with our heavy articles on their horses, the waters is divided into several narrow chanels which pass through a hard black rock forming islands of rocks at this stage of the water. On those islands of rocks as well as at and about their lodges I observe great numbers of stacks of pounded salmon neatly preserved in the following manner, i.e. after sufficiently dried it is pounded between two stones fine. 
and put into a species a basket neatly made of grass and rushes of better than two feet long and one foot diameter, which basket is lined with the skin of salmon stretched and dried for the purpose. Entice it is pressed down as hard as is possible, when full they secure the open part with the fish skins across which they fasten though the loops of the basket that part very securely. And then on a dry situation they set those baskets the corded part up, their common custom is to set seven as close as they can stand and five on the top of them. And secure them with mats which is raped around them and made fast with cords and covered also with mats, those twelve baskets are from ninety to one hundred w. Each form a stack. Thus preserved those fish may be kept sound and sweet several years, as those people inform me, great quantities as they inform us are sold to the whites people who visit the mouth of this river as well as to the natives below. On one of those island I saw several tombs but did not visit them the principal chiefs of the bands residing about this place is out hunting in the mountains to the S. W. No Indians reside on the S. W. Side of this river for fear, as we were informed, of the Snake Indians, who are at war with the tribes on this river, they represent the Snake Indians as being very numerous. And residing in a great number of villages on Tornhyuks River which falls in six miles above on the Lard. Side and is reaches a great ways and is large a little above its mouth at which part it is not intercepted with rapids, they inform that one considerable rapid and many small ones in that river, and that the snake live on salmon. And they go to war to their first villages in twelve days, the cows they pointed is S. E. or to the S of S. E. We are visited by great numbers of Indians today to view us, we purchased a dog for supper, some fish and with difficulty procured as much wood as cooked supper, which we also purchased we made nineteen miles today. Clark, October 23rd. 1805. October 23rd, Saturday. Wednesday 1805 took the canoes over the portage on the Lard. Side with much difficulty, description on another paper one canoe got loose and caught by the Indians which we were obliged to pay. Our old chiefs overheard the Indians from below say they would try to kill us and informed us of it, we have all the arm examined and put in order, all th ins leave us early. Great numbers of fleas on the Lard side, shot a sea odor which I did not get, great numbers about those rapids we purchased eight dogs, small and fat for our party to eat, the Indians not very fond of selling their good fish. Compels us to make use of dogs for food exchanged our small canoe for a large and a very new one built for riding the waves obst Merton. Alft. 66 degrees 27 minutes 30 seconds lat. Prodst. 45 degrees 42 minutes 57 and 3 tenths north. Clark, October 23, 1805. October 23d Wednesday 1805 A fine morning. I with the greater part of the men crossed in the canoes to opposite side above the falls and hauled them across the portage of 457 yards which is on the lard. Side and certainly the best side to pass the canoes I then deck-ended through a narrow chanel of about 150 yards wide forming a kind of half-circle in a course of a mile to a pitch of eight feet in which the chanel is divided by two large rocks at this place we were obliged to let the canoes down by strong ropes of elk skin which we had for the purpose. One canoe in passing this place got loose by the cords breaking, and was caught by the Indians below. I accomplished this necessary business and landed safe with all the canoes at our camp below the falls by 3 o'clock p.m. Nearly covered with fleas which were so thick amongst the straw and fish skins at the upper part of the portage at which place the natives had been camped not long since. That every man of the party was obliged to strip naked during the time of taking over the canoes, that they might have an opportunity of brushing the fleas of their legs and bodies, great numbers of sea otters in the river below the falls. I shot one in the narrow chanel today which I could not get. Great numbers of Indians visit us both from above and below, one of the old chiefs who had accompanied us from the head of the river, informed us that he heard the Indians say that the nation below intended to kill us, we examined all the arms and complete the ammunition to one hundred rounds. The natives leave us earlier this evening than usual, which gives a shadow of confirmation to the information of our old chief as we are at all times and places on our guard, are under no greater apprehension than is common.
We purchased eight small fat dogs for the party to eat the natives not being fond of selling their good fish, compels us to make use of dog meat for food. The flesh of which the most of the party have become fond of from the habits of using it for some time past. The altitude of this day 66 degrees 27 minutes 30 seconds gave for lat. 45 degrees 42 minutes 57 and 1 tenth n. I observed on the beach near the Indian lodges two canoes beautiful of different shape and size to what we had seen above wide in the mid and tapering to each end, on the bow curious figures were cut in the wood and. Captain. Lewis went up to the lodges to see those canoes and exchanged our smallest canoe for one of them by giving a hatchet and few trinkets to the owner who informed that he purchased it of a white man below for a horse. These canoes are neither made than any I have ever seen and calculated to ride the waves, and carry immense burthens, they are dug thin and are supported by cross pieces of about one inch diameter tied with strong bark through holes in the sides. Our two old chiefs appeared very uneasy this evening. Clark, October 24, 1805. October 24, Thursday, 1805 A fine morning the Indians approached us with caution. Our two old chiefs determined to return home, saying they were at war with Indians below and they would kill them we persuaded them to stay two nights longer with us. With a view to make a peace with those Indians below as well as to have them with us during our delay with this tribe. Captain Lewis went to view the falls I set out with the party at 9 o'clock a.m. at 21 halves miles past a rock which makes from the starred side four lodges above one below and confined the river in a narrow channel of about 45 yards this continued for about one quarter of a mile and widened to about 200 yards. In those narrows the water was agitated in a most shocking manner boils swell and whirlpools, we passed with great risque it being impossible to make a portage of the canoes. About two miles lower past a very bad place between two rocks one large and in the middle of the river here our canoes took in some water, I put all the men who could not swim on shore. And sent a few articles such as guns and papers, and landed at a village of twenty houses on the starred side in a deep basin where the river APPRD. To be blocked up with immense rocks I walked down and examined the pass found it narrow, and one very bad place a little in the narrows I pursued this chanel which is from fifty to one hundred yards wide and swells and boils with a most tremendous manner. Prosued this channel five milliseconds and returned found Captain Lewis and a chief from below with many of his men on a visit to us, one of our party Pete Crusat played on the violin which pleased the savage, the men danced. Great numbers of sea or tear pole cats about those fisheries. The houses of those Indians are twenty feet square and sunk eight feet underground and covered with bark with a small door round at top rows about eighteen inches above ground, to keep out the snow I saw one hundred and seven parcels of fish stacked. And great quantites in the houses. Clark, October 24th, 1805. October 24th Thursday, 1805 The morning fair after a beautiful night, the natives approached us this morning with great caution. Our two old chiefs expressed a desire to return to their band from this place, saying, that they could be of no further service to us, as their nation extended no further down the river than those falls. And as the nation below had expressed hostile intentions against us, would certainly kill them. Particularly as they had been at war with each other. We requested them to stay with us two nights longer, and we would see the nation below and make a peace between them. They replied they were anxious to return and see our horses, we insisted on their staying with us two nights longer to which they agreed. Our views were to detain those chiefs with us until we should pass the next falls, which we were told was very bad, and at no great distance below, that they might inform us of any designs of the natives. And if possible to bring about a peace between them and the tribes below. The first pitch of this falls is twenty feet perpendicular, then passing through a narrow chanel for one mile to a rapid of about eighteen feet fall below which the water has no perceptible fall but very rapid see sketch number one. It may be proper here to remark that from some obstruction below, the cause of which we have not yet learned, the water in high floods, which are in the spring, rise below these falls nearly to a level with the water above the falls. The marks of which can be plainly tracked around the falls. At that stage of the water the salmon must pass up which abounds in such great numbers above, 
below those falls are salmon trout and great numbers of the heads of a species of trout smaller than the salmon. Those fish they catch out of the salmon season, and are at this time in the act of burying those which they had drid for winter food. The mode of burying those fish is in holes of various sizes, lined with straw on which they lay fish skins in which they enclose the fish which is laid very close, and then covered with earth of about twelve or fifteen inches thick. Captain Lewis and three men crossed the river and on the opposite side to view the falls which he had not yet taken a full view of, at nine o'clock a.m. I set out with the party and proceeded on down a rapid stream of about four hundred yards wide at twenty-one halves miles the river widened into a large basin to the start. Side on which there is five lodges of Indians. Here a tremendous black rock presented itself high and steep appearing to choke up the river nor could I see where the water passed further than the current was drawn with great velocity to the large side of this rock at which place I heard a great roaring. I landed at the lodges and the natives went with me to the top of this rock which makes from the start side, from the top of which I could see the difficulties we had to pass for several miles below. At this place the water of this great river is compressed into a chenelle between two rocks not exceeding forty-five yards wide and continues for a one-quarter of a mile when it again widens to two hundred yards and continues this width for about two miles when it is again intercepted by rocks. This obstruction in the river accounts for the water in high floods rising to such a height at the last falls. The whole of the current of this great river must at all stages pass through this narrow chenel of forty-five yards wide. As the portage of our canoes over this high rock would be impossible with our strength, and the only danger in passing through those narrows was the whirls and swills arising from the compression of the water. And which I thought, as also our principal waterman Peter Crew sat, by good steering we could pass down safe, Accordingly I determined to pass through this place notwithstanding the horrid appearance of this agitated gut swelling. Boiling and whirling in every direction, which from the top of the rock did not appear as bad as when I was in at Winky Face. However we passed safe to the astonishment of all the inns. Of the last lodges who viewed us from the top of the rock. Passed one lodge below this rock and halted on the start. Side to view a very bad place, the current divided by two islands of rocks the lower of them large and in the middle of the river. This place being very bad I sent by land all the men who could not swim and such articles as was most valuable to us such as papers guns and ammunition. And proceeded down with the canoes two at a time to a village of twenty wood houses in a deep bend to the start. Side below which a rigid black rock about twenty feet biter than the common high floods of the river with several dry chapels which appeared to choke the river up quite across. This I took to be the 2D falls or the place the natives above call Tim, the natives of this village reeved me very kindly, one of whom invited me into his house, which I found to be large and commodious. And the first wooden houses in which Indians have lived since we left those in the vicinity of the Illinois, they are scattered promiscuously on an elevated situation near a mound of about thirty feet above the common level. Which mound has some remains of houses and has every appearance of being artificial, those houses are about the same shape size and form twenty feet wide and thirty feet long with one door raised eighteen inches above ground, they are two ninety-one slash two inches high and fourteen wide. Forming in a half circle above those houses were sunk into the earth six feet. The roofs of them was supported by a ridge pole resting on three strong pieces of split timber through one of which the door was cut that and the walls the top of which was just above ground supported a certain number of spars which are covered with the bark of the white cedar. Or arborvitaea. And the whole attached and secured by the fibers of the cedar. The eaves at or near the earth. The gable ends and side walls are secured with split boards which is supported on inner side with strong pieces of timber under the eaves and to keep those pieces erect in the earth from without pressing in the boards, supported by strong posts at the corners to which those poles were attached to give additional strength, small openings were left above the ground, for the purpose, as I conjectured, of discharging their arrows at a besieging enemy. Light is admitted through an opening at top which also serves for the smoke to pass through. One half of those houses is appropriated for the storing away dried and pounded fish which is the principal food the other part next the door is the part occupied by the natives who have beds raised on either side. 
With a fireplace in the center of this space each house appeared to be occupied by about three families. That part which is appropriated for fish was crowded with that article. And a few baskets of buries, I dispatched a sufficient number of the good swimmers back for the two canoes above the last rapid and with two men walked down three miles to examine the river over a bed of rocks. Which the water at very high floods passes over, on those rocks I saw several large scaffolds on which the Indians dry fish. As this is out of season the poles on which they dry those fish are tied up very securely in large bundles and put upon the scaffolds, I counted 107 stacks of dried pounded fish in different places on those rocks which must have contained I O O O O W. Of neat fish, the evening being late I could not examine the river to my satisfaction, the chanel is narrow and compressed for about two miles, when it widens into a deep basin to the starred side, and again contracts into a narrow chanel divided by a rock I returned through a rocky open count ray infested with polecats to the village where I met with Captain. Lewis the two old chiefs who accompanied us and the party and canoes who had all arrived safe, the canoes having taken in some water at the last rapids. Here we formed a camp near the village, the principal chief from the nation below with several of his men visited us and afforded a favorable opportunity of bringing about a peace and good understanding between this chief and his people and the two chiefs who accompanied us which we have the satisfaction to say we have accomplished. As we have every reason to believe and that those two bands or nations are and will be on the most friendly terms with each other. Gave this great chief a medal and some other articles, of which he was much pleased, Peter Crusat played on the violin and the men danced which delighted the natives, who shew every civility towards us. We smoked with those people until late at night, when everyone retired to rest. Clark, October 25, 1805 October 25, Friday, 1805 A cold morning, we determined to attempt the Chanel after breakfast I took down all the party below the bad places with a load and one canoe passed well. A two deep passed while I had men on the shore with ropes to throw in in case any accidents happened at the whirlland, the inns on the rocks vying us the third canoe nearly filled with water we got her safe to shore. The last canoe came over well which to me was truly gratifying set out and had not passed two mills before three canoes run against a rock in the river with great force no dam. Met with a two deep chief of the nation from hunting, we smoked with him and his party and gave a medal of the small size and set out past great numbers of rocks. Good water and came to at a high point of rocks below the mouth of a creek which falls in on the large side and head up towards the high snow mountain to the SW. This creek is twenty yards wide and has some beaver signs at its mouth river about one half a mile wide and crowded with sea otters. And drum was seen this evening we took possession of a high point of rocks to defend ourselves in case the threats of those Indians below should be put in execution against us. Sent out some hunters to look if any signs of game, one man killed a small deer and several others seen I killed a goose, and souped heartily on venison and goose. Camped on the rock guard under the hill. Clark, October 25, 1805. October 25, Friday. 1805 A cool morning Captain Lewis and myself walked down to see the place the Indians pointed out as the worst place in passing through the gut. Which we found difficult of passing without great danger, but as the portage was impracticable with our large canoes. We concluded to make a portage of our most valuable articles and run the canoes through accordingly on our return divided the party some to take over the canoes and others to take our stores across a portage of a mile to a place on the chanel below this bad whirl and suck. With some others I had fixed on the chanel with ropes to throw out to any who should unfortunately meet with difficulty in passing through. Great number of Indians viewing us from the high rocks under which we had to pass, the three furt canoes passed through very well, the fourth nearly filled with water, the last passed through by taking in a little water. Thus safely below what I conceived to be the worst part of this chanel, felt myself extremely gratified and pleased. We loaded the canoes and set out, and had not proceeded, more than two mile before the unfortunate canoe which filled crossing the bad place above, run against a rock and was in great danger of being lost. This chanel is through a hard rough black rock, from fifty to one hundred yards wide. 
swelling and boiling in a most tremendous manner several places on which the Indians inform me they take the salmon as fast as they wish. We pass through a deep basin to the starred side of one mile below which the river narrows and divided by a rock the current we found quick gentle, here we met with our two old chiefs who had been to a village below to smoke a friendly pipe. And at this place they met the chief and party from the village above on his return from hunting all of whom were then crossing over their horses. We landed to smoke a pipe with this chief whom we found to be a bold pleasing looking man of about fifty years of age dressed. In a war jacket a cap leggings and moccasins. He gave us some meat of which he had but little and informed us he and his route met with a war party of snake Indians from the great river of the S. E. which falls in a few miles above and had a fight. We gave this chief a medal, and a parting smoke with our two faithful friends the chiefs who accompanied us from the head of the river, who had purchased a horse each with two robes and intended to return on horseback, we proceeded on down the water fine. Rocks in every direction for a few miles when the river widens and becomes a beautiful gentle stream of about half a mile wide, great numbers of the sea or tear about those narrows and both below and above. We came too, under a high point of rocks on the lard. Side below a creek of twenty yards wide and much water, as it was necessary to make some celestial observations we formed our camp on the top of a high point of rocks, which forms a kind of fortification in the point between the river and creek. With a boat guard, this situation we conceive well calculated for defense, and convenient to hunt under the foots of the mountain to the west and s. w. where timber of different kinds grows, and appears to be handsome coverts for the deer, in oak woods, sent out hunters to examine for game g. d. killed a small deer and other saw much sign, I killed a goose in the creek which was very fat, one of the guards saw a drum fish today as he conceived our situation well calculated to defend ourselves from any designs of the natives. Should they be inclined to attack us? This little creek heads in the range of mountains which run SSW and NW for a long distance on which is scattering pine white oak and the pinnacle of the round toked mountain which we saw a short distance below the forks of this river is S. 43 degrees west. Of us and ABT 37 miles, it is at this time toked with snow we called this the Falls Mountain or Tim Mountain. The face of the Count Ray, on both side of the river above and about the falls, is steep rouged and rocky open and contain but a small pre-portion of herbage, no timber a few bushes excepted. The natives at the upper falls raft their timber down Tornhooks River and those at the Narrows take theirs up the river to the lower part of the Narrows from this creek, and carry it over land three miles to their houses and at the mouth of this creek saw some beaver sign, and a small wolf in a snare set in the willows the snars of which I saw several made for to catch wolves, are made as follows vz, a long pole which will spring is made fast with bark to a willow. On the top of this pole a string. Clark, October 26, 1805. October 26, 1805 Saturday a fine morning sent out six men to hunt deer and collect rosin to pitch our canoes, had all our articles put out to dry, canoes drawed out and repaired. The injuries wrecked in drawing them over the rocks, every article wet in the canoe which nearly sunk yesterday. In the evening two chief and fifteen men came over in a single canoe, those CHFs proved to be the two great chiefs of the tribes above. One gave me a dressed elk skin, and gave us some deer meat, and two cakes of white bread made of white roots. We gave to each chief a mayadel of the small size a red silk handkerchief and a knife to the first a arm band and a pin of paint and a comb to his son a piece of ribbon tied to a tin gorget and two hams of venison they determined to stay with us all night. We had a fire made for them and one man played on the violin which pleased them much my servant danced, our hunters killed five deer, four very large grey squirrels, a goose and pheasant. One man gigged a salmon trout which we had fried in a little bear's oil which a chief gave us yesterday and I think the finest fish I ever tasted, saw great numbers of white crams flying in different directions very high. The river has rose nearly eight inches today and has every appearance of a tide. From what cause I can't say, our hunters saw elk and bear signs today in the white oak woods the country to the lard is broken country thinly timbered with pine and white oak. 
A mountain which I must call Tim or Falls Mountain rises very high and bears to SW the course it has bore sink we first saw it. Our men danced tonight. Dried all our wet articles and repaired our canoes. The fleas myself and the men got on them in passing through the plains the Indians had lately lived in lodges on the lard. Side at the falls, are very troublesome and with every exertion the men can't get rid of them. Particularly as they have no clothes to change those which they wore those Indians are at wear with the snake Indians on the river which falls in a few miles above this and have lately had a battle with them, their loss I cannot learn. Clark, October 26, 1805 October 26, Saturday, 1805 A fine morning sent six men out to hunt deer, and collect rosin to pitch the canoes which has become very leaky. By frequently hauling them over rocks and as well striking rocks frequently in passing down. All our articles we have exposed to the sun to dry, and the canoes drawn out and turned up, many of our stores entirely spoiled by being repeatedly wet. A number of Indians came to the opposite side of the river in the fore part of the day and shew that they were anxious to cross to us, we did not think proper to cross them in our canoes and did not send for them. In the evening two chiefs and fifteen men came over in a small canoe, those two chiefs proved to be the two principal chiefs of the tribes above at the falls, and above, who was out hunting at the time we passed their bands. One of those chiefs made Captain Lewis and myself each a small present of deer meat, and small cakes of white bread made of roots. We gave to each chief a maidel of the small size a red silk handkerchief, armband, knife and a piece of paint, and acknowledged them as chiefs. As we thought it necessary at this time to treat those people very friendly and ingratiate ourselves with them, to ensure us a kind and friendly reception on our return, we gave small presents to several, and half a deer to them to eat. We had also a fire made for those people to sit around in the middle of our camp, and Peter Crusat played on the violin, which pleased those natives exceedingly. The two chiefs and several men determined to delay all night, York danced for the inns, with us all the others returned, leaving the horses for those who stayed on the opposite side. Our hunters returned in the evening killed five deer, for very large grey squirrels and a grouse. One of the guard at the river Gui get a salmon trout, which we had fried in a little bear's oil which the chief we passed below the narrows gave us. This I thought one of the most delicious fish I have ever tasted great numbers of white crane flying in different directions very high, the river rose eight inches today from what cause I cannot say certainly. As the tides cannot affect the river here as there is a falls below, I conjecture that the rise is owing to the winds which has set up the river for twenty-four hours past. Our hunters inform that the Count Ray back is broken, stony and thinly timbered with pine and white oak. They saw elk and bear sign in the mountains. Dried all our wet articles and repart our canoes today, and the party amused themselves at night dancing. The fleas which the party got on them at the upper and great falls, are very troublesome and difficult to get rid of, particularly as the men have not a change of clothes to put on, they strip off their clothes and kill the fleas during which time they remain naked. The nations in the vicinity of this place is at war with the Snake Indians who they say are numerous and live on the river we passed above the falls on the same side on which we have encamped. And the nearest town is about four days' march they pointed nearly s. e. and informed that they had a battle with those inns. Laterly, their loss I could not assert I'm. Clark, October 27, 1805 October 27 Sunday, 1805 A very windy night and morning wind from the west and hard. Send out hunters and they killed four deer one pheasant and a squirrel the two chiefs and party continue with us, we treat them well give them to eat and smoke, they were joined by seven others. From below who stayed about three hours and returned down the river in a pet, soon after the chiefs determined to go home we had them put across the river the wind very high, we took a vocabulary of the languages of the two nations. The one living at the falls call themselves e sure the other residing at the levels or narrows in a village on the STD. Side call themselves e Chilut, notwithstanding those people live only six miles apart. But few words of each other's language, the language of those above having great similarity with those tribes of flat heads we have passed, all have the clucking tone annexed which is predominant. 
Above, all flatten the heads of their female children near the falls, and many above follow the same custom the language of the Chalukitakor a few miles below is different from both in a small degree. The wind increased in the evening and blew very hard from the same point W, day, fair and cold, the creek at which we are encamped is called by the natives Kanet some words with Shabono about his duty, the pinnacle of Falls Mountain Bears south 43 degrees west. About 35 miles. Clark, October 27, 1805. October 27th Sunday, 1805 wind hard from the west all the last night and this morning. Some words with Shabono our interpreter about his duty. Sent out several hunters who brought in four deer, one grouse and a squirrel. The two chiefs and party was joined by seven others from below in two canoes, we gave them to eat and smoke several of those from below returned down the river in a bad humor. Having got into this pet by being prevented doing as they wished with our articles which was then exposed to dry, we took a vocabulary of the languages of those two chiefs which are very different notwithstanding they are situated within six miles of each other. Those at the Great Falls call themselves Enasher and are understood on the river above. Those at the Great Narrows call themselves Eshlut and is understood below, many words of those people are the same, and common to all the flat head bands which we have passed on the river. All have the clucking tone annexed which is predominate above. All the bands flatten the heads of the female children, and many of the male children also. Those two chief leave us this evening and return to their bands, the wind very high and from the west, day proved fair and cool. The natives call this creek near which we are encamped Canet. Clark, October 28, 1805. October 28 Monday, 1805 A windy morning loaded our canoes and set out at 9 o'clock a.m. Three canoes came down from the village above and two from that below and one of those canoes a Indian wore his hair cued. And had on a round hat. Wind from west. Those Indians have a musket a sword, and several brass tea kitties which they appear to be very fond of we purchased of those people five small dogs, and some dried berries and white bread of roots. The wind rose and we were obliged to lie by about one mile below on the lard. Side north one mile to a rock island on the stard. Side. We had not landed long ere an Indian canoe came from below with three Indians in it, those Indians make very nice canoes of pine. Thin with a porns and carve on the head imitation of animals and other heads, the Indians above sacrifice the property of the deceased to wit horses canoes, bulls basques of which they make great use to hold water boil their meat and k. And k. Great many Indians came down from the UPPR village and sat with us, smoked, rained all the evening and blew hard from the west encamped on the large side opst. And rock in a very bad place. Clark, October 28, 1805. October 28 Monday, 1805 A cool windy morning we loaded our canoes and set out at 9 o'clock a.m. As we were about to set out three canoes from above and two from below came to view us in one of those canoes I observed an Indian with round hat jacket and wore his hair cued we proceeded on river enclosed on each side in high cliffs of about ninety feet of loose dark colored rocks at four miles we landed at a village of eight houses on the start. Side under some rigid rocks, those people call themselves Chiolukatequa, live in houses similar to those described. Speak somewhat different language with many words the same and understand those in their neighborhood Cap Lewis took a vocabulary of this language I entered one of the houses in which I saw a British musket. A cutlass and several brass tea kittles of which they appeared very fond saw them boiling fish in baskets with stones, I also saw figures of animals and men cut and painted on boards in one side of the house which they appeared to prize. But for what purpose I will not venture to say, dash. Here we purchased five small dogs, some dried berries, and white bread made of roots, the wind rose and we were obliged to lie by all day at one mile below on the lard. Side. We had not been long on shore before a canoe came up with a man woman and two children, who had a few roots to sell, soon after many others joined them from above, the wind which is the cause of our delay does not retard the motions of those people at all, as their canoes are calculated to ride the highest waves, they are built of white cedar or pine very light wide in the middle and tapers at each end, with a perns. 
and heads of animals carved on the bow, which is generally raised. Those people make great use of canoes, both for transportation and fishing, they also use of bowls and baskets made of grass and splits to hold water and boil their fish and meat. Many of the natives of the last village came down set and smoke with us, wind blew hard accompanied with rain all the evening, our situation not a very good one for an encampment, but such as it is we are obliged to put up with. The harbor is a safe one, we encamped on the sand wet and disagreeable one deer killed this evening, and another wounded near our camp. Clark, October 29, 1805. October 29, Tuesday, 1805 A cloudy morning wind still from th west not hard. We set out at daylight proceeded on about five miles and came to at a lodge of a chief which we made at the upper village at th falls about his house there is six others this chief gave us to eat sakakami's buries hazelnuts fish pounded. And a kind of bread made of roots, we gave to the women pieces of ribbon which they appeared pleased with, those houses are large 25 feet sqr and contain abt. Eight men, say 30 inhabitants. Those people are friendly gave us to eat fish berries, nuts bread of roots and drid berries and we call this the friendly village we purchased 12 dogs of them and 4 sacks of pounded fish. And some few dried berries and proceeded on at four miles further we landed to smoke a pipe with the people of a village of eleven houses we found those people also friendly their village is situated immediately below the mouth of a river of sixty yards water which falls in on the star. Side and heads in the mountains to the N and N, E, the Indians inform us that this river is long and full of falls no salmon pass up it. They also inform that ten nations lives on this river by hunting and on berries and the Count Ray begin to be thinly timbered with pine and low white oak very rocky and hilly, we purchased at this vilg four dogs, at the end of this course is three rocks, in the river and a rock point from the lard. The middle rock is large and has a number of graves on it we call it the Sepulchar Island. The last river we call Kate Rack River from the number of falls which the Indians inform is on it the Indians are afraid to hunt or be on th large side of this Columbia River for fear of the snake ind who reside on a fork of this river which falls and above the falls a good situation for winter quarters if game can be had is just below sepulchre rock on the large side, high in pine and oak timber the rocks rouged above, good hunting count ray back. As it appears from the river Indian village opst. Of two lodges river half a mile wide at rocks. The robes of those Indians are, of wolf deer elk, wild cats, some fox, and deer I saw one of the mountain sheep, th will thick and long coarse hair on the back. Resembling bristles, those animals live among the rocks in those mountains below. Ortair is much valued by those people they sew their hair on each side with it and wear it about the necks with the tail in front. Came to at three miles on this course at three houses of flatheads and encamped on the starred. Side, a pond lies back of those people in which we saw great numbers of the small swan. We purchased of those people three dogs they gave us high bush cranberries, bread of roots and roots, they were pleased with music of th violin. Clark, October 29, 1805. October 29, Tuesday, 1805 A cloudy morning wind from the west but not hard, we set out at daylight, and proceeded on about five miles came to on the start. Side at a village of seven houses built in the same form and materials of those above. Here we found the chief we had seen at the long narrows named underscore 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 underscore. We entered his lodge and he gave us to eat pounded fish, bread made of roots, filbert's nuts. And the berries of sack come. We gave to each woman of the lodge a brace of ribbon of which they were much pleased. Each of those houses may be calculated to contain eight men and thirty souls, they are hospitable and good humored speak the same language of the inhabitants of the last village, we call this the friendly village. I observed in the lodge of the chief sundry articles which must have been procured from the white people, such a scarlet and blue cloth sword jacket and hat. I also observed two wide split boards with images on them cut and painted in imitation of a man. I pointed to this image and asked a man to what use he put them to, he said something the only word I understood was, good, and then stepped to the image and took out his bow and quiver to show me, and some other of his war implements, from behind it. 
The chief then directed his wife to hand him his medicine and bag which he opened and showed us fourteen fingers which he said was the fingers of his enemies which he had taken in war, and pointed to S. E. From which direction I concluded they were snake Indians, this is the first instance I ever knew of the Indians taking any other trophia of their exploits off the dead bodies of their enemies except the scalp. The chief painted those fingers with several other articles which was in his bag read and securely put them back, having first mad a short harangue which I suppose was bragging of what he had done in war. We purchased twelve dogs and four sacks of fish, and some few acid berries, after breakfast we proceeded on, the mountains are high on each side, containing scattering pine white oak and undergrowth, hillside steep and rocky. At four miles lower we observed a small river falling in with great rapidity on the stard. Side below which is a village of eleven houses, here we landed to smoke a pipe with the natives and examine the mouth of the river, which I found to be sixty yards wide rapid and deep, the inhabitants of the village are friendly and cheerful. Those people inform us also those at the last village that this little river is long and full of falls, no salmon pass up it, it runs from N. N. E. That ten nations live on this river and its waters, on berries. And what game they can kill with their bow and arrows. We purchased four dogs and set out, this village is the of the same nation of the one we last passed, and proceeded on the Count Ray on each side begin to be thicker timbered with pine and low white oak. Very rocky and broken. Past three large rocks in the river the middle rock is large long and has several square vaults on it. We call this rocky island the Sepulchre, the last river we passed we shall call the Cataract River from the number of falls which the Indians say is on it, past two lodges of Indians a short distance below the Sepulchre Island on the Stard. Side river wide, at four mile past two houses on the Stard. Side, six miles lower past four houses above the mouth of a small river forty yards wide on the Lard. Side a thick timbered bottom above and back of those houses. Those are the first houses which we have seen on the south side of the Columbia River, and the access to those difficult, for fear of the approach of their common enemies the Snake Indians, past fourteen houses on the STD. Side scattered on the bank, from the mouth of this little river which we shall call Labiash River, the Falls Mountain is south and the top is covered with snow. One mile below past the mouth of a large rapid stream on the Stard. Side, opposite to a large sand bar, in this creek the Indians above take their fish, here we saw several canoes, which induced us to call this canoe creek it is twenty-eight yards wide. About four miles lower and below the sand bar is a beautiful cascade falling over a rock of about one hundred feet, a short distance lower past four Indian houses on the lard. Side in a timbered bottom, a few miles further we came to at three houses on Stard. Side, back of which is a pond in which I saw great numbers of small swan, Captain. Lewis and I went into the houses of those people who appeared somewhat surprised at first their houses are built on the same construction of those above, speak the same language and dress in the same way, robes of the skins of wolves deer, elk. Wild cat, or lucervia and fox, also saw a mountain sheep skin the wool of which is long, thick, and coarse with long coarse hair on the top of the neck and back something resembling bristles of a goat, the skin was of white hair. Those animals these people inform me by signs live in the mountains among the rocks, their horns are small and straight, or tear skins are highly prized among those people as well as those on the river above. They cue their hair which is divided on each shoulder, and also wear small strips about their necks with the tail hanging down in front. Those people gave us, high bush cram berries, bread made of roots, and roots, we purchased three dogs for the party to eat, we smoked with the men, all mush pleased with the violin dash. Here the mountains are high on each side, those to the lard. Side has some snow on them at this time, more timber than above and of greater variety. Clark, October 30th. 1805. October 30th Wednesday, 1805 A cloudy morning. Some little rain all night, after eating a slight breakfast of venison we set out. The rocks project into the river in many places and have the appearance of having fallen from the high hills those projected rocks is common and small bays below and niches in the rocks passed for cascades or small streams falling from the mountains. On Lard. 
This part of the river resembles a pond partly drained leaving many stumps bare both in and out of the water, current about 1 mil pr. Hour. The bottom above the river is about three quarters of a mile wide and rich, some deer and bear sign, rained moderately all day we are wet and cold. Saw several species of wood which I never saw before, some resembling beech and others poplar. Day dark and disagreeable. I with two men proceeded down the river two miles on an old Indian path to view the rapids, which I found impassable for our canoes without a portage. The road bad at one mile I saw a town of houses laterly abandoned on an elevated situation opst. A 2D shoot, returned at dark. Captain Lewis and five men went to the town found them kind they gave berries and nuts, but he cd. Get nothing from them in the way of information, the greater part of those people out collecting roots below. Rained all the evening those people have one gun and many articles which they have purchased of the white people their food is principally fish. Clark, October 30, 1805. October 30, Wednesday, 1805 A cool morning. A moderate rain all the last night. After eating a partial breakfast of venison we set out past several places where the rocks projected into the river and have the appearance of having separate from the mountains and fallen promiscuously into the river. Small niches are formed in the banks below those projecting rocks which is common in this part of the river, saw four cascades caused by small streams falling from the mountains on the lard. Side, a remarkable circumstance in this part of the river is, the stumps of pine trees are in many places are at some distance in the river. And gives every appearance of the rivers being darned up below from some cause which I am not at this time acquainted with, the current of the river is also very gentle not exceeding eleven halves mile pr. Hour and about three quarters of a mile in width. Some rain, we landed above the mouth of a small river on the start. Side and dine J. Shields killed a buck and labiek three ducks, here the river widens to about one mile large sand bar in the middle, a great rock both in and out of the water, large stones, or rocks are also promiscuously scattered about in the river. This day we saw some few of the large buzzard captain. Lewis shot at one, those buzzards are much larger than any other of their spes or the largest eagle white under part of their wings and the bottoms above the mouth of this little river is rich covered with grass and fern and is about three quarters of a mile wide rich and rises gradually, below the river, which is sixty yards wide above its mouth, the country rises with steep ascent. We call this little river New Timbered River from a species of ash which grows on its banks of a very large and different from any we had before seen. And a timber resembling the beech in bark but different in its leaf which is smaller and the tree smaller. Past many large rocks in the river and a large creek on the start. Side in the mouth of which is an island, passed on the right of three islands near the start. Side, and landed on an island close under the start. Side at the head of the great chute, and a little below a village of eight large houses on a deep bend on the start. Side, and opposite two small islands immediately in the head of the chute, which islands are covered with pine, many large rocks also, in the head of the chute. Ponds back of the houses, and count ray low for a short distance. The day proved cloudy dark and disagreeable with some rain all day which kept us wet. The country a high mountain on each side thickly covered with timber, such as spruck, pine, cedar, oak cotton and k. And k. I took two men and walked down three miles to examine the chute and river below proceeded along an old Indian path, past. An old village at one mile on an elevated situation of this village contained very large houses built in a different form from any I had seen, and laterly abandoned, and the most of the boats put into a pond of water near the village. As I conceived to drown the fleas, which was immensely numerous about the houses dash. I found by examination that we must make a portage of the greater proportion of our stores twenty-one halves miles, and the canoes we could haul over the rocks, I returned at dark Captain Lewis and five men had just returned from the village, Cap L. Informed me that he found the natives kind, they gave him berries, nuts and fish to eat, but he could get nothing from them in the way of information. 
the greater part of the inhabitants of this village being absent down the river some distance collecting roots Captain L. saw one gun and several articles which must have been procured from the white people. A wet disagreeable evening, the only wood we could get to burn on this little island on which we have encamped is the newly discovered ash, which makes a tolerable fire. We made fifteen miles today. Clark, October 31, 1805 October 31, Thursday, 1805 A cloudy rainy morning I proceed down the river to view it more at leisure, I took Joss Fields and Peter Crusat and proceeded on down, sent Crusat back at two milliseconds. To examine the rapid near the shore and I proceeded on down about ten miles to a very high rock in a bottom on the start. Opst. Two islands covered with timber on which I saw inns. At a distance. Found the river rocky for six miles, after which the current became uniform, at one mile I passed an old deserted village on a pond on a high situation of eight houses, at thirty-one halves miles one house the only rent. Of an antient village one half a mile lower I saw eight vaults for the dead which was nearly square eight feet closely covered with broad bodes curiously engraved, the bones in some of those vaults wer four feet thick. In others the dead was yet laid side of each other nearly east and west, raped up and bound securely in robes, great numbers of trinkets brass kittle, sea shells, iron, pan hair and and was hung about the vaults and great many wooden gods, or images of men cut in wood, set up round the vaults, some of those so old and worn by time that they were nearly worn out of shape. And some of those vaults so old that they were wrote entirely to the ground, notwithstanding they would is of pine and underscore 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 or satyr as also the wooden gods. I cannot learn certainly if those people worship those wooden emics. They have them in conspicuous parts of their houses at five miles I passed four large houses on the starred side a little above the last rapid and opposite a large island which is situated near the lard. Side, the inhabitants of those houses had left them closely shut up, they appeared to con. A great deal of property and provisions such as those people use, I did not disturb anything about those houses, but proceed on down below the rapid which I found to be the last, a large village has at some period been on the start. Side below this rapid the bottom is high stony and about two miles wide covered with grass, here sea is the head of a large island in high water, at this time no water passes on the start. Side I walked through this island which I found to be very rich, open and covered with strawberry vines, and has greatly the appearance of having at some period been cultivated, the natives has dug roots in some parts of this isle which is about three miles long and one wide, a small island covered with timber opposite the lower point no water runs on the start. Side. Of it. Below and in the middle of the river is a large island covered with tall trees opposite the strawberry island on its start. Side a creek falls in which has no running water at present, it has the appearing of throwing out immense torrents, I saw five Indians in a canoe below, Joe. Killed a sandhill crane and we returned by the same route to camp at the Grand Chute where I found several Indians, I smoked. Two canoes loaded with fish for the trade below came down and unloaded the afternoon fare. Those Indians cut off the hands of those they kill and proserve the fingers. Clark, October 31, 1805 October 31, Thursday 1805 A cloudy rainy disagreeable morning I proceeded down the river to view with more attention we had to pass on the river below, the two men with me Joe. Fields and Peter Crusat proceeded down to examine the rapids the great chute which commenced at the island on which we encamped Continad with great rapidity and force through a narrow chanel much compressed. And interspersed with large rocks for one half a mile, at a mile lower is a very considerable rapid at which place the waves are remarkably high, and proceeded on in a old Indian path twenty-one halves miles by land through a thick wood and hillside. To the river where the Indians make a portage, from this place I dispatched Peter Crusat, our principal waterman, back to follow the river and examine the practicability of the canoes passing. As the rapids appeared to continue down below as far as I could see, I with Joe. Fields proceeded on, at one half a mile below the end of the portage passed a house where there had been an old town for ages past as this house was old decayed and a plat of fleas I did not enter it. 
About one half a mile below this house in a very thick part of the woods is eight vaults which appeared closely covered and highly decorated with ornaments. Those vaults are all nearly the same cis and form eight feet square, five feet high, sloped a little so as to convey off the rain made of pine or cedar boards closely connected and skewerly covered with wide boards. With a door left in the east side which is partially stoked with wide boards curiously engraved. In several of those vaults the dead bodies re-raped up very securely in skins tied around with cords of grass and bark, laid on a mat, all east and west and some of those vaults had as many as four bodies laying on the side of each other. The other vaults containing bones only, some contained bones for the dead of four feet. On the tops and on poles attached to those vaults hung brass kitties and frying pans pierced through their bottoms, baskets, bowls of wood, sea shells, skins, bits of cloth, hair. Bags of trinkets and small paces of bone and can independent of the curious engraving and paintings on the boards which formed the vaults I observed several wooden images, cut in the figure of men and set up on the sides of the vaults all round. Some of those so old and worn by time, that they were nearly out of shape, I also observed the remains of vaults rotted entirely into the ground and covered with moss. This must be the burying place for many ages for the inhabitants of those rapids. The vaults are of the most lasting timber pine and cedar, I cannot say certainly that those natives worship those wooden idols as I have every reason to believe they do not. As they are set up in the most conspicuous parts of their houses, and treated more like ornaments than objects of adoration. At two miles lower and five below our camp I passed a village of four large houses abandoned by the natives, with their boars bared up. I looked into those houses and observed as much property as is usual in the houses of those people which induced me to conclude that they re at no great distance, either hunting or collecting roots, to add to their winter subsistence. From a short distance below the vaults the mountain which is but low on the starred side leave the river, and a level stony open bottom succeeds on the said STD. Side for a great distance down. The mountains high and rugged on the large side this open bottom is about two miles a short distance below this village is a bad stony rapid and appears to be the last in view I observed at this lower rapid the remains of a large and anti-ant village which I could plainly trace by the sinks in which they had formed their houses. As also those in which they had buried their fish, from this rapid to the lower end of the portage the river is crowded with rocks of various sizes between which the water passes with great velocity creating in many places large waves. An island which is situated near the lard. Side occupies about half the distance the lower point of which is at this rapid. Immediately below this rapid the high water passes through a narrow chanel through the stard. Bottom forming an island of three miles long and one wide, I walked through this island which I found to be very rich land, and had every appearance of having been at some distant period cultivated. At this time it is covered with grass interspersed with strawberry vines. I observed several places on this island where the natives had dug for roots and from its lower point I observed five Indians in a canoe below the upper point of an island near the middle of the river covered with tall timber. Which endued me to believe that a village was at no great distance below, I could not see any rapids below in the extent of my view which was for a long distance down the river. Which from the last rapids widened and had every appearance of being affected by the tide, I determined to return to camp ten miles distant. A remarkable high detached rock stands in a bottom on the starred side near the lower point of this island on the starred side about 800 feet high and 400 paces around, we call the beaten rock. A brook falls into the narrow chanel which forms the strawberry island, which at this time has no running water, but has every appearance of discharging immense torrents and k. And k. Joe. Field shot a sandhill crane. I returned by the same route on an Indian path passing up on the N.W. side of the river to our camp at the Great Chute. Found several Indians from the village, I smoked with them. Soon after my return two canoes loaded with fish and bare grass for the trade below, came down from the village at the mouth of the Cataract River, they unloaded and turned their canoes upside down on the beach. And camped under a shelving rock below our camp. One of the men shot a goose above this great chute, which was floating into the chute when an Indian observed it, 
plunged into the water and swam to the goose and brought in on shore. At the head of the suck, as this Indian richly earned the goose I suffered him to keep it which he about half picked and spiked it up with the guts in it to rost. This great chute or falls is about one half a mile with the water of this great river compressed within the space of 150 paces in which there is great numbers of both large and small rocks. Water passing with great velocity forming and boiling in a most horrible manner, with a fall of about 20 feet, below it widens to about 200 paces and current gentle for a short distance. A short distance above is three small rocky islands, and at the head of those falls, three small rocky islands are situated crosswise the river, several rocks above in the river and four large rocks in the head of the chute. Those obstructions together with the high stones which are continually breaking loose from the mountain on the starred side and rolling down into the chute ade to those which break loose from those islands above and lodge in the chute. Must be the cause of the rivers darning up to such a distance above, where it shows such evident marks of the common current of the river being much lower than at the present day. Clark, November 1. 1805. November 1 Friday. 1805 A very cold morning wind for men. E and hard set all hands packing the loading over th portage which is below the grand chutes and is 940 yards of bad way over rocks and on slippery hillsides the Indians who came down in two canoes last night packed their fish over a portage of 21 halves. Miles to avoid a 2D chute. Four of them took their canoes over the first portage and run the 2D chute, great numbers of sea otters, they are so cautious that I with difficulty got a shoot at one today. Which I must have killed but could not get him as he sunk. We got all our canoes and baggage below the great chute three of the canoes being leaky from injures wrecked in hauling them over the rocks. Obliged us to delay to have them repaired a bad rapid just below us three Indian canoes loaded with pounded fish for the end. Trade down the river arrived at the upper end of the portage this evening. I can't learn whether those Indians trade with white people or inns. Below for the beads and copper, which they are so fond of, they are nearly necked, preferring beads to anything, those beads they traffic with Indians still higher up this river for skins robes and k. And k. The Indians on those waters do not appear to be sickly, sore eyes are common and many have lost their eyes, some one and, many both, they have bad teeth, and the greater proportion of them have worn their teeth down, many into the gums. They are rather small high cheeks, women small and homely, many of them had sweeled legs, large about the knees owing to the position in which they sat on their hams. They are nearly necked only a piece of leather tied about their breech and a small robe which generally comes to a little below their waists and scarcely sufficiently large to cover around them when confined, they are all fond of clothes but more so of beads particularly blue and white beads. They are deady in the extreme both in their cookery and in their houses. Those at the last village raise the beads about five feet from the earth under which they store their provisions, their houses is about thirty-three feet to fifty feet square, the bore of which is about thirty ink. High and sixteen inches wide in this form cut in a wide pine board they have many images cut in wood, generally, in the figure of a man, those people are high with what they have to sell. And say the white people below give them great prices for what they sell to them. Their nose are all pierced. And the wear a white shell many of which are two inch long pushed through the nose, all the women have flat heads pressed to almost a point at top the pressed the female children's heads between two boards when young until they form the skull as they wish it which is generally very flat. This amongst those people is considered as a great mark of beauty and is practiced in all the tribes we have passed on this river more or less. Men take more of the druggery off the women than is common with Indians. Clark, November 1, 1805. November 1 Friday, 1805 A very cool morning wind hard from the N.E. The Indians who arrived last evening took their canoes on their shoulders and carried them below the great chute. We set about taking our small canoe and all the baggage by land 940 yards of bad slippery and rocky way the Indians we discovered took their loading the whole length of the portage 21 halves miles, to avoid a second chute which appears very bad to pass. And through which they passed with their empty canoes. Great numbers of sea otters, they are so cautious that I with difficulty got a shot at one today, which I must have killed, 
but could not get him as he sunk. We got all our baggage over the portage of 940 yards. After which we got the four large canoes over by slipping them over the rocks on poles placed across from one rock to another, and at some places along partial streams of the river. In passing those canoes over the rocks and three of them received injuries which obliged us to delay to have them repart. Several Indian canoes arrived at the head of the portage, some of the men accompanied by those from the village came down to smoke with us. They appear to speak the same language with a little different accent. I visited the Indian village found that the construction of the houses similar to those above described. With this difference only that they are larger say from 35 to 50 feet by 30 feet, raised about 5 feet above the earth. And nearly as much below the doors in the same form and size cut in the wide post which supports one end of the ridge pole and which is carved and painted with different figures and hieroglyphics those people gave me to eat nuts berries and a little dried fish. And sold me a hat of their own taste without a brim, and baskets in which they hold their water, their beads are raised about forty-one slash two feet, under which they store away their dried fish. Between the part on which they lie and the back wall they store away their roots berries nuts and valuable articles on mats, which are spread also around the fireplace which is sunk about one foot lower than the bottom floor of the house. This fireplace is about eight feet long and six feet wide secured with a frame those houses are calculated for four, five and six families, each family having a nice painted ladder to ascend up to their beads. I saw in those houses several wooden images all cut in imitation of men, but differently fascinated and placed in the most conspicuous parts of the houses, probably as an ornament I cannot learn certainly as to the traffic those inns. Carry on below, if white people or the Indians who trade with the whites who are either settled or visit the mouth of this river. I believe mostly with the latter as their knowledge of the white people appears to be very imperfect, and the articles which they appear to trade mostly i.e. pounded fish, bear grass, and roots. Cannot be an object of commerce with few and merchants, however they get in return for those articles blue and white beads copper tea kitties, brass armbands, some scarlet and blue robes and a few articles of old clothes. They prefer beads to anything and will part with the last mouthful or articles of clothing they have for a few of those beads, those beads the traffic with Indians still higher up this river for robes, skins, chapelle bread, bear grass and who in their turn traffic with those under the rocky mountains for bear grass, pashiko roots and robes and. The natives of the waters of the Columbia appear healthy, some have turners on different parts of their bodies, and sore and weak eyes are common, many have lost their sight entirely great numbers with one eye out and frequently the other very weak. This misfortune I must again ascribe to the water and. They have bad teeth, which is not common with Indians, many have worn their teeth down and some quite into their gums, this I cannot satisfactorily account for it, do ascribe it in some measure to their method of eating, their food. Roots particularly, which they make use of as they are taken out of the earth frequently nearly covered with sand, I have not seen any of their long roots offered for sale clear of sand. They are rather below the common size high cheeks woman small and homely, and have swelled legs and thighs. And their knees remarkably large which I ascribe to the method in which they sit on their hams go nearly necked wearing only a piece of leather tied about their breast which falls down nearly as low as the waist, a small robe about three feet square. And a piece of leather tied about their breech, they have all flat heads in this quarter they are turdy in the extreme, both in their person and cooking, where their hair loose hanging in every direction. They ASC high prices for what they sell and say that the white people below give great prices for everything and the noses are all pierced and when they are dressed they have a long tapered piece of white shell or wampum put through the nose, those shells are about two inches in length. I observed in many of the villages which I have passed, the heads of the female children in the press for the purpose of compressing their heads in their infancy into a certain form, between two boards. Clark, November 2nd. 1805. Navre. 2D Saturday 1805 Meridian Altitude 59 degrees 45 minutes 45 seconds made a portage of about 11 halves miles with half of the baggage, and run the rapid with the canoes without much damage, one struck a rock and split a little. 
and three others took in some water seven squars came over the portage loaded with dried fish and bear grass, soon after four men came down in a canoe after taking breakfast. And after taking a meridian altitude we set out past two bad rapids one at two and the other at four mile below the ISD on Lard. And upper end of Strawberry Island on the Stard. Side from the creek end of last course. We Labiak killed fourteen geese in a brant, Collins one joss. Fields and our three those G's are much smaller than common, and have white under their rumps and around the tail, the tide rises here a few nine inches, I cannot assert I'm the prosize height it rises at the last rapid or at this place off camp. The Indians we left at the portage passed us this evening one other canoe come up. Clark, November 2nd, 1805. November 2nd Saturday, 1805 examined the rapid below us more particularly the danger appearing too great to hazard our canoes loaded. Dispatched all the men who could not swim with loads to the end of the portage below, I also walked to the end of the portage with the carriers where I delayed until every articles was brought over and canoes arrived safe. Here we breakfast and took a merit. Altitude 59 degrees 45 minutes 45 seconds about the time we were setting out seven squars came over loaded with dried fish and bare grass neatly bundled up, soon after four Indian men came down over the rapid in a large canoe. Passed a rapid at two miles and one at four miles opposite the lower point of a high island on the large side, and a little below four houses on the start. Bank, a small creek on the large side opposite Strawberry Island, which heads below the last rapid. Opposite the lower point of this island passed three islands covered with tall timber opposite the beaten rock those islands are nearest the starboard side, immediately below on the start. Side passed a village of nine houses, which is situated between two small creeks, and are of the same construction of those above. Here the river widens to near a mile, and the bottoms are more extensive and thickly timbered, as also the high mountains on each side, with pine, spruce pine, cottonwood, a species of ash, and alder. At seventeen miles past a rock near the middle of the river, about one hundred feet high and eighty feet diameter, proceed on down a smooth gentle stream of about two miles wide in which the tide has its effect as high as the beaten rock or the last rapids at Strawberry Island, saw great numbers of waterfowl of different kinds, such as swan, geese, white and grey brants, ducks of various kinds, gulls, and plever. Lab each killed fourteen brant Joseph Fields three and Collins one. We encamped under a high projecting rock on the lard. Side, here the mountains leave the river on each side, which from the great chute to this place is high and rigid. Thickly covered with timber principal A of the pine species. The bottoms below appear extensive and thickly covered with wood. River here about twenty-one halves miles wide. Seven Indians in a canoe on their way down to trade with the natives below, in camp with us, those we left at the portage passed us this evening and proceeded on down the ebb tide rose here about nine inches. The flood tide must rise here much higher, we made twenty-nine miles today from the Great Chute. Clark, November 3. 1805. November 3 Sunday, 1805 The fog so thick this morning we did not think it prudent to set out until ten o'clock we set out and proceeded on very well. Accompanied by our Indian friends, this morning Labick killed three geese flying Collins killed a duck, the water rose inches last night the effects of tide. The Count Ray has a handsome appearance in advance no mountains extensive bottoms, the water shallow for a great distance from shore dash. The fog continued thick until twelve o'clock, we coasted, and halted at the mouth of a large river on the large side, this river throws out immense quantity of sand and is very shallow, th narrowest part two hundred yards wide bold current. Much resembling the river Platte, several islands about one mile up and has a sand bar of three miles in extent immediately in its mouth, discharging it waters by two mouths. And crowding its coarse sand so as to throw the Columbian waters on its northern banks, and conch it to half a millisecond. In width past a small prairie on the start. Side above, a large creek opposite QK Sand River on the start. Side, extensive bottoms and low hilly count ray on each side, good wintering place, a high-peaked mountain supposed to be empty. 
Hood is on the large side S85E, 40 miles distant from the mouth of Quick Sand River. Clark, November 3, 1805. November 3rd Sunday, 1805 The fog so thick this morning that we could not see a man fifty steps off, this fog detained us until ten o'clock at which time we set out. Accompanied by our Indian friends who are from a village near the Great Falls, previous to our setting out Collins killed a large buck, and Labiek killed three geese flying. I walked on the sand beach lard. Side, opposite the canoes as they passed along. The undergrowth rushes, vines and in the bottoms too thick to pass through, at three miles I arrived at the entrance of a river which appeared to scatter over a sandbar, the bottom of which I could see quite across and did not appear to be four inches deep in any part. I attempted to wade this stream and to my astonishment found the bottom a quick sand, and impassable, I called to the canoes to put to shore, I got into the canoe and landed below the mouth. And Captain Lewis and myself walked up this river about eleven halves miles to examine this river which we found to be a very considerable stream discharging its waters through two chanels which forms an island of about three miles in length on the river and eleven halves miles wide. Composed of coarse sand which is thrown out of this quick sand river compressing the waters of the Columbia and throwing the whole current of its waters against its northern banks, within a chanel of one half a mile wide. Several small islands one mile up this river, this stream has much the appearance of the river plate. Rolling its quick sands into the bottoms with great velocity after which it is divided into two chanels by a large sandbar before mentioned. The narrowest part of this river is 120 yards on the opposite side of the Columbia a falls and above this creek on the same side is a small prairie. Extensive low country on each side thickly timbered. The Quick Sand River appears to pass through the low Count Ray at the foot of those high range of mountains in a southerly direction, the large creeks which fall into the Columbia on the Stard. Side rise in the same range of mountains to the N, N, E and pass through some ridgy land, a mountain which we suppose to be M to Hood is S, 85 E about 47 miles distant from the mouth of Quick Sand River this MTN is covered with snow and in the range of mountains which we have passed through and is of a conical form but rigid, after taking dinner at the mouth of this river we proceeded on past the head of a island near the large side back of which on the same side and near the head a large creek falls in. And nearly opposite and three miles below the upper mouth of Quick Sand River is the lower mouth, this island is thirty-one halves miles long, has rocks at the upper point, some timber on the borders of this island in the middle open and pawnee. Some rigid rocks in the middle of the stream opposite this island. Proceeded into center of a large island in the middle of the river which we call Diamond Isle. From its appearance, here we met fifteen INDN men in two canoes from below, they informed us they saw three vestless below and and We landed on the north side of this Diamond Island and encamped, Captain. L walked out with his gun on the island, sent out hunters and fowlers, Below Quick Sand River the Count Ray is low rich and thickly timbered on each side of the river. The islands open and some ponds river wide and immense numbers of fowls flying in every direction such as swan, geese, brants, cranes, stalks, white gulls, cumrants and plevers and also great numbers of sea otter in the river. A canoe arrived from the village below the last rapid with a man his wife and three children, and a woman whom had been taken prisoner from the Snake Inns. On Clark's River I sent the interpreter's wife who is a so so any or snake Indian of the Missouri, to speak to this squar, they could not understand each other sufficiently to converse. This family and the inns. We met from below continued with us Captain Lewis borrowed a small canoe of those Indians and four men took her across to a small lake in the isle. Capel and three men set out after night in this canoe in search of the swans, brants ducks and and which appeared in great numbers in the lake, he killed a swan and several ducks which made our number of fowls this evening three swan, eight brant and five ducks, on which we made a sumptuous supper. We gave the Indian who lent the canoe a brant, and some meat to the others. One of those Indians, the man from the village near the lower rapids has a gun with a brass barrel and cock of which he prizes highly, note the mountain we saw from near the forks proves to be Mount Hood. Clark, November 4, 
1805. Navre. Fourth Monday, 1805 A cloudy cool morning, wind west. We set out at one half past eight o'clock having dispatched four men in the small canoe to hunt. Those people men and women heads are flat. We landed at a village two hundred men of flatheads of twenty-five houses fifty canoes built of straw, we were treated very kindly by them. They gave us round root near the size of a hen's egg roasted which they call wapta to eat. I walked out on the starred. Side found the country fine, an open prairie for one mile back of which the woodland commence rising back, the timber on the edge of the prairie is white oak. Back is spruce pine and other species of pine mixed some under growth of a wild crab and a species of wood I'm not acquainted, a species of maple and cottonwood grow near this river, some low bushes. Indians continue to be with us. Several canoes continue with us, the Indians at the last village have more cloth and European trinkets than above I saw some guns, a sword, many powder flasks, sailors jackets, overalls, hats and shirts, copper and brass trinkets with few beads only. During the time I was at dinner the Indians stole my tomahawk which I made use of to smoke I searched but could not find it, a pond on the starred side, off from the river. Raspberries and underscore 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 are also in the bottoms, met a large and small canoe with twelve men from below the men were dressed with a variety of articles of European manufactory the large canoe had images on the bow and stern handsomely carved in wood and painted. With the figure of a bear in front and man in a stern. Saw white geese with black wings, saw a small crab apple with all the taste and flavor of the common. Those Indians were all armed with pistols or bows and arrows ready sprung war axes and Mount Helen bears N. 25 degrees east about 80 miles, this is the mountain we saw near the fox of this river. It is immensely high and covered with snow, rising in a kind of cone perhaps the highest pine cow from the common level in America past a village of 4 hs. On the starred side at 2 mills, one at 3 mls. One deer two ducks and Brandt killed. Clark, November 4, 1805. November 4 Monday, 1805 A cloudy cool morning wine from the west we set out at one half past eight o'clock, one man Shannon set out early to walk on the island to kill something. He joined us at the lower point with a buck. This island is six miles long and near three miles wide thinly timbered, Tide rose last night 18 inches perpendicular at camp, near the lower point of this diamond island is the head of a large island separate from a small one by a narrow chanel. And both situated nearest the large side, those islands as also the bottoms are thickly covered with pine and river wide, country low on both sides, on the main large shore a short distance below the last island we landed at a village of 25 houses. Twenty-four of those houses were thatched with straw, and covered with bark, the other house is built of boards in the form of those above. Except that it is above ground and about fifty feet in length and covered with broad split boards this village contains about two hundred men of the Skillut nation I counted fifty-two canoes on the bank in front of this village many of them very large and raised in bow. We recognize the man who overtook us last night. He invited us to a lodge in which he had some part and gave us a roundish roots about the size of a small Irish potato which they roasted in the embers until they became soft. This root they call wapatu which the bulb of the Chinese cultivate in great quantities called the sagit ti folia or common arrowhead dash. It has an agreeable taste and answers very well in place of bread. We purchased about four bushels of this root and divided it to our party, at seven miles below this village past the upper point of a large island nearest the large side, a small prairie in which there is a pond opposite on the starred. Here I landed and walked on shore, about three miles a fine open prairie for about one mile, back of which the Count Ray rises gradually and would land cumminsies such as white oak, pine of different kinds. Wild crabs with the taste and flavor of the common crab and several species of undergrowth of which I am not acquainted, a few cottonwood trees and the ash of this Count Ray grow scattered on the river bank, saw some elk and deer sign and joined Captain. Lewis at a place he had landed with the party for diner. 
Soon after several canoes of Indians from the village above came down dressed for the purpose as I supposed of paying us a friendly visit, they had scarlet and blue blanket sailors' jackets, overalls, shirts and hats independent of their usual dress. The most of them had either wore axes spears or bows sprung with quivers of arrows, muskets or pistols, and tin flasks to hold their powder. Those fellows we found assuming disagreeable, however we smoked with them and treated them with every attention and friendship. During the time we were at dinner those fellows stole my pipe tomahawk which they were smoking with, I immediately searched every man in the canoes, but could find nothing of my tomahawk. While searching for the tomahawk one of those scoundrels stole a capo of one of our interpreters, which was found stuffed under the root of a trayer, near the place they sat, we became much displeased with those fellows. Which they discovered and moved off on their return home to their village, except two canoes which had passed on down, we proceeded on met a large and a small canoe from below. With twelve men the large canoe was ornament with images carved in wood the figures of a bear in front and a man in stern, painted and fixed very nettily on the of the canoe. Rising to near the height of a man two Indians very finely dressed and with hats on was in this canoe past the lower point of the island which is nine miles in length having passed two islands on the starred side of this large island. Three small islands at its lower point. The Indians make signs that a village is situated back of those islands on the lard. Side and I believe that a Chanel is still on the LRD, side as a canoe passed in between the small islands, and made signs that way, probably to traffic with some of the natives living on another Chanel, at three miles lower. And twelve leagues below Quick Sand River passed a village of four large houses on the Lard. Side, near which we had a full view of M. Tehelian which is perhaps the highest pinnacle in America from their base it bears n. 25 degrees east about 90 miles, this is the mountain I saw from the Mussel Shell Rapid on the 19th of October last covered with snow, it rises something in the form of a sugar loaf, about a mile lower past a single house on the Lard. Side, and one on the Stard. Side, past a village on each side and camped near a house on the Stard. Side we proceeded on until one hour after dark with a view to get clear of the natives who was constantly about us, and troublesome, finding that we could not get shut of those people for one night, we landed and encamped on the Stard. Side soon after two canoes came to us loaded with Indians, we purchased a few roots of them. This evening we saw vines much resembling the raspberry which is very thick in the bottoms. A range of high hills at about five miles on the large side which runs S, E and N, W, covered with tall timber the bottoms below in this range of hills and the river is rich and level, saw white geese with a part of their wings black. The river here is eleven halves miles wide, and current gentle. Opposite to our camp on a small sandy island the brant and geese make such a noise that it will be impossible for me to sleep. We made twenty-nine miles today killed a deer and several brant and ducks. I saw a braro tamed at the first village today the Indians which we have passed today of the Silute nation in their language from those near and about the long narrows of the Chelukatiikwar or Ichilut, their dress differ but little. Except they have more of the articles procured from the white traders, they all have flattened heads both men and women, live principally on fish and wap pato roots, they also kill some few elk and deer. During the short time I remained in their village they brought in three deer which they had killed with their bow and arrows. They are thievishly inclined as we have experienced. Clark, November 5, 1805 Navar 5th Tuesday 1805 A cloudy morning psalm rain the after part of last night and this morning. I could not sleep for the noise kept by the swans, geese, white and black brant, ducks and k. On a opposite base, and sandhill crane, they were immensely numerous and their noise horrid. We set out at sunrise and our hunters killed ten brant four of which were white with black wings two ducks, and a swan which were divided, we came to and encamped on the lard. Side under a high ridgy land, the high land come to the river on each side. The river about eleven halves mile wide. Those high lands rise gradually from the river and bottoms, we are all wet cold and disagreeable, rain continues and increases. I killed a pheasant which is very fat, my feet and legs cold. 
I saw seventeen snakes today on an island, but little appearance of frost at this place. Clark, November 5, 1805. November 5, Tuesday, 1805 rained all the after part of last night, rain continues this morning, I slept but very little last night for the noise kept during the whole of the night by the swans, geese. White and grey brant ducks and On a small sand island close under the lard. Side, they were immensely numerous, and their noise horrid, we set out early here the river is not more than three quarters of a mile in width, past a small prairie on the start. Side past two houses about one half a mile from each other on the lard. Side a canoe came from the upper house, with three men in it merely to view us, past an isle. Covered with tall trees and green briars separate from the start. Shore by a narrow chanel at nine miles I observed on the chanel which passes on the starred side of this island a short distance above its lower point is situated a large village, the front of which occupies nearly one quarter of a mile fronting the chanel. And closely connected, I counted fourteen houses in front here the river widens to about eleven halves miles. Seven canoes of Indians came out from this large village to view and trade with us, they appeared orderly and well disposed, they accompanied us a few miles and returned back. About one eleven slash two miles below this village on the large side behind a rocky sharp point, we passed a chanel one quarter of a mile wide. Which I take to be the one the Indian canoe entered yesterday from the lower point of Image Canoe Island as some low cliffs of rocks below this chanel, a large island close under the starred side opposite, and two small islands, below. Here we met two canoes from below, Below those islands a range of high hills form the start. Bank of the river, the shore bold and rocky, covered with a thick growth of pine and extensive low island, separate from the large side by a narrow chanel. On this island we stoked to dine I walked out found it open and covered with grass interspersed with small ponds, in which was great number. Of fowl, the remains of an old village on the lower part of this island, I saw several deer our hunters killed on this island a swan, for white six grey brant and two ducks all of them were divided. Below the lower point of this island a range of high hills, which runs s. e. forms the lard. Bank of the river the shores bold and rocky and hills covered with pine, the high hills leave the river on the start. Side a high bottom between the hill and river. We met four canoes of Indians from below, in which there is twenty-six Indians, one of those canoes is large, an ornament with images on the bow and stern. That in the bow the likeness of a bear, and in stern the picture of a man, we landed on the lard. Side and camped a little below the mouth of a creek on the start. Side a little below the mouth of which is an old village which is now abandoned dash, here the river is about one and a half miles wide, and deep, the high hills which run in a n w and s e. Direction form both banks of the river the shore bold and rocky, the hills rise gradually and are covered with a thick growth of pine and. The valley which is from above the mouth of Quick Sand River to this place may be computed at sixty miles wide on a direct line, and extends a great distinct to the right and left rich thickly covered with tall timber. With a few small prairies bordering on the river and on the islands. Some few standing ponds and several small streams of running water on either side of the river, this is certainly a fertile and a handsome valley, at this time crowded with Indians. The day proved cloudy with rain the greater part of it. We are all wet cold and disagreeable, I saw but little appearance of frost in this valley which we call Wapalu Columbia from that root or plants growing spontaneously in this valley only in my walk of today I saw seventeen striped snakes I killed a grouse which was very fat and larger than common. This is the first night which we have been entirely clear of Indians since our arrival on the waters of the Columbia River. We made 32 miles today by estimation. Clark, November 6, 1805. November 6, Wednesday a cold wet morning. Rain continued, until underscore 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 o'clock we set out early and proceeded on the course of last night and. Clark, November 6, 1805. November 6, Wednesday, 
1805 a cool wet rainy morning we set out early at four miles past two lodges of Indians in a small bottom on the large side I believe those Indians to be travelers. Opposite is the head of a long narrow island close under the starboard side, back of this island two creeks fall in about six miles apart, and appear to head in the high hilly count ray to the N.E. Opposite this long island is two others one small and about the middle of the river. The other larger and nearly opposite its lower point, and opposite a high cliff of black rocks on the lard. Side at fourteen miles, here the Indians of the two lodges we passed today came in their canoes with sundry articles to sell, we purchased of them wapatu roots, salmon trout, and I purchased two beaver skins for which I gave five small fish hooks. Here the hills leave the river on the lard. Side, a beautiful open and extensive bottom in which there is an old village, one also on the starred. Side a little above both of which are abandoned by all their inhabitants except two small dogs nearly starved, and an unreasonable portion of fleas, the hills and mountains are covered with several kinds of pine arbor vitia or white cedar, red laurel. Alder and several species of undergrowth, the bottoms have common rushes, nettles, and grass the slashy parts have bull rushes and flags, some willow on the water's edge, past an island three miles long and one mile wide, close under the starred. Side below the long narrow island below which the starred hills are very from the river bank and continues high and rigid on that side all day. We overtook two canoes of Indians going down to trade one of the Indians spoke a few words of English and said that the principal man who traded with them was Mr. Haley, and that he had a woman in his canoe who Mr. Haley was fond of and. He showed us a bow of iron and several other things which he said Mr. Haley gave him. We came too to dine on the long narrow island found the wood so thick with undergrowth that the hunters could not get any distance into the isle. The red wood, and green briars interwoven, and mixed with pine, alder, a species of beech, ash and. We killed nothing today the Indians leave us in the evening, river about one mile wide hills high and steep on the STD. No place for several miles subsequently large and level for our camp we at length landed at a place which by moving the stones we made a place sufficiently large for the party to lie level on the smaller stones clear of the tide cloudy with rain all day we are all wet and disagreeable. Had large fires made on the stone and dried our bedding and kill the fleas. Which collected in our blankets at every old village we encamped near I had like to have forgotten a very remarkable knob rising from the edge of the water to about eighty feet high and about two hundred paces around at its base and situated on the long narrow island above and nearly opposite to the two lodges we passed today, it is some distance from the high land and in a low part of the island. Clark, November 7. 1805. November 7 Thursday, 1805 A cloudy foggy morning, a little rain. Set out at eight o'clock proceeded on. The women's petticoat is about fifteen inches long made of arbor vita or the white cedar bark wove to a string and hanging down and toss less and tied so as to cover from their hips as low as the petticoat will reach and only covers them when standing. As in any other position the toes will separate. Those people sold us otter skins for fish hooks of which they wer fond. We delayed eleven halves hour and set out the tide being up in and the river so cut with islands we got an Indian to pilot us into the main chanel one of our canoes separate from us this. Morning in the fog, great numbers of waterfowls of every description. Common to this river. Clark, November 7, 1805. November 7, Thursday, 1805 A cloudy foggy morning some rain. We set out early proceeded under the starred shore under a high rigid hills with steep ascent the shore bolt and rocky, the fog so thick we could not see across the river. Two canoes of Indians met and returned with us to their village which is situated on the starred side behind a cluster of marshy islands, on a narrow channel. Of the river through which we passed to the village of four houses, they gave us to eat some fish, and sold us, fish, wap pa to roots three dogs and two otter skins for which we gave fish hooks principally of which they were very fond. Those people call themselves Warsiayakum and speak a language different from the natives above with whom they trade for the wapato roots of which they make great use of as food. Their houses differently built, 
raised entirely above ground eaves about five feet from the ground supported and covered in the same way of those above, dotes about the same size but in the side of the house in one corner. One fireplace and that near the opposite end. Around which they have their beads raised about four feet from the floor which is of earth, under their beads they store away baskets of dried fish berries and wapato. Over the fire they hang the flesh as they take them and which they do not make immediate use. Their canoes are of the same form of those above. The dress of the men differ very little from those above, the women altogether different. Their robes are smaller only covering their shoulders and falling down to near the hip, and sometimes when it is cold a peak of fur curiously plaited and connected so as to meet around the body from the arms to the hips the garment which occupies the waist and thence as low as the knee before and mid-leg behind. Cannot properly be called a petticoat, in the common except ion of the word. It is a tissue formed of white cedar bark bruised or broken into small straps which are interwoven in their center by means of several cords of the same materials which serves as well for a girdle as to hold in place the straps of bark which forms the tissue, and which strands, confined in the middle. Hang with their ends pendulous from the waist, the whole being of sufficient thickness when the female stands erect to conceal those parts use ally covered from familiar view. But when she stoops or places herself in any other attitudes this battery of Venus is not altogether impervious to the penetrating eye of the Amorite. This tissue is sometimes formed of little strings of the silk grass twisted and knotted at their ends and those Indians are low and ill-shaped all flat heads. After delaying at this village one hour and a half we set out piloted by an Indian dressed in a sailor's dress, to the main chanel of the river. The tide being in we should have found much difficulty in passing into the main chanel from behind those islands, without a pilot, a large marshy island near the middle of the river near which several canoes came alongside with skins, roots fish and to sell, and had a temporary residence on this island, here we see great numbers of waterfowls about those marshy islands, here the high mountainous Count Ray approaches the river on the large side, a high mountain. To the SW about twenty miles, the high mountains. Count Ray continue on the starred side, about fourteen miles below the last village and eighteen miles of this day we landed at a village of the same nation. This village is at the foot of the high hills on the starred side back of two small islands it contains seven indifferent houses built in the same form of those above, here we purchased a dog some fish. Wapato roots and I purchased two beaver skins for the purpose of making me a robe, as the robe I have is rotten and good for nothing. Opposite to this village the high mountainous Count Ray leave the river on the large side below which the river widens into a kind of bay and is crowded with low islands subject to be covered by the tides, we proceeded on about twelve miles below the village. Under a high mountainous Count Ray on the starred side. Shore bold and rocky and encamped under a high hill on the starred. Side opposite to a rock situated half a mile from the shore, about fifty feet high and twenty feet diameter. We with difficulty found a place clear of the tide and sufficiently large to lie on and the only place we could get was on round stones on which we lay our mats rain continent. Moderately all day and two Indians accompanied us from the last village, they we detected in stealing a knife and returned. Our small canoe which got separate in the fog this morning joined us this evening from a large island situated nearest the large side below the high hills on that side. The river being too wide to see either the form shape or size of the islands on the large side. Great joy in camp we are in view of the ocean, this great Pacific Octian which we've been so long anxious to see. And the roaring or noise made by the waves breaking on the rocky shores, as I suppose, may be heard distinctly. We made 34 miles today as computed. Clark, November 8, 1805. Navre. 8th Friday 1805 A cloudy morning some rain and wind we changed our clothes and set out at 9 o'clock proceeded on close under the starred. Side. R. Fields killed a goose and two canvas back ducks in this bay after dinner we took the advantage of the returning tide and proceeded on to the 2D point. At which place we found the swells too high to proceed we landed and drew our canoes up so as to let the tide leave them. 
The three Indians after selling us four fish for which we gave seven small fishing hooks, and a piece of red cloth. Some fine rain at intervales all this day. The swells continued high all the evening and we are compelled to form an encampment on a point scarcely room sufficient for us all to lie clear of the tide water. Hills high and with a steep ascent, river wide and at this place too salt to be used for drink. We are all wet and disagreeable, as we have been continually for several. Days passed, we are at a loss and cannot find out if any settlement is near the mouth of this river. The swells were so high and the canoes rolled in such a manner as to cause several to be very sick. Reuben Fields, Wiser McNeil and the Squar W.E.R. of the number. Clark, November 8, 1805. November 8 Friday, 1805 A cloudy morning some rain, we did not set out until nine o'clock, having changed our clothing, proceeded on close under the starred. Side, the hills high with steep ascent, shore bold and rocky several low islands in a deep bend or bay to the large side, river about five or seven miles wide. Three Indians in a canoe overtook us, with salmon to sell, past two old villages on the starred. Side and at three miles entered a niche of about six miles wide and five miles deep with several creeks making into the starred hills. This niche we found very shallow water and call it the shallow niche we came to at the remains of an old village at the bottom of this niche and dined, here we saw great numbers of fowl. Sent out two men and they killed a goose and two cans back ducks here we found great numbers of hees which we treated with the greatest caution and distance. After diner the Indians left us and we took the advantage of a returning tide and proceeded on to the second point on the STD, here we found the swells or waves so high that we thought it imprudent to proceed. We landed unloaded and drew up our canoes. Some rain all day at intervales, we are all wet and disagreeable, as we have been for several days past, and our present situation a very disagreeable one inasmuch. As we have not level land sufficient for an encampment and for our baggage to lie clear of the tide, the high hills jutting in so close and steep that we cannot retreat back, and the water of the river too salt to be used. Added to this the waves are increasing to such a height that we cannot move from this place, in this situation we are compelled to form our camp between the height of the ebb and flood tides. And raise our baggage on logs, we are not certain as yet if the whites people who trade with those people or from whom they procure their goods are stationary at the mouth, or visit this quarter at stated times for the purpose of traffic and. I believe the latter to be the most probable conjecture, the seas rolled and tossed the canoes in such a manner this evening that several of our party were seasick. Clark, November 9, 1805. Navarre. 9th Saturday 1805 The tide of last night obliged us to unload all the canoes one of which sunk before she was unloaded by the high waves or swells which accompanied the returning tide, the others we unloaded. And three others was filled with water soon after by the swells or high seas which broke against the shore immediately where we lay, rained hard all the fore part of the day. The tide which rose until two o'clock p.m. today brought with it such immense swells or waves, added to a hard wind from the south which loosened the drift trees which is very thick on the shores, and tossed them about in such a manner. As to endanger our canoes very much. With every exertion and the strictest attention by the party was scarcely suffiant to defend our canoes from being crushed to pieces between those immensely large trees many of them two hundred feet long and four feet through. The tide of this day rose about underscore 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 feet and fifteen inches higher than yesterday this is owing to the wind which sets in from the ocean, we are compelled to move our camp from the water. As also the loading every man as wet all the last night and this day as the rain could make them which contained. All day. At four o'clock the wind shifted about to the S, W immediately from the ocean and blew a storm for about two hours, raised the tide very high all wet and cold Labiac killed four ducks very fat and our fields saw elk sign. Notwithstanding the disagreeable time of the party for several days past they are all cheerful and full of anxiety to see further into the ocean. The water is too salt to drink, we use rain water. The salt water has acted on some of the party already as a purgative. Rain continues. Clark, November 9, 1805. November 9, Saturday, 
1805 the tide of last night did not rise sufficiently high to come into our camp, but the canoes which was exposed to the mercy of the waves and which accompanied the returning tide, they all filled, and with great attention we saved them until the tide left them dry, wind hard from the south and rained hard all the fore part of the day. At two o'clock p.m. the flood tide came and accompanied with immense waves and heavy winds, floated the trees and drift which was on the point on which we camped and tows them about in such a manner as to endanger the canoes very much. With every exertion and the strictest attention by every individual of the party was scarcely sufficient to save our canoes from being crushed by those monstrous trees many of them nearly two hundred feet long and from four to seven feet through. Our camp entirely under water during the height of the tide, every man as wet as water could make them all the last night and today all day as the rain continued all day, at four o'clock p.m. the wind shifted about to the S.W. and blew with great violence immediately from the ocean for about two hours. Notwithstanding the disagreeable situation of our party all wet and cold, and one which they have experienced for several days past, they are cheerful and anxious to see further into the ocean. The water of the river being too salt to use we are obliged to make use of rain water, some of the party not accustomed to salt water has made too free a use of it on them it acts as a purgative. At this dismal point we must spend another night as the wind and waves are too high to proceed. Clark, November 10, 1805 November 10 Sunday, 1805 rained very hard the greater part of the last night and continues this morning, the wind has laid and the swells are fallen. We loaded our canoes and proceeded on, past a deep bay on the start. Side I call underscore 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 the wind rose from the NW, and the swells became so high, we were compelled to return about two miles to a place where we could unwold. Our canoes, which was in a small bay on driftwood, on which we had also to make our fires to dry ourselves as well as we could the shore being either a cliff of perpendicular rocks or steep ascents to the height of four or five hundred feet. We continued on this driftwood until about three o'clock when the evening appearing favorable we loaded and set out in hopes to turn the point below and get into a better harbor, but finding the waves and swells continue to rage with great fury below. We got a safe place for our stores and a much better one for the canoes to lie and formed a campment on drift logs in the same little bay under a high hill at the entrance of a small dream which we found very conved. On account of its water, as that of the river is brackish, the logs on which we lie is all on float every high tide, the rain continent all day, we are all wet, also our beating in many other articles. We are all employed until late drying our bedding. Nothing to eat but pounded fish. Clark, November 10, 1805. November 10 Sunday, 1805 rained very hard the greater part of last night and continues this morning. The wind has lulled and the waves are not high. We loaded our canoes and proceeded on past several small and deep niche on the start. Side, we proceeded on about ten miles saw great numbers of sea gulls, the wind rose from the N, W. And the waves became so high that we were compelled to return about two miles to a place we could unload our canoes, which we did in a small niche at the mouth of a small run on a pile of drift logs where we continued until low water. When the river appeared calm we loaded and set out but was obliged to return finding the waves too high for our canoes to ride, we again unloaded the canoes, and stowed the loading on a rock above the tide water, and formed a camp on the drift logs which appeared to be the only situation we could find to lie, the hills being either a perpendicular cliff, or steep ascent. Rising to about five hundred feet, our canoes we secured as well as we could, we are all with the rain having continued all day, our beating, and many other articles. Employ ourselves drying our blankets, nothing to eat but dried fish pounded which we brought from the falls. We made ten miles today. Clark, November 11, 1805. November 11, Monday, 1805 A hard rain all the last night we again get wet the rain continue at intervals all day. Wind very high from SW and blew a storm all day sent out Joe. Fields and Collins to hunt. At twelve o'clock at a time the wind was very high and waves tremendous five Indians came down in a canoe loaded with fish of salmon spess. Called Red Char, 
we purchased of those Indians thirteen of these fish, for which we gave, fishing hooks and some trifling things, we had seen those Indians at a village behind some marshy islands a few days ago. They are on their way to trade those fish with white people which they make signs live below round a point, those people are badly clad, one is dressed. In an old sailor's jacket and trousers, the other's elk skin robes. We are truly unfortunate to be compelled to lie for days nearly in the same place at a time that our day are precious to us. The wind shifted to underscore 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 the Indians left us and crossed the river which is about five miles wide through the highest seas I ever saw a small vessel ride, their canoe is small. Many times they were out of sight before they were two miles off certain it is they are the best canoe navigators I ever saw the tide was three hours later today than yesterday and rose much higher. The trees we camped on was all on float for about two hours from three until five o'clock p.m., the great quantities of rain which has fallen lozens the stones on the side of the hill and the small ones fall on us. Our situation is truly a disagreeable one our canoes in one place at the mercy of the waves our baggage in another and ourselves and party scattered on drift trees of immense sizes. And are on what dry land they can find in the crevices of the rocks and hillsides. Clark, November 11, 1805. November 11, Monday, 1805 A hard rain all the last night. During the last tide the logs on which we lay was all on float sent out Joe Fields to hunt, he soon returned and informed us that the hills was so high and steep, and thick with undergrowth and fallen timber that he could not get out any distance. About twelve o'clock five Indians came down in a canoe, the wind very high from the S.W. With most tremendous waves breaking with great violence against the shores, rain falling in torrents, we are all wet as usual and our situation is truly a disagreeable one. The great quantites of rain which has loosened the stones on the hillsides, and the small stones fall down upon us, our canoes at one place at the mercy of the waves. Our baggage in another and ourselves and party scattered on floating logs and such dry spots as can be found on the hillsides and crevices of the rocks. We purchased of the Indians thirteen red cherry which we found to be an excellent fish we have seen those Indians above and are of a nation who reside above and on the opposite side who call themselves Kalharma they are badly clad and illy made. Small and speak a language much resembling the last nation, one of those men had on a sailor's jacket and pantaloons and made signs that he got those clothes from the white people who lived below the point and. Those people left us and crossed the river which is about five miles wide at this place, through the highest waves I ever saw a small vestless ride. Those Indians are certainly the best canoe navigators I ever saw. Rained all, lay. Clark, November 12, 1805. November 12, Tuesday, 1805 A tremendous thunderstorm about three o'clock this morning accompanied by wind from the S.W. And hail, this storm of hard claps thunder lighting and hail until about six o'clock at intervals it then became light for a short time when the heavens became darkened by a black cloud from the S, W. And a hard rain succeeded which lasted until twelve o'clock with a hard wind which raised the seas tremendously high breaking with great force and fury against the rocks and trees on which we lie, as our situation became seriously dangerous. We took the advantage of a low tide and moved our camp around a point a short distance to a small wet bottom at the mouth of a small creek, which we had not observed when we first came to this cove. From its being very thick and obscured by drift trees and thick bushes, send out men to hunt they found the wood so thick with pine and timber and under broth that they could not get through, saw some elk tracks. I walked up this creek and killed two salmon trout, the men killed. Thirteen of the salmon species, the pine of fir specks, or spruck pine grow here to an immense size and height many of them seven and eight feet through and upwards of two hundred feet high. It would be distressing to a feeling person to see our situation at this time all wet and cold with our bedding and also wet, in a cove scarcely large enough to contain us, our baggage in a small holler about one half a mile from us, and canoes at the mercy of the waves and drift wood. We have skewered them as well as it is possible by sinking and weighting them down with stones to prevent the immense waves dashing them to pieces against the rocks, one got loose last night and was left on a rock by the tide some distance below without wrecking much damage. 
Fortunately for us our men are held I. It was clear at twelve for a short time. I observed the mountains on the opposite side was covered with snow our party has been wet for eight days and is truly disagreeable, their robes and leather clothes are rotten from being continually wet, and they are not in a situation to get others. And we are not in a situation to restore them, I observe great numbers of sea gulls, flying in every direction, three men Gibson Bratton and Willard attempted to deck end in a canoe built in the Indian fashion in ABT. The size of the one the Indians visited us in yesterday, they could not proceed, as the waves tossed them about at will. They returned after proceeding about one mile, we got ourselves tolerable comfortable by drying ourselves and bedding caught three salmon this evening in a small branch above about one mile. Clark, November 12th. 1805. November 12th Tuesday, 1805 A tremendous wind from the S. W, about three o'clock this morning with lightning and hard claps of thunder, and hail which continued until six o'clock a.m. when it became light for a short time, then the heavens became suddenly darkened by a black cloud from the S, W. And rained with great violence until twelve o'clock, the waves tremendous breaking with great fury against the rocks and trees on which we were encamped. Our situation is dangerous. We took the advantage of a low tide and moved our camp around a point to a small wet bottom at the mouth of a brook, which we had not observed when we came to this cove. From it being very thick and obscured by drift trees and thick bushes it would be distressing to see our situation, all wet and cold our bedding also wet. And the robes of the party which compose half the bedding is rotten and we are not in a situation to supply their places, in a wet bottom scarcely large enough to contain us, our baggage half a mile from us and canoes at the mercy of the waves. Although secured as well as possible, sunk with immense parcels of stone to w-a-t-e them down to prevent their dashing to pieces against the rocks. One got loose last night and was left on a rock a short distance below, without receiving more damage than a split in her bottom, fortunately for us our men are healthy. Three men Gibson Bratton and Willard attempted to go around the point below in our Indian canoe, much such a canoe as the Indians visited us in yesterday, they proceeded to the point from which they were obliged to return. The waves tossing them about it while I walked up the branch and gigged three salmon trout. The party killed thirteen salmon today in a branch about two miles above. Rain continued. Clark, November 13, 1805. November 13, Wednesday, 1805 Some intervales of fair weather last night, rain and wind continue this morning. As we are in a cove and the mountains very high and pine spruce very high and thick cannot determine the precise course of the winds. I walked to the top of the first part of the mountain with much fatigue as the distance was about three miles through intolerable thickets of small pine, arrow wood a growth much resembling arrow wood with briars. Growing to ten and fifteen feet high interlocking with each other in fun, odd aid to this difficulty the hill was so steep that I was obliged to drawing myself up in many places by the bowers, the count ray continues thick and hilly as far back a I could see. Some elk sign, Rained all day moderately. I am wet and k. And k. The hail which fell two night past is yet to be seen on the mountain on which I was today. I saw a small red berry which grows on a stem of about six or eight inches from the ground, in bunches and in great quantity on the mountains, the taste in sight. I saw a number of very large spruce pine one of which I measured fourteen feet around and very tall. My principal objects in ask. This mountain was to view the river below, the weather being so cloudy and thick that I could not see any distance down, discovered the wind high from the N, W. And waves high at a short distance below our encampment, squared displeased with me for not sin and canned. Waploa excellent root which is rosted and tastes like a potato I cut my hand dispatched three men in an Indian canoe, which is calculated to ride high swells, down to examine if they can find the bay at the mouth and good barbers below for us to proceed. In safety. The fighties at every hud come in with great swells and break against the rocks and drift trees with great fury, the rain continue all the evening nothing to eat but pounded fish which we have as a reserve sea store. And what poor fish we can kill up the branch on which we are encamped our canoe and the three men did not return this evening, 
if we were to have cold weather to accompany the rain which we have had for this six or eight days past we must inevitably suffer very much as clothes are sirs with us. Clark, November 13, 1805. November 13, Wednesday, 1805 Some intervales of fair weather last night, rain continue this morning. I walked up the brook and ascended the first spur of the mountain with much fatigue, the distance about three miles, through an intolerable thickets of small pine, a groth much resembling arrow wood on the stem of which there is thorns. This groth about twelve or fifteen feet high interlocked into each other and scattered over the high fern and fallen timber. Added to this the hills were so steep that I was compelled to draw myself up by the assistance of those bushes, the timber on those hills are of the pine species large and tall many of them more than two hundred feet high and from eight to ten feet through at the stump those hills and as far back as I could see. I saw some elk sign, on the spur of the mountain though not fresh. I killed a salmon trout on my return. The hail which fell two nights past is yet to be seen on the mountains, I saw in my ramble today a red berry resembling Solomon's seal berry which the natives call solmi and use it to eat. My principal object in ascending this mountain was to view the Count Ray below, the rain continuing and weather proved so cloudy that I could not see any distance on my return we dispatched three men Calter. Willard and Shannon in the Indian canoe to get around the point if possible and examine the river, and the bay below for a god barber for our canoes to lie in safety and. The tide at every flute tide came with great swells breaking against the rocks and drift trees with great fury the rain continue all day. Nothing to eat but pounded fish which we keep as a reserve and use in situations of this kind. Clark, November 14, 1805. Navre. 14 Thursday 1805 rained last night without intermission and this morning the wind blew hard from the underscore 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 we could not move, one canoe was broken last night against the rocks. By the waves dashing her against them in high tide about ten o'clock five Indians come up in a canoe through immense waves and swells, they landed and informed us they saw the three men we sent down yesterday. At some distance below soon after those people came Calter one of the three men returned and informed us that he had proceeded with his canoe as far as they could, for the waves and could find no white people, or bay. He saw a good canoe barber and two camps of Indians at no great distance below and that those with us had taken his gig and knife and which he forcibly took from them and they left us, after our treating them well. The rain continue all day all wet as usual, killed only two fish today for the whole party, at three o'clock Captain Lewis drew ear Joe. And R. Fields and Fraser set out down on the shore to examine if any white men were below within our reach, they took an empty canoe and five men to set them around the point on a gravelly beach which Calter informed was at no great distance below. The canoe returned at dusk half full of water, from the waves which dashed over in passing the point Captain Lewis is object is also to find a small bay as laid down by Vancouver just out of the mouth of the Columbia River. Rained as usual all the evening, all wet and disagreeable situated. Clark, November 14, 1805 November 14 Thursday, 1805 rained all the last night without intermission, and this morning. Wind blows very hard but our situation is such that we cannot tell from what point it comes, one of our canoes is much broken by the waves dashing it against the rocks, five Indians came up in a canoe, through the waves. Which is very high and roll with great fury, they made signs to us that they saw the three men we sent down yesterday. Only three of those Indians landed, the other two which was women played off in the waves, which induced me to suspect that they had taken something from our men below. At this time one of the men Calter returned by land and informed us that those Indians had taken his gig and basket, I called to the squares to land and give back the gig, which they would not do until a man run with a gun. As if he intended to shoot them when they landed, and Calter got his gig and basket I then ordered those fellows off, and they very readily cleared out they are of the Warsiaia come in. Calter informed us that it was but a short distance from where we lay around the point to a beautiful sand beach, which continued for a long ways. That he had found a good harbor in the mouth of a creek near two Indian lodges that he had proceeded in the canoe as far as he could for the waves. The other two men Willard and Shannon had proceeded on down. 
Captain Lewis concluded to proceed on by land and find if possible the white people the Indians say is below and examine if a bay is situated near the mouth of this river as laid down by Vancouver in which we expect. If there is white traders to find them and. At three o'clock he set out with four men Druyer Joss and Rue. Fields and Art Fraser, in one of our large canoes and five men to set them around the point on the sand beach. This canoe returned nearly filled with water at dark which it received by the waves dashing into it on its return, having landed Captain Lewis and his party safe on the sand beach. The rain continues all day all wet. The rain and k which has continued without a longer intermission than two hours at a time for ten days past has destroyed. The robes and rotted nearly one half of the few clothes the party has, particularly the leather clothes. Fortunately for us we have no very cold weather as yet and if we have cold weather before we can kill and dress skins for clothing the bulk of the party will suffer very much. Clark, November 15, 1805 November 15 Friday, 1805 rained all the last night at intervals of sometimes of two hours, this morning it became calm and fair, I prepared to set out at which time the wind sprung up from the S.E. And blew down the river and in a few minutes raised such swells and waves breaking on the rocks at the point as to render it unsafe to proceed. I went to the point in an empty canoe and found it would be dangerous to proceed even in an empty canoe the sun shone until 1 o'clock p.m. Which gave an opportunity for us to dry some of our bedding, and examine our baggage, the greater part of which I found with some of our pounded fish spoiled I had all the arms put in order and ammunition examined. The rainy weather continued without a longer intermission than two hours at a time from the fifth in the morn. Until the sixteenth is eleven days rain, and the most disagreeable time I have experienced confined on a tempiest coast wet, where I can neither get out to hunt, return to a better situation. Or proceed on, in this situation have we been for six days past. Fortunately the wind lay about three o'clock we loaded I in great haste and set out past the blustering point below which is a sand beach, with a small marshy bottom for three miles on the start. Side, on which is a large village of thirty-six houses deserted by the inns. And in full possession of the fleas, a small creek fall in at this village, which waters the country for a few miles back. Shannon and five Indians met me here, Shannon informed me he met Captain. Lewis some distance below and he took Willard with him and sent him to meet me, the inns with him W.E.R. rogues, they had the night before stole both his and Willard's guns from under their heads, Captain. Lewis and party arrived at the camp of those Indians at so timely a period that the inns were all armed and delivered up the guns and the tide meeting of me and the immense swells from the main ocean, immediately in front of us, raised to such a height that I concluded to form a camp on the highest spot I could find in the marshy bottom. And proceed no further by water as the coast becomes very dangerous for crafts of the size of our canoes and as the ocean is immediately in front and gives us an extensive view of it from Cape Disappointment to Point Adams. My situation is in the upper part of Haley Bay S. 86 degrees west underscore 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 miles course 5 to Cape Disapt. And S, 35 degrees west, course underscore 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 miles from Point Adams. The river here at its mouth from Point Adams to the entrance of Haley Bay above is underscore 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 miles or thereabouts, a large ISD. The lower point of which is immediately in the mouth above. For Indians in a canoe came down with papto roots to sell, for which they asked, blankets or robes. Both of which we could not spare I informed those Indians all of which understood some English that if they stole our guns and the men would certainly shoot them, I treated them with great distance. And the sentinel which was over our baggage all armed them very much, they all promised not to take anything, and if anything was taken by the squars and bad boys to return them and. The waves became very high evening fair and pleasant, our men all comfortable in the camps they have made of the boards they found at the town above. Clark, November 15, 1805. November 15, Friday, 1805 rained all the last night. This morning it became calm and fair, I preposed setting out, and ordered the canoes repart and loaded. 
Before we could load our canoes the wind suddenly sprung up from the S, E and blew with such violence, that we could not proceed in safety with the loading. I proceeded to the point in an empty canoe. And found that the waves dashed against the rocks with such violence that I thought it unsafe to set out with the loaded canoes, the sun shone until 1 o'clock p.m. which afford us time to dry our bedding and examine the baggage which I found nearly all wet. Some of our pounded fish spoiled in the wet. I examined the ammunition and caused all the arms to be put in order. About three o'clock the wind lulled, and the river became calm, I had the canoes loaded in great haste and set out, from this dismal nitic where we have been confined for six days past, without the possibility of proceeding on. Returning to a better situation, or get out to hunt, surse of provisions. And torrents of rain pouring on us all the time, proceeded on past the blustering point below which I found a beautiful sand beach through which runs a small below the mouth of this stream is a village of thirty-six houses uninhabited by anything except fleas. Here I met G. Shannon and five Indians. Shannon informed me that he met Captain. Lewis at an Indian hut about ten miles below who had sent him back to meet me, he also told me the Indians were thievish, as the night before they had stolen both his and Willard's rifles from under their heads. That they set out on their return and had not proceeded far up the beach before they met Captain Lewis. Whose arrival was at a timely moment and alarmed the Indians so that they instantly produced the guns, I told those Indians who accompanied Shannon that they should not come near us, and if any one of their nation stole anything from us. I would have him shot, which they understood very well. As the tide was coming in and the seas became very high immediately from the ocean, immediately facing us, I landed and formed a camp on the highest spot I could find between the height of the tides. And the slashers in a small bottom this I could plainly see would be the extent of our journey by water, as the waves were too high at any stage for our canoes to proceed any further down. In full view of the ocean from Point Adams to Cape Disappointment, I could not see any island in the mouth of this river as laid down by Vancouver. The bay which he lies down in the mouth is immediately below me. This bay we call Haley's Bay from a favorite trader with the Indians which they say comes into this bay and trades with them course to Point Adams is s. 35 degrees west. About 8 miles to Cape Disappointment is s. 86 degrees west. About 14 miles four Indians of the Warki Akum nation came down with Papatu to sell and The Indians who accompanied Shannon from the village below speak a different language from those above, and reside to the north of this place that call themselves Chin Nooks, I told those people that they had attempted to steal two guns and that if any one of their nation stole anything that the sentinel whom they saw near our baggage with his gun would most certainly shoot them, they all promised not to touch a thing, and if any of their woman or bad boys took anything to return it immediately and chastise them for it. I treated those people with great distance. Our men all comfortable in their camps which they have made of boards from the old village above. We made three miles today. Clark, November 16, 1805 November 16 Saturday 1805 A fine morning cool the latter part of the night, I had all our articles of every description examined, and found much wet, had all put out and dried, the five Indians thieves left me. I took a Meridine alft. With sext. 50 degrees 36 15 The shaking image below, I sent out several hunters some to kill fowl others to hunt deer or elk. The sea is foaming and looks truly dismal today, from the wind which blew today from the S. W. An Indian canoe passed down today, loaded with roots and Three Indians came up from below I gave them smoke but allowed then no kind of privileges whatever, they camped with the four which came down yesterday, near us, the evening proved. Cloudy and I could make no lunar observations. One man sick with a violent cold, caught by lying in his wet clothes, several nights course from Stormy Point to Cape Disappointment is underscore 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 miles. Past a small creek and an old village at two miles on the starred side a small creek at one mile we encamped just above a point in a deep bay to the starred. Side into which falls two small rivers STD, grat many Indians living on the bay and those two rivers, the the count ray on the starred. Side high broken and thickly timbered, that on the lard. 
At some distance from Point Adams High and Mountains on a pine cow of a witch is snow at this time, near the point is low bottom land. Our hunters and fowlers killed two deer one crane and two ducks, my served. York killed two geese and eight white, black and speckle brants, the white brant, with part of their wings black is much the largest, the black brant is very small, a little larger than a large duck, the deer poor but large. Clark, November 16. 1805. November 16 Saturday. 1805 cool the latter part of the last night this morning clear and beautiful. I had all our articles of every description examined and put out to dry. The five chin nooks left us I took a meridional altitude with the sexton. 50 degrees 36 minutes 15 which gave for latitude 46 degrees 19 minutes 11 and 1 tenth north. I sent out several hunters and fowlers in pursuit elk, deer, or fowls of any kind. Wind hard from the SW the waves high and look dismal indeed breaking with great fury on our beach an Indian canoe passed down today loaded with wapato roots. Several Indians came up today from below, I gave them smoke but allowed them no kind of privilege whatever in the camp, they with the four which came down yesterday encamped a short distance from us. The evening proved cloudy and I could not take any lunar observations, one man sick with a violent cold, caught by laying in his wet leather clothes for many nights past. The Count Ray on the starred side above Haley Bay is high broken and thick lay timbered on the large side from Point Adams the country appears low for 15 or 20 miles back to the mountains, a pinnacle of which now is covered with snow or hail. As the opposite is too far distant to be distinguished well, I shall not attempt to describe anything on that side at present. Our hunters and fowlers killed two deer one crane and two ducks, and my man York killed two geese and eight brant, three of them white with a part of their wings black and much larger than the grey brant which is a cis larger than a duck. Clark, November 17, 1805. November 17 Sunday, 1805 A fair cool windy morning wind from the east. Every tide which rises eight feet six inches at this place, comes in with high swells which break on the sand shore with great fury. I sent out six men to kill deer and fowls this morning at half past one o'clock Captain Lewis and his party returned having around past. Point disappointment and some distance on the main ocean to the N.W. Several Indians followed him and soon after a canoe with wapto roots, and licorice boiled, which they gave as presents, in return for which we gave more than the worth to satisfy them a bad practice to receive a present of Indians. As they are never satisfied in return. Our hunters killed three deer and th fowler two ducks and q brant I surveyed a little on the course and made some observance. The chief of the nation below us came up to see us the name of the nation is Chinook and his numerous live principally on fish roots a few elk and fowls. They are well armed with good fusees. I directed all the men who wished to see more of the ocean to get ready to set out with me on tomorrow daylight. The following men expressed a wish to accompany me i.e. Sari. Nat Pryor searched. J. Ordway, Joe. Fields are, Fields, Joe. Shannon, Joe Coulter, William Bratton, Peter Weiser, Shabono and my servant York. All others being well contented with what part of the ocean and its curiosities which could be seen from the vicinity of our camp. Clark, November 17, 1805. November 17 Sunday, 1805 A fair cool morning wine from the east. The tide rises at this place 8 feet 6 inches and comes in with great waves breaking on the sand beach on which we lay with great fury six hunters out this morning in search of deer and fowl. At half past one o'clock Captain Lewis returned having traversed Haley's Bay to Cape Disappointment and the sea coast to the north for some distance. Several Chinook Indians followed, Aptel, and a canoe came up with roots mats and to sell. Those Chinooks made us a present of a root boiled much resembling the common licorice in taste and size, in return for this root we gave more than double the value to satisfy their craving disposition. It is a bad practice to receive a present from those Indians as they are never satisfied for what they reave in return if ten time the value of the articles they gave. 
This Chin Nook nation is about 400 souls inhabit the Count Ray on the small rivers which run into the bay below us and on the ponds to the NW of us, live principally on fish and roots. They are well armed with fusees and sometimes kill elk deer and fowl. Our hunters killed today three deer, four brant and two ducks, and informed me they saw some elk sign. I directed all the men who wished to see more of the main ocean to prepare themselves to set out with me early on tomorrow morning. The principal chief of the Chinooks and his family came up to see us this evening. Clark, November 18, 1805. Navre. 18th Monday 1805 A little cloudy this morning I set out at daylight with ten men and my seventh, Shabono, served. Prior Otterway Joss and R. Fields Shannon Coulter, Wiser, Libiek and York proceeded on down the shore from the first point. At a run an island here the shore here the traders answer and trade. We passed at each point a soft cliffs of yellow, brown and dark soft stones here Captain Lewis myself and several. Of the men marked our names day of the month and by land and k. And k. From this s, w, three miles to the inner point. Of Cape Disappointment past a point and two small niches, Reuben Fields killed a vulture, we found a curious fiat fish shaped like a turtle, with fins on each side, and a tail notched like a fish. The internals on one side and tail and fins flat wise this fish flounder has a white on one side and lies flat to the ground, passed from last hitch across to the ocean one half a mile low land the cape is a high partly bald hill, founded on rock. I assenkled a high separate bald hill covered with long coarse grass and separate from the height of country by a slashy bottom two miles s. 60, west of the cape, thence to a 2d grassy point is n, 50 degrees west. Two miles, those hills are founded on rocks and the waves break with great fury against them, the coast is surely for several miles of this cape and for some distance off to the NWA sandbar in the mouth. Surely some distance out from the mouth the coast from the Cape NW is open for a short distance back then it becomes thick piney Count Ray interspersed with ponds. Point Adams is south 20 degrees west about 20 miles the course on that side bears S45 W. I cannot assert I'm the precise course of the deep water in the mouth of the river, the channel is but narrow. I proceeded on up above the 2D point and encamped on the shore above the high tide, evening clear for a short time. Supped. On Brant and Pounded Fish men all cheerful, express a desire to winter near the falls this winter. Clark, November 18, 1805. November 18 H. Monday 1805 A little cloudy this morning I set out with two men and my man York to the ocean by land. I.E. Seat. Ordway and Pryor, Joss and Rue. Fields, Go. Shannon, W. Bratton, J. Coulter, P. Weiser, W. Labiesh and P. Shabono one of our interpreters in York. I set out at daylight and proceeded on a sandy beach from Cape Disappointment to a high point of a mountain. Which we shall call Clark's Point of View Beers S. 20 degrees west. About 40 miles, Point Adams is very low and is situated within the direction between those two high points of land, the water appears very shoal from off the mouth of the river for a great distance. And I cannot assert I'm the direction of the deepest Chanel, the Indian's point nearest the opposite side. The waves appear to break with tremendous force in every direction quite across a large sand bar lies within the mouth nearest to Point Adams which is nearly covered at high tide. I souped on Brant this evening with a little pounded fish. Some rain in the after part of the night. Men appear much satisfied with their trip beholding with astonishment the high waves dashing against the rocks and this immense ocean. Clark, November 19. 1805. November 19 Tuesday, 1805 began to rain a little before day and continued raining until 11 o'clock I proceeded on through immensely bad thickets and hills crossing two points to a third on which we built a fire and cooked a deer which Joss. Field killed. From this point I can see into a deep bend in the coast to the N, E, for ten miles. After breakfast I proceeded on N, 20 E. 
Five miles to consummate a large sandbar at a low part ponds a little off from the coast here the high rocky hills end and a low marshy count ray succeed. I proceeded up the course end 10 degrees west. For miles and marked my name and the day of the month on a pine tree, the waters which wash this sand beach is tinged with a deep brown color for some distance out. The course continued is n 20 degrees west. Low coast and sand beach, saw a dead stigan ten feet long on the sand, and the backbone of a whale, as I conceived rained I then returned to the cape and dined. Some curious deer on this course darker large boated showroot legs pronged horns and the top of the tail black under part white as usual passed a niche in the rocks below into which falls a stream, after dinner I set out on my return s. E. Passed over a low ridge and through a piney count ray 21 versus miles to the bay, thence up the bay to the mouth of the Chinook River crossed in the canoe we had left there and encamped on the upper side the hills in the point of this bay are not high. And immediately below this river the present yellow bluffs above the river and up for about two miles the land is low slashy and contains much drift wood, the count ray up this creek is low with cops of high land or as I may say elevated. The buzzard which Reuben Fields killed diameter of one feather is, eleven fourths and one line from the tip of one to the tip of the other wing is nine feet zero inches, from the point of the bill to the tail is three feet one oh one slash four ins. Middle toe fifty one halves inches, toe nail one inches wing feather two feet half an inch. Tail feathers one forty one slash four in point. Head is sixty one fourths inch long including the beak. Clark, November 19, 1805. November 19, Tuesday, 1805 A cloudy rainy day proceeded up the coast which runs from my camp 11 fourths miles west of the inner extry of the Cape N, 20 degrees west. Five miles through a rugged hilly count ray thickly off the sea coast to the commencement of an extensive sand beach which runs N, 10 degrees west, to Point Lewis about 20 miles distance. I proceeded up this coast four miles and marked my name on a low pine. And returned three miles back, the Count Ray Opst. This sand coast is low and slashy, crossed the point two miles to the bay and encamped on Chinook River, see another book for particulars. Clark, November 19. 1805 Tuesday, November the 19th, 1805 I arose early this morning from under a wet blanket caused by a shower of rain which fell in the latter part of the last night and sent two men on ahead with directions to proceed on near the sea coast and kill something for breakfast and that I should follow myself in about half an hour. After drying our blankets a little I set out with a view to proceed near the coast the direction of which induced me to conclude that at the distance of eight or ten miles, the bay was at no great distance across. I overtook the hunters at about three miles, they had killed a small deer on which we breakfast at Cumnet raining and continued moderately until eleven o'clock a.m. After taking a sumptuous breakfast of venison which was roasted on sticks exposed to the fire, I proceeded on through rouged country of high hills and steep hollers on a course from the Cape North twenty degrees west. Five miles on a direct line to the commencement of a sandy coast which extended n, ten degrees west from the top of the hill above the sand shore to a point of high land distant near twenty miles. This point I have taken the liberty of calling after my particular friend Lewis, at the commencement of this sand beach the high lands leave the sea coast in a direction to Chinook River. And does not touch the sea coast again below Point Lewis leaving a low pondy count ray, Many places open with small ponds in which there is great number. Of fowl I am informed that the Chinook nation inhabit this low count ray and live in large wood houses on a river which passes through this bottom parallel to the sea coast and falls into the bay. I proceeded on the sandy coast four miles. And marked my name on a small pine, the day of the month and year, and, and returned to the foot of the hill, from which place I intended to strike across to the bay, I saw a sturgeon which had been thrown on shore and left by the tide ten feet in length. And several joints of the backbone of a whale which must have foundered on this part of the coast. After dining on the remains of our small deer I proceeded through over a land S.E. with some ponds to the bay distance about two miles, thence up to the mouth of Chinook River two miles. Crossed this little river in the canoe we left at its mouth and encamped on the upper side in an open sandy bottom, 
the hills next to the Bay Cape Disappointment to a short distance up the Chinook River is not very high thickly covered. With different species of pine and many of which are large, I observed in many places pine of three or four feet through growing on the bodies of large trees which had fallen down, and covered with moss and yet part sound. The deer of this coast differ materially from our common deer in a much as they are much darker deeper bodied shorter ledged horns equally branched from the beam the top of the tail black from the root to the end eyes larger and do not lope but. Jump Dash Clark, November 20, 1805 Navre 20 Wednesday 1805 Some rain last night dispatched. Three men to hunt Joe. Fields and cotter to hunt elk and labick to kill some brant for our breakfast the morning cleared up fair and we proceeded on by the same route we went out, at the river we found no Indians. Made a raft and Reuben Fields crossed and took over a small canoe which lay at the Indian cabin, this creek is at this time of high tide 300 yards wide and the marshes for some distance up the creek covered with water. Not an Indian to be seen near the creek. I proceeded on to camp and on my way was overtaken by three Indians one gave us sturgeon and wapto roots to eat I met several parties on way all of them appeared to know me and was distant, found all well at camp. Many Indians about one of which had on a robe made of two sea or tear skins. Captain Lewis offered him many things for his skins with others a blanket, a coat all of which he refused we at length purchased it for a belt of blue beads which the squaw had, the tide being out we walked home on the beach. Clark. November 20th. 1805. Wednesday, November the 20th, 1805. Some rain last night dispatched Labiak to kill some fowl for our breakfast. He returned in about two hours with eight large ducks on which we breakfast. I proceeded on to the entrance of a creek near a cabin, no person being at this cabin, and two canoes laying on the opposite shore from us. I determined to have a raft made and send a man over for a canoe. A small raft was soon made and Reuben Fields crossed and brought over a canoe, this creek which is the outlet of a number of ponds. Is at this time, high tide, three hundred yards wide, I proceeded on up the beach and was overtaken by three Indians one of them gave me some dried sturgeon and a few wapato roots. I employed those Indians to take up one of our canoes which had been left by the first party that came down. For which service I gave them each a fishing hook of a large size. On my way up I met several parties of Chinooks which I had not before seen they were on their return from our camp. All those people appeared to know my determination of keeping every individual of their nation at a proper distance, as they were guarded and reserved in my presence and found many of the Chin Nooks with Captain Lewis of whom there was two chiefs Kam Kam Moly and Chiolarlawil to whom we gave medals and to one a flag. One of the Indians had on a robe made of two sea otter skins the fur of them were more beautiful than any fur I had ever seen both Captain. Lewis and myself endeavored to purchase the robe with different articles at length we procured it for a belt of blue beads which the squaw wife of our interpreter Shabona wore around her waist. In my absence the hunters had killed several deer and fowl of different kinds. Clark, November 21, 1805 November 21st Thursday, 1805 A cloudy morning most of the Indians left us, the nation on the opposite side is small and called Clapsoil. Their great chief name still Lasha the nation living to the north is called Chiltz. The chief is named Mala not large nation and wore his beards as informed by the Inns. In my absence the hunters kiled. Seven deer, four brants and a crane. Great numbers of the dark brant passing southerly, the white yet stationary, no g's and swan to be seen. The wind blew hard from the s-e. Which with the addition of the flood tide raised immense swells and waves which almost entered our encampment morn. Dark and disagreeable, a surprising climate. We have not had one cold day since we passed below the last falls or great shoot and some time before the climate is temperate. And the only change we have experienced is from fair weather to rainy windy weather, I made a chief and gave a medal this man is named Towal and appears to have some influence with the nation and tells me he lives at the great shoot we gave the squar a coate of blue cloth for the belt of blue beads we gave for the sea otter skins purchased of an Indian. At twelve o'clock it began to rain, and continued moderately all day, 
some wind from the S, E, waves too high for us to proceed on our homeward bound journey. Latitude of this place is 46 degrees 19 minutes 11 and 1 tenth, north several Indians and squars came this evening I believe for the purpose of gratifying the passions of our men, those people appear to view sensuality as a necessary evil, And do not appear to abhor this as crime in the unmarried females. The young women sport openly with our men, and appear to receive the approbation of their friends and relations for so doing many of the women are handsome. They are all low both men and women, I saw the name of J. Baumann marked or picked on a young squaw's left arm. The women of this nation pick their legs in different figures as an orpiment. They wear their hair loose, some trinkets in their ears, none in the nose as those above, their dress is as follows, I, e the men, wear a robe of either the skins of underscore 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 a small feared animal, and which is most common, or the skins of the sea or tear. Loon, swan, beaver, deer, elk, or blankets either red, blue, or white, which robes cover the shoulders arms and body, all other parts are knacked. The women wear a short petticoat of the inner bark of the white cedar or arbor vita, which hang down loose in strings nearly as low as the knee, with a short robe which fall halfway down the thigh. No other part is covered. The ornaments are beads, blue principally, large brass wire around their wrists some rings, and many men have sailor's clothes, many have good fusees and ball and powder, the women wear a string of something curious tied tight above the ankle. All have large swelled legs and thighs the men small legs and thighs and generally badly made, they live on elk deer fowls, but principally fish and roots of three kinds, licorice, wapto and. The women have more privileges than is common amongst Indians, Pox and venereal is common amongst them I saw one man and one woman who appeared to be all in scabs, and several men with the venereal. Their other disorders and the remides for them I could not learn we divided some ribbon between the men of our party to bestow on their favorite lasses, this plan to save the knives and more valuable articles. Those people gave me sturgeon salmon and wapto roots, and we bought roots, some mats and k for which we were obliged to give immense prices, we also purchased a kind of cranberry which the Indians say the hayather in the low lands, off of small either vines or bushes just above the ground, we also purchased hats made of grass and of those Indians, some very handsome mats made of flag some few curious baskets made of a strong weed and willow or underscore 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 splits dash, also a sweet soft black root, about th cis and shape of a carrot. This root they value very highly, the wapto root is surce, and highly valued by those people, this root they rost in hot ashes like a potato and the outer skin peels off, though this is a trouble they seldom perform. Clark, November 21, 1805 Thursday, November 21, 1805 A cloudy morning most of the Chinooks leave our camp and return home, great numbers of the dark brant passing to the south, the white brant have not yet commenced their flight. The wind blew hard from the S.E., which with the addition of the flood tide raised very high waves which broke with great violence against the shore throwing water into our camp, the fore part of this day cloudy at twelve o'clock it began to rain and continued all day moderately. Several Indians visit us today of different nations or band some of the Chilts nation who reside on the sea coast near Point Louis, several of the Klotzops who reside on the opposite side of the Columbia immediately opposite to us and a chief from the Grand Rapid to whom we gave a medal. An old woman and wife to a chief of the Chinooks came and made a camp near our as she brought with her six young squares I believe for the purpose of gratifying the passions of the men of our party and receiving for those indulgences such small as she, the old woman, thought proper to accept of. Those people appear to view sensuality as a necessary evil. And do not appear to abhor it as a crime in the unmarried state, the young females are fond of the attention of our men and appear to meet the sincere approbation of their friends and connections, for thus obtaining their favors. The women of the Chinook nation have handsome faces low and badly made with large legs and thighs which are generally swelled from a stopage of the circulation in the feet, which are small, by many strands of beads or curious strings which are drawn tight around the leg above the ankle. Their legs are also picked with different figures, I saw on the left arm of a squaw the following letters. 
Baumann, all those are considered by the natives of this quarter as handsome decorations. And a woman without those decorations is considered as among the lower class they wear their hair loose hanging over their back and shoulders many have blue beads threaded and hung from different parts of their ears and about their neck and around their wrists. Their dress otherwise is precisely like that of the nation of Wasiya come as already described. A short robe, and tissue or kind of petticoat of the bark of cedar which fall down in strings as low as the knee behind and not so low before many of the men have blankets of red blue or spotted cloth or the common three and twenty-one halves point blankets. And sailors old clothes which they appear to prize highly, they also have robes of sea otter, beaver, elk, deer, fox and cat common to this count ray, which I have never seen in the U States. They also procure a robe from the natives above, which is made of the skins of a small animal about the size of a cat. Which is light and durable and highly prized by those people, the greater numbers of the men of the Chinooks have guns and powder and ball, the men are low homely and badly made, small crooked legs large feet. And all of both sex have flattened heads, the food of this nation is principally fish and roots the fish they procure from the river by the means of nets and gigs. And the salmon which run up the small branches together with what they collect drifted up on the shores of the sea coast near to where they live. The roots which they use are several different kinds. The wapato which they procure from the natives above, a black root which they call shanatake and the wild licorice is the most common. They also kill a few elk deer and fowl, many of the Chinooks appear to have venereous and pustulous disorders. One woman whom I saw at the beach appeared all over in scabs and ulcers and We gave to the men each a piece of ribbon we purchased cranberries mats very nettily made of flags and rushes, some roots, salmon and I purchased a hat made of splits and strong grass. Which is made in the fashion which was common in the U States two years ago also small baskets to hold water made of split and straw, for those articles we gave high prices dash. Clark, November 22nd. 1805. Navre. 22nd Friday 1805 Some little rain all the last night with wind, before day the wind increased to a storm from the S.S.E. And blew with violence throwing the water of the river with immense waves out of its banks almost overwhelming us in water, oh! How horrible is the day, this storm continued all day with equal violence accompanied with rain, several Indians about us, nothing killed the waves and breakers flew over our camp. One canoe split by the tossing of those waves, we are all confined to our camp and wet. Purchased some wapto roots for which was given, brass armbands and rings of which the squars were fond. We find the Indians easy ruled and kept in order by a stricter indifference towards them. Clark, November 22, 1805. Friday, November 22, 1805 A moderate rain all the last night with wind. A little before day light the wind which was from the SS. E. Blew with such violence that we wer almost overwhelm Ned with water blown from the river, this storm did not cease at day but blew with nearly equal violence throughout the whole day accompanied with rain. Oh! How horrible is the day waves breaking with great violence against the shore throwing the water into our camp and all wet and confined to our shelters, several Indian men and women crowding about the men's shelters today, we purchased a few wapato roots for which we gave armbands, and rings to the old squar, those roots are equal to the Irish potato. And is a tolerable substitute for bread. The threat which I made to the men of this nation whom I first saw, and an indifference towards them. Is I am fully convinced the cause of their conducting themselves with great propriety towards ourselves and party. Clark, November 23, 1805. November 23, Saturday, 1805 The cloudy and calm, a moderate rain the greater part of the last night, sent out men to hunt this morning and they killed three bucks, rained at intervales all day. I marked my name the day of the month and year on a beech trees and, by land, Captain Lewis branded his and the men all marked their names on trees about the camp. One Indian came up from their village on some lakes near Haley's Bay. In the evening seven Indians of the Clatsop Nation, opposite came over, they brought with them two sea or tear skins, for which they asked such high prices we were unable to purchase. 
Without reducing our small stock of merchandise on which we have to depend in part for a subsistence on our return home, Kyle for Brant and three ducks today. Clark, November 23, 1805. Saturday, November 22, RD, 1805. A calm cloudy morning, a moderate rain the greater part of the last night, Captain Lewis branded a tree with his name date and. I marked my name the day and year on a alder tree, the party all cut the first letters of their names on different trees in the bottom. Our hunters killed three bucks, for Brant and three ducks today. In the evening seven Indians of the Clotsop nation came over in a canoe, they brought with them two sea otter skins for which they asked blue beads and and such high prices that we were unable to purchase them without reducing our small stock of merchandise, on which we depended for subsistence on our return up this river, merely to try the Indian who had one of those skins, I offered him my watch. Handkerchief a bunch of red beads and a dollar of the American coin, all of which he refused and demanded, TIA, Koemo Shack, which is chief beads and the most common blue beads. But few of which we have at this time. This nation is the remains of a large nation destroyed by the smallpox or some other which those people were not acquainted with. They speak the same language of the Chinooks and resemble them in every respect except that of stealing, which we have not caught them at as yet. Clark, November 24, 1805. November 24, Sunday, 1805 Several of the Chen Nook N came, one of them brought in sea or tear skin for which we gave some blue beads, this day proved to be fair and we dried our wet articles bedding and the hunters killed only one brant no deer or anything else. The old chief of Chinook Nation and several men and women came to our camp this evening and smoked the pipe. Serge J. Ordway. Cross and examine. S. Searched. N. Prior. Do do. S. Sergeant P. Gas. Do do. S. Joe. Shields. Proceed to Sandy R. Go. Shannon. Exam. Cross. Falls. T. P. Howard. Do do. Falls. P. Weiser. Do do. S. R. J. Collins. Do do. S. R. Joe Fields. Do do. Up. Al Willard. Do do. Up. R. Willard. Do do. Up. J. Potts. Do do. Falls. R. Frazier. Do do. Up. William Bratton. Do do. Up. R. Fields. Do do. Falls. J. B. Thompson. Do do. Up. J. Coulter. Do do. Up. H. Hall. Do do. S. R. La Beach. Do do. S. R. Peter Krizat. Do do. S. R. J. B. Depage. Do do. Up. Shabono. S. Gutterick. Do do. Falls. W. Werner. Do do. Up. Go. Gibson. Do do. Up. Joss. White House. Do do. Up. Geo Druyer. Exam other side. Falls. McNeil. Do do. Up. York. Lookout. Falls Sandy River Lookout up. 6 10 12. Janie in favor of a place where there is plenty of potas. CPL proceed on tomorrow and examine the other side if good hunting to winter there, as salt is an object.